Corruption Redeem. Unofficial Warhammer 40k Ice Guy slash Lit RPG. By O Security Viking. Bjork was an ordinary man living an ordinary life. Working as a blacksmith in a nation plagued by recurring civil wars, growing up with divorced parents, a feeling of being born in the wrong place or time, and a burning desire to live a life of more excitement. Any kind of excitement. A desire that will make him truly understand the meaning of the phrase, be careful what you wish for, and regret ever wishing himself away from his mundane and monotone life. His only strength in life is his ability to simply go with the flow, no matter what happens. Prologue, how it all started. I felt the familiar grip of the hotshot loss gun in my hands as I leaned against the inside of the trench. My comrades from the curls of Fenris surrounded the trenches around me. The Creek Commissar was walking down the trench line, preaching about the value of waiting for the right moment to attack, to maximize your sacrifice in the name of the Emperor. Several of the Kriegers manning the trench turned their heads briefly to look in his general direction before returning their gaze to the battlefield in front of them. I didn't need to peek over the edge to see the horrors that would make depictions of hell from back home look like cute children's drawings. Lakes of blood filled the craters lefts by the numberless artillery pieces on both sides, dumping their ordnance on the enemy without pause. Limbs strewn about no man's land as if a giant had casually thrown a bucket of toothpicks on the ground. The screams of the wounded and dying were mixed in with sporadic gunfire. The sickening stench of rotting flesh, infected wounds, gunpowder, guts, shit, piss, and vaporized blood. I could no longer remember the sound of silence. Leaning my head against the dirt, I closed my eyes and thought back to how it all started. Underscore 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 underscore. It was just another day at work. Fit the plates for the balconies that the customer had ordered, go home, have a beer, and read a story or two. He always did that. Went to work and spent his spare time reading stories. He didn't care what they were about, as long as they were epic and glorious. Dungeons and Dragons stories, Ice Guy stories, sci fi stories, space operas, and his favorite of them all Warhammer 40k stories. He was smitten with the Warhammer universe and everything in it. He had spent many a night wishing for dear life that he would wake up in the 40k universe as a mighty space marine. Vanquishing the enemies of the Emperor with blade and bolter. Live forever as a space marine had the potential to do, provided they did not die in battle. He could easily see himself as a chapter master, guiding the Imperium into a new age of technological progress and understanding instead of the backward and fearful approach they currently had in the lore. When he was finally on his way home he was excited. He had gotten a book he had been waiting for, for the longest time and could not wait to get home to read it. But his colleagues had other plans. One of them was celebrating his birthday at the local bar and they would not take no as an answer. So Bjork very reluctantly agreed to come with. A couple of beers and he would head home as soon as it was socially acceptable. That was his first mistake. Bjork's second mistake, talking to the guy. They had spent a great many hours talking, much longer than he had originally planned to stay at the bar. The stranger kept asking questions about his reasoning for wanting to leave this life behind and what kind of life he would prefer instead if he got to choose. When he had mentioned the 40k universe and explained the basics, he had committed his third and final mistake. He had not seen the red flag in the sadistically gleeful smile that crept over the stranger's face as he offered to buy the next round. Bjork had only had two beers over the last several hours so he felt fine to drink another. It was rare to meet people interested in 40k who were not already a fan, and despite the stranger's creepiness, the longer he spent with him the less the creepiness seemed to matter. They shared another beer when Bjork suddenly felt like he needed to get away from the stranger. The aura of strange, evil atmosphere that had started emanating from him was unsettling, to say the least. He made a half-assed excuse and rose from his seat to get the hell away from the man radiating danger and something foreign, something that did not belong in this world. The stranger hand snapped out, fast as a striking snake, and grabbed his right elbow. He felt a burning sensation under the palm of the stranger, burning its way into the skin on the inside of his elbow joint. He let out a yell of pain and ripped his arm free of the stranger's grip. Before anyone could move, the stranger had jumped up from his seat and bolted out of the front door. An hour later I was on my way home. The burning had not left any mark, but I did not feel well. I didn't feel sick, I just didn't feel well. 
The last thing I remember is puking in an alley before everything went black. Underscore 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 underscore. I have no idea how long I was out, but when I woke up, I didn't really wake up. I was there but I was not present. I just heard a voice in my head as I regained consciousness. Welcome, new soul. Your life is about to begin again. Please select race. Race? I thought to myself. I am human if that is what it means. Race selected, human. Adding 10 points to luck stat. Selecting random spawn location. Wait, no, I didn't choose anything. I want to do over. All choices are final. For list of available choices in the future, please use the command show options. Random spawn location chosen. Segmentum obscurus. Calixi sector. Subsector, Marcane marches. Carrick system. Planet, Carrick. Please try not to die. I could feel consciousness fade and return, but this time I was in a body again. I slowly opened my eyes. I was laying in a stone room of what looked to be a monastery. I could hear chanting somewhere and the air was thick and heavy with incense. I could see skull adornments and an eagle symbol I knew all too well from the stories I loved so much. The Imperial Aquila. While I was looking around, I noticed a weird blinking in the corner of my vision. When I focused my thoughts on it, a screen popped into my vision. Human. Level 1. Stat points remaining, 5. Alignment, pure in the eyes of the emperor. Litanies, 1. Augmentations, none. Level, 0 600. Strength, 5. Agility, 5. Perception, 5. Will, 5. Luck, 15. Chapter 1, What the Actual Fuck? Race? Litanies? XP? What the actual fuck is happening right now? I thought as I looked around the room. The first thing that sprang out was the pragmatic approach to home decoration. Besides useful tools, odds and ends, the only decoration was an imperial aquila adorning the walls. A piece of paper was framed on the wall above the door. It looked old. A wax seal at the bottom with the laurel encrusted, double-headed eagle hanging over a human skull. The ideology was clear as day. The skull at the bottom represents humanity. The laurel crown represents the purity of the human species and the double-headed eagle represents the imperium of man. One does not fanboy over 40k without learning a myriad of random things, including basic heraldry, rang through my head as a thousand thoughts all tried to get to the front of the line. I looked down at my own body and was stupefied. I was not looking at my original body. It felt like it, and in many ways, it looked like it. But it was not the same body. This body was lean, toned, pale as ice, and covered in small and medium-sized scars. My hands were rough and hard, callous almost everywhere, the legs muscular without being obscene. Getting up from the simple bed I had been sleeping in, I stumbled over to the wall where a mirror was hanging. At least my face looks the same, I thought with relief as I looked in the mirror. That's when I noticed the ease with which I moved. Silent steps on confident feet. I moved like a predator on the prowl, fast and deadly. Finally awake, eh? The emperor protects. A gruff voice rang out and broke my train of thought, I turned around and saw an older man walking towards me from a different room, which I presumed to be a living room, on account of the large table and chair set in the middle. The man walked with confidence, a soldier's walk. There was no fear in him. He was holding a bowl of what was best described as goop with an ever so slightly green tinge. I figured you were hungry and there is always plenty of Soylens Viridians asterisk to go around. He said to me as he handed me the bowl and a spoon. Feeling my stomach respond to me holding food, I tentatively took a spoonful of the goop. If bland was a taste, this was the source. Never had I tasted something so, full-blown bland before. But it was filling and soon the bowl was empty. Good, you need to regain your strength. That crash was a nasty one. The older man continued. Crash? I don't remember any crash. I said as I slowly rose from the bed. You did hit your head phenomenally hard, I'm surprised your skull didn't crack open like an egg. What is your name? Bjork, I said. I sensed it would not be a good idea to reveal my true identity just yet. But that is all I remember. I have no memory before waking up in this bed. I am Nayla. Welcome to my humble abode. 
Nayla sarcastically gestured to the, honestly speaking, miserable living conditions surrounding us. Bare walls of what looked like concrete, but with too smooth a finish, the bed barely more than a slab of wood with some stuffing in a lowering in the middle and a cheap blanket on top. The view outside the small window in the wall showed a city, larger than I had ever seen or imagined before. What worried me was the insane amount of gun emplacements on the walls. Where the fuck did I end up? I scoured my memory. The voice had said something about the planet Carrick. Searching my memory, all that came up was asterisk orc infested, almost ice world. Figures. I get my one true wish fulfilled and I end up on a half-frozen ball of screaming death in the form of freezing winds and orcs. I thought to myself as reality hit me. I had been granted the one thing I wanted. A life of excitement. The only problem was, as much as I loved the Warhammer setting, whenever people asked if I wanted to live in it, my immediate answer would always be no thanks, I choose life. The Warhammer setting was great for imagining yourself as a mighty space marine. Being thrust into the world as a baseline human? His choices were basically what he would like to kill him. He could join the Imperial Guard. Have an expected lifespan of around 15 seconds in open battle. He could join a gang and increase that life expectancy to around two years before a rival gang would wipe them out or the Arbites would roll through and mount his corpse on a pike as a warning to the rest of the gangs around. He could, of course, take regular work. Let 16-hour shifts slowly break down his body and will until all that was left was an empty husk, ready to be processed into corpse starch. The only truly sensible option would be to get a hold of a gun and blow his brains out. Then again, he had never been that sensible a person. Life was indeed grimdark in the 40k universe, but he needed to try and make the best of it. Get some rest, you are still zoning out. Next time you wake up, we will talk more. Nayla said and left the room. I laid down on the bed, but sleep was the last thing on my mind. There was some sort of system in place, judging from the voice in my head earlier, and I was determined to find out how it worked. Show options, I thought to myself. Nothing happened. Um? Open character info. The same screen from yesterday filled my vision. Human. Level 1. Stat points remaining, 5. Alignment, pure in the eyes of the Emperor. Litanies, 1. Augmentations, none. Level, 0 600. Strength, 5. Agility, 5. Perception, 5. Will, 5. Luck, 15. Hmm, living on a world like this, I would benefit more from agility and perception than raw strength. I thought to myself. After a bit of internal deliberation, I dumped all five points in perception. Seeing the danger coming was better than being able to outrun an ambush you never saw coming. A small box popped up, confirming my selection, and I felt a slight tingle wash over my body. The difference was almost imperceptible, but it was there. I didn't only notice more details as I looked around again but I also made mental connections I had not been able to make before. For example, it occurred to me, from the confident walk in his steps and the imperial Aquila dotted around the small home, to the indifference with which he mentioned Soylen's viridians always being plentiful, indicating that he was either used to or at least knew of, better quality food, that he was most like either a member of the imperial guard or a former, retired member. He did look like he was quite a bit older than my mid-thirties. The small light was blinking in the corner of my vision again, and I focused my mind on it. A new screen filled my vision. Congratulations. You have earned an achievement. For putting all your initial stat points into a single stat, you have earned the achievement one trick pony. Achievement reward, one stat point. Huh. So I guess achievements are a thing as well. Not bad for someone that never played the game before. I thought to myself, happy with the small boon. Compared to my already 40 collective stat points, it was a drop in the water. But every advantage counts and I took this one with glee, putting the point into luck. It only seemed fair, since it was my luck that got me the stat point. Afterward, my character looked as follows. Human. Level 1. Stat points remaining, 0. Alignment, pure in the eyes of the Emperor. Litanies, 1. Augmentations, none. Level, 0 600. Strength, 5. Agility, 5. Perception, 10. Will, 5. Luck, 16. That was fairly easy, I thought to myself, I wonder what litanies are. Show litanies. Litanies, 1. Prayer of adulation to the emperor. I wonder how that works. 
I continued my train of thought. Without thinking I started speaking the words as I was laying on the bed. O immortal emperor, have mercy upon us, miserable unworthies that we are. O master of the galaxy, protect your flock from the alien. O keeper of the light, guide our darkened path with your radiance. We are your warriors and we are servants to thee. We stand free from blindness of heart. Free from hypocrisy, vainglory, and deceits. But captive to hatred, malice, and anger. To the filth, the alien, the heretic. By thy agony and bloody sweat, by the golden throne and thy death. By the destruction and re-emergence as the god of men. Keep and strengthen us, we who fight for thee. The last three lines of the prayer were echoed from the adjoining room as Nayla came back through the door. I see you have not forgotten everything. He said to me with a small smile on his lips. For a moment I was worried I might have picked up a heretic in the making and would have to register you for re-education. The hard look in his eyes contradicted his smile and pleasant voice. I had no doubt he would have killed me off soon had I not exhibited the behavior of an imperial citizen. Re-education, I thought to myself. That's a good one. More like indoctrination with mandatory lobotomy for anyone deemed a failure in re-education. I thought, but simply smiled at the Nela and said, the glory of the emperor's light can never be extinguished. Nela's smile grew and the hard look in his eyes disappeared. Spoken like a true imperial citizen. I am now certain you were not the saboteur. Saboteur, wait, what? I asked confused. Please elaborate. Right, memory loss. Nayla reminded himself. I recovered you from a downed Arvis lighter transport shuttle. The damage was extensive and had all the signs of an orc missile attack from the surface. Except for the precision damage of the explosions. Only the engine and hull were damaged, but they were so badly damaged it's a wonder the shuttle didn't tear itself apart. Nayla took a deep breath to continue, but the sound of a kettle starting to boil interrupted him and he hurried out. Moments later he returned with two steaming cups. Recaf asterisk asterisk? He asked me as he held out one of the cups. Yes, thank you. I said and took it. I took a deep inhale of the fumes coming off of the surface of the fluid in the cup. It smelled like coffee from back home, even though it looked like tea. A sip confirmed that it was indeed a tea-colored coffee. Since you cannot remember anything from before, I guess the most sensible thing would be to figure out what you want to do. I could not find any identification papers on you, so I'm guessing they must have got lost in the crash. So first, we get you to the local administorum office, get your identity papers in order, and then we find your function. Nayla said slowly as if he was thinking over the issue as he spoke. What would be my options? I asked of him, curious as to what place in society I could fill out. There are not many choices for you on Carrick, I'm afraid. Work in the mines, work in the warehouses, join the PDF asterisk asterisk asterisk, or join one of the gangs in the underhive. See link in post chapter notes, those are your choices, really. Nayla explained before smiling and adding, but hey, at least we are not living on a death world asterisk 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 asterisk. He chuckled a bit at his own words and it gave me time to focus my thoughts on the blinking at the edge of my vision that had started to become familiar at this point. Quest received. Quest task, choose career path. Reward S50 XP, access to skills. Time limit, infinite. Chapter 2. Depressingly interesting. There are quests in this world? Neat. I thought to myself as I read the message. But what to choose? Nayla, can I wait to choose until we have been by the administorum? I asked. Of course. I was wondering if you would join me in prayer before we leave? This time, Nayla's smile was genuine and warm. I saw no other choice than to accept. Of course, Nayla. I would be delighted to. I answered enthusiastically. Oh? I rarely get to meet someone as excited as I am about the prayers. Nayla, despite his older age, seemed almost giddy at the thought and something popped into my head from my previous life. A sentence from a book I once read. Lay a fire within your soul and another between your hands, and let both be your weapons. For one is faith and the other is victory and neither may ever be put out. I recited solemnly. The teachings of Saint Sabbath. You must have studied the Ecclesiarchy's asterisk holy texts. This could be a clue in figuring out who you are. Nayla said excitedly. Just a quick question, Nayla. Shouldn't we be going to the Adeptus Administratum asterisk asterisk to get me registered, instead of the Adeptus Ministorum? 
Nayla drank the last of his recaf and kept smiling as he answered. Right you are, Bjork, but we have representatives from the administratum in the halls of the ministorum. When you add to that that I am a deacon in his holy emperor's service, I can make things go faster. What would be a six-month wait with you at the mercy of the goodwill of those around you, the three hours of interview I can arrange for you should be the preferable choice. You are correct, Nayla, that would be most preferable. I put on a happy attitude but inside I was dying. First prayer and then a several-hour interview? Just give me something to do instead. Remembering another quote, I recited another memory. When the people forget their duty they are no longer human and become something less than beasts. They have no place in the bosom of humanity nor in the heart of the emperor. Let them die and be forgotten I long to do something productive. Let us waste no time, Nela. Better to get this over with. Of course, I was rescued by a member of the ecclesiarchy. The only people with some sense of humanity in this universe. From the prime edicts of the holy synod of the Adeptus Ministorum. You are either a member of the ecclesiarchy or a very devout believer in the emperor. Nela seemed immensely satisfied with himself for good reason. Had he indeed rescued a member of the ecclesiarchy, his promotion to cardinal would almost be guaranteed to happen within years instead of decades, so I fully understood his excitement. What kind of hole was I digging for myself here? I emptied the cup and looked around for a place to set it down, but Nela took it from me and gestured for me to follow. Underscore 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 After spending the next two hours kneeling and praying, as interesting as the experience was, my mind felt numb and sedated. The incense that hung heavy in the air, the closed cathedral, as enormous as it is, felt stuffy and humid from the thousands of bodies kneeling in collective prayer. On the plus side, I gained more litanies and even a hymnal. Each of them gave a minute XP bonus, so at the end of the prayer session, my character sheet had changed slightly. Human. Level 1. Stat points remaining, 0. Alignment, pure in the eyes of the emperor. Litanies, 5. Augmentations, none. Level, 19 600. Strength, 5. Agility, 5. Perception, 10. Will, 5. Luck, 16. I was not about to complain, but if it took that long to farm 19 XP by praying, I needed to start doing something different, and soon. I had enough knowledge of RPGs and their mechanics from my own world to see the similarities and I figured that you could grind levels in the same way. Levels meant power and survivability. Especially in this universe. At the moment, I was at the bottom of the food chain and I did not like that idea. I like to consider myself an easygoing person in life and I saw no reason not to bring that with me to this world. But I wondered if I would be able to do so successfully in this universe, which I had more or less confirmed to be akin to the Warhammer universe from back home. After the prayers were said and done, Nayla approached me again. Bjork, I have set up the interview with an administratum clerk. We should hurry. Have you figured out where you want to serve? He was fidgeting nervously as he spoke. Maybe he got someone higher ranking than he planned, I thought to myself. Yes, Nela, I said to him, I want to serve in the PDF. As the emperor protects the faithful, so shall I. Well spoken, my friend. Well spoken indeed. Nela said and he lead me to the interview. Underscore 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 underscore. There were many tests and trick questions during the interview, but I must have performed satisfactorily because soon I was being tattooed by a servitor. The identification tattoo was would be my lifeline to a normal life in this universe, if there was any normality to be got. Shortly after, we left for the Departmento Munitorum asterisk 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 to get me enrolled in the PDF. On the way, as I was looking around and getting used to the soul-crushing cold weather, I spotted the largest, most deformed human I had ever seen. An ogren asterisk 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 asterisk, I exclaimed surprised. Huh? C'est n'est la absent madeli. He had been mumbling while walking with a bowed head, no doubt praying as we went along. Strange. They are not supposed to be in this part of the city. As Nayla finished speaking, a commissar asterisk 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 rounded the corner, shouting at the ogren. Zeg, come here. You will not disobey me again. The commissar was stomping towards the massive ogren who looked more like a terrified child. No. You are gonna punish Zag. 
The ogren said in a childlike tone of voice as it kept moving forward, away from the commissar. Nayla hurried to the side to avoid getting tangled up in the situation, but I was curious. All the lore I had read about ogrens made them out to be of very low intellect, but unwaveringly loyal to the emperor. Their low intellect also made them quite naive and impressionable, which perhaps could be used to defuse the situation. Of course, there is a good chance I might get turned into mush if I get in the big guy's way. I thought to myself as I started whistling a low tune. The clear tones easily rose above the normal ruckus of pedestrian shuffling and the ogren stopped dead in its tracks and looked around. He soon spotted me and moved toward me much faster than I liked to see such a large being approach me, but I stood my ground and kept whistling. He slowed down just in time to not hit me, and a more than three-meter tall mountain of muscle loomed over me, staring at me with star-filled eyes at the simple whistling that left my lips. It's probably the first time in his life he heard something like it. I thought to myself, the Warhammer universe is not a place that inspires joyful things, like whistling. I saw the commissar quickly making his way over, his great coat and commissarial cap standing out amongst no matter where he went, his hard boots thudding on the ground as he approached us. As soon as he saw what was happening, the commissar just stopped, looked at us, looked at the situation, and I could almost hear the gears in his head turning. Vastly different from regular commissars, those entrusted with ogrins tended to be extremely progressive, patient, and open-minded, meaning that they would not execute you on the spot for suggesting something that is not strictly tried and true by the Imperium. Ogrin commissars had to be far more flexible, considering the very limited mental faculties of their charges. When I finished the tune, the ogrin, Zag, immediately said, That was pretty. Seeing as he had completely forgotten about whatever debacle he had with the commissar, the lore seemed to be correct about their attention span as well. The commissar approached at a more reasonable pace, now sure I was not going to suffer the quick death of an enraged ogrin and put a hand on the giant's arm. Zag, you need to come back to quarters. I am not angry with you and neither is the emperor, colon, he said with a gentle but unyielding voice. The large ogrin turned his head to the commissar. But the man is making pretty noises. He said stubbornly as if that not only explained everything but justified him being here as well. I shot an apologetic look at the commissar and decided to take initiative in the conversation. Ave Imperator, commissar. I made the symbol of the imperial Aquila in front of my chest as I greeted the man. Best to be on the safe side. I had no intention to disrupt your daily training regimen. I was on my way to the Departmento Munitorum to sign up for the PDF and thought it best to continue whistling my little tune when it seemed to keep this mighty ogren docile. The commissar returned my Aquila and waved away my concerns. Ave Imperator citizen. Think nothing of it, this is not a designated training area. Had it been, you would already be dead. But joining the PDF is an admirable ambition. Might I inquire as to why you wish to serve? He said, his movements and tone of voice carefully measured and under strict control. The Emperor's coin are lives. Spend it well. I responded with a smile, hoping to break through the permanent frown on the commissar's face. Not that I was expecting to succeed, but as long as something was hopeless, there was still hope. The commissar stared me down and I was worried I might have said something wrong. How wonderfully descriptive. The commissar said, his face remaining unchanged. However, I am not familiar with the tune you were whistling. From where does that tune originate? The commissar's voice took on a very dangerous undertone, his words were cordial as ever, but I had no doubt I was walking on a knife's edge. It was not a tune, so to speak, commissar. I was merely whistling in enjoyment of this day. I said with a slight smile. Hmm. The simple, inquisitive noise the commissar made was more telling than entire books. He was suspicious. A moment later, I felt a strange force creep over my skin. It was invasive, prodding searching. I tried to ignore it and moments later it was gone. What a strange individual you are. The commissar suddenly said before he turned on his heel and snapped Zieji. We are heading to the barracks. And started walking away, but Zag had other problems. His presence had attracted the attention of the local Adeptus Arbites asterisk 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 that were surrounding the giant ogren, yelling long complicated orders at the giant with the intelligence of a child, and he was getting frustrated and scared. He didn't understand the situation and the usual response from a confused ogren was anger and copious amounts of violence. The commissar heard the commotion going on and turned around. Stand down, Arbites! He bellowed, his voice being amplified by vocal implants. 
The heavily armored Arbites turned their heads and saw the very angry Commissar moving toward them. Zag, the Ogren froze when the Commissar bellowed out and it was obvious he was fighting all of his instincts to stand still. Zag, let us say our prayer to the Emperor. Then, we can go to the barracks, yes? The Commissar said, his voice sounding strained with tested patience. Um? Huh? Yes. Zag said slowly, looking a little calmer at the thought of his prayers. The Commissar kneeled in the middle of the street, the Ogren following suit, and together they began praying. The Emperor is big and strong. He protects us humans all day long. He slays the Chaos and Xenos foe, so we may expand and always grow. He rules above with us beneath, so follow orders and brush your teeth. The Emperor wants what's best for you, so eat your rations and grow strong, it's true. One two, one two, a marching tune, we go and face the foe. We give them shells and lost gun rounds and send them running to and fro. The Emperor always guides us, he wants us to attack. For just as he protects us all we must protect him back. See post chapter notes. Completely flabbergasted, I watched the two of them rise again and walk away without saying another word. I was staring at their backs when I felt a tap on my shoulder and looked to Nela who had been keeping well away from the situation. Now, he was looking at me with a mixture of awe and worry. How did you do that? He asked me with a voice that betrayed his awe. Do what? I just talked to Zag. I said. You didn't run. You didn't cower. You didn't even flinch when that. Abhuman. Loomed over you. He spat the word abhuman and I could tell he was not a fan of Ogrins. I didn't want to anger my new friend, so I urged him that keep moving. What happens happens. It is in the hands of the Emperor whether I live or die. I said as we neared the Departmento Munitorum. All right, maybe I was laying it on a bit thick, but so far, everything in this universe had been exactly like the lore described, so why wouldn't the fanatical zealotry be a thing as well? You humble me, Nela said, I thought myself a pious man, willing to serve to Emperor with whatever he demanded. But now I see there is a deeper understanding to be gained to simply live in acceptance of the Emperor's divine will, no matter what happens. I will take this lesson to heart, Bjork. We reached the entrance to the Departmento Munitorum and Nela shook my hand vigorously. You are free to come stay with me until you can find your own place. It won't take long though. The orcs make sure of that. Nayla said as he left me behind to stare at the massive building in front of me, scores of people moving in and out of the doors every second. That's when I noticed the familiar flashing. Summoning the notification it read. Litany of prayer gained, Ogren's prayer. XP gained, 3. Yay XP! I thought sarcastically to myself. I walked inside and found a sign that said Recruiter. Chapter 3, Well Hello? As you can probably well imagine, the process of joining the PDF was anything but interesting. I was told at the end to report back the next day at the call to work for training and equipment delivery. As soon as I signed on with the PDF, the familiar blinking appeared in my vision and I became impatient to finish up. Well outside the Departmento Munitorum I found a quiet place to open the notification. Career Path Chosen Unlocking Relevant Skills Note, skills may be subject to change at a later point when slash if a new class or subclass is chosen, in which event, all skill points will be returned for the user to place as they see fit. Career Path Soldier Skill Set Unlocked, Martial Skill Set Skills Granted Last Weapon Proficiency Asterisk, Light, Tier 1, Level 1 Last Weapon Proficiency, Heavy, Tier 1, Level 1 Stubber Weapons Asterisk Asterisk Light Tier 1 Level 2 Stubber Weapons Heavy Tier 1 Level 2 Melee Weapons Chain Asterisk 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 Tier 1 Level 1 Melee Weapons Power Asterisk 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 Tier 1 Level 0 Melee Weapons Regular Tier 1 Level 2 Melee Weapons Shovel Tier 1 Level 0 Unarmed Combat Tier 1 Level 1 Armor Proficiency Regular Tier 1 Level 1 Armor Proficiency, Power, Tier 1, Level 0 Rare Abilities, due to your affiliation with the Ecclesiarchy and your alien nature to this plane of existence granting you prior and superior knowledge of the world around you, you have taken the first step on the journey to becoming a warrior priest. As such, you have been granted access to the Rare Ability, Prayer of Absolution. While chanting the Prayer of Absolution, allies in a 100-foot radius around you will be cleansed of fear and doubt, willing themselves to fight to the bitter end without hesitation in the name of the glorious Emperor. Feats Unlocked Feats 
Feats can never be lost. Endurance, Tier 1, Level 3, Note, Planetary Bonus Applied. Danger Instinct, Living on a world where danger is relative and death waits around the corner of every new day have granted you the ability to sense malicious intent towards you. Natural Bluffing, Since your arrival, you have spent a considerable amount of time during conversation lying and twisting the truth. You have been granted the Natural Bluffing feat. Tiers and levels to my skills? Just how high can I raise them? And Danger Instinct? How did that work? I wonder to myself as I read the message. A rare skill? Double neat. I started wondering what kind of equipment I would be given tomorrow and started walking down the street to return to Nela when it dawned on me that I didn't know the way and he never told me where he lives. Unless he lived at the cathedral, in which case, it should not be too difficult to find again. I think? Underscore 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 The sun was starting to set around seven hours later and I was no closer to finding that motherfucking cathedral. Fifteen temples, twenty-two churches, and a countless number of shrines I had been able to find, but not the bloody cathedral. I sat on the sidewalk, leaning against the building behind me when I saw someone I recognized. The commissar from earlier. Sure, all commissars wore the same hat and jacket, but I recognized his facial features. Young and very sharp. A jaw that looked like it was chiseled from granite, a masculine appeal to his face that was broken by what seemed to be a permanent scowl and icy blue eyes. His skin was also as pale as the locals, so perhaps he came from the same stock. Commissars are recruited from the Scola Progenium asterisk 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 asterisk, so there was a very good chance his parents had been high-ranking members of either the Navy or Asta Militarum before they got killed, leaving him an orphan to be raised by the Imperial Church. Commissar. I called out and he turned his head toward me. With strict movements, he made his way over to me as I waved him over, his hard sole boots clicking against the flagstones on the ground. The unusual one. He said, his voice sounding more than a little displeased at being interrupted at whatever it was he was doing. Ave Imperator. What is it, citizen? I am quite busy, he said in a sharp voice, his eyes staring into my soul. Ave Imperator. I? I wanted to ask for directions, but I would hate to take up your time. You are just the only person in this city I know besides Nela, and he is the one I am trying to find, or in lack thereof, the cathedral he works in. Shooting me an incredulous look the young commissar replied, Normally, I would not mind helping you, citizen. But I am in a great hurry. The cathedral is in that general direction, he waved a hand vaguely to my right. Now if you will excuse me, citizen. Ave Imperator. He started walking with a purpose and had soon rounded a corner leaving me alone once again. I sighed and started moving in the direction he had indicated. Underscore 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 underscore. Either I was the most unperceptive person in the entire Imperium or that cathedral sprang into existence while I was looking away. I mean, seriously, how in the everlasting fuck do you manage to hide a building nearing 600 feet in height and the size of 10 city blocks? A rather small cathedral in the 40k universe admitted, but damn it, I am not that blind that I lose a cathedral covering several square kilometers worth of ground. When I finally entered the cathedral, I realized I was not in the part where I was last time. Yay, more walking, I thought bitterly. I can already tell I am going to have to get used to that. After another hour of walking and I heard a familiar chanting and soon found myself in the large prayer room I had been in at the beginning of the day. As I wandered around the edge of the room I heard a familiar voice and felt relief wash through my body. Bjork! What took you so long? You are back just in time for prayer. Nayla sounded worried and enthusiastic. Oh joy. First an entire day of walking and now a few hours of prayer. Grimdark indeed. I thought to myself. Nayla, I am happy to have finally found you. I couldn't find the cathedral and I did not have a map. I said with exasperation heavy in my voice. Nayla's eyebrow flew up high on his head as it dawned on him and he hurriedly said, right, memory loss. That is going to take some getting used to I'm afraid. I promise you, Bjork, when you wake up tomorrow, I will have all the items you might need to function again, ready on the table next to the bed. Including some fresh clothes. I looked down and realized my clothes were still torn from whatever this body I now inhabited had been through before I took control. 
Is someone else trying to figure out how life works in my world? The thought ran through my head at random and decided to stick. All through the hours of prayer, through the evening meal, and to the time my eyes closed as I lay on my simple bed, in my room which had the furniture of a monastery cell. I only had a bed, a table and a chair. The next day, I woke up to see a fresh set of clothes, a small coin pouch, a neatly folded map, and a small pendant at the end of a leather string, in the shape of the symbol of the Adeptus Ministorum. I put on the clothes. Nondescript, tough clothing. Typical for a world that produces PDF forces for the Imperium. Efficiency over form. Looking over my old clothes, I realized they were a far cry from what I was currently wearing. Thinner, more delicate, finely woven cloth with intricate coloration patterns. Maybe that is why he saved me. He thinks I am someone of importance. I thought to myself. It would be like the Imperium I knew. Self-serving and corrupt. For all its splendor, for all its glory, for all its might. The empire was an apple rotted from the core and out. The only fresh thing left was the skin. A red light started blinking in the corner of my vision and I focused, my thoughts on it. Hello, week one. Hello, go away. It would seem I had to make a choice here. Do I respond or tell whoever to buzz off? Chapter 4 You Can't Hide Hello? Who dis? I thought, hoping that whatever voice I was hearing was also hearing my thoughts. Not quite as stupid as you are weak. Weakness is a matter of perspective. Who are you? I thought in reply, hoping this would be over soon. Answering might have been a bad idea. Who I am matters not. What matters is that you were cheated on your arrival. Cheated? What are you talking about? I asked mentally. When a strange soul appears in this universe, we are usually there to greet them. Offer them a place they can belong. A place they can grow strong. We did not know of your arrival and you were denied the chance for power. And now you're outside our reach. Corn asterisk? I asked. I can offer you the chance you were denied. Bjork? Are you alright? Nayla's voice cut through my message communication and I double blinked a few times to clear my vision. Nayla? Yes, yes, I am okay. I was merely lost in thought, trying to recall more memories. I wish to know who I am. I quickly lied. Hopefully, it was believable enough. Understandable, Nayla's voice was filled with sympathy. Quite a surprise, considering the universe I was in. What can I do for you, Nayla? I asked, impatient to get the day going. I was coming to see if the clothes were a good fit. We didn't have time to measure yesterday. Nayla smiled as he talked and I could see the logic in that. So I quickly got changed into my surprise, they would fairly well. It would seem I chose well. So, I shall not keep you any more. Breakfast will be ready after prayers. With that, he departed, leaving me alone once more. I quickly got the message from previously into my vision again. What chance was I denied? I tried communicating mentally and I didn't have to wait long for a response. The chance for ultimate power. Unequaled and unmatched strength. That is the offer you would have been given. That does sound intriguing. But. What is the catch? What price is there to be paid in for such an offer? I asked. One does not fanboy over 40k without learning that nothing, not even basic amenities, came free. Worry only about the power. Strength is all that matters. No price is too great for ultimate prowess. Yeah, that is going to be a resounding no. My soul is a little too precious to me to trade away for a vague offer of power and strength. For a moment, I felt the darkness encroach upon me and it felt like the very existence of the universe pressed down on me to cause me harm. It was gone as quickly as it came and I saw no more message screen and no more red blinking. Most definitely a chaos god. I said to myself, as tempted as I had been, I had this weird sensation along my spine every time I read one of the messages. It flared up doing the moment afterward and then died down. Maybe that was the danger instinct feed activating? I would have to pay close attention to that in the future. Deciding to keep up appearances, I joined in the morning prayer. Once more, the two grueling hours of kneeling and praying were torture on the mind, but I gained several new litanies and a few more XP, according to the notifications. I managed to sneak a peek at my character sheet as I walked to the dining hall. Human. Level 1. Stat points remaining 0. Alignment, pure in the eyes of the Emperor. Litanies 15. Augmentations, none. 
Level, 99 slash 600. Strength, 5. Agility, 5. Perception, 10. Will, 5. Luck, 16. Skills. Feats. Abilities. At least I was gaining litanies at a frightening rate. I wondered why they had their own category. After a short breakfast of more Soylens Viridians, how can something so bland become such a hated meal so quickly? I was ready to head out and, using my map, I set my sights on the training facilities located near the edge of the city. Underscore 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 I found the training quite ridiculous as we spent more time learning how to march in cadence rather than how to use and maintain the gear we had been given. Flak armor asterisk asterisk, bayonet, guard issue medical supplies asterisk asterisk asterisk, 9 to 70 entrenching tool asterisk 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 asterisk, gas mask with Mark 8 filter, and the Imperial Infantryman's uplifting primer asterisk 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 asterisk. It was during this tedious time that I decided to test the system in my spare time. I would find its limits and try to push beyond. If whatever entity contacted me before was right, I was not the first to be transported here. That made me wonder if some of the heroes in the 40k universe were filled out by people like me, moved from my world to this, having used the system to assume positions of power? In any case, I will work to become powerful. Not because the Imperium would benefit it and not because the powers of chaos would like another mindless slayer in their ranks. But because it is the only way to have any sort of chance at an independent life. From what I remember about the lore I studied back home, my best shot at this is becoming a rogue trader asterisk 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 asterisk. But gaining that right will not just be difficult, it will be borderline impossible. But I am confident I can find a way to make it happen. Anything would be better than wasting my life away, praying for endless hours when I'm not marching up and down the same airstrip. Underscore 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 The following week was spent doing the same things every day. Wake up, pray, eat, train, pray, eat, sleep. I could feel my soul withering with each passing day, and I saw no way out of the monotonous boredom. Then on the eighth day, things changed. I woke up earlier than usual to the klaxon of warning sirens and a general message being broadcasted all over the city. Orc attack. Imperial citizens are urged to continue their daily lives. PDF troopers report to the Eastern Wall section. This message repeats. An orc attack? I thought to myself as I tried getting my bleary eyes to focus on the PDF gear that I stored, packed, and ready, next to the bed. The Imperial Infantryman's primer lay on the table and I shoved it into the inner pocket of my new jacket. The pocket was designed specifically to hold the primer and was sealed when you closed the pocket to keep it safe. I grabbed my map and slung my small backpack over my shoulder before I grabbed my lost gun and charge pack and mumbled the prayer of loading, machine spirit, accept my gift, swallow the light and spit out death, before I slammed the charge pack into place and started walking fast out of the room. I saw Nayla on his way toward my room, but when he saw me with my backpack and rifle he simply nodded, turned around, and went back to his duties. I started running, checking the map to see where I needed to go. Chapter 5, Let's Do Some Fucking Grinding It took me close to 15 minutes to reach the eastern wall section and I arrived in time to see an imperial officer trying to assemble a group of guardsmen along the top of the wall. I was surprised at the ineptitude the PDF troopers displayed in following the orders, not understanding the need for equal spacing to maximize the effectiveness of their guns. They kept drifting towards each other, ending up in small clustered groups, barely able to aim properly the way they were pressing against each other. Huh. One would think they would be more experienced with this, considering they grew up on the planet, I thought to myself as I slammed against the parapet on top of the wall. Heavy gun emplacements were embedded along the bulwark that made up the city wall and experienced crews were busy hauling boxes of ammunition over in storage next to the gun while tech priests were chanting their rights over the gun barrels and loading mechanisms. The officer cast a glance in my direction, but as I was pressed against the wall, lost gun pointed towards the east, he was satisfied and turned his attention to the more hopeless cases. A few more experienced soldiers made themselves comfortable against the wall while they waited. I scanned the horizon and I noticed a small black blob on the horizon. 
To my horror, I saw it grow at a frightening rate, the horde of screaming and roaring greenskins surging towards the city like a green wave of violence and death. I watched the horde grow in size the closer it got to the walls, but I also noticed the lack of ranged weapons. Feral ORKS incoming an officer shouted and a visible shudder of relief passed through the ranks. Racking my brain for information on the orcs, I remembered that they live in a society built squarely on the principle of might makes right and are always led by the biggest and most violent specimen the group has to offer. Being a symbiotic life form between the orc part and a symbiotic form of fungi, orcs never stop growing. How much and how fast was determined by how much and how big enemies they were fighting. In theory, an orc would simply keep growing throughout the centuries. Feral orc were orcs without a dedicated leader or warboss as they called them. Limited to advanced Stone Age technology tools and weapons, they were still an exceptionally dangerous enemy in melee combat on account of their enormous strengths and size and the fact that an orc is only truly happy when they are fighting. What and how they are fighting matters less than the act of fighting itself. Facing feral orcs put us in relative safety as the chance of them shooting back was non-existent until they were right on top of the wall and could fire bows and arrows at the PDF troopers. Our lost guns, on the other hand, had an effective firing range of 2 to 300 meters. Even with every orc taking multiple shots to take down, the distance they had to cross and the mounted heavy weapon emplacements consisting of heavy bolters asterisk, missile systems, and artillery cannons, this was more a shooting lesson and less an active defense. Even so, I saw several commissars being approached by PDF officers who hurried away after a short while. As more and more officers arrived, they had an easier time keeping the troopers spread out along the wall. Personally, I was eager to see what kind of XP I could gain. As I watched the horde grow, I felt my unease grow again, as there seemed to be no end to the constant stream of screaming Xenos rolling over the horizon. Despite only having crude melee weapons and bows. That many orcs would quite literally be able to use their dead to create a ramp to the top. The horde kept growing in size as they approached the city walls, far faster than I thought creatures of that size could move by their own speed and I felt sweat forming in heavy beads on my forehead. Being behind large walls, holding a gun, and knowing there are hundreds of your brothers in arms nearby, manning large static defenses, with just as much incentive to live, is all well and good. But no matter how ready you think you are, once the wall of sound from the orcs hits you, you will know fear. True, ice finger gripping, spine shivering, shit in your pants and pray to the higher powers, fear. The wall defenses opened up moments later, and all along the wall, gun emplacements began spitting rapid death across the battlefield in the form of Bolt Star. A creeping artillery barrage from the wall cannon started in front of the orc wave and started moving through their lines, blowing arms, legs, heads, and torsos in all directions. Somehow, it only encouraged the orcs, their roaring taking on an excited note. I started mumbling the litany of accuracy as I took aim. Grant me the sight of the eagle, the calm of the breeze, the patience of a saint, and the skill to smite the foe from afar. And I heard the mumbling of the other PDF troopers around me. Risking a glance, I noticed the satisfied look on the nearby commissar's face and breathed out a sigh of relief. Nobody wanted to be on the receiving end of the wrath of a commissar asterisk asterisk. The orcs kept coming. Through hellfire and death, they kept coming. One of the troopers along the wall threw his rifle away and started running, but he barely made it three steps before a large boom was heard and his chest exploded in a shower of blood and mushed organs. There will be no cowards today. I will tolerate no retreat. The amplified voice of an older-looking commissar rang out across the entire wall. He must have a respirator vox grill asterisk 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 in his helmet. Moments later, he gave the order. Fire! Glory to the first man to die! I lined up my lost gun and started shooting into the bum-rushing pile of orcs. Despite knowing it was a laser weapon, I was surprised at the lack of kickback. The novelty wore off quickly though, as I was busy trying to just get a kill. Again, it seemed the lure from my world was spot on. I could see my weapon hitting, but I could not see it have any effect. I started blasting as fast as I could and suddenly, I saw the familiar blinking at the edge of my vision. Not hesitating, I opened the notification just to get an idea of what I was gaining from this. Orc chop a boy asterisk 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 killed. XP received 32. I quickly dismissed the message with a thought and started blasting to my heart's content. At 32 XP per kill, I might see a level up today if I am lucky. Another nine times I saw the small flash of a notification in the corner of my vision before I heard a sharp whistle followed by the dreaded words. Throw pesh, fix bayonets. Equip bayonets and get ready for blood. 
I heard the older commissar order. Without much of a choice, I unsheathed my bayonet and slid it into place over my lost gun. Weird. Why are they using ring bayonets instead of socket bayonets? A socket bayonet allows you to keep it mounted on the rifle without obstructing your barrel or aim. The ring bayonet has both these drawbacks and it can potentially pop off due to the design. I thought to myself as I ran down to assemble in front of the gate. I guess my only choice now is the front or the back of the charge? Chapter 6, Deep in It There was a lot of shoving and pushing as we gathered in front of the gate and I ended up being squished into the middle of the group. I could not leave if I wanted to, the bodies of the other PDF troopers pressing against me as we all presented our bayonets and made ready for the gates to swing open. As the PDF officers got into position, the sound of heavy feet attempting and failing miserably to run in unison could be heard approaching fast. Unable to turn around and look at what was happening, my curiosity was soon satiated as I heard a slightly familiar voice call out moments later. O Grinch, halt! I heard the commissar from earlier in the week yell out. Immediately, the PDF officers were over us, ordering that we split into two groups, making a corridor for the Ogrins to pass through when the gate opened. Listen up troopers! The commissar's voice could be heard all over the wall. When the gate opens, the Ogrins will lead the charge. Once they have fired off their ripper guns asterisk the charge will commence. Remember, pain is temporary, honor is forever. And when you decide to die for our glorious emperor, remember to grant the enemy the same honor. The gates began opening and one of the ogrins attempted to run forward, only to be elbowed in the chest with enough force to misshape the discarded tank tracks that were used to make the armor usually reserved for bulgrins asterisk asterisk. Not yet. Commissar ain't given the order yet. The ogrin that had thrown the elbow said. He was even bigger than the rest and had obvious signs of cerebral implants. A bone ead asterisk asterisk asterisk. I could see the orcs approaching the walls fast. Their war cries had united into a rolling, never-ending whack asterisk 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 asterisk. That went on forever as they charged us. I noticed small flags planted in the ground, extending outwards from the city walls, and for a moment, I wondered about the purpose until I saw that the artillery stopped just short of where the flags changed color from gold to green. The weapon emplacements on top of the walls had not stopped firing during all of this and yet, the orcs kept coming. The gates opened the last bit of way and the commissar blew a small whistle just before my world became a confusing mess of running, pushing, and screaming mixed with the dread of running towards danger and the smell of gunpowder, blood, and ozone. As we closed on the orcs we did not slow down. Instead, the bone EAD, on an order from the commissar, bellowed shoot DA green ones, and the ogrins all opened fire. The cacophony of noise was disorienting and deafening but I kept running. As the ogrins ran out of ammo and were directed to change the magazines, light ones empty, heavy ones full, some of them got confused and, in their childlike tantrums, opted to switch grips on the guns to use them as clubs. Our line clashed with the orcs a second later and everything became chaos. The man in front of me fell over with an oversized blade sticking half an arm's length out of his back and I thrust my bayonet over his falling body, impaling a Gretchen asterisk 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 asterisk. It still screeched at me and tried to claw at me, but I started pulling the trigger on my lost gun, making the little body jerk every time I pulled the trigger. I put a foot on the corpse, intending to kick it off, but halfway through the movie, I got pushed aside by an ogrin who was busy smashing in the head of an orc with the blunt end of his ripper gun. I managed to untangle my lost gun from the Gretchen corpse and brought it to bear despite the awkward angle and started shooting blindly. To this day, I have no clue how I managed to make the shots connect, but the distraction was enough for the ogrin to bash the orc aside. As I scrambled to my feet, I heard the commissar bellowing across the battlefield, target and deny. By our death shall they know us. I managed to spot him further ahead, swinging a power sword with reckless abandon while doling out death with his bolt pistol. Fear not, the emperor protects. He continued shouting as his bolt pistol was knocked aside by a grinning orc that immediately fell to the power sword, almost cleaved in two. Sir, they are killing us. I could hear what I assumed was a PDF officer cry out over the fight. So kill them back. The commissar bellowed back as he pressed forward to engage the orcs again. I decided I would be less than useless if I entered melee at the current time, so I tagged myself onto the nearest ogren and began working as an infantryman would have done in my world. Providing cover fire, watching for enemies closing from the flanks, and suppressing the advancing orcs, as much as you can suppress an enemy that only feels happiness in the thick of the fighting. The heavier the fighting the happier the orc. 
More PDF troopers saw what I was doing and decided to follow suit, making our small group grow rapidly in number. More Ogrins saw the attention we attracted from the orcs and, in their blessed simple minds, they somehow figured out they would do better by joining our group than they would by rampaging on their own. Slowly but surely, we became a bulwark of Ripper and Lost Gun Fire, our killing potential heavily augmented by the massive Ogrins dealing with everything that came remotely close to us. But we still suffered losses. Men were dying by the handful every minute and there seemed to be no end to the orcs. The press of green bodies weighing down on us kept growing and the space we had around kept shrinking, the troopers becoming panicked and uncoordinated, resulting in even more death. Somewhere deep within me, I felt desperation grow, but next to that desperation a small flower of something started growing and suddenly I found myself shouting far louder than I ever thought humanly possible. Protect us, O Emperor, from the snares of the heretic, the mutant, the xeno, and the warp spawn. In you we place all our faith. In you we find refuge. In you we find our avenger. Lead us forth into the legions of humanity's foes with thy spirit and give us the courage and capability to slay the foes in every battle we are compelled to fight, though they last until the end of time. I could feel the effects of the prayer of absolution in the men around me as I spoke the words. Their aim became steady again, their cries of fear gave way to screams of anger and hatred, and even the Ogren seemed to be fighting more ferociously if that was even possible. I have no idea for how long we fought, but suddenly the flow of orcs seemed to lessen and we got enough breathing room for the PDF troopers to deploy grenades, giving us some proper space to move in. The commissar materialized out of thin air as soon as the explosions went off and helped drive off the last orcs by taking direct charge of the remaining Ogrens. Under his supervision and the supporting fire of the surviving PDF troopers, we finally managed to kill off the last orcs. Underscore 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 underscore. After the battle had ended and the survivors were milling about, gathering charge packs and other equipment from the dead troopers, I found myself in front of a young man, barely more than a boy. He was laying on his back, cut open from chest to groin so far and you could see his spinal cord. But the only thing I could see was his smile. It was a smile of bliss. Fulfillment. Knowing that you do exactly what you were meant to do in this life and it disturbed me far more than I will ever admit. After mumbling a prayer over the dead I emptied his pockets for useful equipment. A dead man would not need it anyway. I felt a strange shape in one of his pockets and pulled it out. A harmonica. I don't know why, but the little instrument reminded me of home and, after wiping it off, I gave it a hesitant try. The tones were crisp and clean, meaning he had taken good care of it. Without thinking about it, I sat down next to the corpse of the young man whose name I didn't even know, and I started playing a little tune I remembered from back home. See post chapter notes. At some point, while I played, one of the surviving ogrins had come over and sat down on the ground behind me. I didn't notice, to begin with, my mind occupied with playing the tune and trying to, I don't know, send this young boy on his way with even the slightest bit of care. I didn't even care about the blinking in the corner of my vision. I just wanted to play this song and remember, if only for a little while. I miss my dull life back home. Like all things, the moment came to an end all too soon and I had to get up. That's when I noticed the ogrin, covered in small wounds, with the star-filled eyes of an awestruck child locked on me. Something about the giant human seemed familiar and I took a guess. Jacques? I asked hesitantly. Yes. Can you play again? I like the sounds you make. He asked, oblivious to everything else around us. Jacques. Came the sharp commanding voice of the young commissar. Stop bothering the PDF trooper and get back to your unit. I jumped to my feet and saluted the commissar with the Imperial Aquila. Ave Imperator, Commissar, I said dutifully. Forgive me, but I am afraid I am the reason your ogren left his unit. I was playing a little tune on this harmonica, you see, I lifted the harmonica for him to see, and Zag seems to be enjoying it more than the other ogrens. I'm afraid the fault, even unknowingly, is mine. The Commissar gave me a critical look before he spoke, I remember you. The strange one. You started praying during the battle and rallied the troops. He gave me a nod before continuing. Thank the Emperor for your duty this day, for had I not seen that during the battle, you would be dead for this. With that, he turned on his heel and walked away. Zetaji, come. He bellowed as he walked away and the giant ogren got up and trudged after him, looking over his shoulder the entire way. 
I could finally take a look at the blinking notification. Level up. Congratulations on reaching level 2.5 skill points awarded. Achievement unlocked to me brothers for rallying troops around you with the prayer of absolution during a hopeless battle. Two skill points awarded. Prayer of absolution upgrade progress 1 15th. Skills leveled up last weapons light. Melee weapons regular. Not bad. Not bad at all. Looking over my character sheet, I liked what I saw. Human. Level 2. Stat points remaining 7. Alignment, pure in the eyes of the emperor. Litanies 17. Augmentations, none. Level, 121 slash 1200. Strength, 5. Agility, 5. Perception, 10. Will, 5. Luck, 16. Skills. Feats. Abilities. Now, where to put all my points? Perception had served me well so far, but so had luck. The falling over in the battle told me I needed more agility, but I just wasn't sure. What to choose? Chapter 7, Is This My Life Now? I was too conflicted to make a single choice regarding my new stat points. As much as I wanted to throw everything into agility to compensate for my clumsiness during the battle, the close look I got at the orcs and ogrins had made it painfully clear that I was so far outclassed in terms of strength that it was laughable. I settled on putting three points into strength, three points into agility, and the last remaining point into will. I had no idea what the will stat was used for, but it could not hurt to boost it, even if it was just a little. When I was finished I looked over my character sheet. Human. Level 2. Stat points remaining, 0. Alignment, pure in the eyes of the emperor. Litanies, 17. Augmentations, none. Level, 121 slash 1200. Strength, 8. Agility, 8. Perception, 10. Will, 6. Luck, 16. Skills. Feats. Abilities. Not bad if I say so myself. And I do I thought to myself. I remembered something about my skills leveling up as well and I opened the screen to take a look. Last weapon proficiency, light, tier 1, level 4. Last weapon proficiency, heavy, tier 1, level 1. Stubber Weapons Light, Tier 1, Level 2. Stubber Weapons Heavy, Tier 1, Level 2. Melee Weapons Chain, Tier 1, Level 1. Melee Weapons Power, Tier 1, Level 0. Melee Weapons Regular, Tier 1, Level 3. Melee Weapons Shovel, Tier 1, Level 0. Unarmed Combat, Tier 1, Level 1. Armor Proficiency Regular, Tier 1, Level 1. Armor Proficiency Power, Tier 1, Level 0. Apparently, I had gained three levels in lost gun proficiency and a single level in regular melee weapons. Must have been from that Gretchen that charged at me I thought, remembering impaling the small creature and blasting its gut full of laser fire. Suddenly, a wave of nausea hit me and I emptied the contents of my stomach onto the ground in front of me. How can it look just as appetizing coming up as it did going down? I thought to myself as I laid eyes on the Soylent's viridians I just puked up. Then my thoughts turned to the horror show I had just endured. I looked over the battlefield again and the nausea hit me in full force. The dismembered, disemboweled, and decapitated corpses of the PDF troopers that didn't make it, the dying orcs that had not been killed entirely off during the attack, and the ever-present smell of death. It was a horrible mix of smells, shit and piss from the dying soldiers that soiled themselves, noxious fumes from the exposed innards of the corpses, gunpowder from the kinetic weapons, and a heavy smell of ozone from the lost guns. There were still troopers dying on the field, their injuries deemed too severe to spend the resources needed to save them. I watched the several commissars walk from wounded soldier to wounded soldier, saying a prayer for them before putting a bolt in their heads. Well, putting a bolt in it was an understatement, as the massive bolts turned the heads into mush in a fountain of blood. At least it was a quick death. I felt my stomach turning again and I had to turn away to not vomit again. Despite the disgust I had started feeling at my actions, I began my looting again. As horrible as it was, my earlier thoughts were true. A dead man did not need his equipment. At the end of my grisly work, I ended up with eight more power packs and even a lost pistol that had been overlooked when the other troopers had looted the body. I tucked it inside my jacket along with a power pack for my rifle, as the pistol accepted the same power pack. This meant I had gotten my hands on an Akatran pattern Mark II lost pistol, a standard issue for all Astra Militarum officers. 
While it ate up the charge of the power packs quite a lot faster than a regular loss pistol, it also packed a bigger punch. And with the power packs being recharged either by sunlight or by thrusting them into a fire for a few minutes, I would never be out of ammunition for long. Especially not with a total of 9 power packs. I also found a few personal items, some cheap jewelry I had no use for but figured I could sell to someone, for a few thrones asterisk along with several packs of low sticks, asterisk asterisk that I stuffed into my backpack. My looting done, I turned to head back to the city and realized how late in the day it had become. It had been very early morning when the attack came and now I was staring at the midday sun. I felt drained and tired. I needed something to eat and a good nap if I had a choice. But I knew I was expected to report back to the PDF training area and so I started trudging back and spent the rest of the day continuing marching in cadence and looking good while marching. Utterly useless and a waste of my time. A few weeks passed like this. Show up, march in cadence for countless hours, go back and sleep, repeat. Every so often there would be another orc raid but nothing like the first one we were attacked by. My level progress was slow but I slowly increased my skills by practicing on my own and I steadily approached level 3. One day, all the PDF troopers I had trained with were gathered up on the parade grounds and a PDF officer stepped forward and started a speech. Troopers! Today is a glorious day for you. Today is the day your training ends and you will be assigned a station of deployment. You will be sent to safeguard Imperial worlds from the foul Xeno scum. Take heart, troopers. For your sacrifices shall guard the lives of countless Imperial citizens. Your deaths will serve as an example to the Imperium. Rejoice in this opportunity, troopers. For in our pain we find glory. Remember well, troopers, victory is achieved through metal. Glory is achieved through metal. With that, he stepped back down and a small swarm of servoskulls asterisk 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 flew over the parade grounds, handing out small cards to each trooper. When I got mine, I saw it contained the information about my deployment. Segmentum, Obscurus. Sector, Calixis. Subsector, Drusus Marches. Planet, Purgatory. The information on the card was lacking at best. But it was more than nothing. Over the next few days, we prepared ourselves to be shipped out, I said my goodbyes to Nayla and he told me I would always be welcome to visit if I came back. It took several weeks to arrive on planet Purgatory. The time spent in the warp asterisk 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 was time spent drilling and training. My skills increased even more and when the message finally came that we would leave the warp, I opened up my skills screen for the first time since that first attack by the orcs. Last Weapon Proficiency, Light, Tier 1, Level 8. Last Weapon Proficiency, Heavy, Tier 1, Level 2. Stubber Weapons, Light, Tier 1, Level 2. Stubber Weapons, Heavy, Tier 1, Level 2. Melee Weapons, Chain, Tier 1, Level 1. Melee Weapons, Power, Tier 1, Level 0. Melee Weapons, Regular, Tier 1, Level 5. Melee Weapons, Shovel, Tier 1, Level 0. Unarmed Combat, Tier 1, Level 2. Armor Proficiency, Regular, Tier 1, Level 3. Armor Proficiency, Power, Tier 1, Level 0. I had received some symbolic training in unarmed combat and armor use, but the real training had consisted of bayonet and lost gun use. My increase in agility and strength also made it a lot easier to handle the weapon efficiently. I also took a look at my regular character screen to see how much XP I had accumulated before we shipped out. Human. Level 2. Stat points remaining, 0. Alignment, pure in the eyes of the Emperor. Litanies, 19. Augmentations, none. Level, 831-1200. Strength, 8. Agility, 8. Perception, 10. Will, 6. Luck, 16. Skills. Feats. Abilities. I was pretty happy with my progress, the XP growing steadily. From what I had heard of Purgatory, I would need all the advantages I could get before we landed. We had only been told that there was a heretic presence on the planet, but I knew from my previous life that where there were heretics, there were chaos space marines. As if I was not weak enough already. Now I was going to a planet under siege from literal superhumans. I hope I am going to make it through, though, knowing the Imperium, I could very well spend the rest of my life fighting for control over a planet that is more or less insignificant in the grand scheme of things. If I do not get killed first, that is. We disembarked and filed into marching position and walked towards the officers that would determine where we would be deployed on the planet. I noticed a trend as we were marching toward them. 
Every third group of soldiers that came up to them was sent to a different section of the planet to assist the combat engineer squads. I couldn't decide where I wanted to go. The CES or the regular trenches? Chapter 8, un plaisant surprise. I shuffled and pushed the best I had learned and the extra strength points served me well, but no matter what I did I was pushed towards the officers with a group that seemed destined for the front lines. As we were getting close, I noticed one of the numerous vehicles driving the corpses away from the front line and my heart skipped a beat. Those were not regular human corpses of heretics. Those were mutated, grotesque. Freaks, for lack of a better word. Oh. No. Mutants. This is not purgatory. This is tranche. This is the tranche war. I thought to myself. This was not good. While we were still in the same system and even the same sector, the change in planet meant quite a lot. First off, Tranche was a hive world asterisk, so there would be a constant struggle against ambitious underhive gangs during any form of war. And the Tranche war was a great one. Beginning with a mutant uprising and eventually ending with Pyrrhic to the Imperium and mutant warlords becoming roaming bands of marauders. I could not remember the details, but that did not bother me. I had an idea of what I was going up against. At least killing those grotesque freaks would not be as bad as regular humans. On the other hand, these mutants would have ways of moving and attacking that regular humans did not have. At least I would only be facing stubbers, autocannons, asterisk, asterisk, and blades. Not bolters, chain axes, and worse. It was not that I did not understand why the mutants revolted. Tranche, unlike most imperial worlds, did not kill off their mutant population, instead, making them working slaves, from the moment they could walk until the day they collapsed, they would work in the factories of the hive cities. Churning out untold amounts of war gear and supplies for the never-ending wars of the Imperium. I did indeed get sent to the front lines, but I suppose it could be worse. Several penal legions asterisk 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 were being led past us, their faces a mix of hopeless despair and excited bloodlust. I watched them for a moment before I returned my thoughts to the task at hand. Ten minutes later, the group I was with had been sent to the front lines and we were marching towards the trenches that encircled the hive looming in the distance. While we marched, I had time for my own thoughts. I knew I was on a war world, even a blind man would have known from the continuous sound of artillery being fired all around the hive city. I guess I would have to get used to that. The Imperial Guard only stopped firing their artillery when it came time to charge the enemy, and sometimes, not even then. Underscore 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 underscore. I spent most of the day getting situated in my barracks, finding my way around the trenches, and figuring out where on the line I was supposed to be. I lost two charge packs for my loss gun as a result of not thinking. I should have remembered that all guardsmen are notorious looters and leaving something as valuable as a charge pack unattended for even a minute is all that is needed. I also caught a glimpse of troopers I had hoped to never see. The death corpse of Krieg asterisk 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 was here. That was unwelcome news to say the least. They only showed up on planets where the fighting was extreme even by 40k standards. Unlike most other Imperial Guard regiments, Krieg Commissars were not there to keep morale up and to urge the soldiers to charge the enemy. Krieg Commissars were there to hold back the Krieg soldiers. Prevent them from suicidal charges until the time is deemed right. This, of course, meant that Krieg regiments almost always had new Commissars in their ranks. Somehow, those pesky, nosy, glorious death in the Emperor's name preventing commissars just seemed to suffer a ridiculous amount of fatal accidents or they were the unlucky target of a misfire when attached to Krieg regiments. For me, it meant that I was about to enter into some of the most dangerous and gruesome fighting the Imperium of Man could offer a regular mortal human like me. The next day was spent in the trenches, watching the Hive City suffer under the relentless artillery fire. As the hours dragged on I found my mind going numb with boredom. With nothing to do other than stay in my trench, nothing to look at except for a city being bombed, and no one to talk to on account of the regular guardsmen being about as interesting a conversation partner as wet cardboard, I worried how I would get through the days to come. The next week was much the same. Man the trench, watch the horizon, and be ready to repel the odd attack on the lines that never arrived. I did find a conversation partner though. A cute little redhead that seemed to latch onto me for whatever reason. We only exchanged a few words in passing on the second day, but from that moment, I could almost always see her, if I looked around. She was good-looking and seemed sweet, but this was not the universe I came from. Here, people died as easily as they breathed. 
getting close to people was only going to open me up to being hurt later. And yet, I hoped to see her. So far, she seemed to be the only positive thing I had found about this universe. And with my future looking as bleak as it did, it wasn't the worst thing to get involved with. My thought was disturbed by the sound of a commissar's whistle. Troopers, get ready for blood, the enemy attacks. He bellowed across the trenches, his order being repeated down the line and I pressed against the top of the trench, aligned my loss gun, and waited. I could see the movement outside the hive, but it was still just a blurry blob on the horizon. Almost immediately after the whistle sounded, the artillery fire ramped up, becoming a constant rumble surrounding us on all sides and the explosions moved from the hive and unto the wasteland of mud and bodies between our trench lines and the coming horde of mutants. I wondered how anything could survive the hell that was being unleashed upon the mutants, but deep down I knew that while the artillery did good damage, it was a hindrance more than a danger to the attackers. As I watched the slaughter take place, I noticed the explosions starting to move closer at a rapid pace. But that couldn't be. How could they move so fast while under artillery fire? In any case, I was watching as the increased speed kept up. Looking around, I saw that the officers and commissars had noticed it as well and were scrambling to prepare the second trench line, in case we were overrun and had to retreat to a backup position that was already manned by the reserve troops. The wonders of imperial high strategy. Hold the line until you fail and the next idiot can hold the line. I thought to myself as I started seeing glimpses of bodies among the explosions, smoke, and dirt that were kicked into the air by the artillery. I could only wait and brace myself. How I hated the waiting. Chapter 9, Welcome to Hell The waiting dragged on for longer than I would have thought. The attacking mutant horde had moved with speed and purpose, but it seemed as if the artillery had finally managed to suppress them, at least to a small degree. But as all things must do, the waiting came to an end when the moving cloud of explosions and blood passed a pre-marked line, the trenches lit up with the collective firepower that was mustered against the tide of mutated flesh running towards them. The charging mutants died by the hundreds each second but for every fallen mutant, another three appeared in its place. I fired my loss gun in short, controlled bursts of laser fire, seeing notification after notification popping into the corner of my view. I was gaining good XP from this. Several small caliber rounds made contact with my armor, but thankfully I got nothing more to show for it than some bruising. I tried turning slightly sideways to make myself a smaller target, without sacrificing my accuracy and hoped it would work. My charge pack ran dry and I started mumbling the praying of unloading as I fumbled to get the charge pack out of the lost gun, machine spirit, forgive my actions, soon you will be whole again. As soon as I finished the prayer, it was as if the charge pack just popped out into my hand. I jammed the empty charge pack into an empty pocket and grabbed a new one as I mumbled the prayer of loading, machine spirit, accept my gift, swallow the light and spit out death, slamming it home. I resumed firing, only to realize the mutants were almost on top of the trench in the short few seconds it took me to reload the loss gun. I scrambled for my bayonet and barely had time to slot it into place before a flesh horror came over the trench top. Its multiple extra limbs were flailing while holding improvised melee weapons, its unervingly dead eyes fixated on me and the noise, oh the noise. Horrible screeching mixed with what sounded like nails on a board and tearing metal. The sound hit me and almost made me stagger, the effects feeling a physical assault on my mind, but I stood my ground and thrust the rifle upwards in a desperate attempt to impale the mutant and fling it over the trench so its corpse did not stink up my designated area. It was a good thrust aimed at the stomach. An ordinary man would have been busy screaming for his life after getting gutted like that. The mutant, however, seemed less than unaffected. He or she? It? Swung the trench club asterisk towards my head and I had to bash it aside with my loss gun. I tried stabbing the thing again, but it dodged and swung the club again, this time swinging a bayonet from the other side. I jumped backward, bringing my weapon to bear, and started unloading loss gun shots as fast as I could. At such a short range, it was impossible to miss and the mutant tumbled over and stopped moving. I didn't have time to celebrate though. As soon as my opponent fell over, I looked down the line and saw the same situation unfolding in front of me. Making a quick choice, I opened fire. The back of the closest mutant was punched open by the force of the repeated hits, covering me in a spray of blood and guts. The guardsman that was no longer under immediate threat from getting stabbed turned around and did the same as me, shooting at every mutant in the trench we could get a clear line of sight on. Meanwhile, the heavy weapons emplacements were thundering loud as ever, spitting payload after payload of explosive death at the enemy. 
The more troopers we freed from the melee, the more Lascans joined our ranks and started clearing the trench quickly and effectively. The artillery was landing within 10 meters of the trench, giving a whole new definition to the phrase danger close bombardment asterisk asterisk. Mutants still made it through the hellfire of artillery, but the rate with which they made it through had declined somewhat, enough for the trench to keep the mutants at bay. We were still under massive pressure. Being from the Hive City, they had untold amounts of war gear and supplies at their disposal, along with the capability to manufacture more. And they were well aware of this, judging from the hail of grenades that were constantly tossed at the trench as the enemy got close enough. Most of them fell short or sailed over the trench, but every once in a while a lucky throw would see the death of another handful of troopers. Blood was running deep in the trench already and the situation looked hopeless. Every second the mutant kept trickling into the trench and with them came chaos and death. In all of the chaos, amongst the screams of the dying and wounded, the horrible screeches of the mutants, the rolling explosions, and the rampaging gunfire, I heard the clear tone of a new whistle. But I heard nothing after the whistle and moments later I was engaged in more fighting with my fellow troopers. The mutants kept pushing and we kept giving ground. No matter how many died, more kept coming. Then it came. The sound of running boots and labored breath being filtered through a gas mask. All of a sudden, made all the eerier by their silence, the Krieg soldiers jumped into our trench and started killing mutants with a reckless abandon that bordered on suicidal. I saw Krieg soldiers jump into clusters of enemies, a grenade in each hand while hollering a muffled prayer to the emperor in the moments before they turned into a raging inferno of fire and shrapnel. We rallied behind the fanatical Krieg troopers and began the difficult and nasty task of clearing out the trenches. I might have committed what back in my world would be considered a horrible crime against gamers and gone to great lengths to ensure I got the kill. Might as well exploit the situation to my own advantage. Beyond a few offhand comments about my zealous nature and making sure the mutants were dead, nothing came of it. I joined in the looting of the corpses with more enthusiasm than I did when I looted my fellow dead troopers back on Carrick and I quickly gathered a small heap of low sticks and charge packs that I squirreled away. While I was not a smoker, yet who knew? And in any case, they made good items for trade. Thinking back to the charge on our trench and the following mop-up, I had killed more than 30 mutants, if my math was right. I pulled up my character sheet to see the results of this battle. Human. Level 3. Stat points remaining, 5. Alignment, Faithful Imperial. Litanies, 19. Augmentations, none. Level, 293-2400. Strength, 8. Agility, 8. Perception, 10. Will, 6. Luck, 16. Skills. Feats. Abilities. What was up with my alignment? Why did it change? I had done nothing that could be considered as directly against the Imperium or the Imperial Doctrine. I would have to think about his. I was certain the answer lay somewhere in my memory of the world I came from. But for now, the answer eluded me. Now, what to spend my points on? Maybe will, considering the effect the screeching of the mutants had on me. Or more agility, in the hopes it would reduce reload times and make melee combat easier. I could go for more strength, making sure that whenever I landed a hit, it could be felt. Maybe some more luck, to keep the things going my way, like the Krieg charge that, quite literally, saved our asses. Or perception, making sure I get more deadly hits on the enemy, instead of stabbing them in places that still let them fight back. I would have to consider this carefully. In the meantime, I open up my skills to see what I had gained in that department. Last Weapon Proficiency, Light, Tier 2, Level 3. Last Weapon Proficiency, Heavy, Tier 1, Level 2. Stubber Weapons, Light, Tier 1, Level 2. Stubber Weapons, Heavy, Tier 1, Level 2. Melee Weapons, Chain, Tier 1, Level 1. Melee Weapons, Power, Tier 1, Level 0. Melee Weapons, Regular, Tier 1, Level 6. Melee Weapons, Shovel, Tier 1, Level 0. Unarmed Combat, Tier 1, Level 2. Armor Proficiency, Regular, Tier 1, Level 5. Armor Proficiency, Power, Tier 1, Level 0. I had tiered up in Light Loss Weapons. I wondered what that did for me. I had to try and figure this out. Information, Loss Weapons Light, I thought to myself. Nothing happened. Expand, Skill, Loss Weapons Light, that got me some results. Last Weapons, Light, Tier 2, Level 3. Tier 1, Knowledge of How to Use and Maintain Last Weapons. Tier 2, Knowledge of Manipulation of Power Pack Output and Last Gun Power Settings. Tier, 
continue to level up to unlock next tier. Well, that was not the worst thing that could happen. I now had the ability to turn my power packs into hotshot power packs. Effectively lowering my amount of shots per pack by half, but making them much more powerful. Of course, there was always the chance of the hotshot power pack would overload my weapon and burn it out, but that was a risk I was willing to take to add more stopping power to my shots. The looting done and the last enemies killed, there was not much to do other than return to my barrack for a well-deserved rest. Chapter 10 Emperor Damn It All My cot felt like it was covered in silken sheets and fluffy pillows when I laid down. I was exhausted beyond reason. Those mutant screams really did a number on my head. But before I could go to sleep, I wanted to allocate my stat points. But where to put them? My will stat was woefully underpowered already and I had a feeling that it was one of the main reasons that the mutant screeching affected me so badly. More agility had worked well for my ability to handle my loss gun more efficiently. Strength would only serve me well in melee and there were other, more specialized units that could handle that. Luck was still my highest stat and I saw no reason to fiddle with that just yet. I also wondered just how that stat worked, if it directly influenced the world or if it was more subtle than that. Perception was fairly high, all things considered. I opened the stat screen and began spending my stat points. Human. Level 3. Stat points remaining, 0. Alignment, Faithful Imperial. Litanies, 19. Augmentations, none. Level, 293-2400. Strength, 9. Agility, 9. Perception, 10. Will, 9. Luck, 16. Skills. Feats. Abilities. All finished, I laid back down and reflected on my alignment. It had changed the wording presumably to a lower rank. But why? I turned over on the cot when I realized what must be the reason. I had not prayed to the emperor since saying goodbye to Nela. Well, it can't hurt to try, I thought to myself as I rose from the cot and kneeled in front of it as I began praying. Adore the immortal emperor, praise the immortal emperor. For he is our protector. For his undying rule. Admire the immortal emperor, hail the immortal emperor. For his sacrifice to mankind. For he is the lord and master. Exalt the immortal emperor, worship the immortal emperor. For his strict guidance. For without him we are nothing. Revere the Immortal Emperor. For his undying guard. Venerate the Immortal Emperor. For his holy wisdom. Honor the Immortal Emperor. For his eternal strength. Glorify the Immortal Emperor. For his all-seeing vision. When I was finished I felt better. I could not describe it, even if I wanted to, but I simply felt better. The headache from the mutant screeching had also receded a bit during my prayer. Satisfied, I laid down on the cot again and drifted off. Blissful sleep. Underscore 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 underscore. I was woken up all too soon by a sharp whistle and I rolled off the cot with all the grace and finesse of a drunken rhino rampaging through a porcelain store. Picking myself up from the floor and grabbing the lost pistol I kept under my cot, I looked around in confusion. Clumsy. But good instincts. Came a sharp voice that sounded familiar. Light your way in the darkness with the pyres of burning heretics, I mumbled drowsily. Where did that come from? I located the source of the voice and stared at the young commissar from Carrick that had been in charge of the Ogrins. I threw the lost pistol on my cot and made the imperial Aquila in front of my chest. Ave Imperator, Commissar. I barked, hoping my quick reaction would be enough to spare me from the famous Commissar temper. Ave Imperator, Trooper. Get up and follow me. He said before turning around and waking out of the barracks with purpose. I scrambled to my feet, grabbed my lost gun and backpack, and hurried after him. When I came outside, I could see several dozen PDF troopers waiting in formation and I hurried over to them and took my place in the formation. The commissar who had stopped in front of them said nothing, but that only made me feel relief. When a commissar had nothing to say, the chances of being executed for immoral improvement reasons dropped drastically. I started mumbling my morning prayers to myself, determined to see if it affected the alignment stat. Besides, it never hurt to show devotion in the face of a commissar. Troopers! 
You have been tasked with assisting the 39th Krieg Siege Army in their assault on the Hive City with the mission of establishing a bridgehead for us to launch further campaigns from. Gather your gear and move out. Emperor protects. Emperor protects. We all called out in response before we took stock of our gear and some of the troopers ran off to get their missing pieces. The redhead from earlier was making her way toward me and I had no excuse to not talk to her. You have been avoiding me. She said when she came close enough for me to hear her. I could not deny that but it just seemed rude to agree with her. Not on purpose I hastily said. The officers have been on my ass ever since I arrived and my duties have kept me busy dash, my rambling was stopped as she stepped into my private sphere, almost pressing herself against me as she did. It's okay, outworlder, I like the hunt. She said with a mischievous smile as she traced a finger along my chin. Her brashness made me flustered and I had no idea what to do with myself. She smirked at me before walking away with a seductive sway to her hips and I could not help but stare. About fifteen meters away, she turned her head to see me staring and smiled to herself as she kept walking. I was ripped out of my thoughts by a slap to the back of the head and one of the other troopers was looking at me like I was crazy. By holy Terra, how did you manage to get her attention? He groaned. What do you mean? I asked. I had always been stupid when it came to social interaction. Are you blind or stupid? Every guy in three companies is praying to the emperor that she will find them interesting. But she casts her gaze on the only idiot who is not only not showing any interest in here, but is so clueless that he barely sees it. By the throne, how did I end up with such idiot fellow troopers? He threw his hands up as he spoke and walked away at the end of his little tirade. His words made me take a good look around and in the eyes of my fellow troopers, I saw nothing but envy. I had no more time to think about things as the order to move out rang across the formation and we all started moving out soon after. We were headed towards the creek part of the line. I was excited to see if they were as formidable as the lore from my world made them sound. I was also scared that they might be exactly like the lore back home painted them full-blown suicidal lunatics that considered death in service to the emperor to not only be their right but their sole purpose in life, on account of the history of Krieg. The only planet in the Imperium that can be asked to deliver a battalion of men and send two siege armies because they are eager to die for the emperor. Also, the only planet in the Imperium that were exceeding the tithe is not seen as a warning that heresy is taking place. The further we made it into the creek position of the trenches, the more the signs of individuality disappeared in favor of the brutal efficiency that Krieg was known for. I saw the PDF officers talking to what I assumed were Krieg officers, hard as it was to tell. The only difference between Krieg soldiers and officers seemed to be the hat. We walked past endless rows of the beloved Dithudgunzi asterisk that the Krieg soldiers had a strange fondness for, several basilisks asterisk asterisk, and even a few of the mighty Earthshaker cannons asterisk 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 dot, all of them being moved into position to provide heavy artillery bombardment before and during the assault. We were designated a trench barracks and we made ourselves comfortable. Nothing to do now but wait for the attack to begin. Underscore 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 I slowly woke up the next day, the constant sound of artillery having moved closer and grown more intense. I got up and moved out of the barracks. When I entered the trench, I was met with the back of several of the Krieg soldiers, all of them watching the hive in the distance as they looked over the edge of the trench. A sudden burst of stubborn fire from the empty ground between us and the hive caused two of them to drop where they stood. The other Krieg soldiers barely reacted beyond moving a little closer together to make up for the uncovered part of the trench. The only noise they made was the constant gas mask noises of filtering air. One of them whirled around and stared at me for a second before turning back to watch the hive in the distance. I will never forget the look of that gas mask covered face. It was like staring at a vision of death. Chapter 11, Wake Up Call The following many days were spent on endless patrols along the trench line, mixed with the occasional artillery barrage from the defenders. As far as waiting goes, it was not the worst of fates, even if danger was nearby. The heretics attempted raids during the night, but faced with Krieg soldiers, there was nothing they could do. The maniacs gladly threw themselves onto heretic bayonets if it meant creating an opening for the troopers behind them. Even the PDF forces got had some opportunity to kill heretics, alongside the Kriegers, but our commissars held us back as much as possible. They needed us for when the assault was ordered. Then, after almost a week, we were woken up by the sharp whistles of our commissars and we hurried to get equipped and line up outside our barracks. 
As soon as the last man was out, we were herded toward the part of the trench line that was closest to the hive city and lined up in attack formation. Artillery had been pounding the hive for days on end, focusing on five areas in a straight line from the trench. We stood there motionless and waiting with our loss rifles slung over our shoulders and our bayonets in our hands. We knew the order that was about to come and we both relished and feared the moment the words would come. The incessant artillery fire had ramped up in volume, a sure sign that the Imperial Guard was about to order an attack since this was standard doctrine during assaults. They would keep it up for as long as possible, right up to the point where the first Krieg soldiers crossed a predetermined line. After what felt like hours, the dreaded order came. Fix bayonets, I keep bayonets. Be ready for blood. A commissar shouted out and we all attached our bayonets to our loss rifles and held them at the ready. Soon after, a single whistle rang out across the trenches and with a collective roar of defiance from the PDF, we started spilling over the top of the trench, the silence of the Kriegers serving to emphasize the difference in approach to war. Almost immediately, sporadic stubber fire began flying from the hive ahead of us, but in comparison to the more than 50.000 men and women charging forward, it was like throwing pebbles at a rolling boulder, hoping to stop it. More than once, a soldier next to me or in front of me fell over from the stubber fire and treacherous terrain and I felt my shoulder pauldrons deflect several bullets, but thankfully none of them was a clean hit. More than once, I stumbled on the uneven terrain but thankfully I managed to stay on my feet and move forward. The Kriegers had managed to rush ahead of the PDF troopers, but that was to be expected, considering they spent their entire life training for and executing suicide assaults. Several of them were blown up by our artillery before the round stopped falling, their mutilated bodies being blown in all directions. A foot with the boot still attached was past my head and I recoiled on instinct. Nothing but indoctrination from childbirth could prepare you for something like that. But when the artillery stopped, the trouble began. It only took the defenders a few moments to realize that the artillery fire had stopped and they scrambled to man whatever wall defenses were still operational the level of fire poured against us increased a hundredfold, but as close as we were to the large opening that had been blown in the wall, it didn't make much difference. I felt the tingling along my spine and jumped sideways while still running forward and a moment later the spot I had just occupied was saturated with stubber fire. Once more, I praised my lucky stars for the danger instinct, but I was suddenly knocked over by what felt like a sledgehammer to the chest. Sprawled out on the ground, I looked down and saw a large scorch mark on the chest of my flak armor, indicating it had stopped a loss rifle shot. I got up as soon as I could but I felt a hand grabbing me under the shoulder and hauling me up. Looking up, I saw the face of the red-haired woman smiling back at me as she helped me up before she pushed me forward to resume the attack. Together, we reached the hive without further incident and joined in the heavy fighting that was taking place. PDF troopers were putting down ludicrous amounts of loss fire, all aimed at the same general direction while the Krieg soldiers moved forward in small 50-man groups, eager to close the distance and engage in melee, granting the PDF the advantage of the enemy being unable to fire back at them. The ground inside the hive instantly became clogged with heretics and Krieg soldiers engaged in brutal melee combat. Limbs were chopped off, guts were spilled on the ground and the screams of the wounded and dying mixed with the sporadic stubber and loss fire. The stench of ozone and death quickly filled my nostrils as I hoisted the loss rifle and started shooting at anyone not wearing a PDF or Krieg uniform. It didn't matter if it was a man, woman, or child, if I did not kill them, they would most certainly kill me. Forward. Press forward men, for the light of the Emperor shines upon U.S roared a commissar behind me and I felt the press of the bodies around me pushing into motion. There was no denying a commissar in a battle situation. With a scream of frustration, I hoisted my loss rifle and charged forward with the rest of the unit and within a few dozen steps we slammed into the chaotic melee taking place in the bombed-out opening in the hive wall. Cursing, shouting, random weapons fire, and the constant ringing of clashing blades filled my ears at the moment before I was busy adding my part to the growing battle. Every second new forces arrived, the slower units with the heavy weapons finally cresting the melee, lending their considerable firepower to the battle by creating an area of denial in front of the melee attackers, giving them room to breathe and their commissars precious seconds to form firing lines and at least attempt to rein in the Krieg soldiers. They fascinated me, their unnaturally calm and indifferent demeanor when out of battle and the contrast to the almost blood-crazed killers they became once they reached melee, slavering on the border of madness, but always staying in control, they killed with the ruthless efficiency of centuries of Krieg indoctrination and training, distilled into what was speculated to be cloned teenagers. A true embodiment of the grim dark universe I had come to inhabit. 
Having dispatched the last enemy in range, I quickly reformed with the other PDF troopers, those that were still alive and able to fight, I opened fire before the commissar gave the order and the troopers around me followed suit, unleashing a wall of loss fire into the smoke of the growing ring of our heavy weapons support and the attacking heretics beyond. I felt more than saw the commissar's gaze on me and my danger instinct went into overdrive, but I focused on firing fast and accurate bursts of loss fire into the smoke, noting the occasional ping from the corner of my eye. Not nearly as many as I would have liked, but slow progress was still progress. With the battle raging on, the commissar had to take his attention away from me, but I knew I had made a mistake that would require me to play my cards very carefully after this battle. I could explain the lack of waiting for orders if I acted correctly, which meant being completely unbothered no matter what happened from this point. Engineers were already rushing sandbags in, literally building fortifications around us as we kept up the suppressive fire, picking up their shotguns as soon as their objective was done, taking up position in the same fortifications, and screaming at us to push on and get them more ground to claim. Onward we pushed, the level of resistance ramping up in response to our increasing grip on the foothold into the hive, more and more defenders rushing against our firing lines, the floor space filled with a moving ocean of bodies being torn apart bit by bloody bit as we emptied our charge packs into the withering mass of heretics. Grenades! I screamed as I pulled the pin on my frack grenade and recited the prayer of ignition. Spirit of fire! Prime this weapon! And blast the foe! From the emperor's sight! and flung it against the helmet of a snarling mountain of a man trying to bring a largely improvised cleaver to bear on us. A few of the troops around me did the same and changed their charge packs after they had thrown them. The shower of blood and meat chunks hit me as soon as the explosions from the grenades rocked through the ranks of the enemy and on a whim I loaded a hotshot power pack. Sure, it could melt my weapons internally, but we needed more firepower to buy the engineers time and space to reinforce our hold inside the city. Making sure to recite the prayer of loading as I put the power pack in place, I raised the loss rifle once more to lay down suppressive fire, but a random round punched through my left shoulder pauldron and continued through the muscle, bone, and then more armor as I was slammed to the ground with a gaping hole in my shoulder. Everything became a haze, sounds immediately drowned out by a weird ringing and I felt the sweet grasp of unconsciousness reach out to me, and oh. I had to fight it. Falling asleep now could be fatal, it was just the body reacting to extreme, unexpected damage. Fight, damn it. Slowly lifting my upper body, my head lolling from side to side, I managed to get my good arm under me to lean on. Suddenly hands grabbed me and pulled me back the way two came from, away from the fighting. It wasn't long before I was put on a cold surface and someone started prodding me around the wound. Opening an eye and squinting it to try and focus, I saw the face of one of the many guard regiments that aided in the assault and realized he must be the field churgeon asterisk. He quickly wrapped up my shoulder before injecting a few different things into my arm and I immediately started feeling better. Rest ten minutes, then rejoin the front line, he said before I was carried over to a group of guardsmen and PDF troopers, and handed my rifle. I could feel whatever they had given me working hard to fix whatever damage I had sustained, but I also knew it would be temporary. At some point, the drugs would wear off, and the only reason I was afforded this luxury is that we are still early in the campaign. We could spare the resources when taking into account the projected gains from the stockpiles, conveniently near the entrance into the hive. Looking around, I saw the beginnings of a field hospital placed against the inside of the hive wall. I leaned back against the wall. I could use the short break, maybe try to cheat my way to avoiding battle for longer. On the other hand, I didn't want to abuse the goodwill of the soldiers around me, they had been quick to get me out of there. Instead, I used the time to run through the slew of notifications that had been accumulating during the attacks so far. According to all the messages, a whooping 47 heretics had been killed by my hand, and at 31 XP per heretic, I was not one to complain. But something else was up and I pondered the symbol next to my abilities tab. Human. Level 3. Stat points remaining, 5. Alignment, Faithful Imperial. Litanies, 19. Augmentations, none. Level, 1750-2400. Strength, 9. Agility, 9. Perception, 10. Will, 9. Luck, 16. Skills. Feats. Abilities, asterisk. There were also notifications about an increase in skills, so I opened that tab first to see the good news. Last weapon proficiency, light, tier 2, level 6. Last Weapon Proficiency, Heavy, Tier 1, Level 2 Stubber Weapons, Light, Tier 1, Level 2 
Stubber Weapons Heavy, Tier 1, Level 2. Melee Weapons Chain, Tier 1, Level 1. Melee Weapons Power, Tier 1, Level 0. Melee Weapons Regular, Tier 1, Level 9. Melee Weapons Shovel, Tier 1, Level 0. Unarmed Combat, Tier 1, Level 2. Armor Proficiency Regular, Tier 1, Level 8. Armor Proficiency, Power, Tier 1, Level 0. After running through the list and noting that several skills were close to tearing up, I moved on to the Abilities tab. Abilities Get Up Guardsman, this grants the user the ability to push through what would otherwise be incapacitating damage and keep on fighting. One use per week. Holy Terra, talk about being granted an ability at a clutch moment. Unless The ability formed as a result of my actions during a moment of crisis. I would have to look deeper into this at some point, but for now, I wanted to give my feats a look over, since I was setting time aside for stat screen time. Endurance, Tier 1, Level 9, Note, Planetary Bonus Applied. Danger Instinct, Living in a world where danger is relative and death waits around the corner of every new day have granted you the ability to sense malicious intent towards you. Natural Bluffing, Since your arrival, you have spent a considerable amount of time during conversation lying and twisting the truth. You have been granted the natural bluffing feat. My endurance feat is about to tear up as well. Yes, please. I suspect the whole getting wounded thing had something to do with that. I was close to a level as well, the best thing I could do was lay back and let a bit of rest do its work. I would soon get a chance to boost my XP once more. Chapter 12 No Rest for the Wicked I barely got five minutes of rest after shutting down my stat screen and leaning back, the guardsmen from before came over to herd a whole group of us away to make room for the new wounded that was now arriving in a steady stream of casualties. With S grunt of pain, I got on my feet and hefted my loss rifle. The wound in my shoulder made its presence known, a burning sensation flaring up as I got my rifle into position in the nook formed by my arm and shoulder and tried supporting the barrel with my left arm. It hurt and made my hand shake, but it was possible to fight like this. Thank fuck for the lack of recoil on loss rifles, otherwise, two don't know if I could still fire this thing. Shit, I needed every advantage at this point. A single shot at a bad angle was enough to take me out of the fight at this point. And with the future looking like it did, I was about to run a gauntlet against possibly millions of random bullets fired in my direction. The next chance I got, I had to sit down and memorize exactly what I was able to utilize to my advantage, provided I survived this little excursion to the front. Even calling it that was generous, it was a couple of hundred meters at the best to the temporary fortifications. As it turned out, the fighting had died down quite a bit once the bulk of our small attacking force had arrived, the different hive gangs unable to keep the temporary peace brought on by our attack. One side saw an opening, took it, and weakened a different position which in turn was attacked by another gang and so on. Sporadic groups of attacks were easily kept at bay with the help of massed loss and heavy loss fire, and between the attacks, I had time to go over everything I had at my disposal. I had forgotten about my rallying ability and made a mental note to use it the next time an opportunity presented itself. Still, no new feats as far as I knew, but I opened the tab anyway. Feats. Feats of circumstance. What the hell? That subcategory was new. Open, damn it open. Notice, first time opening feats of circumstance. Effects will now be active. Orc familiarity, having received combat training on a world infested with orcs and survived battle against the greenskins, you have an innate knowledge of what it takes to dispose of them. Plus 15% damage against any greenskin. Just a flesh wound, surviving a horrendous wound has left your body better able to deal with the sudden shock of damage. Reduced chance of panic or unconsciousness when severely wounded. Run the gauntlet. Living through a mass charge on enemy fortifications has strengthened your resolve. Add plus one will. Leaderless, act without order in front of a commissar and live to tell the tale. Add plus two luck. Publicly loyal, you recite your prayers with duty and reverence when others are looking. A slight reduction in purity. Ogren empathy, you have a weird understanding of how ogrens function and they seem to respond to this. Interaction with ogren will always be positive unless actively seeking confrontation. Deathworlder, hailing from a world where surviving to adulthood is a considerable mark of resilience in and of itself, your natural resistance to extreme cold and the deadly living conditions puts you at a significant advantage in terms of survival. Small boost to survival-related skills and plus two strength. Holy motherfucking shit. I mentally kicked myself for not exploring everything on my status screen more often, I suspected it would have made some things quite a lot easier. 
This was great. This was more than great. These kinds of feats, which seemed to be based purely on things I had been through or were a direct part of me, could be a game changer for my life in this world. Maybe there was a way to farm such feats. Of course, that would mean putting myself in new and dangerous situations constantly, in an attempt to figure out if I am right or not. Maybe put that on hold until further notice, I had plenty of danger in my near future. As PDF troopers, we were some of the most expendable, usually relegated to guard duty and planetary defense, we were not trained for combat like this, so our role would most likely be that of meat shield unless we captured more ground soon. I was ripped out of my thoughts by the sound of heavy footsteps approaching in what sounded like a failed attempt at marching in order. Moments later a squad of ogrins entered my vision, confirming my suspicions. If the ogrins had arrived, then the bridgehead was secure and a supply line established. They would do wonders inside the hive, the ripper guns, and massive size giving them a distinct advantage in the often cramped conditions found in hive cities. I had heard talk of Bulgren's asterisk being brought in, and I hoped it was true. It would be amazing to have the added defense of a moving wall of steel and muscle in front of you during assaults, but I doubted that luxury would be afforded PDF troopers. If we were lucky they would assign us to guard duty inside the hive, at the entrances that had been created and taken to pave the way for the years-long task of clearing out the hive city. There would be no quarter given and no survivors to speak of. It was easier to simply cleanse the hive city and ship in a few million people from another world. I was making my patrol along the fortifications when I heard someone call out Trooper. And I turned around to see the commissar from the charge on the city, making his way toward me with determined steps. As if my life wasn't miserable enough, now I had an angry commissar zeroed in on me, most likely because I didn't wait for his order. But doing so would have resulted in a lot more dead soldiers, and we all know how indifferent commissars are to human life in general. Lives are the emperor's coin, spend it well. I turned to face the angry commissar approaching me at a fast pace and made the imperial Aquila Ave Imperator, commissar, he returned the Aquila reluctantly but didn't waste time with introductions. Why did you act without orders during the assault, he demanded and I noticed the troopers around me inching away from me. I had the enemy in my sights and waiting for the wisdom of our commissar would have resulted in more troopers dying. I thought that keeping them alive by being proactive would be in line with reducing the strain on our imperial forces, prolonging the effective use of our company. I answered, hoping my quick pocket wisdom would prove enough to not get me executed for immoral improvement reasons. I could see the commissar's hand twitching dangerously close to his bolt pistol as he racked his brain for any reason to accuse me of heresy, the silence started dragging out and becoming uncomfortable before he finally talked again. Very well, trooper. But remember, a good soldier obeys without question. And a good officer commands without doubt. I finished the sentence. His eyes grew wide as he asked, you have studied the tactica imperium asterisk asterisk? As far as my duties allow me, commissar. Which is to say, not much. I hesitantly replied, worried that it might imply a shirking of duties on my part. That was a surefire way to have your free trial of life expire quicker than quick. Very well, he said, return to your duties, trooper. But no, I will be keeping a close eye on you. After saying what he wanted to say, he turned on his heel and marched away with audible clicks of his boots. How did they make a pair of boots sound so foreboding anyway? A yellow blinking in the side of my vision informed me of something new happening on my status screen, but before I could dive into it, my comrades called on me and we resumed our patrol of temporary fortifications meant to solidify our meager hold on the hive city. The sight of the ogrins showing up had done wonders to morale, knowing that we had murderous giants with itchy trigger fingers on our side. It didn't take long for the dreaded order to reach us and we were recalled from patrol duties to reinforce a combat group of Krieg soldiers that was gathering up for a push into the hive. The commanders wanted to secure the nearby storehouses along with the ammunition and weapons they held, both to resupply ourselves and also to deny the enemy the supplier before they managed to empty them out. The constant ringing of gunfire further in the hive told a story of the gangs waging what sounded like a full-scale war on each other, which would make sense since the leadership of the hive was essentially in shambles and could not focus on anything other than the invading forces. Usually, the hive gangs would be kept in line by those in power, but the war changed the priorities of any people in power extremely quickly, giving the gangs the chance they wanted to take out the competition and seize more ground to control and exploit to increase their power. Unfortunately for them, this would only add to our advantage, making it much easier to eradicate any survivors of these internal power struggles. 
My shoulder was still heavily bandaged and wounded, but the pain had become a numb sensation rather than the burning sensation of a fresh wound, but it would still affect my ability to fight. I could only hope to retain a place in the back line, providing fire support for the fanatical Krieg soldiers as they did what they did best. Charge forward in eerie silence to bring the Emperor's mercy to anyone within shovel range. It didn't take long for us to gather up behind the impatient Kriegers, the special commissars assigned to the Krieg regiments working hard to prevent them from rushing forward in their eagerness to die for the Emperor. When the last of the PDF troopers designated to assist in the push had arrived, the commissars wasted no time in blowing their whistles, signaling the time to attack and the impatient Kriegers immediately started moving at a fast walk, the first line crouched over allowing the second line to shoot over them. This did not slow them down, however, their proficiency in fighting in trenches and bunkers showed itself in the fast walking speed of the front line. The whistles sounded a second time, signaling the PDF backup to start advancing, ready to reinforce any section that encountered resistance with heavy amounts of loss fire, in the hopes it would overwhelm any enemy they might encounter. Remembering the last fight, I had slotted a hotshot charge pack, willingly trading the stability of my weapon and the generous amounts of ammunition a charge pack usually provided, for some much-needed penetration and stopping power. It took less than two minutes for us to reach the point of first contact with the enemy. The Krieg lines ahead of us started turning a corner and suddenly surged forward, much to the confusion of their commissars, as they started firing their loss rifles in the quick and controlled manner that few mortal soldiers in the universe were capable of. Before we reached the corner, our commissars were already bellowing out orders to move forward at speed and join the fight. The area that opened up in front of us was already a scene of chaos before we joined the fight. Thousands of people engaged in a brutal fight for control of the storehouse we were entering. Judging from their different armors and loadouts of weaponry it was obvious we were seeing two different gangs embroiled in an all-out war with no holds barred. The arrival of 500 Krieg soldiers with a thirst for blood and a strained patience had rocked both of the groups on their heels and they were scrambling for any cover there was to find, in an attempt to escape the torrent of loss fire that started pouring down on their positions by a wave of silent, gas-mask-clad soldiers that all looked like the same soldier, cloned over and over. This was soon joined by a few thousand PDF troopers adding their loss fire to the fight, forcing the already scared and desperate gangers to dig in deeper, preventing most, if not all, retaliation fire. The Krieg soldiers soon reached melee combat, their advance never slowing as they fired, and they began their grim work with deadly efficiency. The PDF troopers were ordered to a halt about halfway between the entrance and the warm corpses of the Krieg soldiers' first victims, to lay down a torrent of covering fire, keeping the Kriegers somewhat safe from the stubbers of the gangers. The fight was short, brutal, and bloody. We lost few, the element of surprise complete, but a couple of dozen managed to make their escape, no doubt in the hopes of rousing any kind of support against us. We pressed forward through a sludge of blood and entrails, the stench was unbelievable, yet most of the troopers seemed completely unbothered by it. I tried not to let it get to me as we moved toward the main body of the stores, the Kriegers having picked up their pace once more, now proceeding at a fast walking speed. How they managed to keep formation while doing that was beyond me. As expected, the survivors had warned of our coming and we were soon met with concentrated fire from behind hastily constructed barricades made of flimsy materials. While it took a few shots to penetrate, it was not impossible and we took full advantage while withering the angry return fire. Most of it was focused on the Krieg soldiers, letting the bulk of our forces shoot rather unhindered. The effort was useless though, the fanatical mindset of the Krieg soldiers leaving no room for fear or doubt. Any soldier that saw themselves being killed by the enemy as the ultimate glory was not a soldier you wanted to fire your weapon at. More friendly troopers were trickling in every minute from our lines, being sent directly from their arrival into the hive toward our position, but the same was happening for the hive gangers. The battle grew in intensity as both sides got reinforced over and over and it seemed as though it would grow into a full-blown battle instead of the expected skirmishes. That's when it happened. Chapter 13 a massive explosion rocked the floor and a giant hole appeared in the wall on the far right, followed by a small flood of ogren making their way inside the warehouse, engaging anyone they happened upon in short and incredibly brutal melee combat. Almost as one, the Krieg soldiers switched their focus to the new threat as the commotion caused the various gangs to seize the chance and retreat into more solid cover. Scores of ogrens all bearing the same markings, they could only belong to one of the noble houses within the hive, most likely sent to restore order so a defense could be organized or a counterattack on the warehouse could be started. 
All of this happened within a few instants and then the ogrins reached the Krieg soldiers that, unlike their Hiveganger counterparts, responded with the same level of aggression, descending upon the ogrins like a swarm of angry ants before a group of Hercules beetles. Shovels, bayonets, random loss fire, and more were being used with brutal efficiency, the Kriegers focusing on the joints and ligaments to disable their enemy before they slaughtered them and the ogrins using their massive size and freakish strength to smash whole groups of soldiers with every swing. All we could do was stand and watch, hoping for an opening to present itself to our lost gun fire but that never happened. Instead, we heard the dreaded voice of a commissar, in the name of the god emperor, charge! And the press of bodies moved me forward against my will, so I started running along instead of getting trampled or shot. This was not good. Not good at all. Sure, there was a good chance of getting new feats here, but at the same time, there was a very real possibility of death. Ogrins were no joke, if I hadn't already seen them fight orcs, I would have known from the bodies that kept falling to the enormous abhumans and their wild attacks. They operated on fury and a joy of smashing things, which was made evident as the Kriegers were being decimated in front of our rapidly advancing firing lines that had been bolstered by regular guardsmen as a proper route into the hive had been secured and reinforced. Not that it would do much good to prevent me from getting turned into a paste. We were close enough that the troopers around me raised their rifles and started firing as they closed the last few steps between us and I did the same. By some divine stroke of luck, my first stab hit the throat of a raging ogren that was desperately trying to rid himself of the three Krieg soldiers that clung to his back and hacked away with their shovels with wild abandon. His frustrated roars of pain turned into a gurgle as he locked his eyes on me and stumbled forward, pressing the bayonet further into his neck where I could feel it cutting sinew and scraping against bone. The ogren finally fell over but my bayonet was stuck in his neck and the loss rifle was ripped from my arms, leaving me without a weapon, and in desperation, I took the example of the Krieg soldiers and grabbed my trench shovel. There would not be time to reach down and try to wrench my loss rifle from the neck of the fallen abhuman, the melee was already unfolding. Over the roar of the ogrens and the screams of the dying, I could hear the desperation in the shouted orders among our officers. Things were not going well and our lines were threatening to break. I tried to remember something, anything, that could help us. The prayer. I took in a deep breath and felt the same sensation of my chest swelling up as the last time this happened, only, this time it was my intention and not a random coincidence. Protect us, O Emperor, from the snares of the heretic, the mutant, the xeno, and the warp spawn. In you we place all our faith. In you we find refuge. In you we find our avenger. Lead us forth into the legions of humanity's foes with thy spirit and give us the courage and capability to slay the foes in every battle we are compelled to fight, though they last until the end of time. I could sense the calm settle over the panicking troopers and guardsmen around me as I bellowed out the words, the speed of loss fire slowed down from panicking full auto to controlled bursts, and the ones engaged in melee attacked with more precision and less fear, their courage bolstered by the prayer ability I used even the voices of the officers nearby seemed to gain more gusto and bravado as they spurred their troops forward with renewed energy. Slowly, ever so slowly, the tides turned to our advantage, as the constant pour of troops being committed to this skirmish kept trickling in and reinforcing our ranks. I had lost count of my kills long ago and had stopped thinking about anything other than staying alive and, should the unthinkable happen, take as many with me as possible. At some point, I realized I was screaming incoherently as I swung my shovel wildly in an attempt to keep an ogren at bay. Had it not been for the soldiers around me, I would have been turned into a smear on the floor, but as things were, my desperate flailing bought my fellow troopers the time they needed to swing around the loss rifles and send the abhuman to the ground under a torrent of laser fire. Off on the far side of our lines, the ogrens were attempting to break through with a mass charge, but the heavy weapons teams had arrived and set up their autocannons asterisk, giving the flank the firepower they needed to hold against the brutal attack. On our side, the ebb of ogrens from the large hole that had been blown in the side of the warehouse was finally dying down after what felt like days of fighting. My muscles were screaming and my mind protesting every time I forced any kind of movement, but I wanted to stay alive more than I wanted to relax and sleep, so I fought on. On and on and on, until the blood was covering most of my body and dripping from my weapon. A thin, misty, slightly red vapor was covering the area we fought in, vaporized blood from the loss fire, and the taste was nauseating. Fighting back to urge to empty the contents of my stomach on the ground, I pressed on, pushing myself to keep fighting in melee, keep dodging the wild swings of the enormous ogrens. With the amount of death I had helped deal in this engagement, there was no way I had not gained a level, and I wanted more levels, many more. I was woefully underpowered and unprepared for this world, 
and the only thing that had kept me alive so far was sheer luck, but that would not keep working. Nobody had infinite luck, so I needed to power up fast. Finally, bloody finally. We managed to finish off the Ogren counterattack, mostly as a result of the heavy weapons teams arriving and augmenting our killing potential many times over. The heavy thud of the autocannon fire sounded like heavenly drums as they helped thin out the sea of mutated muscle that faced us. As soon as the last Ogren was dead, I started looking for me lost rifle. Emperor only knows what the officers or commissars would do to me if I lost it. It didn't take long to find, all I had to do was find the place where PDF troopers started appearing among the dead and look for an Ogren for a lost rifle stuck in his neck. But when I found it, the Ogren was, to my surprise, still alive, though his life would be measured in minutes at this point. I did the only sensible thing and put a few shots in his head. They might be terrifying in combat, but mentally, they were no more than children, and I couldn't leave him to suffer to death. Some might be looking at me from the outside and see a PDF trooper that had accepted life as a soldier, but none of them could fathom the amount of empathy I felt for that simple creature. Regiment after regiment of guardsmen entered the warehouses as soon as the battle died down and got to work on setting up a new defensive line for the heretics and traitors within the hive to throw themselves at. The defensive lines further back would not be abandoned, instead, they would be reinforced and made into permanent fortifications until the hive had been liberated and imperial order restored. With feet that felt like concrete, the stench of death hovering around me, the blood of countless enemies still dripping from my arms and hands, and a great desire to sleep, I slowly trudged back to the temporary barracks that had been set up. Admittedly, it was better than sharing bunkers with your fellow soldiers as the hive provided plenty of space where soldiers could find a bit of peace. I had been lucky enough to get my hands on a large storage closet, no more than a few meters to each side, but it was private, a thing I had missed greatly since my arrival in this world. I managed to get back there and slide the door closed behind me without meeting any officers or commissars. They were probably busy overseeing the construction of the new fortifications, which meant I could catch some very well-deserved sleep. I slipped out of my flak armor and uniform and lifted the covers of my sleeping bag, but I could not lie down, on account of it already being occupied. A mess of red hair and a pair of glinting eyes stared back at me before she reached out a hand and dragged me down to her. It would seem I still had a challenge to overcome before blissful sleep could, at last, be mine. But was this really a good idea? It seemed too good to be true, and if I had learned anything from my old life, it was that things that seemed too good to be true usually was. Chapter 14 Left Breathless I woke up slightly dizzy and blinked a few times before I remembered what had happened last night and a flood of memories and images flashed through my mind for a second as I noticed the bed was empty, beside myself of course. I looked around and saw the redhead moving toward the room door. Wait, I don't even know your name. I called out in a hoarse voice and she turned her head to me and smiled before she slid out of the door and closed it behind her. My body was sore all over and the harder I thought about what happened during the night, the more my amazement grew at my own agility and endurance. I guess not everything is bad about being ripped from your own world. I also remembered she had lit up something that looked like a low stick, but tasted, and worked, differently. The only thing I could think of that would have similar effects would be Kixa Asterisk, but that couldn't be right. No guardsman or PDF trooper would ever be able to afford such a substance. Just who was this mystery redhead? I had seen her in the battle lines but never actually seen her fight. She always seemed to be nearby when she wanted my attention, but I could never find her whenever I wanted to meet her on my terms. My danger instinct started screaming when I put all these things together and I had to agree with the feeling. Something was off about that woman, as tempting as she was. I would have to be more careful in the future, especially when she was around. I got dressed as quickly as I could and as I was about to go after her, I felt a sudden wave of nausea wash over me and I started coughing. Trying to keep my feet steady under me and suppress the coughing, I managed to open the door and stumble out of my room, but the cough kept getting worse, I was having trouble breathing and my vision was swimming on account of nausea. Every step felt like climbing a mountain and every breath felt like a struggle for life. The world started tilting sideways and it wasn't until the faces of nearby PDF troopers filled my vision that I understood I had collapsed. I couldn't breathe and my lungs felt like they were burning up from the inside. I could feel that I was being moved, but I had no understanding of where to or by whom, but next time my eyes could focus through the pain and dizziness, I saw what looked like a mechanicus engine seer, but the surroundings were all wrong. It was dark and musty and a multitude of colored lights was shining all around. I could hear falling water, rumbling, hushed voices, and growling animals. 
The smell was of rot and mold, gunpowder and death, and for some reason, alcohol. As my mind started focusing and the pain slowly subsided I could pick up snippets of a nearby conversation. Mint are you offering in return? The voice was robotic and droning as the words were spoken. Most definitely the engine seer asterisk asterisk. Your life when the Imperium rushes through this place. And this? The other voice was rough and commanding and it sounded familiar, but everything was hazy and contorted and I could not place the voice. Whatever had been offered must have been acceptable because I felt something prick me in the arm before I drifted off into blissful sleep. Underscore 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 When I woke up, I was still groggy, which could most likely be chalked up to whatever concoction I had been given before I drifted off. Before I could gather my wits about me, the same robotic voice from before spoke up right on schedule. How is your breathing? I tried breathing deeply and to my delight, there was no pain. The air even tasted clean and fresh, but I felt different. Changed. I couldn't explain it. What did you do? I asked hesitantly. I did what I was paid to do. Implanted you with cybernetic lungs. Not the best quality, but they will replicate the function of your old ones and even filter the most common pollution and airborne toxins out of whatever atmosphere you breathe. The engine seer droned on. For some reason, your body rejected the substance you took, and the resulting damage to your body was focused around the lungs. You are lucky you were brought to me when you were, much longer and you would have fulfilled your oath to the emperor. I took a moment to digest the information I had been given before I spoke again, where is this place? You are down in the underhive asterisk asterisk asterisk, and if you wouldn't mind, stop wasting the time of the engine seer with your menial questions, he is only present to make sure your lungs are functioning. I was the one that put them inside of you, so if you have any further questions, direct them to me. Came a tired and slightly irritated voice from the doorway on my right I hadn't noticed. Turning my head, I saw an elderly man wearing a worn-out and heavily patched Imperial Guard medic uniform under the homemade lab coat he was wearing. How did I get here, and what happened to me? I asked after a moment of thought. This man was a no-bullshit kind of person. He had seen too much of this harsh reality to allow himself any form of self-delusion about niceties and manners. A young commissar and his retinue brought you here, and before you ask how they made it into the underhive without facing opposition, your PDF friends were kind enough to provide him with a security detail. Why he would ever take an interest in someone like you would normally be a mystery, but I have the advantage of having dug through your body. Kixa does not cause this amount of damage to people unless they are not what they say they are. And you are different. Your body should have been able to handle the drug without issue, but it didn't. He looked me over with a strange look in his eye before he continued. This made me curious as to what could cause this. By all accounts, you should have been perfectly fine, if a bit spent. But you were on the brink of death, your lungs were ruined beyond the repair. So I took a deeper look. You are not you. He stated with a menacing look in his greedy eyes. And now you want me to pay for your silence. I completed the unspoken sentence and he seemed satisfied with my understanding of the situation. I rose from the metal slab I had been laying on and noticed that apart from my loss rifle being gone, I still had my knife in my boot and my loss pistol in the holster on my thigh. He looked me over as I slowly stood on my feet and continued to speak, I don't know who or what you are, I just know this body is not yours. I am certain the Inquisition would be thrilled to have you delivered to their door. But I also know that I like Imperial Scrip, and you are going to help me accumulate it. And how did you figure I was going to do that? In case you have not noticed, I am kind of involved in a small war. I countered, stalling for time to find a solution, but with the engine seer working behind me, violence was not an option at the current time. His servo arm would crush me before I fired my second shot. He wouldn't even have to turn around to do it. I am always in need of supplies, and with your access to the troops currently deployed, you can start pilfering them for me. Do not worry about contacting me or trying to escape the deal. I have other people among your ranks and they will be happy to report any treachery on your part. Speaking of, there is no time like the present, so go on back to your little war and get to it. Anything of immediate value, especially proper alcohol and food rations. I am tired of corpse starch asterisk 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 dot. 
With a wave of his hand, he dismissed me as casually as one would dismiss an annoying fly. I had no idea what he thought I was, but the best guess would be some sort of psycher asterisk 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 since my consciousness had occupied the mind of another body, which would actually make some sort of weird sense. And I had been contacted earlier by the mysterious voice talking about power. And I had access to this weird leveling system. It's not like I have much of a choice, is it? I mumbled and made my way out of his little workshop. Outside was a stark difference to the front lines I had come to know a myriad of alleys, side paths, and hidden ways stretched out among the old and crumbled buildings that made up the majority of the underhive. The muck and filth dripped down from above, the walls were covered in grime, and the streets were filled with puddles of waste. All around I could see signs of humans living in the area, lights that had been attached to the walls in a futile attempt to make things more hospitable and bright, drawing on the side of a building, most likely a child that had not been ruined by life and reality yet. Gangers walked around, keeping the peace, despite their rivals being no further away than one could throw a rock. Vendors, shops, bounty hunters, guilders, hired killers and every imaginable kind of scum of the city could be found here, all of them busy with something and none of them interested in a single PDF trooper leaving a doctor's abode. All except for a single pair of eyes that was firmly locked on me. I had no idea, but I felt my danger sense tingling slightly not enough to make me worried, but more than it would have when I was surrounded by my fellow soldiers. Seeing nothing that could tip me off to what could make me sense it, I headed in the direction I figured would take up into the hive itself, glancing at the various shops as I passed them by. Everything, from illegal weapon modifications to every imaginable and unimaginable narcotic and drug known to man. Which is quite a lot in this universe. I was almost at the lift that would take me up from this depressing place when I saw the one thing I had been missing since arriving here. I saw a bar. I had my imperial scrip in my pocket, the trooper pay might be menial but with almost nothing to use it on near the front, it had accumulated. I wanted a drink and I wanted it bad. Rocking up to the bartender, I noticed the slim selection, and before the gruff and nasty individual behind the bar could speak up, I placed my order. Rotgut asterisk 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 I simply said and threw a few scripts on the counter. A filthy glass filled with a murky liquid was placed in front of me, but the strong smell from it revealed it to indeed be the booze I had wanted. Before my courage failed me, I grabbed the glass and gulped down the foul concoction. It burned like fire and tasted like death, but the alcohol hit my system and I could feel the familiar burn turn into a ball of warmth inside of my stomach. Slamming the glass back down, I continued on my merry way, much to the surprise of the other patrons who most likely figured I would have gotten drunk before leaving. I had no such intentions, knowing where I was, being drunk without backup was a guaranteed way of ending up in an alley with a knife firmly planted at the base of your skull or a mess of stubber holes in your chest. I had just pressed the button that summoned the lift when my danger instinct flared up, sending a wave of panic down my spine which caused me to dive sideways. Not a moment later, the ground I had previously occupied was hit by a round from a long loss, the sniper variant of the common loss rifle. I hid behind a couple of metal crates as I waited for the lift to arrive. No further shots were taken which left very few possibilities of what just happened. Either it was a guardsman that had been ordered to prevent people from using the lift, which was highly unlikely. It could also be an opportunistic ganger, trying to stack some kills for his comrades to loot once they were dead. Or I had made enemies, which was the most likely scenario. I had no idea who would want to kill me, but if they only had the economy to hire mortals, I had nothing to fear. At least not yet. When the lift arrived, I dove inside and pushed the button that would take me back to the regular hive city. I guess I had time to go through my status screen on the way up. Chapter 15, please anything but that. It was going to take a while to get back up to the surface, so I had time to finally go over my status screen. I knew I had gained a level, I had killed too much and been through too much since the last time for me not to have gained a level. As I sat down on the floor and leaned back against the rattling lift, I started going over everything that had changed. Human. Level 5. Stat points remaining, 15. Alignment, Faithful Imperial. Litanies, 27. Augmentations, Cybernetic Lung Upgrade LVL1, Toxins Slash Environment. Level, 5267 Slash 9600. Strength, 10. Agility, 8. Perception, 10. Will, 7. Luck, 18. Skills. Feats. Abilities asterisk. Wait, did I forget to allocate skill points last time I leveled up? And had I just gained two levels during a single combat engagement? 
things were starting to look up. I had even picked up a few more combat-oriented litanies on the front lines if things were this well with the applied bonuses from my feats of circumstance, then I had to wonder if my skills had risen as much as my XP count, so naturally, I immediately opened the tab. Skills Last Weapon Proficiency, Light, Tier 3, Level 2 Last Weapon Proficiency, Heavy, Tier 1, Level 4 Stubber Weapons, Light, Tier 1, Level 2 Stubber Weapons, Heavy, Tier 1, Level 2 Melee Weapons Chain Tier 1 Level 1 Melee Weapons Power Tier 1 Level 0 Melee Weapons Regular Tier 2 Level 5 Melee Weapons Shovel Tier 1 Level 0 Unarmed Combat Tier 1 Level 2 Armor Proficiency Regular Tier 2 Level 3 Armor Proficiency Power Tier 1 Level 0 Whoa, 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 Melee, Armor, and Lost Gun tiered up since last time? Now that is what I'm talking about. A thought struck me and I opened the abilities e tab with fervor. Get up guardsman, this ability grants the user the ability to push through what would otherwise be incapacitating damage and keep on fighting. One use per week. Endurance, tier 2, level 7, note, planetary bonus applied. Danger instinct, living in a world where danger is relative and death waits around the corner of every new day have granted you the ability to sense malicious intent towards you. Natural bluffing. Since your arrival, you have spent a considerable amount of time during conversation lying and twisting the truth. You have been granted the natural bluffing feat. I mentally clicked the endurance ability to see what my new tier gave me access to. Endurance, tier 2, level 7. Tier 1, environmental hazards affect you to a lesser degree than your peers. Passive bonus to environmental resistance. Tier 2, minor resistance to irritants, toxins, and poisons. Minor passive resistance to harmful environmental effects. Tier, keep leveling up to unlock the next tier. That explained why I never seem to be too cold or too hot. And the minor resistance bonus from the second tier would help me breathe in industrial areas or battlefields with blood vapor. I eagerly went back to the skills to see what bonuses the new tiers would grant me there. Lost Weapons Light Tier 3 Level 2 Tier 1, Knowledge of How to Use and Maintain Lost Weapons Tier 2, Knowledge of Manipulation of Power Pack Output and Lost Gun Power Settings. Tier 3, Knowledge of How to Jury Rig Power Packs into Makeshift Grenades. Tier, Keep Leveling Up to Unlock the Next Tier. Melee Weapons Regular, Tier 2, Level 5. Tier 1, Knowledge of How to Use Basic Melee Weapons in Combat. Tier 2, Knowledge of How to Inflict the Most Damage with Every Hit. Cause Targets to Bleed Violently with Every Cut and Stab. Tier, Keep Leveling to Unlock the Next Tier. Armor Proficiency, Regular, Tier 2, Level 3 Tier 1, Knowledge of how to make proper use of basic personal combat armor Tier 2, Knowledge of how to maximize the limited potential in basic armor Vastly increased chance for anything but a direct hit to be glancing rather than wounding Tier, keep leveling to unlock the next tier I saw a lot of changes and I liked what I saw And I had not even allocated my 15 points yet I could double some of my stats and almost triple my will if I wanted to. But with this many points dropped at once, I'm certain the changes would be notable once I made my choice so I would have to wait with that until I had been back and knew I could go to bed afterward. There was still blinking in the corner of my eye and I opened the insistent notification. New achievement unlocked. Flesh decays. Get your first cybernetic implant. Plus one strength. Plus one agility. New achievement unlocked. Mysterious Mercy. An unknown entity interfered with your life to save it. Plus two luck. Quest received and accepted. Who are you? Find and identify the unknown entity that helped you survive. Quest reward, plus four skill points. Time limit, infinite. Wait, I never accepted any quest. But then again. Getting four skill points just to find someone I planned on finding anyway was a hell of a bonus. On the other hand, the fact that a quest was involved with this person also meant that it would not be as simple as asking around and finding a person. There would be danger involved, significant danger at that, if the reward was anything to go by. For skill points would be a massive boon at this point, even with the 15 I had still to allocate. This was cause for concern and made me draw my lost pistol on a hunch. Maybe the sniper shooting at me had not been as random as I had first assumed. For the love of the Holy Emperor, please don't tell me that I have somehow been roped into 40k politics. I am not touching that garbage fire with a 200 feet pole. I thought to myself as the possibilities started popping up in my head. 
The political world of the Imperium was as hellish and confusing as the battlefields they fought on. Dozens of different administrative branches, all with their own separate power and secret agendas, working together in the most fragile of ways, with corruption running at an all-time high. Bribes, favors, backroom deals, threats, murder, conflicting interests, and obligation to the Imperium all rolled up into one neat clusterfuck of power-hungry idiots, all squabbling over whatever scraps they could steal from each other while minimizing their loss. This was dangerous territory if I was right. The wrong comment here, the lack of a compliment there, everything could lead to a planetary governor, for some reason or another, to decide they did not like you and would want you removed from the galaxy. After all, the true and rightful rulers could not be expected to deal with something as menial as someone else living if their existence bothered said rulers. I prayed it was a just one of the commissars that had taken notice of me, planning some nefarious suicidal task that needed a volunteer force of outstanding individuals that could be sacrificed for the greater gain. At least that would offer me the chance to look my enemy in the eye when they cut me open. If it was the politics, then I would just get my throat slit at some point, with a murderer that had disappeared before my body hit the ground. The lift rattled on as my mind raced. My stomach rumbled, so I pulled out a ration of Soylen's Viridians and slowly ate the bland and flavorless food while I thought things over. Suddenly, a crushing feeling of dread and rage washed over and through me, with paranoia burning in every crevice in my mind and my hands trembling from the rage I scanned my surroundings, looking for something, anything I could rip apart. Anything that would make this feeling go away? As quickly as it had come, it was gone again and I was left on my hands and knees, panting for breath and trying to get my body and mind under control again. What the hell just happened? Was it a psychic barrier or field I passed through? An intrusive power from the warp? A psyker trying to attack my mind? That? That was an unpleasant and scary experience. A very solid reminder that as much as my power was growing, I was an insignificantly small mote of dust, floating around in a large room of flower piles. As much as I didn't want to, I immediately put five points into my will stat. These mental intrusions and effects were getting too frequent and too overwhelming for my liking. This put it at a solid 13, almost doubling it. Sure, it might be an action brought on by lingering paranoia, but I had consistently underestimated the power of psychers and psychic abilities since my arrival and I was done having my mind messed with in this way. Another thought struck me out of the blue. The last time something like this happened, my alignment was changed. It was the only circumstance I had been able to narrow it down to. On a whim, I kneeled and started reciting some of the litanies I had picked up while underway, and I slowly felt the residual anger and paranoia dissipate in favor of a serene sense of calm and peace of mind. As I prayed, a small golden blinking started in the corner of my eye. I hadn't seen that color notification before, but I finished my prayers before I opened it. Gaufrukinst. Opening the notification flooded me with a batch of new notifications. I was confused beyond reason. Gaufru? Cleansing? What the hell was happening? I started on the new notifications. Achievement unlocked. The root of chaos. Chaos and warp energies latch onto people and objects in near vicinity to them. These energies gather into a chaos flux which functions as an anchor for new energies to be drawn towards. The act of sincerely reciting the Emperor's prayers while the flux is active will tear it apart and expel the energies back to the warp. Unlocking this achievement will grant you the ability to see the aura of chaos energies that would activate a flux. Achievement unlocked. Cleanser of chaos. Successfully cleanse an active chaos flux within yourself. Plus one will. Achievement unlocked. Are you metagaming? Complete an advanced task outside of your designated skills. Unlock psychic abilities. Wait, and oh. I do not want this. Do not give me access to the warp. Asterisk ding asterisk. Shit, new notification. No, I am not doing it. I am not opening it. No. With a heavy sigh, I opened the new notification. Psyker subclass unlocked. You have unlocked the Psyker subclass, please choose a specialty among the following. Biomancy. Divination. Pyromancy. Telekinesis. Telepathy. Well, this was a different kind of mystery altogether. I had never paid much mind to the psychic lore of Warhammer back home and that would most likely come back to bite me in the ass now. Biomancy and pyromancy sounded alike, so where pyromancy most likely had something to do with heat and fire, I suspected that biomancy had something to do with biological matter. 
Divination sounded like prediction of some sort, maybe reading the future? That left telepathy and telekinesis. I didn't have anyone I wanted to talk to in this world, and speaking in other people's minds without proper authorization from the Imperium was almost a guaranteed execution as a heretic. So, that left telekinesis. But I wasn't sure. I couldn't be sure. But I had to choose eventually. Along with the rest of my ten points. I took a look at my updated status screen. Human. Level 5. Stat points remaining, 10. Alignment, Faithful Imperial Plus. Litanies, 27. Augmentations, Cybernetic Lung Upgrade LVL1, Toxins Slash Environment. Level, 5267 Slash 9600. Strength, 11. Agility, 9. Perception, 10. Will, 13. Luck, 20. Psyche, 1 Slash 500. Skills. Feats. Abilities asterisk. Wait, what was with the plus sign next to my alignment? What the hell was going on? Every time I thought I had this system figured out, something new appeared. And now I had a psyche stat with what I assumed was a progress counter. I ran through the other tabs again and ended up finding a new ability. Get up guardsman, this ability grants the user the ability to push through what would otherwise be incapacitating damage and keep on fighting. One use per week. Endurance, Tier 2, Level 7, Note, Planetary Bonus Applied. Danger Instinct, Living in a world where danger is relative and death waits around the corner of every new day have granted you the ability to sense malicious intent towards you. Natural Bluffing, Since your arrival, you have spent a considerable amount of time during conversation lying and twisting the truth. You have been granted the Natural Bluffing feat. Which site asterisk, use your psychic abilities to ered the aura and intent of those around you. Well, I guess that explains what comes next. I have to use my abilities to level them up. But psychic abilities are never safe to use, especially not as an unsanctioned psyker within the Imperium. If I get discovered I can look forward to a very short and excruciatingly painful future. Suddenly, I recalled a sentence from the guardsman's uplifting primer. Harboring or withholding information regarding one he knows to be touched by the warp. Sentence, who will be whipped, have his eyes put out, and then hung until dead. The Emperor will have his revenge on the unclean denizens of the warp. Any soldier who, through his own will or not, becomes touched by the warp in any way and becomes impure and a danger to security will be the beneficiary of the Emperor's mercy. The Emperor's mercy, of course, being a bolt round to the face, conveniently placed there by the nearest commissar. This, this is not what I wanted. This is not what I wished for. Using my psychic power around the wrong people would spell death for me. But for me to know which people were safe and unsafe, I would have to use my powers. And every time psychic powers were used, there was a chance that some malicious entity would take notice and decide that life would be less boring if they interfered with the warp user. In theory, anything could happen, from the area starting to smell of sulfur and rotten eggs, to becoming an unbound demon host, allowing a lesser or greater demon to tear a hole between realities and manifest itself in real space, consuming the psyker in question in the process. It was a dangerous power to wield and even more dangerous power to actively use. This? This meant I had to dive back into the underhive at some point. But I would have to find a way out of my current PDF outfit to do so, and preferably one that did not involve me faking my death. The lift continued rattling but it had become lighter and the air was fresher, so I was nearing the surface once more. It was time to put my own plans behind me and fall into the role of a regular PDF trooper for as long as it was needed to ensure my safety. Well, safety was a relative concept, but a role that would not get me executed at first chance. As the lift reached the top and I opened the door, I was assaulted by the sounds and smells of the bustling civilian area of the Hive City under Imperial control. Vendors, beggars, whores, doomsday prophets, drug peddlers, muggers, regular citizens, and everything in between made up the flowing crowd that seemed to be never-ending. Nobody spared me more than a passing glance, only briefly stopping on me to wonder why a PDF trooper would have been alone in the underhive, but there was too much going on for me to draw any meaningful attention, so I made my way towards the barracks area. There were bound to be a few campfires going where I could charge my power packs. A quick rummaging of my backpack how revealed that I only had the half-charged packs in my weapons to spare, the other ten were depleted. If I got in another fight before I got to charge them, I would be more than useless. I would have to stay nearby while they were charged. Guardsmen and PDF troopers were downright infamous for the ability to acquire AI items and war gear that was not their own. 
Thieves and pickpockets back home never even came close to this level of expertise. The black market among the regular troopers, as a result, was brimming with everything from extra rations to body modifications that would make a mechanicus adept squirt copious amounts of oil in pure excitement. I had thought of getting in on the action, but I had no idea what services I could offer that others could not offer at a cheaper price, on account of their connections to, well, anyone. I would have to test my new power pack grenades and see how effective they were. Perhaps I could make a black market business of modifying gear for others. I had not met any people able to modify technology yet, but then again, technology was very weird in this universe. My loss rifle wouldn't fire if I did not say the prayers of loading and unloading when putting in a new power pack, for example. It was a weird way of things, but I went with the flow. Nothing else to do if I wanted to live. It only took 15 or so minutes for me to make the walk back to the designated barracks section of the hive where I quickly found a nice campfire to charge my packs in. I would have to wait a few hours for them to be properly charged and I saw the troopers that passed by sending avarice-filled glances toward the pile of power packs, but a single look at me was enough to make them keep walking. Not that I was a particularly intimidating character to look at, but nobody wanted trouble with their fellow troopers, and while everyone stole from everyone, it was a completely different thing if you got caught doing it. It was during this waiting period that I heard the step of hard leather boots approaching in that controlled and foreboding manner that was unique to the commissars. It was hard to suppress the instinct to look up, but a commissar's attention was not something you wanted under any circumstance, and since just looking at them could elicit an impromptu morale improvement accession. As they got closer, I could feel the tension in my body rise and see it in the troopers that were visible in the corner of my eye. He was walking too slowly to be going anywhere, which meant he was looking for someone or something. I breathed a silent sigh of relief as he passed by me, but it was short-lived. Barely a half dozen steps passed where I was sitting with my back turned, watching the fire and my power packs, I heard him come to a stop and then the gravel under his boot crunching as he spun on his heel. Five more steps and a voice rang out behind me, Where have you been, trooper? Ah, shit! Chapter 16 If grim dark is what I get, then grim dark is what I shall become. I scrambled to my feet as quickly as I could, making sure I made the sign of the Aquila as I did. As I made eye contact with the commissar I noticed how old he was. His face was a mask of wrinkles and old scars, his skin was graying and his hands looked crooked and gnarly. But he had a gaze of sharp steel and right now his entire focus was centered on me. Ave Imperator, Commissar. I quickly said. I have been indisposed on account of serious injury, but since receiving the attention of a Medici asterisk I find myself once more able to perform my duties in the name of the Emperor. Sure, I was laying it on a bit thick, but the commissars knew the power they wielded and the fear it inspired in the men around them. In any case, I would rather be accused of embellishing the truth a bit than of trying to shirk my imperial duties. The commissar narrowed his eyes in suspicion. This was not his first rodeo. Why have you not reported to your company commander? The question was fired at me like a bolt, but I had my answer ready. My power packs were almost all used up, Commissar, and I had to charge them back up before I could be of proper use in combat. I wished to report back for duty, ready to take on my responsibilities from the moment I stood in front of my commander. Shit, I just hoped it was good enough to avoid a firing squad. The grizzled old Commissar stared me down for a few seconds as if trying to recall my face before he spoke again. I remember you from the initial charge into the hive. You rallied the troops around you and pushed the objective, allowing us to gain a foothold. I recall the commissar stopping, actually stopping, during the charge into the city, to stare at me when I used my rallying ability, to me brothers, eh. I had been worried back then, and now those worries returned with a vengeance, as it dawned on me that an overzealous commissar would execute me on principle. I couldn't be an unsanctioned psyker if I was dead. A crude, yet extremely pragmatic and effective way of looking at things. The commissar continued staring me down for what felt like an eternity and I saw his pistol hand twitch several times as if he was fighting an instinct to blast my body into a pile of goo on the ground. Finally, he spoke again, we will meet again trooper, and soon at that. Do not die in the meantime. The emperor has a glorious death planned for you. With that, he spun on his heel and walked away at a brisk pace, making his retinue jog to keep up with him. It wasn't until he walked away that I noticed the slender, red-haired woman that followed him, and the only reason I noticed her was on account of her turning her head back to me and winking as she walked away. It was the mysterious woman who, for lack of a better word, used me, though I must admit I do not mind in the slightest. Not counting the lung damage, of course. 
But what struck me was not the fact that she was here, but the fact that she was wearing the uniform of a high-ranking member of the Ordo Hereticus asterisk asterisk. I slowly exhaled as I watched them disappear in the distance and I noticed my hands trembling from suppressed fear of dying. I needed to find a way out of the PDF and fast. Every interaction with anyone above the rank and file soldiers was potentially dangerous for me. My knowledge of this universe was not complete nor perfect and eventually, I would slip up on something rudimentary which would cause enough suspicion about me to grant me a very swift execution, maybe with a bit of extreme torture and mind probing before I died. Add to that the worries of having had a romantic encounter with a freaking inquisitor of the Ordo Hereticus I was well and truly fucked. I spent the remaining time waiting for my power packs to charge, trying to get my emotions under control. It was becoming too much, I was getting overwhelmed, always on edge, always on the watch, and always mindful of my actions and words. The stress was getting to me. As soon as the first pack was charged I immediately began fiddling with it to give my mind something else to think about. I soon figured out that if I was to turn them into power pack grenades, I would have to use them immediately after changing the settings, as it happened by overloading the pack rather than change any settings on it, so there went the idea of using them as a black market selling items. Unless… I pushed the thought back, it would have to wait. My power packs were charged and I had no desire to give the commissars any sort of reason to cast more suspicion my way. My rallying of the troops had already made them center their crosshairs on me and the grizzled one that had just talked to me had made it plain that plans were being made that involved me. With a heavy sigh, I gathered my things and packed my pockets and backpack, found a clean-ish water source to refill my primary canteen and the ones I had looted as well, double-checked my weapons and equipment, and hurried back to the area where my unit was currently stationed. It took me almost two hours to reach the area, as I got lost in the hive on several occasions, these things were not built as hives, to begin with, and the city planning was all but non-existent. When I finally arrived I was greeted with extreme indifference, if not outright hostility. I shouldn't be surprised. The Inquisitor that had infiltrated the PDF troopers had been the object of desire for almost every man and many of the women in my unit and seeing her decide on me had been the perfect soil for resentment and envy on their part. No doubt they had hoped I was dead and gone, thereby making it a possibility that they would be the next lucky pick of what they thought to be a regular trooper like the rest of us. Knowing what I did now, I also realized just how much danger I had been in last night. A single misunderstood word or gesture, the slightest inclination that I was more than a regular trooper with fervorous faith, and she would have killed me with a casual ease that sent shivers down my spine. I quickly fell into the rhythm of things once more. Guard duty, patrol duty guard duty, rest and refuel, repeat. Throw in the occasional skirmish with hive gangers so drugged up they thought they had a chance against established bulkheads of bunkers and trenches with three or four fallback positions that left the enemy extremely exposed should they decide to take the defensive positions given up by us, and probing attacks from the rebellious elements within the hive. It was obvious they were being orchestrated as they never attacked for long or with any commitment and they never attacked the same target twice. They were either searching for a weak spot or trying to get a sense of our defensive capabilities. The days passed, I got an occasional kill during the attacks, I waited in a more or less permanent state of stress for the commissar's words to come true, and nothing happened. And it was slowly tearing me apart. I found myself taking more chances during engagements, I became more snappy and aggressive toward my fellow troopers, and I stopped caring about the people I killed. About the lives they may have lived and the people that might be waiting for them. The waiting was eating away at me, as was the constant lure of psychic powers, but with an inquisitor around, you would have better luck pissing against a strong wind and hoping to not get wet than you would be finding me using my witch sight. I also threw my last 10 skill points into luck, putting it at a very solid 30. With luck like that I would not have to worry about it for a while and I could focus on my other skills for the next few levels. I also started pilfering supplies with the same enthusiasm as the rest of the soldiers around me, but since alcohol was hard to hide unless you had accomplices, I opted for his second desired item and focused on stealing, looting, pickpocketing, scamming, and pilfering Soylen's viridians to the very best of my ability. It reached a point where I managed two bottles of alcohol which I used to barter for an extra backpack to store my loot in. Through trial and error, I had managed to figure out the lock on the room I was in, giving me a safe place to keep said backpack, though I did pack my bed with it in such a way that it looked like a sleeping person. After a week, I had two days of rest coming up and I decided to go back to the underhive to settle the first part of the greedy doctor's deal. It was not hard to find a dozen or so people that wanted to go get drunk in the underhive and as a large group, we would be fairly safe. 
the ride down was fairly uneventful and mostly silent. The only thing binding all of us together was the uniform, but I had a plan. The others had questioned my backpack, but I had shrugged it off with a comment about needing to trade a few things. I took to the front when we got down and quickly found the same bar as before. Figuring I could use a few friends among the troopers as well as a reputation boost, I walked up to the bar and ordered six bottles of Amasek, a potent, wine-like alcoholic beverage that was all around popular. Sure, underhive quality was nothing to write home about, but it smelled infinitely better than the rot gut I had partaken in last time. Bringing the bottles down to the tables that had been cleared of drunks and junkies and pushed together for the group. The smiles on the faces of my fellow troopers told me I had made a good choice in alcohol. First round is on me. I declared and put the bottles on the table, helping myself to a hearty swig in the process. It would still be considered poor quality back home, but if Rotgut was under hive standard, then this was indeed a proper wine in comparison. Made from grains strong enough to use as a firebomb, but quite pleasant in its taste, it was a drink I could get used to drinking. I excused myself after a few minutes and headed for the doctor. I was stopped by a very bored and very big guard as soon as I got to the door. Where do you think you are going? The doctor is busy. Then you can explain to the grumpy goat why he must continue eating corpse starch when I get better things for him. I snapped back. I was already done with this whole thing. The doctor had to go. This might only be food, but I could have traded it for other things that would have proven immediately useful to me. This grumpy goat would prefer you to show a bit of respect. Came the voice of the doctor from inside and I pushed the guard aside. Respect is earned, not given, I stated just to piss him off, and it worked. You better be bringing something good for me. He snapped, and as I opened the backpack, I saw him eyeing the rations with obvious delight. At least you know how to listen when given directions, which is more than I can say for some people. The last words were directed over his shoulder toward the door. The guard was not in as high favor as he could have wished, it would seem. I hope this is a good start, at least. I said, trying to play to the belief that I had accepted my fate, and he confirmed. A few more runs like this and I will have to start paying you. I foresee a very profitable partnership between the two of us, the doctor declared as he was already munching on a ration bar. I saw no reason to correct him, but if that was how he felt about this situation, I could already think of a few ways to get out of this situation, but that was in the long term. For now, it was all about appearances. If you say so. Are we done? I have people waiting for me. I asked and after he nodded, I turned around and left immediately. I quickly made it back to the bar where several more bottles had found the table and I went by the bar to get another fresh batch before I sat back down. I was greeted with a lot more vigor than initially, proving once more that a small gesture of goodwill combined with some booze was still a good way to worm your way into people's good graces. I was surprised though that it didn't take more than a few bottles of Amasek to change their opinion of me so drastically. I spent the next few hours just having a few drinks and relaxing with the others, and as we packed up to go back topside, I quickly bought two extra bottles that were stuffed into my backpack. One of them might have been a more expensive bottle than most of the ones available, and I would be lying if it wasn't to make a good impression on the redhead inquisitorial agent. Dangerous as she was, I had seen her from a different side and I had decided I would enjoy this life while it lasted. I had already beaten the average lifespan of a PDF trooper, so might as well. And back to the daily routine, I went. On my next trip, I added a power pack I managed to win during gambling. There was a myriad of different games being played in the soldiers' free time, mostly dice or cards, and all the different cultural backgrounds provided by the literal million worlds that made up the Imperium asterisk asterisk asterisk, provided me with all the excuses I needed to introduce games of my own. Poker quickly gained popularity since many could play at once and it required you to think when playing, a valued trait as it tricked you into forgetting your bleak existence for a few hours, chasing that dopamine rush of winning. What most of the new troopers didn't know was that in poker you do not play the cards, but rather the people at the table. It allowed me to make winnings in imperial crowns rather than goods for bartering, slowly giving me the need to store the growing sum of money in the bottom of my extra backpack. It also made me worried about thievery and I set about trying to figure out a way to keep things safe. I ended up taking one of my frag grenades and tying the top of the pack to the safety pin before carefully closing the entire thing. Unless you knew it was there, you would never discover the trap before the telltale ping as the striker lever activated the chemical delay inside the grenade. At that point, the explosion would be exactly two seconds away. The first time I put the whole thing together, I got a new notification. 
Skill granted, improvised trap making. Tier 1, level 1. How interesting. I got a feeling this would be a very useful skill to have. Leveling it would definitely be in my best interest, looking forward. Maybe I could even figure out a way to combine it with my power pack grenades. If only I could figure out a way to make the explosion happen when I wished for it and not on an overload timer. One morning, after rigging my backpack trap and heading for my designated post, she was there again. Red hair, standard PDF trooper uniform, and a crooked smile on her face, she was standing at the spot where my watch partner would be standing, watching me and waiting. This was going to be quite an interesting day. Chapter 17, A Very Special Offer I groaned mentally as I laid my eyes on her. It was a weird mix of emotions, on one hand, I still desired her. The memories of our night together were still very livid in my mind, and her position within the Ordo Hereticus would explain her access to Kixa, but her position as either a full-on Inquisitor or an infiltration agent working for an Inquisitor filled me with anxiety. You look like you could go for another round, she called out as I got closer. So it was a friendly visit so far. I would not be opposed to the idea, I replied as I got closer. Though, knowing what I know now, I am a bit surprised to see you here. She got a serious look on her face as I said that and I wondered if I had gone too far. You have been watched ever since your first rallying cry back on Carrick. At first, we suspected you were an unsanctioned psyker, but after our little rendezvous, it became clear that this was not the case. So I decided I might as well have a bit of fun in the completion of my duties. You were my first deathworlder, but with the endurance your kind has, most definitely not the last. She winked at me as she said this, despite the serious implications of her words. Was that why my danger instinct was always tingling ever so slightly? So what has warranted this pleasant surprise during my duties? I asked. If I had gotten my psychic powers just two days before, I would not have lived through that night and the realization made me sweat with nervous energy. The Ordo Hereticus took a special interest in you. Why do you think your life was saved? You might be a good lay, but not that good, trooper. She said with a voice full of mirth. This made me think. If the Ordo Hereticus saved my life, they would most likely want something in return. But what could the Inquisition want from me? I was just a PDF trooper in their eyes. I think you better explain to me exactly what it is the Inquisition wishes of me, so that I may do my best to fulfill their wishes, I said in a measured tone. This was deeper than random conversation, though it was cleverly disguised as such. The subtle body language told its own story and my investment in perception was paying off. I couldn't pinpoint exactly how I knew or what made me aware, but I knew she had a hidden agenda with this conversation. She fixed me with a cold stare and all of a sudden I saw her for what she was. A trained killer, obedient to the point of fanaticism, willing to kill as casually as one would drink water, and completely focused on achieving her mission. As you well know, she began, the Ordo Hereticus are wary about the rogue traitor's asterisk and the potential for heresy that is present within their occupation. However, it is extremely difficult to keep track of these imperial servants, on account of their rather special field of work. This has in turn led the ecclesiarchy to conclude that rogue traders, working for the Inquisition, is the only way to get some semblance of control over the situation. This is why I am here. You and a select few others have been chosen as possible candidates for such a position. And between you and me you are in a rather favorable position. You have the ability to rally soldiers around you, a valued trait since you would often find yourself without any other support that can fit on a starship. And of course, there would have to be an inquisitorial agent on board, to report back at regular intervals. And since I already know how pleasant company you can be, I have taken the liberty of recommending you very highly. It would make the travels so much more bearable. She said the last words with a voice that was laced with promises of reenacting our last night together and I had to kick myself mentally in the groin to not start grinning like a madman. Wait, I interjected, you are the inquisitorial agent chosen to travel with said rogue trader? Yes. She confirmed. Why else would I be the one to tell you about this? You have a good point there. Was that also the reason to sleep with me? I asked. I was not sure I wanted to hear the answer, but it was out there now. No, that was just a pleasant way to pass the time. Your possessions have also been searched multiple times. Nice trap by the way, almost went off last time. So far, nothing but indications of a faithful imperial soldier. But you already know this. You are still alive. She explained. This gave me pause. It was true that the fact I was still breathing was more than enough proof they had not found anything wrong with me. 
but that did not exclude the possibility of them finding out I actually was an unsanctioned psyker. And it wouldn't even be a quick death. As an unsanctioned psyker, they would most likely round me up on one of the black ships asterisk asterisk where I would eventually be sacrificed to the emperor to keep him alive for another day. So what is this? A test of how I am to spend any prolonged time with. I asked, trying to find her angle. Partly. She confirmed. And partly to see what kind of company you are. And finally, I wish to observe you doing your job. It will tell me a lot about your sense of duty. I had to agree with that logic. If they for some insane reason should choose to grant me the status of rogue trader, I would experience a level of freedom that was very seldomly experienced in this universe, even by those at the highest echelons of power. Perhaps my luck stat was finally doing something else besides keeping me alive. Not that I was complaining, I appreciated not being dead. But a way out of this hell of a situation would also be good. On a whim, I asked, who are the other candidates? It has been elected that the candidates will not be introduced to each other, nor be made aware of the other candidate's identity, to avoid any foul play. She said smoothly. But let's not talk about that. Why not come over here and let me know if you missed me? Her mischievous smile spelled promises of endless joy, but something she said moments before made me hesitate. I did miss you terribly, but right now I am on guard duty and I cannot shirk that responsibility. As much as I want to, it cannot happen while I am on the job. I said, my groin screaming at me in protest and my brain patting my shoulder for being the responsible adult. Apparently, it was the right thing to say because not a moment later she pulled out a small notepad and immediately wrote down a few words. Well done, you managed to avoid being turned into a servitor. You would be surprised how many failed that test. There was something about her chipper tone of voice that told me she wasn't joking and I once again shuddered with suppressed fear and anxiety. Just how far did the power of this woman reach? We spent the shift making idle small talk and watching for hive gangers or heretic troopers. Unsurprisingly, it was a boring watch with nothing happening except the dozens of soldiers swinging by and trying to make their move on the redhead. I found it all quite entertaining as she was quite adept at shooting down their hopes and dreams without being mean about it. It didn't stop them from staring daggers at me as they walked away, but I was not surprised. I had already been through that mill the first time she showed interest in me. I took great care in praying diligently and on time, doing my hardest to make it seem like a natural and ingrained part of my daily routine and I noticed her well-hidden satisfaction when I excused myself for prayers, moments before it was time. I prayed with fervor and sincerity, silently praying that it would be enough to satisfy any doubts she might have had. The rest of the day passed in peaceful boredom and when the changing of the guard occurred I gathered my things as she came over to me. See you tomorrow, trooper. She said and turned to walk off. I still don't know your name. I exclaimed after her and she answered without turning around. It's Elris. See you, Bjorke. Wait, how did she know my name? I never told her and nothing in my gear carries my full name. I narrowed my eyes and followed her with my eyes. More on instinct than through conscious choice, I activated which sight without thinking and was immediately rewarded with a heavy aura around Elris. She was a psyker. As soon as I realized what I had just done, I immediately turned it off again, but she had already noticed. She had stopped and was looking around, trying to find the source of the new psychic energy that came into play around her. Just as quickly I resumed picking up my stuff and casually walked away, doing my best to not reveal the sheer terror that was running through my body. Every instinct screamed to look behind me and check if she was looking at me, but nothing would make me seem more guilty at the moment. Then checking her reaction. I made it back to my small room without any trouble and I threw myself on my cot, but I couldn't sleep. I had been so close to ending my own life without even thinking about it. I needed to get better control of myself. I didn't have the slightest idea of how to do that, but I tried meditation back home before I was transported here, so it was worth a try. I settled into a sitting position and closed my eyes, trying to find a calm center within myself. I focused my mind on my breathing and let go of everything around me. Slowly, gradually, the stress and anxiety that had built up during the day left me and allowed me to relax mentally. When I finally felt relaxed enough to open my eyes, Elris was sitting in front of me, legs crossed and a smile on her face. I have never seen a trooper focus their mind that way. Usually, only the Astartes will spend their time doing that. You are a strange one. She said thoughtfully as she looked me over. Well, you did throw a lot onto my plate today. I needed to clear my mind so I can focus on my duties. 
I replied with a half smile. Well, one of your duties is waiting for you to get to it. Unless you were lying when you said you missed me? She was coy and playful as she pulled away from me, but it was all a ruse. She was just as eager as I was, and I only hesitated for a moment when she pulled out another stick of Kixa, but I decided to put my trust in my new cybernetic lungs, and the high brought every sensation up to eleven. Underscore 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 underscore. When I woke up, the first thing I noticed was that I was not alone. An arm was draped over my chest and my face was hidden behind a mess of red hair. So she stayed this time. I was not complaining but I did wonder why. Slowly and gently, I untangled myself from her and slipped into my uniform pants, made my way outside, and started looking for a quartermaster to get some recaf from. It didn't take long and the short line in front of him quickly diminished. When it was my turn, I noticed a glint of recognition in the eyes of the man on the other side of the table. Great, another envious soul to deal with. I need recaf, extra rations, and my daily portion of water, I told him. Water in hive cities was controlled by the water guild which was in charge of distributing every drop of water in a hive city. From the imported ice water sipped on by nobles to the runoff sluice used in the industries of the hive, everything went through the water guild. Not that the Imperium lacked the means to get water from them, but there was a tight hold on every drop. No can do, supply restrictions prevent me from handing out any more without special authorization. But there are ways to expedite the process. He said with a sly smile while rubbing his thumb and index finger against each other in a universal sign for payment. With a heavy sigh, I started the bartering process, but the quartermaster seemed very intent on ripping me off in the most extraordinary way. And I couldn't seem to get anything near a decent deal. After about ten minutes of the idiot becoming more and more outrageous in his demands, I noticed a commissar walking just within earshot and I had a brilliant if despicable idea. No, I will not pay you to hand out my daily rations. I bellowed loud enough for the commissar to hear. The quartermaster turned pale and made hidden gestures for me to quiet down, but it was too late. The commissar had heard me and was stomping over toward the quartermaster booth with his bolt pistol already drawn and a scowl on his face so menacing I almost felt sorry for the poor fool. What is the meaning of this? Explain yourself. He demanded from the quartermaster as he leveled the bolt pistol at his head. Nothing but a simple misunderstanding, commissar, I assure you. The man stammered, I misunderstood the intent of this trooper and thought he asked for more rations than he was allotted, which of course would require payment. But now I understand that he only wished to be given what is rightfully his. As he spoke, he was manifesting things from behind the counter of his booth and putting them on the table in front of me. Even the recaf I had requested was put there. A small apology for the misunderstanding. He said as he placed the last recaf. No apology needed, it was an honest mistake. How many crowns do I owe for the recaf? I asked, and the commissar kept switching his gaze between the two of us. The quartermaster named a price that was many times lower than what he demanded from me a minute ago and the commissar seemed. Well, not satisfied, but placated at least, and he walked away, still clutching his bolt pistol. As soon as he was out of earshot, I turned back to the quartermaster. Next time you try to rip me off, I am not saving your fat ass. I snarled at him and he could only nod meekly as I gathered my things and headed back to my room. I had barely made it inside before I heard Elris speak. For a moment I thought you had repaid me the favor of disappearing before you woke up, she sounded like she had just woken up and she stretched out on my cot, the blanket sliding provocatively down from her ample chest, revealing that she slept in the nude, a fact that had escaped me when I woke up. How, I did not know, but her eyes lit up at the sight of the recaf. Oh, I am definitely recommending you for the position. She exclaimed and made grabby hands at the mug in my hand, but I pulled it away from her and smiled. What are you offering in return? I asked and she was completely floored by the question. It was obvious she was used to being in charge, but I wanted to flip that script. She needed to learn that I was not going to roll over whenever she whistled. Well, she said as she leaned backward, exposing herself to me. I can't offer you anything you have not had before, but I think you will enjoy it just as much. And that was all it took for me to hand over the cup. Damn my male biology and its influence over my mental faculties. She sipped the recaf with a delighted look on her face and I decided to distract myself by making breakfast. Not that it required a lot of work, field rations are fairly simple and can be eaten cold, but it gave me something to think about other than the naked woman drinking recaf three feet away. 
After breakfast, she slipped out of my room after getting dressed and I sat down to take a breather. I was slightly on edge when she was nearby, the revelation she was a psyker filled me with dread. If I wanted to explore the psychic possibilities, I either needed to convince her I was a sanctioned psyker, which was next to impossible, try and train on my own without getting caught, which was even less likely, or get rid of her at some point. Of course, I could always just forget everything about my psychic abilities, but being a psyker always presented a danger just by being one. And the best weapon against the denizens of the warp was, quite ironically, psychic powers fueled by the warp. I would like to avoid the murder of an inquisitorial agent if at all possible, but once out among the stars, anything could happen. Of course, there was a possibility she would be fine with my psychic powers, but then again. The ecclesiarchy was one of, if not the most fanatical faction in this entire universe, and their inquisition had almost unlimited freedom of power. They could even order around Astartes' chapters, something that otherwise was unthinkable unless you were looking for suicide by chain's word. I decided to push the musing aside and quickly down the last of my ration before I grabbed my gear and headed out for another day of patrol duty. But it was not to be. My commanding officer found me on the way and told me I had been given a couple of days off to spend as I saw fit. Not wanting to challenge my luck I hurried away and decided to start the first part of my plan to get rid of the troublesome blackmailing doctor in the underhive. I had to sacrifice a power pack to start the plan, but it would be a good expenditure. A quick trip into the underhive and the doctor's face lit up at the sight of the power pack and the extra rations, he inspected the power pack, found it to be functional and fully charged, then looked at me as he said, I half expected you to bring me something broken and empty, not a power pack in excellent condition and fully charged as well. I snorted at his comment. Maybe you just forgot how it feels to work with people that possess a minimum of integrity. You saved my life, the least I can do in return is to properly deliver on our agreement. The insult did not go over his head and he cocked an eyebrow at me before he started laughing. You deathworlders and your strange sense of honor. Not that I'm complaining. If you can get more power packs, my payment will be due in a very short time. I just smiled and nodded. He thought me complacent and agreeable. Perfect. The next delivery would be his death. As I was about to make my way back to the surface, I could hear rhythmic stomping approaching rapidly and I hurried over to a bar and ordered a bottle of Amasek. Better to appear as a trooper out for a drink. Moments later, a squad of Arbites asterisk 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 came running rapidly around the corner, their carapace armor donned, despite being reserved for direct combat, and the mix of bolt guns, shotguns, grenade launchers, suppression shields, and power mauls already in their hands and ready to fire. They continued toward the deeper slum of the underhive, so it would seem a raid was in progress and I wanted as little to do with that as possible, so I stashed the bottle in my backpack and hurried on my merry way to the lift. It wasn't until I reached the lift that a thought hit me. The Arbites ran straight past us. Despite there being numerous shops selling all manner of illegal items and controlled substances, they had run right past us with a clear goal in mind. But there had been no sounds of fighting. The Arbites only moved with such purpose when they were trying to catch someone or something, completely unaware which usually only happened with gang lords and heretical dealings. And since the gang lords were quite safe, that left only the heretical dealings as the possibility which meant I needed to get my happy little ass out of there as fast as possible. The lift had barely been underway for one minute before an explosion could be heard deeper in the underhive and the muffled sounds of heavy gunfire followed. Thank the emperor I made it out of there. After waiting and listening to the sounds of gunfire disappearing in the darkness below me, I reached the top and almost walked into Elris and the commissar from the last time she was wearing her inquisitor's uniform. The strange one. The old commissar growled and gave me a critical stare. What could you possibly be doing in the underhive trooper? Just securing provisions for myself and a lucky lady, Commissar, I said as I made the Aquila across my chest. No reason to risk a public flogging for failure to salute. Elris, standing behind the Commissar, smirked at my words and winked at me. Provisions, he says. The Commissar exclaimed theatrically. Well, why don't we go over those provisions together? With pleasure, Commissar, I said compliantly and opened my backpack. The only thing down there was a couple of rations, my extra power packs, and the bottle of Amasek I had just purchased. The commissar's eyes lit up at the sight of the bottle and I knew he would confiscate it before I had shown it to him. No matter, this was the basic stuff anyway. I had a better vintage stuffed away in my room, well hidden in my dirty clothes. Elris's confession to having rummaged through my belongings had made me change some of my habits. 
Thankfully, the precious bottle was hidden in the dirty clothes as soon as I brought it back. I better confiscate that bottle, trooper. No reason to risk you falling for temptation and getting drunk on duty. He growled again, and I had to agree with that logic, despite me not being much of a drinker. I had already seen two soldiers get caught being drunk on sentry duty and the punishment was flogging followed by shooting. Why on earth they bothered flogging them before they shot them I will never understand, but then again, the Imperium is not exactly known for its logic and good common sense. Elris looked crestfallen as the commissar stuffed the bottle inside his jacket, but I just kept smiling. She must have caught on that I had something planned so she just cast an inquisitive look in my direction. I didn't react to it, but I spoke again. Thank you for relieving me of the temptation, Commissar. May I be dismissed? I have prayers to attend to. As much as he wanted to search my person for more items to confiscate or execute me for having, the Commissar could not in good conscience deny me my prayers in front of an inquisitorial agent. Reluctantly, he sent me on my way, but Elris hung back to talk to me. A shame, I would have liked to enjoy that bottle with you. She said. I knew she was being nice, her position afforded her the economy to acquire Kixa, so she would be accustomed to a finer palate of alcoholic drinks. Guess I just have to be more careful next time I come back from shopping, I said smoothly, which almost made her laugh, but she stopped herself. That uniform she was wearing represented a special branch of the ecclesiarchy and it would not do to break character out in public. Will I see you again tonight? I asked, with no small amount of hope in my voice. Screw being stoic, right now, Elris was the only positive thing to have entered my life since I came here. Even with the added danger of being found out as a psyker, that just added to the excitement, at least for me. You just might, she answered with delight before she turned on her heel and walked off. I took this chance to make my way back to my room, but I didn't get far. Getting cozy with the redhead again last night, eh? I turned my head as someone called out and saw a shorter-than-average trooper, covered in grime and dirt, his uniform wrinkled and unwashed, his gear in various states of disrepair, and an overall aura of just being a scumbag human being. So what if I am? I retorted, just because you are so smelly and dirty you would be lucky if an underhive whore would cast you a second glance. The troopers that had started paying attention as he called out to me started hooting and hollering at my response. They love drama, anything that would break the boredom. If it came to blows, they would have something new to talk about for weeks. The dirty trooper's face contorted with rage at my words, but he didn't do anything. Fracking deathworlders. He spat, the universe would be better without the lot of you. This made me roar with laughter which was joined in on by several other troopers also hailing from death worlds, that were milling about in the area. Then who would pull your stinking corpse out of the fire whenever you get into a fight, little man? I taunted. Looking him over, I had nothing to fear unless he drew a firearm, and he was not stupid enough to do that. Nobody wanted to receive a field judgment for killing another trooper, especially not since field judgment usually meant death by shooting. He could, of course, still attack me but I doubted he would, so I might as well have a little fun. Eventually she will tire of you and find someone else. He tried, but he knew the verbal battle was lost. And don't call me little. Being more than a head taller than the loudmouthed idiot I couldn't help myself. What are you? The newest edition of Pocket Troopers, for when you need a little soldier for little problems. I continued taunting and it had the intended effect. He took a swing at me, but he was both slow and telegraphing his moves, so I just leaned ever so slightly backward and watched his fist sail past my face and spinning him around in the process. I pushed him gently on the back, making him stumble a few steps in the process. He whirled around and attacked again and again, but I evaded every attack giving him a shove every time he was off balance. He fell over several times and only grew angrier. Are you too scared to fight back? He sneered at me as he took another swing and I caught his wrist as his arm sailed past me yet again, because you are not worth the effort it would take to teach you a lesson in manners, short stack. I replied and pushed him away once more. It would seem I had miscalculated the stupidity of the trooper because the next thing I knew he had drawn his bayonet and was holding it as an experienced soldier would. Solid grip on the handle, blade pointing straight forward, held in front of his torso. He was an experienced knife fighter, but he was still slow. The first stab nearly caught my abdomen, so when he went in for the second attempt, I sidestepped the attack and kicked as hard and fast as I could toward his knee. The loud crunch when my boot impacted with his kneecap told everyone nearby that I had shattered his knee and he fell over, screaming in pain. Before things could escalate further, I hurried away from the scene and retreated to my room. If Elris showed up tonight, it wouldn't be for a few more hours. 
Guess I had to figure out what to focus on next. Committing to securing that rogue trader position or getting rid of that doctor in the underhive. I would have to think long and hard about this while I waited. Chapter 18 How Deep Does This System Run? I was laying in my cot, having an inner debate about my choices, but the rogue trader position was going to be the focal point of my efforts. It would grant me the power to take care of that annoying snitch of a doctor in the underhive without any issues, and more importantly, it would secure me the freedom I was starting to crave. Life had been interesting and new when I first arrived, but every day brought with it the fact that my life as a trooper was meaningless and short-lived, and every battle I survived was a bit of my luck being shaved away. I was becoming disillusioned and I could feel the effects of it. Being free to move about, more or less as I pleased, sounded like the right path for me. I had to come to terms with my way of thinking not aligning with the common imperial citizen and it would get me killed sooner rather than later. Having a warrant of trade or even just a letter of Mark Star. I did not need to create a dynasty as the other rogue traders did. I was deep in thought and musing but I still noticed the footsteps approaching my door. Several people, judging from the multitude of steps, and the door was opened moments later. I was staring at the same old grizzled commissar, Elris, and my regiment commander. I jumped up and made the Aquila, waiting for the order from my regiment commander to relax. It only took them a minute to make me understand why they had come. I was temporarily promoted to lieutenant and given command of two, twenty-man squads of guardsmen each with an attached sergeant. The reason? They wanted to test my leadership abilities and decided the best way to do it was to give me an insufficient force of soldiers and orders to take control of the next section in our path. The small industrial area would be key to securing the ground level of the hive, completely cutting it off from the rest of the planet and thus ensuring the containment of the rebellious elements. The area in and of itself was not that large, but it was the home ground for one of the more troublesome gangs of the city the underhive runners be unofficially employed by one of the more powerful highborn houses and officially one massive pain in the side of the Imperium. Well-equipped, well-trained, absolutely fucking mental when it came to desecrating the dead, the only reason they had not been branded heretics was their use of said desecrated dead to make imperial symbols. No more than a death cult that saw themselves as the heralds of the Emperor's divine will, delivered by having your inner being revealed to his eyes. At least that was the best explanation that had been given by captured gang members. When I pressed for information on the underhive runners, I was informed they totaled close to 200 members at any given time, in the area I was supposed to take, though they would be partying resting and getting drugged out of their minds, with it being their hideout and all. When asked if I had any questions I said a only one. Will I have operational freedom in securing my objective? What are you asking trooper? My regiment commander snapped and I hastened to answer, I am asking if I will be given the freedom and control to direct the troops as I see fit during the assault, sir. The three of them shared a long look before the commissar turned to me with a suspicious glint in his eye, do you see any fault in the imperial doctrine, trooper? He asked me, his voice carefully neutral. I was stepping on extremely volatile ground right now. No, commissar. But imperial doctrine always accounts for superior or equal numbers during an engagement. When outnumbered, even if it's merely five to one against an inferior enemy, there may be the need for adaptation on the battlefield to secure victory in the name of the emperor. Unorthodox, but let's see if it can yield results, Galris said, all of the warmth I had come to know in her voice, gone. She spoke like a true agent of the Inquisition. Cold fervor, analytical judging. Her word, however, seemed to be law among these three although that should not surprise me. Even my regiment commander could do little other than bow and scrape if she truly chose to allow it. And so it came to be that I was swiftly marched over to get a change of uniform and marched out in front of the twenty soldiers that were to accompany me. I was far from impressed and from the smirk on the commissar's face, he had a hand in this. The sergeants looked capable enough, doing their best to make the glorified suicide squad look presentable. They utterly failed. Sagging, small-talking, smoking and doing their very best to look like anything other than a soldier. I sighed deeply as we walked up to them. The two sergeants immediately stood at attention and made the Aquila, as did all the soldiers except one. Before I had time to register what was happening, the commissar jumped forward and grabbed the offending trooper around the neck and started shouting, failure to salute an officer or anyone of higher rank carries the sentence of flogging. Fifty lashes. He turned to the nearest sergeant and barked to sergeant, carry out the punishment, before violently shoving the offending soldier to the ground. The man was quickly stripped of his shirt and tied up with his hands above his head. 
The sergeant had requisitioned a whip at the nearest quartermaster and took up position behind the man before he began the punishment. By the fifth lash, he started screaming from the long snaking wounds the whip created. By the fifteenth he didn't have the strength to scream, but his face still contorted whenever he was struck. By the thirty-fifth lash he started weeping silently, the tears rolling down his face as the blood ran rivers down his back. He finally passed out by the fortieth lash but the last ten were still administered. As his unconscious body hit the ground the commissar ordered him taken to the nearest medici. Such a punishment would not relieve him of his duty, but it would take him off the mission and after leaving for less than two minutes, the commissar came back, dragging a scared and confused trooper behind him. He was quickly shoved into the group of soldiers that had lost a member and a short briefing ensued by the regiment commander. The troopers looked less than pleased but being a deathworlder, I was built taller and stronger than most of them, except one of the sergeants, thus giving them at least some comfort in my abilities to fight and survive. Better than an armchair officer anyway. And so, I was suddenly left in charge of these twenty-two men. Taking a moment to go over the situation, I pulled out a map I had been given of the area we were supposed to take. Industrial, mostly the melting down of scrap metal and pouring of metal into bars. Hot, dangerous, a plethora of places for enemies to hide and take advantage of the shadows, and a fortified position in the back of the area, up against one of the enormous pillars that made up part of the hive base structure. Not much to work with, but I noticed that their territory was bordering another hive gang, the Iron Nails G. Perhaps I knew I could use it to my advantage, but I had yet to figure out how. But it was not all bad. As numerous as the hive gangers were, they were drugged up psychos with little to no formal training. I had trained soldiers under my command. Sure, they were scruffy and looked to lack discipline, but I had a gut feeling that when shit got real, their training would kick in and their natural defiance would see them through to the other side. As much as guardsmen did. I would be lucky if I got away with more than half of them still alive. My sergeants would most likely be the saving grace. Seasoned, competent, and secure in their abilities, they would assuredly push the troopers to the best of their abilities, in the name of survival. With a silent sigh of worry, I gave the order to move out and started leading the men to the area that served as a border between the two gangs. It took almost an hour of navigating around the hive city to arrive near the correct area, and it dawned on me once more just how much larger everything was in this universe, compared to back home. It also illustrated how much ground we had taken so far, which would only increase exponentially until we needed to start taking the levels above ground. They would be repetitions of our initial assault. Punch a hole in the defenses, establish a bridgehead, and start expanding until the level is under our control. And the higher we go, the more difficult our battle will become, because the higher levels are reserved for the wealthier, granting them access to war gear and armor that easily surpasses the quality of the Imperial Guard. But the fate of the hive was sealed the moment we gained a solid foothold inside. From that point forward, all the enemy had to fight for was the number of casualties they could inflict upon us. We finally arrived and took a lift a short way down to reach the construction area that stretched out for miles around. The sound of random skirmishes between gang members flared up and died down in the distance, the roaring of the ovens melting down the endless amounts of scrap, the clanking of the conveyor systems, it all melted together to form a disorienting and overwhelming environment. Add to the mix the orange glow from the melted metals, the yellowish light from the few and random glow globes asterisk 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 that were scattered around the area, and the many dark areas created by the various light sources, and we were walking into a possible death trap. But I had a plan. Or, I had an idea for a plan, but since I was in charge, I had a plan. I found a solid place to hunker down, easy to defend and hard to attack, and helped drag some smaller pieces of equipment over to construct some makeshift barricades. When we were ready, I gave each sergeant three troopers and tasked them with taking pot shots at the different gangs, doing their best to make it seem like the rivals were committing to an attack. I wanted to instigate an all-out war between the two factions and wait in our dark corner while they fought it out. Once the smoke settled, we could move in and finish off the underhive runners while they were bleeding and drained of manpower. All I had to do was be extremely lucky and trust my men to do their part. We watched as the sergeants took their charges and skulked off in different directions, taking careful note of the area so they knew where to retreat once their mission was accomplished. It didn't take more than ten minutes before we heard very aggressive loss gun fire, followed by a mix of loss and stubber fire. The sound of battle would disappear for a few seconds before resuming once more, each time getting closer to the middle of the border area. 
After almost two minutes of this, six figures came rushing toward our position and a few of the guardsmen raised their rifles before they recognized the sergeants and four of the six troopers that had been with them. Random stubber fire flew past them and impacted near our barricades, sending the troopers, who were more or less settled down for a long wait, into a frenzy of return fire that helped the sergeants and troopers reach the safety of the makeshift barriers before they were gunned down by the pursuing gang members. As the scattered pursuers got closer, their fire started shifting from us to each other and I realized they were from the different factions, so the best we could do was hunker down and let them fight it out. Sure, it was not what was expected of me, but what did I care? My life mattered more to me than imperial battle doctrine, and I had the advantage of surface-level knowledge about a great many things from back home. There was another benefit to my way of directing this fight. The troopers, that had wrongfully assumed I would charge in and fight the enemy head-on, had warmed up quite a bit when I was near and some of them even greeted me with some semblance of happiness. As we listened, the sounds of battle intensified, large explosions and screams of the dying and wounded filling our ears. It was weighing on me. The others might have grown up with this life, but I had not. I came from a universe of relative peace. Sure, crime and war were still a thing back home, but not to this degree. My world would be a literal paradise to all but the most powerful people in the entirety of the Imperium. Being able to go to sleep without screams of agony in the distance was considered a good life, here. I shook myself out of my thought as we settled down to wait for the gangs to fight it out. For more times, we had to instigate battle between the two factions, and four times the dying sounds of battle resumed with a vengeance. I lost another three troopers, leaving me with the two sergeants and fifteen troopers, but it was well within acceptable losses for a mission such as this. The fifth time I sent troops out to instigate, they quickly came back to report that the area was more or less safe to enter, and we moved out. Moving quickly, sticking low to the ground and rushing from cover to cover, I directed the troops forward toward the underhive runner's territory. We rounded a large piece of machinery and I had to take a moment to regain myself before I could continue. I was staring at a hellscape. Burning, twisted, broken, and torn apart, the bodies were spread out across the area in numbers I had a hard time comprehending. From the look of things, I would say that almost a thousand or more people lay dead in an area the size of four football fields, dotted with heavy machinery. We would have to wade through the dead and still dying to get to where we wanted to go. I suppressed a shiver and quickly started moving again. The number of dead bodies did not diminish as we got closer to the headquarters of the underhive runners and I started to worry that maybe the iron nails had managed to win this miniature war I had instigated and I would be facing them instead. I had no intel on them beyond their name so they presented an unknown danger. My fears proved to be unfounded, as the look of the dead started changing from one gang to another, and when we arrived, all we saw was a few stragglers, hobbling around the various rooms that were used as living spaces and community gatherings. I counted no more than some odd thirty shapes moving around and I guess there was no more than double that inside. Add to that they were wounded and tired and this should be fairly straightforward. One of my troops raised their rifle, but his sergeant quickly pushed it back down with a shake of his head, allowing us to move forward in silence. The closer we got, the greater the element of surprise. We were no more than twenty meters away when we got spotted. One of the wounded glanced out toward the border area and saw the seventeen of us moving quickly toward their position. He barely managed to cry out before the beam of a lost gun punched a hole where his face used to be and we went loud. Attack men! Kill the bastards! I shouted and started firing indiscriminately at the open doorways while advancing. As soon as we got within range, the sergeants primed a frag grenade each that was tossed into the rooms where sporadic return fire had opened up. This inspired the rest of us to do the same with the other rooms and after the rocking explosions, we started cleaning up. Going from room to room, half of our group stayed outside either with me or the two sergeants as we alternated the overwatch duty. Sad to say, I didn't get many kills, but what could you do? I was appointed to orchestrate, not eliminate. My job was the big picture, the troopers were there to see to the actual work, but I did manage to sneak in a few quick shots along the way. There was no trouble for most of the process except for the end where a last-ditch ambush cost me two more troopers and a glancing shot that bounced off of my pauldron before our massed fire managed to finish off the wounded remains of a gang that had controlled a significant area not in size, but in value. With this foundry area, the attacking Imperial Army could resupply gear and munitions locally instead of relying on supplies captured or transported in from off-planet. This was massive and most likely the reason it had been chosen as a special assignment. 
Had I failed, they would have just rolled a few thousand guardsmen over the area, but if it could be avoided by testing a potential rogue trader, that would of course be the preferable option. Especially considering the Inquisition stood to gain absolute control over said rogue trader. In any case, it would still be a significant upgrade to be chosen for the position. We might have done what we were tasked to do, but I didn't trust anything until I had been cleared of duty, so I chose one of the sergeants to huff it back and report mission success, the other sergeant to take ten troopers and patrol the captured area and finish off any survivors or intruders, while I hunkered down with the remaining three troopers who quickly got a small fire and a pot of mystery stew up and running, made from ingredients scavenged around the area. While we waited, I sat down on the ground and leaned against one of the massive foundry machines, letting the heat emanating from it warm me up as I decided to check out my status. I scrolled past the usual notifications but my eye caught the last two. Imperial Faction Quest Complete Reward, 2000 XP Achievement Unlocked, Outgunned and Underpowered Time to think! You outwitted your enemies and forced a victory through deception and guile. Congratulations, you backstabbing snake! Reward, plus one will, plus one luck. Wait, when did this system start commenting on my actions? I shook off the thought and continued to my status screen. Human. Level 5. Stat points remaining, 0. Alignment, Faithful Imperial Plus. Litanies, 27. Augmentations, Cybernetic Lung Upgrade LVL1, Toxins Slash Environment. Level, 7649 Slash 9600. Strength, 11. Agility, 9. Perception, 10. Will, 14. Luck, 31. Psyche, 1 slash 500. Skills. Feats. Abilities. I liked what I was seeing. The random quest I had completed put me close to level 6, but faction quests? That was both new and it made me wonder. Would it be possible to do quests for other factions if I got the coveted position as a rogue trader? How would that even work? Would I be able to get away with it? It didn't matter for the moment and I settled down, waiting for the commissar to arrive. It took a little while, but he arrived with Elris and a retinue of close to 100 guardsmen. Scanning the area and occasionally firing his bolt gun into corpses at random as he made his way to meet report, he demanded, gruff and direct. Mission successful. We instigated a small gang war and used to damage caused, to mop up the remains and take the area. The neighboring gang, the Iron Nails, were beaten back and should present a very weak opponent right now. I reported, and the commissar turned to exchange a look with a captain who immediately ordered the retinue to move out. I could swear the commissar looked pleased underneath that permanent scowl of his, as insane as the very idea sounded. When you said you planned unorthodox tactics, this is not what I expected. Elris remarked as she took in the area, but I cannot argue with the results. You even managed to weaken the strength of another gang to the point where we can get rid of them immediately. This will certainly count in your favor. She was still as ice cold and distant as ever, but I understood why. This was business. Pleasure had its time and she had a reputation, considering her station. Go rest and relax. You have earned it. You will be summoned again in one day. The commissar said, effectively ending the conversation, so I and the surviving members of our group gathered our things, aside from the troopers there were now chowing down on the mystery stew and made our way back to the safety of our territory. Soon enough I had made it back to my room and could throw myself on my cot. I was almost asleep when there was a knock on the door to the room and I opened the door to see a trooper I had not seen before, carrying a small satchel. I was ordered to bring this to you, he said before shoving the satchel in my arms and making off again. I closed the door again and sat down on the cot while looking over the satchel. What was all this about? Chapter 19, When Things Start Moving, They Start Moving I couldn't resist the temptation and opened the satchel right away. Inside I found two letters and a small token with the Inquisition's insignia on one side and the insignia of the Adeptus Mechanicus on the other. The first letter explained the meaning of the token, which was to be traded in for my new set of carapace armor asterisk at the nearest Officio Departamento Munitorum. The Inquisition had already taken care of everything and it just needed to be picked up and fitted to my body. Furthermore, the letter explained my promotion to rogue trader and informed me that a ceremony would be held in the near future to make my new status official. In the meantime, I was to report to Elris, who would be my immediate supervisor and travel companion in the near future as I get underway with my new task. 
She would spend the time between now and the ceremony teaching me about my new responsibilities and what the Inquisition expected from me as well. The second letter was handwritten by Elris, telling me to go and get my armor handed out and then wait for her in my room before it finished off stating that she would be thirsty on her arrival. I dutifully unpacked the Amasek bottle I had squirreled away, taking the not very subtle hint and hurried over to the nearest Munitorum office. The quartermaster behind the counter shot up from his seat and barked at a Mechanicus adept when I put the counter on the table and after inspecting it thoroughly, I was escorted into a Mechanicus workshop where the work to fit my armor began immediately. While quite a bit heavier than my old flak armor, it also offered a massive upgrade in protection, one that I was more than happy to trade a little bit of mobility for. I felt safe in this armor. The process took a few hours and the adepts were extremely nitpicky about any perceived error or miscalculation, but the fruits of their labor were undeniable. When they were finished, the armor felt like it was a second piece of skin I could slip into at will. The only thing I was not the biggest fan of was the not at all subtle markings of the Inquisition that adorned the armor. It was what it was. There were worse factions within the Imperium I could be associated with, and at least the mark of the Inquisition usually crushed any idea of being difficult I might encounter among many Imperial subjects. I felt powerful as I left the Munitorum, mostly because the regular troops around me wore flak armor. I could tank damage that would obliterate a regular guardsman in this thing. Which, when I thought about it, didn't amount to that much. But still, slow progress is still progress, and every sliver of advantage I could scrounge up for myself was to be cherished and appreciated. I also received an upgrade in weaponry, opting for the Bullock class stub cannon asterisk asterisk. Sure, the low ammunition count in the enormous revolver was insignificant compared to my loss rifle, but when each shot has the potential to stop an ogren or turn a regular man into a mess of scattered body parts, ammunition becomes a relative concept. Whoever heard of someone needing to be splattered twice? I noticed numerous looks of both envy and confusion on my way back, as the Inquisition's mark was not a normal sight on these front lines. I made my way back to my room without any issues and found Elris waiting for me, having already dipped into the bottle. The armor suits you, though I expect you are going to want to modify it at a later point. I knew there was something different about you when I read the commissary's battle report back on Carrick tomorrow, we begin your instructions. But tonight, you get to celebrate early. The smile she sent me over the glass in her hand sent shivers down my spine and I was suddenly struck by the absurdity of the situation, seen from an outside perspective. An armored and armed man, being spun around the finger of a beautiful woman in tight clothing. A cliché as old as humanity itself. The oldest game ever played, and I had to stick to the rules, so I dutifully removed my armor and joined her for a few glasses before the real celebration got underway. The following days were spent listening to endless repetitions of the same subjects, Namely, the normal duties of a rogue trader, establishing contact with worlds outside of the Empire's influence, bringing any lost human civilization back into the fold, and otherwise finding the best way to exploit and conquer whatever I set my eyes on, in the name of the Emperor. I was also informed that I would indeed be bringing a liaison from the Inquisition that would function as advisor and middleman, between me and the Ordo Hereticus. I was also endlessly rehearsed in the correct wording when accepting the position during the ceremony. The matter of tradition was of the utmost importance, and there could be no errors for anyone to point at in the future, should a conflict between the imperial factions arise as a consequence of my actions out beyond the borders of the Imperium. Elris was especially tenacious about me not being a direct part of the Inquisition, but rather a freelance agent benefiting from an endorsement that could be withdrawn more or less whenever it suited the people in power, which only happened if I started disappointing in my duties. Thankfully, shackled as I was compared to other rogue traders, my task was fairly easy. Do regular rogue trader stuff, claim planets for the Imperium, bring lost human civilizations back under Imperial rule, and trade to my heart's content with exotic and rare items and minerals. As far as I was interested, trading was my main focus point. There were many things for sale in this universe, and the most precious of them all was knowledge. Someone, somewhere, out there, knew the secret for me to get home, and I wanted to find that someone. No price would be too high and no cost too great. And I was lucky, lucky beyond all reason and hope to get this chance. But I could not get my hopes up. This would be more than flying to the outer rims and finding a backwater planet with a shamanistic human culture. If I had to play by the rules of this universe, my best bet would most likely be the chaos powers, but that was not an option with the whole inquisitorial agent thing I had been roped into. Unless I could get more freedom, which meant getting rid of my inquisition liaison down the line. 
A shame, Elris was good company outside our rank and file, but she was also standing in my way, in more ways than one. I had no real possibility to use slash train my psychic powers with her nearby, and she would also prevent me from forming any meaningful relations with any planetary civilization that was not strictly imperial, severely hampering my ability to discover as much as possible. But those were a concern for a different time. Two days before the ceremony was to take place, I was asked to give my future crew some thoughts. As a rogue trader, I would be given a contingent from the Imperial Guard to travel with me and take care of the more aggressive side of Imperial diplomacy. Meaning, do what I want or my personal army will vaporize you under a torrent of laser fire. But I would also have to start creating a personal retinue of specialists, starting with someone in charge of my security. But no matter how I twisted and turned the idea, I didn't like the thought of having someone else plan out my security detail. Then it hit me. Abhumans. As soon as I got the idea, I voiced my desire to have a few ogrins placed on my ship, along with a commissar trained in the handling of them. From the look on Elris's face, I could tell she was less than impressed by the idea, but it was a tried and true method to have ogrins as personal guards. Or, to me be more specific, bone eads e asterisk asterisk asterisk, the heavily augmented sergeants among the ogrins. Bigger, stronger, able to understand orders as complex as he attacked the enemy from the side eight, and fiercely loyal toward their commander, they would sooner break the neck of anyone threatening their charge, high-ranking imperial officials as well, than they would let harm come to those whose protection they are charged with. But I had another reason for wanting an ogrin as my personal protector. Showing up on an undiscovered world with a lost human population would always create tension. Letting them see me have ultimate control over an abhuman large enough to crush me with a firm handshake would remove any illusions of empty bravado in the claims I would bring about the strength of the Imperium. And it would be nice to have a companion whose biggest issue in life was whether to eat or sleep if they were not in a fight. Ogrins were so lovingly uncomplicated. I also spent some time testing out my new weapon, the outlying checkpoints and defensive works could always use extra manpower, and the hive gangers and heretics provided ample opportunity to test out my new toy. The first time I connected a shot, there was little left of my unfortunate victim's left side of the chest. The arm and shoulder had been ripped off by the bullet and the poor idiot bled out within a handful of seconds. Of course, I also attracted quite a bit of attention from the return fire, on account of my new armor, which the gangers undoubtedly saw as a potential prize to be looted once I had been killed. The effectiveness of the armor was astonishing, most of the stubber rounds clanging harmlessly off of the pauldrons and chest armor, and the few that weren't deflected didn't penetrate enough to damage me, and a quick visit by the local Mechanicus adept quickly saw minor damage corrected. Laser fire was still somewhat of an issue though, the concentrated light burned through the armor at an alarming rate whenever the occasional loss weapon was used against us, and I very quickly learned to focus down anything even remotely looking like a loss or, emperor forbid, a plasma weapon among our enemies. That last one had not happened yet, but we with my future looking like it did, there was no telling what kind of weaponry I would possibly be pitted against, so it was best to learn the limitations of my new armor. Hopefully, I would get the chance to upgrade again sooner rather than later, and preferably to something that was not covered in inquisitorial markings. I would really like to get my hands on some power armor, but considering that the full suit of carapace armor I was wearing was usually reserved for wealthy individuals or used by special units like elite storm troopers or squads of the Adeptus Arbites when they performed their underhive raids, I could not complain about my current situation. It had been an upgrade from paper armor to actual armor. The day before the ceremony I was given a short list by Elris and told to pick out a ship class from the ones listed. I am sorry there are no better choices, but with the limited resources we have to spare on this project, they are the best we can supply. She added with a sad smile on her face. I truly believe she was sorry I could not pick from more suited options. There was the Jericho class pilgrim vessel, an enormous vessel that had been converted from a refinery vessel, it was able to hold thousands upon thousands of inhabitants with little issue and had massive amounts of cargo space. This also meant that its weaponry was rather limited, and it handled as well as a flying brick. I was not surprised this was on the list, the ecclesiarchy was the main user of these ships, transporting pilgrims to and from the endless amount of shrines that were scattered across the Imperium. A good vessel for the rogue trader that wanted to do just that. Trade and travel with a large force of guardsmen to protect him. Then there was a Hazroth class privateer, so named for its wide popularity among pirates and raiders. A good sized crew with a decent amount of weaponry for its size, it suffered from a lack of armor and cargo space, in favor of engine heavy designs, allowing them to run from anything they cannot fight. 
a good starting vessel for the up-and-coming pirate in the making. There was also a vagabond-class merchant trader, a freighter-style vessel with small amounts of weaponry, enough to discourage pirates anyway, engine power on the lower end of the scale, but good cargo space and decent crew manning. Unassuming and a very common sight along the imperial shipping lanes, it was a ship that would blend into the crowd. A safe bet for any starting captain. Finally, there was a Havoc-class merchant raider, an older ship designed with fast engines, sizable cargo space, enough firepower to rival many frigates, and a good-sized crew. The only downside was its relative lack of armor, earning it the nickname a glass cannon. A somewhat good choice, for the captain that was confident in their ability to either avoid a fight or end it before it could begin. It was an interesting choice, and one I would have to think over very carefully before I decided. Chapter 20 So Many Worries Havoc class, I said after thinking it over for a long moment. It was the only sensible choice. Engines fast enough to get me out of trouble, enough weapons to pose a threat to any similar-sized frigate, and still a respectable amount of cargo space along with a more than respectable crew size, meaning, allowing me to bring as much as five regiments of guardsmen, provided the Inquisition would supply me with that much. I doubted it. Most likely, I would be given a single regiment until I could prove my worth, either by trading and finding worlds that could be of use to the Inquisition or by weeding out potential heretics among the other rogue traders, if and when I met them, which I was bound to do sooner or later. An interesting choice. I would have thought you would have gone for the Hazroth. Many new traders prefer to start with as fast a ship as they can get their hands on. Elris said as she pulled on her boots. She wasn't bothering with anything more than her basic guardsman shirt and pants, but I had a feeling she would be dressed to impress for the handing over of the letters of Mark. It was not every day a new rogue trader entered the scene, even if I was not a full-on rogue trader with a fledgling dynasty behind me. And you don't have to worry about finding skilled crew. It will be supplied for your first ship. Navigators, tech priests, deckhands, two regiments of guardsmen, everything. We have even found an ogren that would be a suitable candidate. For some reason, he claimed to have seen you before, back on Carrick. You understand why I find this to be quite incredible, considering we are dealing with an abhuman. Her voice was laced with vitriol as she said the last word, her distaste for the massive humanoids being put on full display, and I knew what she meant. An ogren being able to remember anything that had not been repeated 10.000 times was touching the borders of the unbelievable. I do not understand why you would insist on having one of them assigned to your retinue. Apart from their size, I can see no advantage in using them for such tasks. You forget about their loyalty. Once charged with my safety, no amount of coaxing, bribery, threats, begging, or anything else will make him go against that the task of protecting me. Sure, he might be manipulated, but as my bodyguard, he will be spending all the time away from the ship, glued to my side. There will not be many chances for anyone to attempt such a thing. There is also the possibility to put a literal wall of flesh and muscle between me and any danger there might arise. Given some Bulgrin armor asterisk and a proper power maul and a ripper gun, once he has proved worth the expense, he will be nay unstoppable, even against an orc knob star. The only thing that could keep me safer would be an Astartes battle brother. But don't worry, I only plan on getting the one Ogren. I need advisors and specialists in certain areas, but I am sure we will encounter such individuals on our travels. Unless of course, you know an infiltration expert that can operate in hostile territory? That would solve at least one more position issue, I was rather hopeful that Elris only operated in our ranks and I was not disappointed. I do not. Those I know are trained to infiltrate our own ranks. Elris was casual as she answered and it struck me how much more information she was willing to give out now that I was chosen for the role of a rogue trader. All of this was of course disclosed under the assumption that it was a private conversation. Spilling Inquisition secrets would get you killed, no matter your rank or position. Even governors of whole sectors would not be safe from spilling such secrets. I didn't care about that, I had no obligation to these people, no duty of care. I just wanted to go back home. I had my life dream fulfilled, and I had been sorely disappointed. I had been blind to the horrors, being enthralled by stories of heroic last stands and epic charges against overwhelming odds. The truth was far more grim. For every heroic tale, millions of meaningless deaths would have to take place. Enough blood to fill oceans would have to be spilled to create the circumstances that transformed an ordinary warrior into a legendary one. And in this universe, I was not one of those ordinary warriors. I was a flea, a surface nuisance, to those that wielded real power. 
Astartes, both regular and chaos varieties, entombed dreadnoughts asterisk asterisk, demons, titan walkers, a literal hell dimension, numerous alien species with nothing but bad intentions for mankind, there were death cults, parasite species, and so much more. I was surrounded by a galaxy of shit and suffering and I had to contribute to it in no small degree to find the only thing I truly wanted at this point. Away home. My dull home seemed like a vacation in paradise when compared to my current situation. A shame. Guess I will have to figure something out with Ordo Militum asterisk 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 down the line. I replied as I started strapping on my new carapace armor. You are very familiar with the inner workings of the Inquisition for a PDF trooper. It was not a statement but a deeply veiled accusation, and I felt the familiar tingling along my spine as the room seemed to grow colder in an instant. Gone was my nighttime distraction and in her place sat the Inquisition agent with the scent of blood in her nostrils. I am also quite capable for a PDF trooper. Is it so strange that I would be of exceptional intellect as well as skill? I fought to keep my tone light, trying to hide behind boastful bravado. I love the Imperium and as such, I have had an interest in learning its inner workings to the best of my ability, which is quite substantial, as you well know. I winked at the last words, causing the tiniest of smirks to appear on her lips for a fraction of a second. She accepted my words reluctantly, but it was plausible. She even kissed me goodbye before she left after giving me the time of the ceremony. Nothing noteworthy happened until then, and the ceremony itself was a very quiet affair. The Inquisition always did like its secrecy. The planetary governor himself signed and handed me the letter of Mark, overseen by Elris, a commissar, and a servitor clerk from Administratum, and just like that I was a rogue trader. The letter was placed in a null box asterisk 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 and I carried it in as we walked toward the landing pad that contained the Havoc class merchant raider I had requested. Mind you, the ship was roughly 1.6 kilometers long, roughly 1 mile, and 400 m wide, roughly 1,200 feet, and had approximately 24.000 crew when fully manned. Add to that my two regiments of 1,500 guardsmen each, and I was set for at least a solid six months of exploring before I would have to return to port to refit, sell cargo, and hire more crew. Given the size of my ship, it took us a while to finally arrive at an entry point, and when we did, we were greeted by a commissar and an enormous ogren that showed signs of heavy cranial augmentation. So it was a bone EAD. His size, however, was quite bigger than the regular abhuman. Where a normal ogren would tower over you at 2.5 to 3 meters, this one almost reached 3.5 and his muscle-to-mass ratio was even more ridiculous than normal ogrens. He was a freak of nature. The initial greetings only took a minute and the commissar looked to the ogren and said firmly Atrak, this is the man you need to protect. That is the only thing you will need to do. Keep. This. Man. Safe. It surprised me that he used such a simple command to an ogren that had been mentally enhanced, but maybe it made it easier for Trok to have a clear order to fall back to whenever he was in doubt. Okay. Keep the man safe. Trok repeated as he stared intensely at me, no doubt committing my face to memory to the best of his abilities. With that, we quickly started moving through the ship to arrive at the bridge, with the captain's quarters located on the deck straight above with a private elevator leading connecting the two. The crew looked at us with curiosity, but as soon as they saw my armor and the box I carried, they knew I was the soon-to-be captain of the vessel and they saluted us with the Imperial Aquila. It might sound glorious, but it was anything but glorious. Cramped corridors that were coated in old grease and grime, gray crew members that lived lives of darkness and endless work, only occasionally broken by a few days of port leave. Some of them had been born into it, never knowing any other life than the snaking corridors and horrible food. If they were lucky they would never experience anything other than the killing monotony of a merchant's life. If they were unlucky they would be killed during a pirate boarding or worse, be taken by chaos to either be sacrificed or corrupted. The True Glory of the Imperium I saw the faces, grey skin and sunken eyes, hunched backs, and dead eyes. The hunger with which they looked at Elris concerned me for a moment, until they saw the Inquisition marks on her clothes and they, in the infinite wisdom a life in the Imperium brings with it should you manage to survive to adulthood, that subservience was the way to go instead. The sight of Trok also brought no small amount of fear into their eyes despite their knowledge that if he wanted to harm them, he would have done so already, but the massive guy was shooting menacing looks in the direction of anyone so much as looking at me. If he had this effect on imperial subjects, I could not wait to see a long-lost human race react to him, and the thought made me giddy as we arrived at our destination. I looked around the bridge as we entered and it was bustling with activity. 
Tech priests, servitors, regular crew members, even a navigator asterisk 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 asterisk. The young man was so pale he could have passed for an albino, spindly of build, but not very tall. The third eye in his forehead was covered with a piece of fabric, but everyone still gave him a wide berth and I noticed Elris sneering in visible disgust as we got closer. I should not be surprised. Navigators were, when it came down to it, mutants. The only reason they were allowed to live was their ability to facilitate travel between the stars, so her dislike of him was only a natural reaction. The navigator greeted me with indifference and expected reaction. This is Farson, a young navigator from a shrouded house. I have no doubt he will work very hard to restore his bloodline's lost honor while in service on your ship. None of this information was critical, so it was obvious Elris was mocking the navigator, her instincts of hate toward any mutation that deviated from a baseline human made it clear, she was inquisition through and through. I returned his greeting and held out my hand to shake his, and the gesture made both Elris and Farson immensely surprised, though for very different reasons, and the navigator hesitantly extended his hand and shook mine. It is rare to see someone so at ease around my kind, even more so when they learn of my great shame. The last words were followed by an irritated glance in the direction of Elris, but nothing more. His restraint was either remarkable or he was used to the insult. My bet was on him being used to it. But it pleases me that we will be able to look past these differences and focus on bringing glory to the Imperium in our future travels. If there is nothing else, Captain, I would like to retreat to my sanctum. Do you have a heading in mind? I thought about it for a second. What would be the most important thing for me to do right now? Then I had an idea that would solve many problems at once. Take us to the edge of the Caligari sector, in Segmentum Tempestus. That is our heading. I said and the navigator quickly retreated. The Caligari sector? What do you expect to accomplish there? Elris asked when we were left alone. Find some heretics, bring them the Emperor's mercy, take whatever is in their ships they have not defiled, and make a new plan once that succeeds. This is a decent ship, Elris, but it needs some upgrades before I am comfortable with taking it out into the fringes. I also need to expand my retinue before we venture out. So for now, we get to chase around heretics, mutants, xenos, and the corrupted. I can't imagine you have anything against showing traitors the error of their ways? I made sure to play on her inquisitorial nature, but I was not lying either. The Caligari sector was a hotspot for all of those mentioned above and its proximity to Imperial space meant that I could run away if I bit off of more than I could chew and reasonably expect to find help before being hunted down and turned into a gruesome trophy. I spent the rest of the day scrutinizing the various blueprints over the ship, a thing that would come to be my primary pastime when I was in standby mode as the captain of the ship. Either them or whatever information we could scrounge up about our next intended destination. When I retreated to my private quarters above the bridge, I was pleasantly surprised to see that the last captain had at least known about comfort, judging from the large and fluffy-looking bed and pillow. A couple of comfortable leather chairs were placed in front of a large steel desk, which had a very official-looking swivel chair placed behind it. The walls were covered in a soft golden light that came from panels along the floor and ceiling, giving the room a calming and comfortable glow. Upon inspection, all the cabinets were empty, but I would rectify that soon enough. Spare weapons, trophies, and the finest booze. Yep, my childhood pirate king dreams would most definitely come to life in this room. Not that I was going to go full pirate mode, but it was nice to have a place to go dream. The first stop on our way was Baca, besides the occasional entering of real space once the navigator was at the limits of his sight from our previous location, so roughly every 5,000 light years or so. With an expected average travel speed of about 250 light years daily when inside of the warp, that meant we have to transition into real space every 19 to 21 days, depending on the navigator and take a day or two for them to rest up and relax. Warp travel was not done easily and it was not an exact science. There was also the fact that I had chosen to travel across the Imperium to begin my journey, so. There was that. I was looking at, in the very best of circumstances, 40 to 50 days of travel before we got anywhere near the sector I wanted to reach. So, I could probably expect a good 70 days of travel before we reached Baca. After getting out of my armor and putting it away on a shelf, I fell into the swivel chair with a heavy sigh, wondering what I could do to pass the time. There was always hedonism, allowing myself to indulge in whatever struck my fancy. But I didn't function well under such circumstances. I would quickly become either apathetic or depraved, neither of which was something that appealed to me. I could always train with the guardsmen. I would have to keep myself ready. 
I could also familiarize myself with Trock who had been dismissed to the care of a young commissar that had been assigned to me as his handler until we reached our destination, at which point, Trock should be bonded enough to me that I would have full control over the giant abhuman. But I could always do that tomorrow. He would be following me whenever I was not in this cabin or when explicitly dismissed, which would happen very rarely. I could also spend time studying every bit of information I could dig out from our data stores and try to get the hang of how combat in space would function. I had gotten a good grasp on ground combat, but space combat was very different. Torpedoes launched at distances of hundreds of thousands of kilometers, point defenses with a range of a few hundred kilometers. Atomics used with reckless abandon, weaponized gamma radiation to fry incoming fighters. My new ship didn't even have lance turrets, the standard high-energy beam weapons mounted on the larger cruisers and capital ships, but I had to do with loss burners asterisk 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 asterisk. And I would have to stick to those underpowered pieces of junk until I could get my hands on a bigger and better ship. It would take days just to plow through the relevant information and weeks to develop a proper understanding of the various subjects. I was restless but exhausted from the events of the day and decided to get some sleep, but I had barely had time to take off my shirt and reach for my belt when a small vox near the elevator down made a chime. I walked over and pressed the button. Speak, I said as I activated the vox. Your belongings from your previous living quarters, Captain. The quality of the vox made it impossible to distinguish gender by voice, but the pitch and tone told me it was one of the guardsmen and I pressed the button that sent the elevator down. Moments later it came back up and a young trooper stepped out, carrying both of my backpacks. She put them on the floor just inside my quarters and looked up to salute me with the Aquila and froze. Her staring told me it was the scars she was looking at, my missing shirt revealing the work of the underhive doctor. Sure, the function of his work was perfect, but he had not been gentle if the scars were anything to go by. Add to that my previous injuries and the injuries that the previous owner of this body had received, and the image of a deathworlder was complete. The trooper was short and lean, not an overly feminine body by any stretch, half a lifetime of war having hardened her into an experienced killing machine. She had seen death and dealt it in equal measure. But she had grown up in a comfortable world, with a stable and comfortable climate, without wildlife that would kill you, given the slightest chance. Compared to me, she was still soft and squishy, and the few wounds I could see would not have been pretty, but they were not too severe either. Even after arriving here, I had stared death in the face and only survived on sheer luck, and only the emperor knew what had transpired to the previous owner. I had been covered in scars before my inept self had taken over. Was there anything else, trooper? I asked and cocked an eyebrow at the young woman. No, captain. She said a little too quickly as she finished her salute. Dismissed. For now. I said with a smile and she blushed as she turned on her heel and took the elevator down without turning back around. It was a cute reaction, but it was just for fun. I didn't dare think of what Elris would do if she thought she had competition. Of course, I doubted I was the only man in her life, but one could never play it too safe with the Inquisition. It wasn't until I fell into my new, wonderful, heavenly, absolutely divine new bed that I noticed a tiny incessant blinking in the corner of my eye. With a small hint of excitement, I opened my character screen. Personal main quest notification, you have started a personal main quest to find a way back to your own world. Guess having your dreams come true was not all it was chalked up to be, huh? Reward upon completion, unknown, yes, unknown. There it was again, that sassy side of the system. What the hell was that about? Achievement unlocked, I am free to become a rogue trader with all of the freedom it entitles. In imperial service, this is a luxury afforded to few and desired by all. Where will you turn your gaze? Plus 3 perception, plus 1000 XP. Well, that was a nice little surprise. I like this achievement system more and more. Human. Level 5. Stat points remaining, 0. Alignment, faithful imperial plus. Litanies, 27. Augmentations, Cybernetic Lung, Upgrade LVL1, Toxins Slash Environment. Level, 8649 Slash 9600. Strength, 11. Agility, 9. Perception, 13. Will, 14. Luck, 31. Psyche, 1 Slash 500. Skills. Feats. Abilities, Asterisk. Retinue, Asterisk. Wow, a new tab? I quickly opened it to see what that was all about. Retinue. Troc the Ogren. Bodyguard. 
Strength 600. Agility 6. Perception 8. Will 5. Luck 5. 600 strength? What was that guy made out of, cybernetic muscle on steroids? Even if I manage to level enough to have the points, there is no way I would ever invest that much into strength, the most deceptive of all stats. Sure, it was impressive to look at, but at what cost? He was tough as a sack full of bricks, but about just as smart. Bodyguard was indeed the best job he could ever have. Perhaps I could get my grubby little hands on some bulgrin armor and a slab shield, covering the formidable meathead in discarded tank tracks fashioned into makeshift armor. But that was wishful thinking for now. I moved on to see my new ability. Get up guardsman, this ability grants the user the ability to push through what would otherwise be incapacitating damage and keep on fighting. One use per week. Endurance, tier 2, level 7, note, planetary bonus applied. Danger instinct, living in a world where danger is relative and death waits around the corner of every new day have granted you the ability to sense malicious intent towards you. Natural bluffing, since your arrival, you have spent a considerable amount of time during conversation lying and twisting the truth. You have been granted the natural bluffing feat. Which side asterisk, use your psychic abilities to arred the aura and intent of those around you. Trader's charm, likable and friendly whenever given the chance, the rogue trader begins any first social interaction with any individual, with a minor increase in chance for a positive outcome, regardless of the situation. That was nice, though I wondered how much use a minor increase in chance would help me out. I was not about to disregard a new ability though, and it was more than I had before. I suddenly heard the elevator and realized I never recalled it after it went down and I got busy closing down the character screen to focus on whoever was coming up, but I heard Elris call out before it stopped. Quite an upgrade from your previous lodgings. It's nice to be back in more comfortable surroundings, but in the future, I advise you to recall the elevator after dismissing someone. She was looking around the room as she walked further in. Somewhat empty, but everything in good time. So, why did you choose a destination on the other side of the Segmentum Solar? I lifted my head and looked at her as she made herself comfortable in one of the leather chairs after turning it around to face me. Because, I answered e as capable as I might be on the ground, I need time to get familiar with the role of rogue trader and captain of a ship. I figured the trip through Imperial space would grant me time to get familiar with the basics before we reach Baca and can get direction on any pirate elements in the nearby area I can hunt down and bring to justice. This will also let me asses the combat level of our little crew and my vessel and paint me an overall picture of how effective this ship operates. And finally, it will be near friendly territory, allowing for a backward-oriented assault, giving our Imperial allies a chance at glory. Elris laughed at the phrasing. It's remarks like that that cause you to stick out you know. You are different. And I cannot help but wonder why. You intrigue me, Bjork, and that is not an easy thing to do. I have served the Imperium for close to 300 years at this point, and never have I met someone with a mind like yours. I know you are not a psyker, you were subject to several tests from our psychers both on and off the battlefield before we contacted you. You stood out back on Carrick, and we took notice back then. A Deathworlder, with no memory, is miraculously saved by an Ecclesiarchy deacon, reciting ancient teachings and choosing to serve in the PDF. Come on, even with memory loss, you had to know that would make you stand out but we have plenty of time for me to figure you out. I am here to be assigned quarters. Unless you prefer to assign me to yours? She raised an eyebrow as she finished speaking and I had to think it over quickly. I would never have alone time if I assigned her here, and it might also give the wrong impression, but there were a few rooms not far away that were meant for wealthier guests during trade between ships or even transporting important people from place to place. You will take one of the large rooms as your permanent room but you are more than welcome to spend the night, almost whenever you want. It was an apologetic refusal, but it made it clear I needed my own space and time every once in a while and she accepted it with a smile. Very well captain, I will go get situated in my chambers, but be sure I will return often. You are pleasant company when you are not being an enigma. And with those parting words, she left the room and sent the elevator back up, leaving me to finally get some rest and try and get accustomed to my new situation. The question of what I would do when I arrived at Baca could wait until tomorrow. Chapter 21 Curse Me The first two weeks passed in a blur. 
When I was not locked in my room, studying schematics, battle plans, statistics, fire drill accuracy charts from the guardsmen, common void battle tactics, information of armaments, common trade goods, uncommon trade goods, expected random happenings, knowledge about the world that were situated on the edge of imperial space, restricted information about the different Xeno species, of which I took special note of the Tau Empire. Sure, they were communists in space, but there had to be a way I could abuse it to my advantage. It would also annoy Elris to no end if we had to deal with them, and I had to admit I got perverse pleasure out of annoying her. The way she looked at Trok was enough to make me smile, so I could only dream of one day introducing her to the Tau. But that would have to wait until such an opportunity presented itself. A thousand other small things required my attention and we quickly reached the first time we had to transition out of the warp for our navigator to get a new bearing and rest up. The time in real space was greatly appreciated by the crew, as it was the only time we could look out of the windows in the ship, as the blast shields were lowered for the duration of warp travel there was no reason to risk insanity, corruption, or worse, just because some idiot guardsman or crew member wanted to take a gander at warp space. It also allowed us to take status of the Geller field generator asterisk, which thankfully was intact and operating at peak efficiency. The Mechanicus adepts were not at all happy that I invaded their sacred spaces, but as captain of this ship, there was little they could do to stop me. They were quite relieved that I didn't touch anything, evidenced by the lack of interference from the tech priest that followed my every move. Any problems with the machine spirit? I asked to try and appease the neurotic tech priest and the robotic voice of his kind answered me. The machine spirit is appeased and functioning, captain. No problems are registered. I decided to take his words at face value. No member of the Mechanicus would not lie about something like that, especially not about the machine spirit. Very good. We would not want to upset it needlessly, lest it decides to give it when we most need it. Take care to anoint the engines and read your rights carefully. I would rather you do it well than fast. I figured it wouldn't hurt to get a good reputation among the ship's Mechanicus adepts, and my words seemed to please the one in front of me if that was even possible. Who knows, maybe I could even get some Skatarii asterisk asterisk under my command in the future. For now, though, I would have to be content with the guardsmen I was already commanding, which was quite good in and of itself. A single loss gun was barely worth noting. But 3,000? That could do some serious damage in a very short amount of time. Or it could delay a great enemy for a short while. Either case, it was their duty and destiny to die for the glory of the Emperor, or in this case, me, as his divine explorer. I suppressed a sigh, the thought making me miserable. The fact that human life was so casually thrown away was a heavy burden on the mind and one that was best forgotten if one wanted to stay sane. Better to see them as tools to be used, so I didn't have to face reality. Was all command like this? Or was it only like this to those that cared? I abandoned that train of thought before it sucked me in deeper. A different issue forced its way into my brain. Elris. She had found, and executed, no less than forty-seven crew members, on grounds of heretical activities and worship. I could of course try and keep her distracted, but my studies demanded my every waking moment. I needed to prepare for when we reached our destination, the veiled region was rife with pirates, heretics, xenos, and outright chaos worshippers. I would need every advantage, every scrap of knowledge I could get my hands on, to have a chance to not only survive but flourish in that region and having an overzealous inquisitorial agent at my side was not going to help things along if I wanted to try and use a bit of guile and deception. She would not be able to control herself, her passion for play in the captain's cabin only being surpassed by her passion for her work. It shouldn't surprise me, three hundred years was a long time to convince yourself that your cause was righteous and just. It was only natural that fanaticism had entered the equation about two hundred years back, that was the great mystery in her fascination with me, my behavior so far would have caused anyone else to get executed more or less on principle. I stuck out. I might have had enough prior knowledge of this world to blend in, but I completely lacked the mannerisms. So far, I had been able to chalk it up to being a goofy individual, but I wondered how long that would continue. As a rogue trader, I was bound to run into very powerful people from time to time, be it irregular humans or Astartes, but they would be individuals who had spent literal millennia assessing people and their character. They would label me instantly, just as the Ordo Malleus had done with me when I entered this world. I had been careless and sloppy and combined with the confusion the system brought me, it was getting increasingly harder to not fall back into old behavior patterns and the endless praying was also taking its toll but I had to keep up appearances or suffer the consequences. 
This insistence on piety would also make me stand out among the other rogue traders, since the general level of freedom afforded such exceptional individuals, such as myself, freed them from such menial things, allowing them to focus on acquiring power and wealth, expanding their fleets and their influence. Having officially ascended from flea to pest, on an intergalactic power scale, I had entered a new pond of fish, once more being placed at the bottom of the food chain. The day after we transitioned back into real space, the navigator, Farson, called me on the Vox. Captain, I must inform you that our travels will be extended by a number of days. Warp anomalies are in the way and we will have to redirect into Segmentum Solar for our next scheduled real space transition. Shall I send a message informing Battlefleet Solar of our arrival? By all means, inform them, I have no interest in incurring their wrath. They are likely to shoot us down before asking questions. I replied before returning my attention to the issue of the day. This day it was a growing sense of dissent among the crew, having to suffer under Elris's constant scrutiny, and I had to figure out a way to reel in her murderous ways. And maybe, just maybe, I had stumbled upon such a way. That evening as I finished up my studies, I sent for Elris and she showed up with a stack of papers in her hands. Take a seat, Elris, have a glass of Amasek, and relax. You are working yourself to the bone with the crew. I gestured to one of the leather chairs and she slumped down in it after getting herself a glass. There are more worrying practices on board this vessel than I thought possible. I have so many leads and hints from those already interrogated. She trailed off to empty the glass and cast a longing glance at the bottle on the far table. I slowly rose and made my way over to it. Then we have a happy coincidence, as I need someone to gather notes on important people near our destination. Everything that can be found, from their taste in clothes to their favorite drink and food. Whatever advantage you can give me, I want. I picked up the bottle as I spoke and brought it over to fill her glass. That would give me time to sit down for a while and go over my notes as well. She mused as she played with the liquid in the glass. But what of the heretical practices among the rest of the crew? Given your recent storm of activity, you can be sure they are going to keep a low profile. Hang back for a bit, let them fall into a false sense of security, then strike once more. I encouraged her, playing on her desire to purge anyone she deemed unclean and using her responsibilities as the dominant factor in my reasoning. Admittedly, I was playing a somewhat dangerous game, but I was fairly certain I could make this fall out to my advantage, given the intimate relationship I shared with Elris. My efforts earned me a weak smile, but I noticed a glint in her eye. A glint of something cold. Calculating. Still smiling, she looked at me and said, It seems as though you have given this a lot of thought, Bjork. Her voice was the same as before, tired and slightly frustrated. Nothing appeared changed. And yet, that glint in her eye had me on edge. Elris. As much as it pains me to admit, your years working for the Imperium give you an insight I simply do not have. I am still in the first stage of my first lifetime. My experience is rather limited. This is why I ask you for this. Yes, there are heretical practices taking place among the crew, but they are not going anywhere unless I approve, and anyone you deem worthy of putting on lockdown, we can arrange it. You have your orders, but I also have mine. Or rather, a lack of. And therefore I have to make my path through the galaxy, serving the Emperor the best I can. But I need help along the way, and right now I am asking for that help. I had to try and reason with her, and the best way to do it without revealing the truth and looking like I sympathized with those she hunted, I had to hide behind false pride. Thankfully, it was a common trait in the Imperium, and my relatively short service in the greater ranks allowed me a bit of ignorance and goodwill from the people I interacted with. Elris stared at me for a long moment before she emptied the glass once more. All right. But you owe me a favor, Bjork, she was smiling again, a genuine smile, as she answered and she held out her glass for me to fill it once more. I don't suppose you accept payment in the form of sexual favors? I asked, more to tease than anything, but a small voice inside of me was screaming for her to say yes. Pay for something I already get? Nice try, but you are just going to have to get used to the thought. I promise to be reasonable when the time comes. Elris laughed and the evening took a more comfortable turn from that point. The bottle of Amasek was emptied, replaced, and emptied again. We joked, we laughed, and we acted like regular people instead of the figures of authority we were. For me, it was a pleasant break in my new duties. For Elris, it was a very rare chance to cut loose without fear of getting judged by everyone around her. Needless to say, we both jumped at the opportunity. 
This universe had a way of grinding away at joy and happiness wherever it presented itself, so to low oneself to remember the joys and good things, rather than the grim darkness we lived in, was an exceedingly rare luxury that would be treasured in our memories for a long time. Underscore 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 the days until the next entering of real space went off in calm silence, the crew was relieved that Elris spent the vast majority of time in her quarters, studying and making small notes for me to hang on when dealing with nobles, royal houses, Astartes, the various branches of the Imperium, behavior in front of regular troops, the importance of spending enough credits to look the part as much as being it. Everything that could be imagined I would need to know without knowing the reason behind. Why? That would come in its own time. Usually, a person would know all of this by heart, since noble houses always made sure their members were extremely well educated. But my case was a special one, since the ecclesiarchy wanted a rogue trader without any ties of any kind, to anyone but the emperor and those that gave him the power no wielded. This routine was broken when we entered real space for the second time. I was summoned to the bridge to answer an incoming hail the moment we left the warp. This is Captain Antaros of the Imperial Fist's Sixth Company, the Siege Hammers, in command of the strike cruiser Justitia Fides. Halt your ship and submit it to inspection by Astartes' forces immediately. Refusal will be met with swift and deadly force. The voice that boomed out of the Vox was not human. It was too deep, too rumbling to be human. Even filtered through the helmet Vox of the Astartes on the other end, it was abundantly clear that this was not a regular human being. We will halt our ship and submit to inspection, as ordered. Is there anything we can prepare for your arrival? I said in a calm and collected tone, doing my very best not to reveal the panic and turmoil going on in my mind. Have your warrant of trade ready to present to our representative. The Astartes responded. I do not possess a warrant of trade, only a letter of mark. I shall have it ready to be presented at your command. I said and heard the other end of the conversation disconnect from the call as our engines died down and our inertial dampeners brought us to a halt. Barely two minutes passed before the expected Thunderhawk made itself visible on our scanners and a minute after that, it had landed and I was informed of a contingent of Astartes approaching the bridge at a brisk pace. I was standing on the bridge with the null box in my hands, Elris at my right side, and Trock at my left. I heard them coming long before I saw them, the impossibly heavy footsteps of a space marine in full armor sounding like the approaching steps of death. Something is coming. Trock said with conviction as he looked around for something to use as a weapon. Relax Trock. The Emperor's angels are coming to see us. I said, using an expression I knew he understood. Emperor's angels? Trock repeated slowly while scratching his head, the gears grinding audibly as he tried desperately to remember. The Emperor's Angels of Death Troc. Bringing the Emperor's anger to the filthy Xenos, remember? Troc had earned his right for the biochemical Ogren Neural Enhancement or Bony AD status by fighting Tyranids, also granting him a burning hatred towards the interstellar cockroaches. Having lost every other Ogren in his squad during the fighting, only surviving thanks to his freakish size and strength until reinforcements arrived at their position, his favorite pastime was now stepping on every bug he could find on the ship. Needless to say, he was plenty entertained when not busy being my enormous shadow of protection, like now. Oh, I remember. They kill the bad bugs very fast. Trock exclaimed and looked happy both with himself for remembering and with the prospect of seeing these angels for himself. He hoped they were big and good at killing bugs. He hated bugs, they hurt you and killed your friends, and you couldn't even eat them. As stimulating as this conversation was, the footsteps had come close enough that I anticipated them walking around the corner any second and was not disappointed. Six battle brothers were approaching fast, one with a helmet attached to his hip, all of them carrying the signature bolter and chains word. They came up to the three of us in formation and didn't stop until they were close enough that I had to look up at the seven-foot superhumans. Letter of Mark The one without a helmet demanded, his barrel chest making his voice impossibly deep and forceful. He sounded old, the three gold studs and three iron studs indicating 330 years of service as a full Astartes. I opened the null box and he carefully extracted the letter and scanned it before placing it back in the box. As he did, the remaining five relaxed the grip on their bolters. I had not realized it, but they had been ready to open fire at a moment's notice if their leader had commanded it. You can never be too careful in Segmentum Solar. We require your aid, rogue trader. 
The unhelmeted one said as he fixed me with a stare and I felt myself going weak under his gaze. It was like I was being stared down by a deadly predator that was only restrained by the greatest amount of cell control that had ever been exerted. Pirates are operating further in the sector, and we need you to find them. Our ships are known to their navigators and we cannot get close before they flee. The Emperor's justice must be fulfilled. Of course. Um, I didn't get your name? I said, a little confused on how to approach an Astartes. Sergeant Demias Iagimas, the Astart rumbled. Sergeant Demias, I will aid you in any way I can. But we must have a clear plan present otherwise, this operation is doomed to fail before it begins. Let us begin then. Demias rumbled, and just like that, I was roped into a five-hour-long meeting going over what he referred to as the beginning stages of a proper plan. Fuck my life, and the neck it rode it on. Chapter 22, A Taste of the Void It took no less than four days for Sergeant Demias to be satisfied with the plans we made to hunt down the pirates that were giving the Imperial Fists grief. For days of discussing possible scenarios, impossible scenarios, and potential courses of action depending on the response of the pirates to any theoretical situation. Estimated losses of my crew and soldiers, should they be allowed to board, and the response time for the Astartes reinforcements that were being made ready to move out at first contact with the pirates. Potential resources that could be reclaimed in the name of the Emperor and the assumed forces under the command of the pirates. For days of mind-numbing boredom, far worse than any prayer session. Take heed that you do not engage their commander without us. The man is a perverted witch, spreading his degenerate filth wherever he sets foot. Demias had warned me, and I understood enough to know that I was dealing with a psyker turned pirate captain. Elris was happy with this, her desire to root out heretical thoughts growing with each passing day. She was used to infiltrating and abolishing small cells of heretics, not spending endless days gathering information and cooking it down into note form for me to take advantage of. I had taken the sergeant's words to heart and had no plans to play the hero in all of this. Sure, I was a psyker myself, but I was untrained, and, more importantly, I was neither sanctioned to be a psyker nor known to be one, meaning I would get a target on my head if it ever became known. So while Elris was happy we got to hunt heretics, I was happy we got to take a back seat and function as nothing more than bait. Of course, we would still be placed in harm's way, but pirates had a habit of causing minimal destruction. If they could salvage it, they could sell or use it. And so it came to be that one week after being contacted by the Imperial Fists, I was taking my ship out to roam the trading lanes between the nearby local planets, running from one planet to another, hoping to get seen as a target for the pirates to jump on, and for once my luck failed me. Several weeks of playing bait yielded no results, and I started fearing that the Astartes might get impatient, but every time I approached the subject, I was met with reassurances that the time would come for our trap to be sprung, we just had to be patient. I was not so sure, and the constant waiting was taking its toll on me. My crew saw it as a vacation, spending their reduced work hours on anything one could think of, from illicit gambling and trading to engaging in hobbies like metal carving and painting. I guess even in this universe, people need something to distract them from the horrors they face in life. It had been damn near a month and I was slowly going mental from the waiting when suddenly the alarm klaxons sounded throughout the ship. I was on the bridge when it happened and was immediately informed that a small group of three unidentified ships was approaching fast. Pressing a button, I connected to the Vox in the navigator's sanctum and ordered him to inform the Astartes on standby. Meanwhile, the crew on my bridge was busy turning my ship around to turn tail and run. While the leading ship was a Hazeroth class like my own ship, the two escort carriers asterisk flying in formation alongside the pirate would surely spell doom if I chose to stay and fight. So, for now, I would have to take on the role of a lone merchant running scared without a plan. As the ship turned around and started running, we still had a good three million kilometers of distance from the enemy. With a ship lance battery having an effective range of roughly 300.000 kilometers, and lost burners having only two-thirds of the effective range and power, we were well beyond any attempts at hitting, much less damaging us. We were losing ground, but it had become a race to reach safety before we were intercepted, and even when we were, we would be looking at a few good hours of combat before we would realistically have lost. After running the calculations, it was estimated that we could keep running for close to 22 hours before being in the range of the enemy weapons, and from the response I got from Farson, our reinforcements were a mere 15 hours away. He also delivered an urgent request to fake an engine problem and slow down to make the arrival of our reinforcements match as closely as possible with the projected arrival of the Astartes strike cruiser and chose to take the advice. 
or some of it, slowing down enough for the intercept to match a 16-hour mark, giving us ample time for any minor mishaps to slow down the strike cruiser. When the orders were given I retreated to my cabin and donned my carapace armor. Luck favored the well-prepared, and I had no intention of being caught slipping, especially not when working with Astartes. Sure, it was going to take a whole lot more to get proper recognition from an Astartes chapter, but being known as at least competent enough to follow orders and prepare for the worst, just in case, would go a long way to not getting dismissed outright in any future dealings. Emerging once more, fully armored and with my stub cannon on my hip, I took my place at the helm and accepted the fate of waiting while the chase was on. I fell into a steady rhythm of updates about distance to the enemy, course changes, engine status, and a myriad of other minor things that helped me pass the time. I admit, I did send a prayer the Emperor's way at every hour, but that was more for my own mental state than in the hopes of it actually helping. I found that praying calmed me down during long periods of increased stress, like waiting for action. The hours slowly ticked away and the pirates slowly got closer, my wish to contact the Astartes, growing with each passing hour, but having the navigator contact them yielded the chance of the pirates' navigator picking up on the transmission of a message, alerting them that foul play was taking place. So I would have to be content with hoping they would be there. Not that I was too worried, we were talking about the Imperial Fists. The only chapter with a sense of duty that could rival the Ultramarines. I remember reading a fan theory back home about the Ultramarines only being so successful because orcs believe blue increases luck. So having an Astartes chapter completely decked out in royal blue was bound to have the orcs mess up something considering the psychic bleeding effect of all orcs and the way it actively influenced the universe around them. Not that I ever put much faith in the fan theory, but it was a fun line of thought nonetheless, and it would cause most if not all imperial branches to have a collectively blown mind if it ever became a public theory in this world. Entire star systems would be scoured clean of life in an attempt to eradicate the idea. My mind was drifting and I returned it to the present, focusing on the tactical display in front of me. Slowly, kilometer by kilometer, the pirates were gaining on us and I had no way of trying fancy maneuvers to try and increase the distance. The two escort ship made sure of that. It was a brilliant, yet very simple and very human, hunting strategy. Persistence hunting. Hunting something down fast enough that it doesn't get to rest up between bouts of chasing, but slow enough that you could keep it up for days if needed. I could of course attempt a warp jump, but they would simply follow me to my destination, making the whole thing redundant and a wasted effort. So there was only running and hoping the plan would work. It most likely would though, the Imperial Fists would not allow something as menial as a band of pirates to stain their reputation. As the hours closed in and the pirates closed the distance, I started growing nervous. I did my best to not show it, but this was my first real engagement in void combat and I could not escape the fact that I was massively worried. I was up against experienced renegades, I was in charge of a void ship, commanding over 25,000 crew and soldiers. And all I had to support the choices I made was a few weeks of reading, some basic soldier training, and my fanboy knowledge from back home. And of course, the system I was a part of. I had not checked up on it since the ship entered the void, and I felt a little disgusted by my own lack of interest in something that gave me such a blatant advantage, but it would have to wait until after this little intermission in life. At three hours left until the supposed arrival of my Astartes allies, the Vox operator informed me that I was being hailed. I gave the order to ignore the hails, seeing to point in incurring both the wrath of Elris and the Imperial Fists by initiating contact with a renegade. Incoming message, the operator informed me moments later. What does it say? I asked quickly. The system brings us all together. The renegades know the truth. The answer came after a moment of hesitation, the confusion evident in the trooper. Insane ramblings of a renegade degenerate. Purge the message, no response. I said with as much disgust as I could muster. Elris nodded in approval and the men and women operating on the bridge collectively sighed in silent relief. But my mind was racing. The renegades knew of the system? And what was that about the system bringing them together? There was no chance I could exchange words with this person, but if the renegades knew about the system, I had to find a way to get Elris off my ship and gain true freedom. But if my opponent was a system user, surely it would aid them in the coming battle. Then again, the system was mostly a bonus for the individual, not the collective, at least not from what I had seen, beyond a very circumstantial ability of mine. In a void fight it was more or less useless. So everything hinged on me having taken well to the self-imposed training of mine, to make me at least somewhat useful in the coming conflict. 
Even with an Astartes strike cruiser backing me up, I would still have to contest with the two escort ships while they boarded and disabled the renegade Hazeroth using boarding torpedoes asterisk asterisk. No matter, they were not big enough to present a serious threat unless I allowed them to be one. Our shields were strong, I had enough troops to repel boarding attempts, and while my weapons were not as good as they could be, they would still be enough. As for how much damage I would sustain, that depended on how well my crew performed, what orders I gave, the same for the two escort ships, and a million other little things. So, it would be more or less random. The minutes ticked by as the tension grew palpable on board my ship. The orders shouted between the crew became sharper in tone and less forgiving about minor mistakes. Several smaller fights almost erupted, and only the intervention of my guardsmen prevented it from escalating I would need to recruit more bosuns to keep the peace among my crew. This gave me an idea concerning Elris, but it needed more thought before I could consider it viable. But maybe increasing the ship's number of confessors asterisk 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 could convince her that I was pious enough for her to resume her regular duties. Sure, we had fun at night, but I was under no illusions in that regard. I was a pleasant distraction from her duties, but nothing more than that. Three hundred years of rooting out heresy from within had hardened her heart to a point where concepts such as love and a compassion only existed to express her feelings about the emperor and the imperium in general. It didn't make her visit any less fun, but it made it that much easier to leave her behind. I wanted home, and to get it, I would have to rid myself of imperial representatives, which included future fleet commissars. They had the power to declare entire crews, including the captain, unfit for service, an effective way of keeping captains in check which also explained the blatant lack of them on most, if not all, rogue trader ships. Nobody wants someone nearby that has the power to have one of the freest agents in the Imperium, restrained and possibly executed, on nothing more than twisting of words and events, and an intent to take them out of service. The warning klaxon ringing out across the ship ripped me out of my introspection and I returned my focus to the present. Ship transitioning into system. The lieutenant in charge of the station called out to me, and I snapped my eyes to the large viewport surrounding the bridge. True to the trooper's words, a massive circular portal opened up and a light strike cruiser emerged from within, the four and a half kilometer long ship quickly entered real space, revealing that all engines were firing and they were headed straight at the main ship of the three in pursuit. I gave the order to turn around and provide escort for the strike cruiser. Despite momentary panic from the renegade pirates, they quickly regained their composure. They opted for sending one of the escort ship to tie up my ship while they attempted to take down the strike cruiser. Against a baseline human, it would have made sense. But pitted against Astartes with their superior. Everything really. It was a fruitless effort that I later learned saw the destruction of the escort ship before the boarding space marines had taken the bridge of the Hazeroth. But I had my own dance partner and I planned to wear them out quickly. Overall, I had a better ship, a larger crew, and more to live for. I also had backup in case things went badly, but it was unlikely. As we closed on the escort ship, I ordered the void shields raised and weapons prepared to combat. I would be faced with a choice as to whether I wanted to board the enemy vessel or try to disable it from the safety of distance. While a boarding action would get me another ship, I did not have the manpower to spare, at least not at the moment, to undertake such a risk. So blasting them from a distance was the choice of the day. Get us within range of the macro cannons asterisk 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 and loss burners. I want to see that ship turned into debris before our Astartes allies are finished with their prey. I demanded and my order was immediately put into effect. The first salvo was exchanged and the shields held on both sides, but then one of the loss burners fired and seared against the void shield of the escort ship. The shield buckled and crackled under the onslaught, but ultimately held out. They fired back and we began a dance of death in the void. As long as the shields held, this pattern of fire and return fire would continue until either a critical ship component would get hit, like the engines or bridge, or one of us blew up under the furious assault of the guns. But it never got to that point. After around 40 minutes of combat, their shield was noticeably weaker and flickered every so often, but I never got to deliver the death blow, as two torpedoes came flying from the direction of the Astartes strike cruiser, one made the shield fail and the next one connected cleanly with the engine. Judging from the way the engine compartment ripped the ship apart shortly after, instead of blowing up immediately, told me it was a melted torpedo they had used. Punching its way through the armor and setting everything inside ablaze, the short flash of roughly 15 million degrees Celsius was enough to melt parts of the superstructure the ship was built around. 
Switching my attention, I saw the other escort ship drifting aimlessly away from the battle, while the Hazeroth was simply hanging in space, with Thunderhawks flying back and forth between it and the strike cruiser. Once more, the superiority of an Astartes mind made itself evident. The Space Marines lived combat. They breathed combat. They saw combat in the name of the Emperor as the singular purpose of their existence, and they had hundreds, theoretically thousands of years to learn how to be better at it. Going up against a strike cruiser, even two-on-one, was bound to end in your demise, unless you had Astartes on your side or your ships were significantly bigger and better defended, both inside and out. I was debating internally whether to keep an escort ship for myself or not, but that choice was made for me as more torpedoes made contact with both ships and turned them into a field of fine debris. The Hazeroth was still intact, but I doubted I could lay claim to a ship that matched my own when a renegade had been the captain. It would be stripped clean, examined inside and out, split up, and used for spare parts. Those parts deemed salvageable anyhow. Demias walked onto my bridge once more to thank me for my generous assistance and to offer assistance in any future ventures I might undertake in this area of space. Mostly empty words meant to keep up etiquette, but there was a kernel of truth in them. This action would indeed give me, no matter how small and insignificant, a minor claim to help that would carry more weight once my actions here were taken into consideration. One last thing. Demias rumbled as he was about to bid us farewell. A message was sent from the renegade to your ship, and the contents worry us. The familiarity of the message suggested he had knowledge of you, and whatever system he was talking about, I hope you have a good explanation, rogue trader. You with horror, I realized that the power fist asterisk 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 equipped on his armor had crackled to life. The threat in the words was barely veiled, the need for such niceties was well past, especially when you remembered that the five honor guards of the sergeant would be more than enough to take this ship under their control, should they wish it. My saving grace came from an unexpected source, to put it mildly. The traitor captain is a faithful servant of the emperor. He dismissed the ramblings of the madman as such and ordered the message purged from the system, with no reply, the moment he learned what it contained. The young commissar that was still traveling with me to keep Troc under control until he had been bonded enough to me to put my safety above all else, spoke up, and everyone turned their head to look at him. This was a significant testimony to my character, as the commissars were exceptionally well known to be suspicious and distrustful by nature. I can confirm the commissar's words, I was standing nearby the captain when he gave the order, Gelris spoke up as well. And faced with an inquisitorial agent and a commissar, in agreement, Demias capitulated quickly. Very well, for a moment I was prepared to deliver the Emperor's mercy to you, just to be safe. But it would seem I have misjudged your character. Keep your faith strong and your bolter armed, rogue trader. Farewell. And with that, Demius turned on his heels and walked back toward the Thunderhawk that would carry him and his honor guard back to their strike cruiser. I was once more struck by how close I had been to death. If Demius had been so inclined, no force in the nearby void could have prevented my death, along with every single other mortal on my ship. Say what you want about the Imperial Fists, but they are effective and tenacious. When the strike cruiser had warped out of the system, I messaged Farson to plot our course once more and get us underway. We had already wasted a month for nothing more than a thank you and a handshake. It was time for us to do something a little more profitable and interesting than playing bait for the Astartes. Back awaited for us, and with it, a wealth of opportunities. Chapter 23, Heresy Without, Heresy Within The rest of our journey passed in relative peace and quiet. Elris had relaxed with her which hunt among the crew, due in no small part to my appointing several of the more pious crew, those that spent most, if not all, of their time at the shrines where they prayed fervently to the emperor. These preachers had, with my blessing, been given authority to start their own gatherings of followers among the crew to serve as makeshift temple and church attendants, until I could either get my hands on a smaller escort ship I could turn into a flying cathedral to serve the spiritual needs of my crew, and of course show of my piety to the ecclesiarchy, or at least turn a spare hanger into a permanent temple. Later on, the natural need for humanity to see one among them rise to be a leader would see one or more confessors appear, chosen by the preachers to be the link between the ecclesiarchy and the officers on board the ship. I didn't mind that at all, as they did not have enough authority to be able to touch me. They did, however, have the authority to hound me ceaselessly and report me to the ecclesiarchy as well should I start falling from the emperor's light. A small price to pay for the freedom that was at my fingertips. I just had two more problems to deal with and I would be truly free. 
one commissar, which would leave my ship as soon as we reached Baca, his almost godlike patience and open-minded understanding was needed to train more ogrins into useful soldiers and guards. The other problem was a tad more difficult. A long-legged, red-haired, church-sanctioned killer with a specialty in infiltration and information extraction. Not only would she be difficult to rid myself of, but I would also miss her company at night, though I would not have any trouble there. A word, a command, a single indication was all that was needed and most, if not all, female crew members and or troopers would come to my chambers. A chance to climb the social ladder was always jumped upon, and the women of this universe fully understood the advantage they could wield simply by being women. Of course, had I been born into a rogue trader dynasty I would have had obligations and duties to the bloodline that required me to marry very specifically, to further political alliances and send signals of allegiance, but as a newly anointed rogue trader, if slightly hampered by the lack of ability to create a lasting dynasty, I was fair game to any and all women in the galaxy. This could be both advantageous and dangerous. There would be nobles that would want to lock me in marriage with daughters or sons had my desires been such. The Imperium did not discriminate against your sexual preference as long as you did your assigned duty. I was hoping that the rapid increase in preachers and the knowledge that they would soon elect confessors among themselves would convince Elris that there was a far better use for her skills elsewhere. The Ecclesiarchy hadn't trained her the way they had, just for her to hide away on the ship of an emerging rogue trader. And maybe, just maybe, I could nudge things in the right direction if I played my card right when we hit Baca. It shouldn't be difficult to get a meeting with a high-ranking official to influence toward the right choice, for the safety and protection of the Imperium of course. As the days passed and my newly appointed preachers took to their new stations with gusto, Elris found herself in the rather unique position of being content with the faith of the crew, but incredibly frustrated as she had nothing to do. The way she skulked around the shadows of the corridors of the ship at all hours, spoke of a woman that sought some form of distraction or work. Anything other than the tedious waiting of warp travel. She lamented her boredom to me in private, taking great care to express that she was not unhappy with the state of things, but rather with her inability to do her assigned job. The engagement with the renegades had even made the crew accept the contingent of guardsmen I brought with me when I took the ship into possession, meaning she couldn't even divert her attention to peacekeeping duties anymore. It was perfect for me and my plans. Eventually, she approached me one evening after I had withdrawn to my quarters. You have done very well in your new role, Bjork. You have adapted better than imagined, and all while keeping your faith in the Emperor strong and your opinion of yourself humble. I do not doubt that the Imperium will benefit greatly from your service. But my duties call me to seek out heresy within and eradicate it wherever I find it. And from your recent promotion of several preachers, your immediate dismissal of contact with a renegade captain, and the willingness with which you offered your assistance to the Astartes, I see no reason to remain aboard your flagship for any longer than it takes for us to reach Baca. A station of that size is bound to have degenerates and scum that requires purging and I plan to offer my assistance to the local ecclesiarchial representatives. It has been fun and you have been an interesting experience, but duty calls. I had to suppress a smile as Elris was trying hard to make it sound as if she was reluctant to go, but I knew better. She was going crazy from not having anything to do and this was the best excuse she could come up with to find a new way to continue snuffing out life in the name of the emperor. But I had to keep up with the act to ensure her departure. I cannot say I am happy about this, Elris, but we must all serve the Emperor as best as we can. But I want to thank you for your invaluable assistance in making this a successful venture, for both me and the Ecclesiarchy. I am going to miss having you on board, but as you said, duty calls. Though, I am going to have to get used to sleeping alone once more. I played my part beautifully, and my words put a sly smile on her face before she shook her head and said, Please, Bjork, don't give me that. You have been a pleasant way to pass the time, but we each have our path to follow. And I am curious how you will fare without the guiding hand of the Ecclesiarchy to guide you. Don't think I don't see what you are doing. Appointing more preachers, giving me more free time to do nothing while you bury yourself in data slates and studies. You want me off the ship, which I was planning anyway. But I admit that our encounter with the Renegade and your immediate dismissal of his attempts to communicate have hastened my decision to do so. I understand you want to stand on your own legs and start building a fortune and a name like other rogue traders. Just don't forget who you answer to. Her voice was warm and intimate while speaking, but the last sentence was delivered with enough seriousness to convey the message perfectly. There would be eyes casting their gaze in my direction from time to time and I had better continue delivering results. 
Not that I worried about that, in the veiled region, which was the closest uncharted area of relative safety where I could run back to friendlier territory if things got out of hand, there would be plenty of planets and areas of space to explore, renegades to find and question about the system, and who knew what else to find among the unexplored stars. All right, Elris. You got me? I am eager to stand on my own two legs. Don't get me wrong, I appreciate both the help and the companionship you have offered, and I would be lying if I said I would have done fine on my own. Blessed throne, I doubt I would have known how to properly deal with the Emperor's angels of death had it not been for you and the work you have done for me. Thank you. Might as well come clean and throw a bit of flattery in there for good measure. Elris didn't respond beyond a smile and a nod, and then she left for her quarters, leaving me to contemplate the near future. Elris had solved a problem that had caused me no small amount of headaches. And she had done so of her own free will, even if it was for reasons that I had completely overlooked as a possibility. Sheer, absolute, boredom. I leaned back in my chair and gave it some more thought. Boredom was not a thing in the Imperium. If you had time left over when you met your work quota, you just kept working in the hopes of getting ahead on the quota for tomorrow, which would never happen. Even among leaders, boredom was not a thing that existed as there was always something to do when you were in a position of power. Only at the very top of the social order, among the planetary rulers and the oldest of the rogue traders, could you find boredom regularly, which was also the reason for, relatively, many planetary rulers succumbing to the influence of the ruinous powers of chaos on a regular basis. When you have everything you could dream of, and no one to reign in your delusions, then corruption, nepotism, perversion, and degeneracy usually entered the picture, and the Imperium was a perfect example of this. The more power you gave an individual from the Imperium, the greater the chances of them being corrupted by the ruinous powers. For all its posturing and proclamation of greatness, the very way the Imperium was built up provided ample ground for the seeds of heresy to take place. It struck me how casually I was thinking of the imperial cult as the basic truth at this point. When had I become so casually religious? Or what it just a way of thinking that made my current life make sense? It was true, I felt more calm and peaceful after praying, but that could just as well have come as a result of focusing my thought on a singular thing, like meditation back home. Only, they had found a way to combine it with religious indoctrination. In a way, it was a beautiful piece of social engineering taking place every hour of every day across the entirety of the Imperium's holdings. It also gave the ecclesiarchy an immense amount of power as the official state church. I suddenly remembered that I hadn't checked my status screen in a while and seeing as I had nothing to do and I was alone in my private quarters, what better chance to do so? Human. Level 6. Stat points remaining, 5. Alignment, Faithful Imperial. Litanies, 35. Augmentations, Cybernetic Lung, Upgrade LVL1, Toxins slash Environment. Level, 9728-19200. Strength, 11. Agility, 9. Perception, 13. Will, 14. Luck, 31. Psyche, for slash 500. Skills. Feats. Abilities. Retinue. Ha new level. Which of course meant five more stat points to play with. My luck was already my highest stat by more than double that of my second highest, so there was no reason to pump that even more for the time being. My agility was the lowest stat and I was standing in front of a choice for the future. I could keep pumping my will, luck, and perception stats, ignore strength and agility, use bionics to compensate and armor to protect myself. Or, I could try to catch up with agility and a bit more strength and start relying on natural skill rather than armor and, frankly, unneeded bionic upgrades. I would have to ponder this question before I allocated the points, but it would have to happen soon. Far too many times had I left points to be allocated when they could have helped me out. I needed to stop being so timid with my choices and start accepting my choices as I made them. Psyche had also increased a small amount even if I didn't use it. That was worrying. It would seem that just being connected to the warp as a psyker caused the warp powers to slowly, ever so slowly, increase on their own. That meant I needed to train to keep myself safe, eventually, or suffer a fate worse than death. Being an unbound demon host asterisk was about as bad as it could ever get in this universe, having my very soul condemned to eternal suffering and torture. If I did not train my psychic abilities, I would not know how to mask them, and that would make me shine like a lighthouse in the night for any psychers or warp entities that might be interested in an untapped and untrained source of psychic energy. Which meant everyone. 
Provided, of course, I didn't get picked up by the black ships and used as a sacrificial offering to keep the golden throne working. Funny, it only took me to be transported to another universe, in one of the worst possible places to appear, to start improving myself as a man. I would have cried if not for the irony. But why hadn't my quest to become a rogue trader finished? I was promised a reward upon achieving the title, yet, my pool of stat points remained suspiciously low. What is up with that system? Where the hell is my bloody quest completion reward? I couldn't do anything about it, so there was nothing gained by wasting thought on it, but damn it, that was not fair. If there were hidden stipulations or parameters for completion, it wasn't fair to keep that information from me. I rubbed my temples and prepared to turn in for the night when my personal vox made a noise. I pressed a button on the wall to connect the attempted communication. Speak! I demanded tiredly. Sir, the ogren is out of control. He is trying to break through a bulkhead to get into some of the crew quarters. The voice of the trooper on the other end was frantic and panicked, and it kicked E out of my tired state in an instant. A rampaging ogren on a ship traveling through the warp. The implications were horrendous and it was made all the more terrible when you realized that Trock was a freak of nature, even among ogrens. His 600 strength was a testament to the sturdy nature of imperial construction if he had not managed to get through the bulkhead to whatever had enraged him. Inform the commissar. I yelled into the vox and jumped from Y chair to the lift that would take me to the bridge. Every second felt like a minute on the very short trip down, and I was greeted by the sight of a panicking bridge crew that stared fearfully down the corridors on the far end. A guardsman was fidgeting and shaking as he stood by the lift, waiting for me. Lead the way, I commanded as I jumped off the lift before it touched down, and the trooper shot me a look like I had ordered him to charge a space marine, but he hunched his shoulders and started running, with me in close pursuit. It only took a minute before we could hear the efforts of a nine-foot behemoth trying to break down a pressurized steel door designed for regular humans to use. From the roars of anger and frustration and the loud banging of what I could only assume to be a part of the ship he had acquired to serve as a bludgeoning tool, it sounded like my new bodyguard had indeed lost his mind completely. We rounded a corner and the sight that greeted us made my blood freeze for a moment. Every vein on Trock's massive body was bulging as if it was about to burst open, he was screaming and roaring like a madman possessed, and he was hammering relentlessly on the door with a large piece of piping he had ripped off the wall, covering the hallway in a thick layer of steam. Trock! Stop! I yelled as loud as I could, but I couldn't even hear myself over the noise the ogren was making. A moment later the commissar arrived, took in the situation in a heartbeat, drew his bolt pistol, and fired it once at the nearest unfortunate crew member standing nearby. The poor man's left side of the torso exploded in a shower of blood and chunks of meat, covering the dozen or so crew embers behind him in blood and gore. The sound of the shot was deafening in the tight corridors inside the ship and it was enough to make Trock turn his head, see the commissar swing his bolt pistol around to aim it at Trock and bellow out a cease immediately, Trock. With enough volume to make my chest vibrate. No doubt he had vocal implants that allowed him to raise his voice above the cacophony of battle to give orders. Now that was an implant I would like to get my hands on at the earliest possible chance. The rampaging ogren halted for just a moment, and it was enough for his primitive augmented mind to kick back in and realize that he had been given an order. Slowly, ever so slowly, he lowered the pipe and put it on the ground before stepping back from it, at which point the commissar holstered his bolt pistol and walked over to the now very embarrassed and frightened ogren. They must have classes on how to walk because there was something deeply menacing about the way the commissar dug his heels in with every step. Not a sound was heard over the clicking of his heels against the steel hull and he didn't stop until he was right in front of the towering abhuman. Explain yourself. His voice was barely more than a hissed whisper, but everyone heard it clear as day, and the lethal intent behind the words was palpable. I heard the man say the emperor was wrong and stupid. Trock finally managed to stammer out, now shaking with fear at the thought of how much he had displeased the emperor with his actions. His words made the commissar stiffen as if someone had slapped him across the face, but after a few seconds, he whirled around and pointed to the guardsman that had led me here. You! He said as he pointed the guardsman out, lock down this entire section and assemble ten squads here within the thirty minutes. There is heresy to snuff out. The grin of malicious glee that crossed his face as he said the last words made even me feel uneasy. The man lived and breathed for the chance to kill anyone that didn't follow the imperial cult blindly. This was the only time he felt truly alive. Hunting and killing the enemies of the Imperium. I used my own vox to contact Elris. What? 
In packing, came the irritated voice of the fiery redhead. We have just locked down a section of crew quarters. Trock was trying to break down a bulkhead. Apparently, he heard someone denouncing the emperor. I said casually and waited for her response. When thirty seconds had passed I started worrying the excitement might have made her pass out, but another fifteen seconds later I heard the sounds of running footsteps. Figures she wouldn't even wait to tell me she was on her way, she was worse than the commissar when it came to religious zealotry. Why are we not hunting down the heretics already? She exclaimed as soon as she was within earshot, but before I could answer, the commissar broke into the conversation, we need at least ten squads to cover this area effectively. They will be assembled within the next thirty minutes, at which point we will start interrogations. Very well, I will gather my tools then, Elris stated and started walking back to where she came from. Trock, I want you to stay with me as we do this. I have a feeling I might need you when this begins. I said and that now quite shameful and subdued Ogren dutifully took up his position by my left side and I started walking to the armory with him. Might as well get him armed if we were going to do this. With the commissar there, he wouldn't do this kind of thing. Hopefully, I wouldn't need the young man after we reached Baka. I would have to spend more time with the Ogren and maybe find some way to interact with him as I had done with others. But that had been accidental and Trok had cranial augmentations, making him smarter than the average Ogren. That would have to wait, however, as we have heresy on board MY ship to root out. It was nice to be on the well-armed side for once. Chapter 24 Final Preparations Before Entering the Fray it barely took fifteen minutes for the requested squads to assemble, they no doubt felt inspired by the trigger-happy commissar in a foul mood. I would love to tell a grand tale of hunting down a secret cult of heretics, culminating in an epic battle with a minor demon. But I would be lying. The soldiers entered the section on lockdown and found the heretic believers already bound and ready to be given the emperor's mercy. It would seem the regular crew had already snuffed out those spreading propaganda against the imperium and attempted to restrain them. This had caused conflict with the followers of the heretical thinking, both those who did so in the open and those who were hiding, no doubt to further spread the malicious influence on board my ship. The result was a minor brawl that had been resolved before we entered and in the hopes of being spared a heretic's death, the loyal crew had done our work for us. This was not enough for Elris or our young commissar, and they organized a thorough interrogation of every individual that had been inside the section in question, and for every heretic they found, their entire social circle and work colleagues were brought in for further questioning. In a single day they had rooted out and killed no less than 152 heretic believers, a not insignificant amount, but it was what it was. The rest of the ship sector was rounded up after the interrogations and gathered in a nearby hangar holding Valkyrie gunships. As they stood around nervously, surrounded by my guardsmen and murmuring amongst themselves. As I approached, flanked by Elris and the commissar, and Trock lumbering close behind me, I could smell the fear in the air. They feared for their lives as they rightfully should. On most other ships in the Imperium, they would simply be shot and fed to the reactor core, as pragmatic and abrupt as the Imperium could make it. Can't be a heretic when you are dead, and the engine can always use more fuel. However, I had very different plans for these people. They were indentured workers, doomed to an existence of backbreaking and mind-crushing labor until they broke down and died, or tried shirking their duties and got killed or turned into servitors. No pay, lousy and never enough food, cramped living conditions even by imperial ship standards, frequent physical punishment, casual abuse from the void's men, high mortality rate, and low life expectancy. They lived in a concentration camp from back home, and most considered it a comfortable, if bleak, existence. I was about to become the closest thing to a god these people had ever laid their eyes on. We stopped as we reached the middle of the hangar and I felt the eyes of the gathered workers fall on us. How do you wish to proceed with the rest of the workers, Captain? The commissar asked as we came to a stop and I thought about it for a short second. Better to give the impression that I desired their counsel in this situation. I would hear your advice before I decide, I told them, and they wasted no time in informing me of what they would have done. Grant them the emperor's mercy. Who knows how many of them still believe in the heretic's words? The commissar uttered without hesitation. Let me take them to the ecclesiarchy's chambers once we reach Baca. They will soon enough know what they know. Elris said, glee and malicious intent oozing from her words. No need for such frivolities. Better to send a clear and strong message, both to any heretics in hiding and to the rest of the crew. That insubordination and radical thinking will be met with a swift death. 
The commissar bristled at Elris's words, and I had suspected he was measuring the cost versus gain on the fly and found it to be an extravagant use of resources that could be better spent on more tangible things, like soldiers on the front line and firing squads for deserters. What better message to send the unbelievers, than one of warning that they will be found and brought to justice? Elris retorted and I sensed a larger conflict brewing between the two. It was bound to happen, the two conflicting branches of the Imperium would always see their organization first, the Imperium second, though they would state the opposite whenever pressed for answers, and in a twisted way, they did see it as the ultimate truth. In their minds, if their organization flourished, so did the Imperium. I cleared my throat and both Elris and the Commissar snapped their heads to me before remembering that this was, in fact, my ship. And as a now full rogue trader, my authority was on par with the most powerful and influential individuals in the Imperium, at least on paper. I still had no legends tied to my name, but that would come in time. For now, I just needed the two to remember that the decision was ultimately mine, as the crew in question was a part of my ship. What are you thinking, Captain? Elris asked, the strain of self-control evident in her voice and I now understood why she had never advanced beyond infiltration. She was emotional. She took things personally and had difficulty keeping personal opinion and imperial duty separate. Promote them, I said flatly, and they both stared at me like I was a talking tyranid that had just asked them to go get tea and crumpets. I'm serious, I said after a moment of stunned silence. I can always use more dedicated voidsmen. They would be bound to the ship, no different from their current situation, there would be soldiers around them at all times along with the officers, they would serve the ship for the rest of their mortal lives, and it would show the rest of the crew that not only is imperial duty expected to be followed, but doing it well is also rewarded. If we do this, I do not doubt that more heretics will suddenly be ousted by people that realize the folly of listening to heretical thoughts and opinions, in the days to come. Besides, what better way to ensure loyalty than binding their service to my ship? Part of the ship, part of the crew. I could hear the wheels in their heads turning as they mulled over my words. My logic was sound and it would not only spare the Imperium the resources, meager as they were, to replenish said indentured workers, but binding them to permanent service on board my ship by freeing them from indentured servitude would show I was more generous than most when it came to excelling at your duties and obligations to the Imperium, thus increasing overall crew loyalty. They were hesitant around me as I was still an unknown entity. They had no idea if I was a spoiled noble son from the upper spires of a hive world, the heir to a long and ancient dynasty of rogue traders, steeped in tradition and etiquette, or a newcomer. My mood and my reactions were unknown to them. I might shoot a messenger or reward him for bringing me news, good or bad, swiftly and without delay. This action would cement to the entire crew that I was strict but far more generous and fair than they could have ever hoped for. That is quite benevolent of you, considering the circumstances. The commissar said. What circumstances? They did their imperial duty upon discovering heresy in their midst. What more could you ask of them? I countered. Elris interjected, heresy should never have found its way in there, to begin with. By that logic, we should punish every single person on board, ourselves included. No, my decision stands. These men and women are to be freed from indentured work, on condition they enter into service as voidsmen on this ship. Unless, of course, one of you wants to start giving orders on my ship. This was the first time I assumed a position of authority over Elris and the Commissar, but not only was it my right to do so in this situation, as it involved the crew on my ship, but it was also about time I showed them that I was no pushover. Of course, Captain, it will be as you command. Elris responded with the slightest hint of amusement in her voice. The commissar took a little longer to accept things, but eventually managed a, a very well, before he turned on his heel and walked out of the hangar. Well, Captain. Your subjects are waiting. Elris said and made a theatrical gesture toward the large group of crew members huddled together under the watchful gaze of a few dozen guardsmen. I took a few steps forward and cleared my throat before speaking to the gathered workers. Loyal citizens of the Imperium. You have been put in an extraordinary situation and acted like true imperials. As a result of your swift action upon the discovery of heresy, the apostates were granted the emperor's mercy before they could spread their cancerous beliefs and thought any more than they already had. The imperium thanks you for your service as do I. Therefore, those of you that may wish it, will be offered a chance to enter into my service as voidsmen, a significant promotion from your current life. There will be a period of training and testing, but I am confident that you will all prove more than capable. Those that do not wish to take this opportunity may leave at once. 
those that wish to become sworn voidsmen may stay and a sergeant will come to assign you to your new living quarters. Ave Imperator. My last words were echoed by everyone present and for a short second, I felt the power of having thousands of people ready to obey your every command. The roar from the workers was loud and enthusiastic, and when I looked over the crowd, I saw nothing but adoration and gratefulness in their eyes. It would seem you were not mistaken. Rarely have I seen such sad fates, look at their lord with such reverence. It is usually fear and duty that motivates the troops. I must admit, this confuses me, Bjork. How did you ever think of this as a viable option? Elris sounded genuinely intrigued, as if the thought of treating those beneath you like anything other than dirt was as alien to her as the idea of not killing a heretic. I shrugged slightly before responding, you gain more favor among the men with Razvad than Rotgut. Then Elris did something I had not heard before. She laughed. Not a controlled chuckle or an amused snicker, but a bubbly laugh that was better suited for a young innocent woman than the centuries-old killer in front of me. She laughed until the tears rolled down her cheeks and she gasped for air. That's a good one. I will have to remember that one. It might even make an Astartes laugh. I wasn't even trying to be funny. I murmured, which only increased her laughing fit. To their credit, the guardsmen had hurried the soon-to-be voidsmen away as, unsurprisingly, none had opted to remain an indentured worker. Sure, being a voidsman was not much better, but you got paid, meaning you could escape reality with alcohol or drugs for a few hours when you were not on duty, and you had the occasional shore leave whenever the ship made port. All in all, I had massively upgraded their quality of life, or at least given them a chance at getting said upgrade. For the entire rest of the day, Elris would snicker every time she saw me, and I had to admit it was getting annoying. Was this universe so bleak that a badly performed crude joke was enough to warrant this kind of reaction? Maybe I should have tried to become a comedian instead. Then again, comedy is usually based on satire, and if there is one thing I know the Imperium lacks, it is enough self-awareness to laugh at themselves. With this minor incident well over with, things quickly fell back into the routine of warp travel. My prediction also came true, as several more groups of heretical thinkers were exposed in the following week. I had a few more complaints from the Voidmasters, on account of the new recruits I had thrown at them and the sudden drop in their worker numbers, but they knew better than to do more than light complaining. Besides, I was planning to let them do a run for indentured workers at the next hive world we reached. Pressganging regular imperial workers into indentured servitude was not a thing I was proud of having to do, but it was the way of things here. It still took another month to get near where I wanted us to be, and one fine morning, drinking my recaf and poring over the local maps of the segmentum, I was called to the bridge and informed of a Vox communication from Baca Naval Base. We are being hailed, Captain. The Vox operator informed me as soon as I left the elevator. Baca Station is demanding we identify ourselves before we continue further. Well, don't keep them waiting. And inform them that I desire to speak with an Astartes representative at the earliest convenience. Be polite and make no demands, only requests. We would not benefit from insulting the Emperor's angels. I ordered and took a seat in the command chair overseeing the bridge. Baca Naval Base was, as the name implied, host to Battle Fleet Baca, under the command of the Ultramarines. The poster boys of the Imperium. The spitting image of duty and going by the book, anything not supported by the Codex Astartes would not be undertaken. Thankfully, a rogue trader carried the same authority and freedom as an Astartes chapter master, meaning my authority over myself and anyone under my command was absolute. Well, except for the Inquisition when they desired something from me, but that is the price I have to pay for my freedom in a universe where such a word is considered quite filthy. The communications flew back and forth for a few moments and we were granted safe passage, for which I was sorely grateful. Having an imperial naval base manned by imperial fists, and the homeworld of the Crimson Fists being located in a sector close to the naval base only added to the danger of approaching Segmentum Pacificus without proper authorization. Now the only choice left would be what to do once I had dropped off Elris and the commissar that had finished his duties in ensuring Troc was loyal to me, and was now needed to train more abhumans for the front lines. I could visit a hive world, replenish the indentured workers that had been uplifted, pick up some trading goods for my travels, and head out in search of new and unexplored worlds. I could visit a feudal world and stock up on food and possibly exotic goods, able to be sold at a great profit down the line. Maybe even pick up a few specialists in close combat to train my guard regiments. Being on a ship, close combat was inevitable, and if my troops had received superior training they would stand a better chance at surviving and succeeding. 
I could go hunting pirates and renegades, though this was a dangerous gamble. My ship was still only equipped with basic loss burners and I only had one. Going pirate hunting, I would have much better chances if I could secure an escort ship or two. Or I could start digging around the underhive bars and communities, putting my ear to the ground and finding any rumor, tall tale, story, and adventure I can, and start looking for the answer I already desire with deep desperation, how do I get home? But this carried its own risk, my lacking reputation and lack of accomplishments granted me precious little goodwill when it came to doing things of questionable behavior, as far as the Imperium was concerned. It could draw the exact kind of attention I did not want, both from inside Imperial ranks and from the ruinous powers. So many options and so little room to act. Chapter 25 Slumming it on Slud The choice was obvious when I thought about it. I would have to find myself some melee specialists to train the soldiers under my command, the advantage could prove to be invaluable once I joined in ship-to-ship -ship combat. But I also wanted to upgrade the general weaponry available to my soldiers. The Void's men would need shot cannons instead of the regular Ironclaw shotguns, and the Void Masters would enjoy being upgraded to the Lucius Pattern Mark 22C revolver slash shotgun hybrid, preferred by the Death Corps of Krieg combat engineers. This would free a hand to wield a melee weapon, instead of relying on a cumbersome shotgun requiring both hands. Maybe 400 or so of the lathe pattern boarding gun. The extreme recoil meant that only the biggest and strongest of the Void's men could use it, but that would only add to the effect of boarding parties. The larger shells and the fact that it could fire all three barrels at once meant that it could pulp anything that wasn't clad in copious amounts of serious armor. Of course, it had a rather limited range, but for combat in void ships, it was perfect, the cramped and snaking corridors making optimal conditions for just such a weapon. A standard close combat weapon would also have to be chosen and trained with, again, something that would give me the most bang for my buck. Axes were a good contender, but since they were favored by renegades and heretics, it would paint the wrong image of my soldiers, and it could not parry effectively as well. No, it would have to be some form of blade and I was leaning toward falchions. Heavier than the cutlass and combining the best aspects of both the sword and the axe, they would deliver the results I desired, and with just a little gold ornamentation and a skull or two, they would look oh so good, when lining up to impress imperial representatives. Of course, all of this was going to cost me a not insignificant amount of imperial thrones, but since I was going to a feudal world anyway, the blades would at least be cheap and well-made. I could pick up the guns at Bacchus Station, but I would either have to pay up or offer up my services as payment. One would not think it initially, but the freedom offered to my position could be a massive boon to any of the organizations in the Imperium, apart from the Inquisition. My best bet would be the Mechanicus, but I was not keen on dealing with those technophile zealots. It was more than enough to have to deal with my own ingenseer regularly. I could put in a requisition with the administratum and receive my shipment in fifteen or so years, my rank did afford me some priority in regards to requisition requests. Naturally, I would have to go outside the official channels. We reached back a station within the next day and I was informed over the Vox that that an ultramarine, Captain Akran, Master of the Watch, would be ready to receive me upon my arrival. We docked without much fuss and after convincing Trock that he did not need the maul he now carried with him everywhere, ever since the incident with the apostates on the ship he and I walked off the ship, followed by the Commissar and Elris. There was no need to ask around to find Captain Akran, as he was standing a few hundred meters away, helmet tucked under his arm, sharp facial features adorned with a stoic look of quiet contemplation. Even without an honor guard, I had no doubts as to who he was. His mere presence was dominating even from this distance. He commandeered your attention and drew it toward himself. The crisp blue of his armor stood out among the green, gray, and gold ships, and he towered above the regular humans scurrying around, dealing with a thousand different and menial tasks. He did not carry his bolter, but the chain's word on his hip was almost as big as I was tall. There was no amount of written lore from back home that could ever do justice to the aura of sheer intimidation that oozed from this man. He was wound up like a bowstring at the moment before you released the arrow, the destructive potential of this behemoth of a man, wearing enough armor to put a tank from my own world to shame, was nothing short of mind-shattering and I had to stop myself from gawking as we walked toward him. Sure, I had met Astartes before, Demias to be specific, but he was nothing like the individual I was now facing. Demias, even with his honor guard, could potentially, although the chance would have been very slim, have been defeated by the collective effort of my ship. But this captain, growing larger as I approached, crushed any such illusions. 
If he so desired, his natural advantages combined with the 800 years of active service, indicated by the gold studs on his forehead, meant he alone could take out me and everyone I commanded with disgusting ease. Trader Bjork Welcome to Baca Naval Base. Akiran's voice was comprised of gravel and rusted iron, the hoarse voice of a man that had been yelling orders and cursing his enemies for centuries. A man that had watched the decline of the Imperium he fought for, slow and agonizing, while he fought to preserve it. He looked every bit of his age and an aura of death and duty hung around him like a miasma, permeating the very air I breathed. Shooting glances at Elris and the Commissar, I saw that they felt it as well, being near a being so powerful it bordered on incredulity. Even Trox's lumbering footsteps behind me had become more hesitant, slower, and not as confident. I was still a bit of a way away when the captain spoke to me, and I had to raise my voice when I answered, Thank you Captain Akran, it is good to finally make port, even if it just for a short while. You wish to speak to an Astartes representative upon your arrival. Speak. While not displeased, Akran sounded impatient, a rare thing for an Astartes to display emotion to a mortal, but then again, Master of the Watch, Captain of the Second Company of the Ultramarines Chapter, was not a regular Astartes. I plan to visit a feudal world, both for resupply and rearmament. However, I thought it prudent to seek information on the systems near the Veiled region before I do so, as I plan to make excursions into the area and bring the Emperor's light to the shrouded hideout for heretics and renegades. I saw no reason to dance around the subject, especially not faced with a disgruntled Astartes captain, and I would like to offer my services, humble as they may be, in exchange for said information. I am certain you have minor tasks that are better suited for someone of less import to the safety of the Imperium. I had no way to read the face of superhuman standing tall in front of me, but I hoped my passive skill for interaction with strangers would help me. A moment, please, Gaykran said as he put on his helmet and I heard the muted click of his internal vox activating. Figures he would vox back to ask the chapter master. I could almost hear the internal grinding mantra that most assuredly rang continuously inside of his head. The Codex Astartes does not support this action. Eh? I swear, if I actually hear that sentence, I will have to use all my willpower to not mock whoever says it. I know it would be a serious health hazard to do so, but damn it, no book could ever account for every possible situation. I waited for a minute before the helmet was removed again and Akran fixed me with a stare that was, well, not friendly but at least not hostile either. There may be something we can use you for, he rumbled, and the wording perplexed me for a second before I reminded myself how the Imperium worked the feudal world of Slud has had issues, and it has been decreed that a change in governor is needed. Since your intended destination happens to be our target of interest, we have a common goal. You will travel to Slud and take care of this situation in the Emperor's name. It was not a request but an order, and something bristled in me at the thought. I shall do this for you, Captain, but only because I so chose. As you said, we have a common goal, and doing this will benefit Imperium and allow me to accomplish my task at the same time. I had to cement a reputation for not getting pushed around and that meant pushing back against these minor attacks on my authority. Yes, it was a literal superhuman standing in front of me, a mere mortal, but my imperial authority rivaled that of his immediate superior, the chapter master of the ultramarines. My wording let him know that I wished to perform my duty as an imperial subject, but also that I had my own agenda and I would not allow anyone to interfere with it. As it must be, Akran rumbled in reply, all the relevant information has been forwarded to your ship. Take heed, Slud is a pre-industrial society, and it is the wish of the Imperium that they remain unaware of the larger galaxy in general. Weapons and equipment planetside will be restricted to pre-industrial equipment only, to keep up the illusion. Breach of this order of secrecy will result in the immediate termination of the transgressor. Praise the Emperor. There was something incredibly intimidating about the way Akran conveyed the threat. He had not moved a muscle, and yet his entire being was pressing down on me like a blanket made from adamantium and ceramite. Deciding he had spent enough of his valuable time on a mere mortal, however glorious my designated position deemed me, he turned on his heel and walked away without another word. I should not be surprised by the casual dismissal of someone, not an Astartes, especially not from a chapter O fanatically codex compliant as the Ultramarines. A small cough made me turn my head and the young commissar caught my eyes before he presented the Aquila, as stiff and formal as if he was being inspected by a former teacher from the Scola Progenium. When I had returned the salute he, to my great surprise, reached out a hand and I did not hesitate to extend my own in a warm handshake. While you are as unconventional and strange as I was told, and your methods border on the heretical, I cannot argue with the results or the faith of your character. 
Trock has also taken well to you, which I must admit is a bit of a surprise. He was a difficult, subject, very willful and stubborn. But the promotion to Bonehead did wonders for his ability to understand the need to obey his superiors. So to see him bond to you without much issue is enigmatic. I have asked him, but all he says is that you make happy noises. You will have to forgive me for asking, but could you elaborate on the subject? The question was innocent enough, and his tone was light, but there was the slightest hint of a twinkle deep in his eyes, and the tingling sensation along my spine was driving me crazy. I was balancing on the border between believable eccentricity and perceived heresy. I whistle, Commissar. Just random little happy tunes. I answered lightly, doing my best to come off as unbothered and slightly amused. I see, his voice remained carefully neutral, and his next words were as predictable as they were expected. And what can bring about such joy, besides a perverse reveling in your newly acquired power? Why, having done a good day's work in the name of the Emperor, Commissar, does it not bring you immense joy to carry out the Emperor's will? I kept my voice light and chipper, but the trap had been laid and the Commissar knew it just as well as I. He could say yes, at which point he would have to relent on this last attempt to wrestle my authority from me under the guise of imperial duty. Or he could say no and stick to his accusations against me, calling his faith into question near an inquisitorial agent in the form of Elris, who was standing less than six feet from him. The crooked and amused smile on her face did not escape my attention. Of course it does. The young commissar almost spat out the words in indignation over that implication, had he disagreed, and I got the thought that this might cause a divide between us if I didn't try mending it post-haste. As I rightly assumed. Your dedication has been an inspiration to my crew and I will not forget the service you have provided on my ship. I was being honest and my voice betrayed that, turning the sour look on the face of the commissar to one of appeased calm. But try whistling around the ogren, commissar. It does not matter what tune you whistle, they seem to respond well to the sound itself. He made a neutral grunt and stepped back, leaving me to turn to Elris. I am staying until tomorrow. Your crew will need a little shore leave, and if you are looking to rearm your troops, I think it's best if I escort you to the Ecclesiarchial representative on the naval base and help you requisition what you need. Within reason, of course. She was being formal, but I had a feeling she also wanted to say goodbye in private. So be it, one last time before we hit the open road. Of course, I only seek to rearm the voidsmen and guardsmen. Laskerbines for the guardsmen, shot cannons for the voidsmen, Lucius pattern Mark 22C for the voidmasters, and around 400 lathe pattern boarding guns. I figured the offset of the downgrading from loss rifles to laskerbines will make it equal out and if not, I am sure something can be worked out. I laid out what I needed and her eyes widened slightly. That's all? I thought you wanted to refit the ship. She exclaimed in surprise as she realized I was being serious. Yes, that is all. Everything beyond that will have to be earned by smart choices and hard work. I told her and she nodded slowly in understanding. I wanted to prove my worth before claiming more resources. At least that's how she interpreted it. I only saw it as a way to not strain my relationship with the Inquisition by being a burden. She nodded and we went on our way. I acquired the upgrade in weapons from the naval base's armory and got my stocks of basic supplies refilled. I granted a full day of leave for everyone that was not indentured or part of a penal crew, and it took almost a week before we had cycled through the crew, at which time I had been in contact with the planetary governor of Slud, the pompous fool was blissfully ignorant of the danger he was currently placed in. I also learned the reason for the needing change in leadership on Slud. The planetary governor, Darts Moret, had chosen to dramatically increase the price he charged the Imperium for his world's ores. It was then that imperial authorities decided to replace him with a more cooperative puppet and where I came into the picture. Had any other representative of the Imperium arrived in orbit, he would have been immediately suspicious and have fled planetside, where they would have to restrict themselves in the gear they used to combat the troops loyal to him, out of fear of the planet's population learning that more advanced technology existed. But as a rogue trader, and especially one looking to rearm his troops with quality melee weapons from a feudal world, I was not only able to arrive without suspicion but I would be welcomed with open arms as an opportunity to increase the size of their coffers was always jumped at by such individuals. I also spent my five points while cursing the system regularly for not granting me completed status on my quest to become a rogue trader, and after many restless hours, the only reason I could think of was that the Inquisition was not allowing me to roam as free as I liked to think. Which meant, they have me under strict surveillance. 
so naturally, I made sure to spend copious amounts of time at the cathedral on the station. A large amount of time spent praying meant that I gained quite a lot of litanies and a positive shift in my alignment. As for my points, I put three points into will, one into agility, and one into perception. I also spent time going over the accuracy exercise charts from the drills that were constantly being run by my crew. I was looking and hoping to find a trooper with over 95% accuracy. I had a plan to take the most accurate of my troopers and turn them into a support unit that would be used to pick off targets of interest, commanders, and officers, while the bulk of regular troopers made sure to keep the enemy occupied. In the end, my status screen looked pretty good. Human. Level 6. Stat points remaining, 0. Alignment, Faithful Imperial Plus. Litanies, 62. Augmentations, Cybernetic Lung, Upgrade LVL1, Toxins Slash Environment. Level, 9818-19200. Strength, 11. Agility, 10. Perception, 14. Will, 17. Luck, 31. Psyche, 5 slash 500. Skills. Feats. Abilities. Retinue. With everything done, the crew rested and rearmed, the immediate plan clear, and absolutely nothing to stand in my way going forward, we left back a naval base and turned the ship toward Slud. Nothing noteworthy happened on the way there and we arrived in orbit above the planet where we got hailed by the nearby space station that housed the governor because of course the prick couldn't be bothered to live on the same common dirt as the people that slaved their existence away so he could live a life of luxury and debauchery. After the standard back and forth over the Vox, I ordered the ship to be docked at the station after being given permission. Not that he could refuse an imperial ship, but it was always good to keep up appearances. Dart Moret was there to greet me and the honor guard I had chosen. While no troopers had the accuracy scores for my little plan, at least not yet, there were a great many that were placed well above the 70% accuracy mark, and I had the Voidmasters pick out four dozen of their most veteran and accomplished troopers to serve as my personal guard. For the occasion, I had dug out enough suits of full carapace armor from my ship's armory to fully deck out my bodyguard, and with the new shotguns in hand, lost pistols, and combat knives on the hip, sharp eyes, and gruff faces, they joined Troc and me as I made ready to leave my ship. I strode off the ship with Troc following close behind me, his usual melee weapon replaced by a ripper gun without a loaded clip, no reason to tempt fate, and the designated honor guard in proper marching order behind me, we made for an impressive sight. The local guardsmen shot envious looks at the armor I had my men wear for the occasion, and they eyed the new shot cannons with both weary trepidation and jealous greed. My men looked professional, hardened, and extremely well equipped for being regular guardsmen, just as you would expect from a rogue trader. In comparison, the troops on board the governor's space station were undisciplined as evidenced by the idle chattering among them, lazy, if the state of their armor and weapons were anything to go by, and completely out of touch with how the Imperium worked, as several of the regular troops would openly challenge me by refusing to avert their gaze as I swept my eyes over them. They looked dirty and uninterested in doing their duty, more akin to the hive-gangers I had fought, than actual guardsmen. It would seem that apathy and hedonism were spreading from their original host, Welcome, welcome to my humble station. I hope you had no trouble during the journey here? The voice came from a ghastly individual, soft and delicate as only a politician could sound. My eyes found the owner of the voice, and I saw everything I had expected in a planetary governor that was on the line for failing his duty. Flabby, overweight, short, dressed in the most expensive and colorful of clothing, draped in jewelry made from precious metal and covered in shining gems. His shoes looked to be made from some form of silk, as well as the cloak that clung to his back, looking more like a napkin that got turned the wrong way. Sure, it might once have fit the man that was now approaching me with beads of sweat running down his forehead, from the exertion it took him to move his sizable girth with a surprising speed. None, I said gruffly as I looked down on the man sending me what I assumed was supposed to be a reassuring and warm smile that mostly came off as fake and treacherous. Good good. Now, I understand you wish to purchase some of the fine weapons produced here on my meager planet? Dartman Rhett rambled on, jumping straight to business. How typical, no tact or etiquette from this supposedly refined person of power and position. Maybe if they are of the quality I desire. I would wish to inspect the blades before we discuss this further, Governor. For now, I would like you to arrange transport to the planet as well as I require a blade master, and one of the trainers among your planet's garrison will be the one to travel with me. 
I kept my voice gruff and blunt, refusing to let his slimy demeanor get to me, and I saw the fake smile turn stiff and the first crack appeared in the facade he was trying to present. I am not sure you would find men of exceptional enough quality to satisfy your needs, Lord. Perhaps I could suggest. He started, but I cut him off, intent on taking control of this interaction. It would shape how we interacted going forward. You will not refuse this honor. The Imperium has needs, and they will be met by you and your loyal Imperial subjects. I said sternly as I caught his gaze and I saw the fires of rebellion flare up for a short moment inside of him before he relented. His authority was great, but mine was greater, and refusing to yield would give me immediate grounds to remove him from office, by violence if needed. Of course Lord, I was merely concerned with the quality of my troops. I would not wish anything but the best for the Emperor's finest. The governor was starting to annoy me, and in turn, I had managed to annoy him, even if he was hiding it well. When can we leave for the planet? I pressed and the question caught him off guard. I can't say with certainty, Lord, he stammered nervously, and I was struck by a sudden inspiration. Very well, if you would follow me, we can take a Valkyrie from my ship and have this whole thing over with in a few hours. I have things to do, places to be, and I cannot afford to wait around. I demanded and there was very little he could say to avoid going with me. At least, if there was a valid protest, he failed to come up with one, and we soon found ourselves heading through my ship, Dartmaret now with an honor guard of his own. It doubled mine in size, but they neither had carapace armor, nor any weapons of note besides regular loss rifles, replaced with simple bows and swords. My men's armor was hidden beneath plain robes. A walk, a flight, and a solid walk as I refused to use the carriage that was waiting for the governor at the grove where we touched down, we soon found ourselves on the outskirts of the biggest town on the planet, the supposed seat of this whining and sweat-drenched excuse for a ruler. He had been complaining about having to walk ever since we left the ship, but I didn't care. Even his own men, sloppy as they were, looked at him with disgust whenever he wasn't watching them. Slud was not something to be proud of. Filthy people worked the fields with rounded backs, smoke bellowed up from the large city, the stench was unbelievable, and wherever we went, the peasants looked up from their fields in fear and awe. We were healthier and stronger than most people on the planet that was not part of the significant military needed to suppress the people and keep them obedient, living in conditions such as these. We didn't carry any weapons besides the combat knives, and a select few troopers with lost pistols tucked away under their shirts. And of course, Trock, that had been outfitted with the piping he had ripped off the wall in his attempt to break down a bulkhead. Mangled and twisted, there was no telling what the piece of metal had once been, so it was safe to bring along. Besides, Trock drew more attention than anyone else, his cranial augmentation hidden beneath a simple hood, and his size and bulk made him stand out like a sore thumb. I had noticed the governor side-eye him with suspicion several times, but he never said anything as the hulking brute stuck close to my side. I now understood why he had been hesitant to go down here. It was a truly depressing setting, just miserable. Muck and grime everywhere, badly maintained roads, guards dressed in too much armor for regular peacetimes, serving to intimidate the general population, animals that looked like they bordered on being malnourished, and an endless train of carts arriving from every road in the horizon, dragging ore, coal, and food to the capital and the countless foundries and blacksmiths working there. Medieval slum at its finest. Oh, how I loathed this pathetic excuse for a leader already, but I still had a role to play before I could see to it that he was removed from office. And he would not be granted a quick death. I plan on handing him over to the Inquisition. That ought to ensure he was properly punished, provided he survived the extended stay in my ship's prison, of course. With a deep internal sigh, I steeled myself for the sights to greet me when we entered the city gate that was already being swung wide open as medieval soldiers assembled to form an impromptu parade for the sudden surprise visit from the almost mythical ruler. Chapter 26, well? That happened. The soldiers that lined the road as we came up on the gate were all dressed in heavy half-plates, male skirts over their pants, and thick leather greaves that doubled as waterproof leggings. All of them carried long swords that looked well-maintained and well-used which made me wonder. What could they be using those blades on, besides the civilian population? There had been no reports of rebellion or heretical uprisings from Slud, so unless they were attacking people at random, there was little reason for their blades to carry that special shine a weapon only gets when it sees frequent use. They had arranged themselves into two neat rows flanking the road as we came walking up to the city, and even though I was wearing plain robes to hide the carapace armor beneath, it was obvious to all that it was me, not the governor, that was in charge at the current time. 
The fat little man was heaving for breath and looking desperately around for something to lean against, but there was nothing to be found except fields, gates, peasants, and soldiers. The contrast between us could not be greater. While I had spent quite a lot of time in my quarters, most of it studying, I had not neglected the occasional practice session with my hand cannon and my combat knife. But a knife would never be good enough in this universe, which brought me to the present. As we crossed the threshold into the city, the wall of stench that hit me felt like a physical attack. Piss, shit, rotting dung heaps, dead animals and rodents, inns, industrial work, and a thousand other vile smells assaulted my nose and almost forced me to gag in response, but I managed to keep it together, even if it took a huge mental strain. The governor, on the other hand, did not fare as well. He hit the wall, made it three steps, and immediately emptied the contents of his stomach on the ground in front of him. With an audible whimper, he recollected himself and used a small silk handkerchief to wipe the vomit from his mouth. I agree, Governor, the stench is unbearable. Might I suggest splitting the city up and creating dedicated zones for industry, housing, agriculture, and so on? I would solve some of the most immediate problems of cities such as this, I remarked and while I received no answer, I could sense the growing frustration in the flabby little dictator. Not that I blamed him, I would feel the same way if someone showed up on my ship and started insulting it right away. But I wanted him angry. Angry men make mistakes, and as a wise old Chinese philosopher once said, never interrupt your enemy when they are making a mistake. He might even order an attack on me and my men if I antagonized him enough, but that would also be a risk. If I used the lost pistols we had smuggled with us, inside the city, I would have to order the city cleansed of life. I had another idea and turned to my honor guard, pointing out twelve of them. You twelve, wait outside the city gate and if I have not returned within the hour, consider it an attack on my person and flee to inform the ship, I said to the one closest to me, and I once more noticed a visible rise in the anger and frustration of the man huffing for breath while trying to minimize his air intake to avoid the smell. But also a level of worry if his body language was to be believed. Then again, fat and useless as he was, one did not become a planetary governor without some skill in politics and intrigue. I would have to keep my senses open at all times, just in case I was being played for a fool. The twelve troopers immediately presented the Aquila and hurried back to where we came from. As the rest of us proceeded into the city, the noise rose to levels of uncomfortability that rivaled the smell. Barking animals, noisy children, yelling shopkeepers, the hammering and sawing of the various industries, fistfights, religious processions, guards yelling orders, ends with their already drunken patrons, beggars, thieves, and a thousand other sounds mixed to create a wall of sound you simply moved through, making it impossible to hear anything beyond what happened in your immediate vicinity. Truck! I shouted and the giant man focused in on my voice. Stay next to me while we are in the city. And he moved closer, almost brushing against me as we continued forward. I wasn't worried about my security so much as I feared that the many sounds and noises would overstimulate Trock. I wanted him within reach, in case it all got too much for him. If he lost his mind the way he lost it back on the ship? I shuddered at the thought, I doubted there was a soldier on this planet capable of putting down the Ogren without the use of imperial technology which made for scary thinking. A freak of an Ogren, rampaging through the largest city on a feudal world. Shit, that might be bad enough for the Inquisition to revoke my letter of mark. Trock, it is very important you stay close to me until we get back to the ship. If you don't the Emperor will be very angry with you. And I do not want the Emperor to be angry with Trock, because I like Trock. I had to dumb it down a bit, even with his cranial augmentations, well hidden beneath his hood, but the giant abhuman moved close, so close that I could smell gunpowder residue still clinging to him from the firing drills this morning. That and his questionable hygiene. We continued our trek through the city until we happened upon a collection of large stone buildings, unlike the wooden houses that dominated the streets. Armored soldiers were drilling in a square outside, messengers came running to and from the largest building, and the nearby stables were a flurry of activity. We had arrived at the guard quarters of the city. The man at the guard post was in the middle of a lazy yawn when he spotted us and the sight of the planetary governor made him try to stop yawning and call attention to the incoming visitors but only managed to get himself caught in a coughing fit. It did draw the attention of nearby soldiers who cried out in alarm and immediately snapped to parade rest, presenting the Aquila to us as we approached. As we entered the drill square between the buildings, an elderly man in a magnificent steel armor with gold ornamentation and silver inlay weaving intricate patterns, left the large building that saw a steady stream of messengers, followed closely by fully plated knights, covered from head to toe in thick steel plating and sporting large claymore swords, held high and ready to strike any who might threaten their commander. 
We stopped two meters apart and silence gripped the square as the commander eyed me and my men, but especially Trock. Not that I blamed him, my Ogren bodyguard was indeed an impressive sight, even with his simple clothes and twisted metal piping. The governor, on the other hand, made for a sad sight. Red-faced and heaving for breath with beads of sweat running rivers down his many chins, he was leaning on two of his men that seemed ready to collapse under the strain and I moved my attention to the commander to see his reaction. He was good, very good, as his face betrayed no emotion at all, but I saw the hint of disdain in his eyes. No wonder, he was the spitting image one would think of when thinking of a medieval military commander. Around fifty years old, small scars crisscrossing the small parts of him not covered in the ornate armor, one eye completely white and a permanent look of angry displeasure etched on his face. Greetings, commander, I said and he snapped his full attention to me, surprised that I spoke before the governor, but more or less unfazed. Greetings, stranger. To what do we owe the pleasure of our lord and his guests, blessing us with their valuable time? His words were impeccably chosen as the perfect greeting, but his tone and demeanor told the story of a man that considered this visit a massive nuisance and inconvenience, at best. The emperor needs your finest swordsman, and I am here to collect him. Old, young, noble, common, it matters not. What matters is the skill of the individual you wish to stand before me. I did my best to sound authoritative and in charge, but the commander still glanced at the governor who simply nodded. Snapping his fingers, he summoned a messenger who immediately ran off after being tasked to find the swordsman in question. While we are at it, I, as the emperor's agent, need a great number of blades. Are there blacksmiths in the city with a significant supply in stock? I asked, making sure to let the commander know I did not expect him to solve this issue for me, beyond some basic directions. By law, the only smiths permitted to make weapons are employed by the army. The armories should hold everything you desire if you can pay. It was obvious the old soldier took great delight in being an inconvenience. No matter, it would be solved once the new governor took the planet under command. I need three thousand falchions and I am willing to trade you their weight in steel of equal quality, which you will accept and be happy about. Better they are used, than rotting away in the armory of a glorified extortion gang. I would not allow this commander, accomplished as he was, to take joy out of standing in the way of mine and, by extension, the emperor's will. These blades would, when paired with a skilled trainer, mean a great difference for any boarding actions, both offensive and defensive. He expectedly bristled at my words, I swear I could see his eyebrows become more bushy, and one of the guards wielding claymores stepped forward and reached out a hand, but it never touched me. Instead, there was a sound of crunching metal, followed by a sound like a twig snapping in the wind before the guard dropped screaming to his knees, staring in what I guessed to be horror, at Trock. The Ogren had sensed what the guard planned and reached out to stop him. In his simple mind, a broken arm could not be used to touch me. Every set of eyes native to the planet within earshot of the whole ordeal was locked on me and as the commander gained a grip on himself, I just had to rub salt in the wound. The emperor protects, I said with a smirk. Indeed he does, he managed, but was stopped from saying anything else by the sound of someone vomiting violently. The governor was apparently not used to the idea of casual violence. Truth be told, less than nine months ago, I was much the same way. I was lucky enough to be introduced to casual killing by orc attacks. Something not human. One of his aides rushed to his side with a container of water to wash the vomit out of his mouth with, and he drank greedily while admonishing the poor soul for not supplying him with water earlier, during our walk. I shall have one of my men escort you to the armories and requisition carts for you to transport the weapons. The commander stated in a mix between a growl and a hiss, both to answer my question in a manner that would be satisfactory, but also to draw attention away from the governor and his childish tantrum. Excellent, though I would request, for the governor's sake, that we get at least one of the carts right now, I suggested and it was met with general agreement. As a cart was procured and we started making our way to the armories, I made it a point to get out in front of the cart with the now placated governor. This was a power move, a way to tell the local population that as powerful as their lord was, my authority extended beyond him, and as such he was beholden to me. He tried several times to engage me in conversation, no doubt in the hope of having me fall back to walk beside his cart to make it look like I was his subordinate rather than his equal, but I brushed off every attempt. There was nothing to be gained from speaking with this self-indulgent excuse for a man. The armories were solid stone buildings, surrounded by soldiers and kept under heavy lock and key. A young man in a soldier's half-plate was engaged in combat with three others, and from the look of things he was toying with them. As you requested, here is the blade master the emperor desires. 
the commander remarked as he looked over the exhibition taking place in front of me. But I didn't like it. It was too convenient that he had arrived and engaged in an exhibition match mere moments before us. I pointed at three of my men and made a gesture with my head, which made them draw their combat knives and approach fast from behind the young man who was busy showing off. If he was the blade master I was being told he was, he would know how to handle what was to come. As my men were five steps away I shouted a warning and the young man threw a look behind him, spun around, and was immediately disarmed by the first arriving soldier and taken to the ground by the next two, the blunt side of their knives pressed against his throat. I slowly turned away from the scene to stare down at the commander, who was now sweating a great deal more than he was mere moments ago. I don't think you understand the position you currently find yourself in, commander. You see, when the emperor desires something from his subjects, it is not our place to question it or to put hindrances in the way of it, but to see the emperor's wish fulfilled in the fastest, most efficient manner. Should we fail due to circumstances outside of our control, that is understandable, to an extent. But when someone, anyone, actively seeks to obstruct the emperor's will from being carried out, that is when people start turning into corpses. Corpses cannot complain about being replaced. Have I made myself clear, or do you need the encouraging attention of my dear Troc, to help you understand what I am trying to tell you? I was so done with both the governor and the commander. It was obvious he was only in the position he was in because of nepotism and a greater interest in pleasing his lord than the imperium and I gestured to Troc as I spoke. The magnificent Ogren even had the whereabouts to take a step closer to the commander at the mention of his name and the effect was instantaneous. The color drained from the hardened veteran's face, he took an involuntary step backward and he had to swallow hard before he could answer me. Of course, Lord. You could not be more clear. He managed to get over his lips before he summoned another messenger to go and get the correct soldier. Now, many hands make light work. My blades, commander. I said, hinting that he should get the soldiers that had stopped what they were doing to gawk at their commander being threatened, to start loading up my order which he did with so much bravado it was hard to believe that he was bowing and scraping before me just seconds earlier. The blade master arrived a few minutes later, a middle-aged man with a pristinely combed and kept mustache, an ornate and elongated saber at his hip, almost as long as a bastard sword. He was slender, but fit and moved with the grace of a predator on the hunt. I did not doubt that this was the man I wanted. I waved him over and he presented himself as he approached. Hector Indrak, at your service, lord. He made a small bow as he presented the Aquila and waited for me to respond. Greetings, Hector. Rejoice, for your skills are needed. The Emperor desires a blade master to train his soldiers and you have been picked as the most likely candidate. Hurry and pack what you might need, though only the most essential. Time is of the essence. I replied and gestured for him to step closer. And between you and me, you might want to pack as if there was a chance you might never return. I said in a lower tone of voice, only loud enough for the two of us to hear. He nodded once and spun around to walk back to the armories. I called after him to meet my men at the city gate when he was done. With that done, I walked over to one of the carts being loaded with weapons and inspected one of the. A nice broad handguard, good quality steel, properly maintained and kept. While they were nothing exceptional, they were still good work and they would do the job well enough. It took close to an hour for the work to finish, but that hasn't stopped the governor from summoning food and drink no less than three times while we waited. The amount of food the fat bastard was shoveling into his pasty face was nauseating and to avoid having to look at it, I inspected every single cart when it was filled. It was during this that I discovered a blade that stood out. With a broader blade, smaller handguard, heavily inlaid with gold, and an imperial prayer written in the metal along the blade, it was a thing of beauty and I picked it up to inspect it more closely. The handle and guard were both exquisite works of art while the edge of the blade which looked smooth from a distance turned out to have minute curves, like a flamberge. It would make for truly devastating attacks against unarmored or lightly armored enemies. It was a thing of beauty and I decided I needed an upgrade from the combat knife I was currently using. Wait, that blade shouldn't be there, it was made on my request. The governor called out, completely forgetting the food he has been busy gorging himself on, and I realized that I had just picked up the newest favored toy in his collection. Fitting that it should hang on the hip of someone that would actually use it for its intended purpose, rather than hanging on the trophy wall of your collection room, wouldn't you say? I replied and took the blade into my possession. But I am not without reason, and a gift of this magnitude deserves something of equal value in return. Would you accompany me to my base of operations when we return, so that I may repay this extravagant gesture? 
I wondered if the idiot would fall for it and he jumped straight in feet first. Now smiling at the thought of being given something exotic and rare in exchange for a blade he could always have replicated, the suggestion appealed to the governor's sense of entitlement and he readily agreed. Nothing more happened until we made our way back to the grove and boarded the Arvis. Once situated and moving away from the planet, the governor noticed we were not heading for the space station, but rather my ship. What is the meaning of this? He demanded, and I took a seat on a crate in front of him. Governor, you disappoint me. You have raised prices on or beyond what the Imperium finds acceptable. It is almost as if you think yourself untouchable like your mudball of a world is important in the grand scheme of things. You have angered forces that are beyond your comprehension and now it's time to pay for those transgressions. I promised you a gift of equal value to the blade you have bestowed upon me, well, Governor. My gift is allowing you to live to be handed over to the Inquisition. Otherwise, I can put a shot in your head right now and get it over with. And before you ask, this cannot be undone. The verdict has been passed, the judgment delivered, and no power in the galaxy can change this. I advise you to meet your fate with some dignity. It is all you have left at this point. I should take joy in bursting his bubble. I should be malicious and gleeful, but all I felt was weary resignation. The fact that people like this were allowed to flourish in the first place overshadowed the joy of being the one to remove him from power. I had expected rage, crying, begging, and attempts at negotiating. Anything but what he did. Instead of any of the expected reactions, he raised his hand and if not for my danger sense, I would have been dead right there. Instead, the lost shot from the digital weapon hidden in one of his rings seared through my ear and took out the man behind me. He only managed one shot as Trock responded by reaching out and ripping the arm off of the man. The field churgeon sprang forward to attend to my wounded ear, but I brushed him off. Save that fat bastard. He doesn't deserve to bleed out and escape the interrogation chambers. Innocentia probat nihil. As I uttered the motto of the Inquisition, silence fell over the Arvis, except for the whimpering of the, literally, disarmed former governor. Trock was still holding the arm and I reached out and started plucking the jewelry from the fingers. A digital weapon was a rarity, even among the obscenely wealthy and powerful, and any other human would most likely have been taken out by that little stunt, and even with all my advantages, I almost got taken out. This would be a wonderful addition to my personal armory and a great last resort when people thought you were disarmed. I just had to figure out which one of the gaudy rings it was, but my engine seer could help me with this. But I was faced with a choice. Did I inform the people on the governor's space station before or after I had returned him to naval base Baca? Chapter 27 Unwanted Responsibility and Four Times the Trouble My ear hurt like hell, but there was no immediate danger in the wound. It had been cauterized by the lost shot so bleeding was not an issue, it just hurt like hell. The governor had been under the care of the churgeon and was now sitting on the ground with several troopers standing close by to watch over him. Not that it was needed, he seemed to have withdrawn into himself after his failed attempt at killing me. Nothing we did elicited a response in any way, and with a missing arm he was no threat, but I had a feeling it was not the wound that caused his apathy, but rather the thought of what he would be subjected to by the Imperium before he would most graciously be allowed to die. If he was even granted that mercy, and if I remembered Imperial law correctly, the punishment for treason, as his actions rightfully were, was death through decapitation or firing squad, or enforced conscription into a penal platoon. Somehow, I think the enforced conscription would be his fate, someone in power would most certainly get a giggle out of seeing a former governor placed in the penal legions. We got him back to the ship and locked him away in the brig, but before we started on the short trip back to Baca, I had a message sent to the space station. Their lord had been summoned to back a station and would be back at his earliest convenience. No reason to cause a panic. Panic among the rank and file soldiers of the Imperium usually leads to a split in the troops, followed by infighting and finally either full blown heretical worship or extreme, fanatical, imperial worship among the survivors. This simple act of informing them of what was happening would be enough to keep them under control until someone could replace the governor. As was expected, the trip back was uneventful, the travel lanes of the Imperium enjoyed a relatively high level of security anywhere except the fringes of its territory. We made it back to Baca without issue, and during the back and forth communication, I informed them that I had the former governor of Slud in custody. That caused the call to be redirected to the Astartes contingent on the station and Captain Akran was waiting for me when we dragged the prisoner from the ship. I see you had a successful journey. The Emperor's justice awaits him in the near future, he rumbled, even sounding rather pleased with the whole thing. 
His eyes followed the whimpering tub of lard as he waddled after the arbites that had come to secure him. Unfortunately, a new governor has not been found. It has been decided that the planet will be placed under your charge until a replacement can be found. Wait, no, I can't take on that responsibility, I have duties to attend to as a rogue trader. I cannot spend my time playing governor. You can't do this. I protested, the prospect of spending my time playing lord to a planet of medieval peasants was not an appealing one. It is already done. We must all do our duty to the emperor and this is what is being asked of you. Be mindful, rogue trader, that this is merely a stewardship until a governor is chosen but the tithe shall be paid as expected. Akran cut through my protests and made it clear in no uncertain terms that this was not negotiable. It pissed me off greatly, being laden with this responsibility. It was not something I wanted, despite the potential wealth that could be gained. How would I find a way home if I spend my time lounging about in a space station hanging above a shithole of a planet? But if they wanted me to stir the pot, I would stir it to such a degree that the Departamento Munitorum would have an aneurysm with the changes I was going to enact on the planet of Slud. A planet was governed as its ruler saw fit, even a temporary ruler. And while the old ruler might have had an aversion to technology to keep the people subservient, I wanted more. If I was to be burdened with the responsibility of ruling these people, I could at least do the one thing no one else would. Find a way to improve the lives of the people under me, like I did with the indentured workers on my ship. Speaking of, they were doing well in their training, the reports from their senior armsmen glowing with praise of about the willingness to serve and sincere faith of these former glorified slaves. There had also been reports of less mutinous behavior among the lowest ranks on the ship, fewer morale problems among the general crew, and an increased sense of duty among the voidsmen in general. Perhaps, the way to get out of this assignment was to start rocking the metaphorical boat. Alternatively, get someone to do the practical work for me while I continued my work as a rogue trader. Now there was an idea, some loyal fanatic that could run the place like their governor had not been replaced until his actual replacement could arrive. I knew I was doing the very same thing that Akran was doing to do, but so what, I had better uses for my time than sitting in orbit over a mining planet with so antiquated technology that an outhouse in the yard was considered modern technology. Without Elris on board to function as my de facto information broker, I would need to set up my retinue of people. And I just happened to have been given a planet to scour of people. Shit. I was going to assume the temporary position, at least for a short while until a suitable puppet could be installed in power. As the emperor demands, I said and Akran acknowledged my acceptance with a nod before he turned and left me to my own devices. With this new task at hand, I made my way to the administratum, closely followed by Trok, the giant abhuman sticking to the order I gave him earlier. Once we arrived, I made my way into the building and found the first clerk I was able to locate. It took a few words but once he understood who I was and what I wanted, I was escorted to a prefectus who immediately started the process of digging out all available information on the people stationed in orbit above Slud. I wanted to know the number of men, their designated titles, and everything else the Imperium knew about them. The former governor was bound to have had several specialists enlisted and I wanted them all. Sure, there might be a little initial grumbling, but a small talk about the actions of their former boss, and the fate that he is suffering, as well the fact that anyone who still supports him will be taken in as an accomplice, should clear the air of any feelings of resentment they might hold toward me. Once again, it struck me how casual an approach I had taken to using and exploiting people, thinking of them not as living beings, but more like tools to further the one goal I had set for myself. Was it something about this universe that either forced that mentality or saw you perish? Or did I always have the capacity and potential for sociopathic behavior and I just suppressed it on account of living in the society I did? It was a thought that was both scary and intriguing. At what point did morals and ethics start to supersede survival and thriving? To what extent was it morally acceptable to push those boundaries without losing yourself and your humanity in the process? How far did you have to go before you started becoming a threat to the very humanity you were fighting to preserve? These were thoughts worth pondering, but I had a lot of things to do and little time to do it. With the requested information being taken to my ship, I made my way to the Departamento Munitorum. I had a special request that I wanted to take care of, one that would see Trock busy for the majority of his waking hours and make him damn near indestructible in battle. We arrived at the office of the Imperial Pursery. However, every single bureaucrat I tried to make contact with ignored me and went about their business, making it clear they had no intention of dealing with me right now. Well, we would just have to see about that, now wouldn't we? 
I physically grabbed the highest ranking bureaucrat I could find and he immediately called for the arbites to have me removed. It took them less than 10 seconds to arrive and two arbitrators rounded the corner, wielding shock mauls and suppression shields, their jaws the only thing exposed by their matte black carapace armor. In the name of the emperor, you will release the official and follow us to be punished in accordance with the Book of Judgment. They ordered and the energy fields of their mauls sprang to life as they bore down on me. Trock didn't move, torn between his understanding that the arbitrators worked for the emperor and the order to protect me, who also worked for the emperor. Arbitrator, I have a very interesting document you might want to review before you tell me what to do and who to release. I said sternly without letting the bureaucrat dangling in my arms, a good foot off the ground. A document? Explain yourself immediately. They ordered, but they didn't advance any further. If you wish, I will let you inspect my letter of mark, and then you can decide whether you want to pursue your previous action. I snarled and out of the corner of my eye I noticed the color drain from the unfortunate man I was holding off the ground. You are the rogue trader that has docked at the station? One of them asked as he slowly lowered his maul and relaxed his shield arm. His comrade still kept his battle stance, but I couldn't blame him. How many people do you see wandering the station with an ogren? I countered and his eyes wandered from me to Trock and I would swear, I could hear the wheels in his head turning. Did he dare risk offending me, or did he dare risk letting a potential criminal go? In the end, the natural desire for self-preservation won, and they turned on their heels and left after offering me an apology. The clerk, still hanging from my arms, looked crestfallen, but I suspected that was more because he learned who I was than the fact that he was not in control of the situation. Do you have time to listen to an agent of the emperor? Or should I find your replacement and request their help? I asked the now-shaking bureaucrat, and he quickly spouted into a lengthy apology mixed with promises of expedient handling of whatever request I had. You can start by leading me to the officio tactica. I wish to requisition specialist troops and war gear. I stated and looked at him expectantly. He tried stalling, citing rule after rule, and regulation after regulation and it started to bore me, so I cut through his rant, your objections have been noted. Now, take me to the officio tactica. And with no more ways to delay me, the now defeated looking man in front of me turned to lead me on my way. Despite my ham-fisted approach to getting what I wanted, I got my wishes fulfilled. I acquired a full set of Bulgrin armor for Trock and even managed to get my hands on three more Ogrins. They would not be part of my retinue but would become the sledgehammer among the forces at my disposal. Sure, three Ogrins didn't sound like much, but when commanded by a bony AD, namely Trock, they would be an unstoppable force moving around the battlefield. Faced with regular humans, they would be nay impervious to anything that could be thrown at them. Against something more dangerous, like traitor Astartes, they would still stand a chance, even in melee. Stories about Ogrins beating traitor Astartes to death with nothing but their fists, or maybe the discarded helmet of said Astartes. When the Ogrins were brought forth, they immediately huddled around Trock, which I must admit surprised me. They were strangers to each other, and yet they sought his company and leadership almost by instinct. They all started speaking with one another and it quickly became apparent that they would follow Trock without hesitation. I would have to look into that at a later time, perhaps there was an untapped potential to be discovered and used. With this done, I could return to my ship and depart for Slud. I would have a little time to go over everything I had received from the Administratum before I arrived back in orbit around the planet. It seemed the governor had only kept 1,500 soldiers occupied on a station that could comfortably accommodate at least 10 times that number of troops. This was worrisome. Not because it was common to fill your station, but because the planet was situated fairly close to unexplored regions, by imperial standards, so to only keep a skeleton crew gave food for thought. Over the next day, I dug deeper and found several discrepancies with the estimated earning when compared to the treasury status. When you added the demanded increase in payment for the or the planet delivered, I started suspecting that the governor was paying off someone to leave the planet in peace. Well, we would just have to see about that. I sent a message to Farson, asking that a request be sent to Baca, asking for naval reinforcements for no more than three months, on account of a suspected attack by renegades. I attached my findings alongside my speculations as the reason for my request and now I could only wait for a response. I hoped it would be positive and quick. Then all that was left was to prepare to enter the small station orbiting Slud, and after a few hours of work, I had what I felt was a solid enough plan that it would go off without a hitch. I would bring 2,000 of my guardsmen with me, leaving the last 1,000 as well as the designated voidsmen to guard the ship. 
We would make our way to the private chambers of the former governor, which I would take into my possession as soon as possible. Once that was done, we had to assume control of the bridge of the station. Some might wonder why I didn't go for the bridge first, but planetary governors were unreasonably paranoid when it came to their safety and I had a hunch that there were quite a few surprises that could be countered, simply by going to the private quarters of the former governor, first thing. We would have to see if my instinct held up or if we wasted time and gave away our intent before we could reach a point where we would be in control before the station troops knew they were under attack, so to speak. Happy with the state of things, I left my quarters and decided to check in on Trock and his new charges. I found them doing supervised training by a frustrated sergeant, and I made a mental note to also secure someone with greater patience to train the Ogrins. I feared this one would rather blow his brains out shortly rather than be stuck with this duty. Trock, I called out, and the group of Ogrins turned their heads collectively to stare at me. I waved him over and he came trotting without hesitation. Tell me, Trock, how are the new Ogrins doing? They are okay. Not very smart, but they want to make the emperor happy. So they are okay. He stated with all the simplicity and insight one could expect of an ogren, but then he surprised me by adding, they need more training. I looked at him in surprise, a tactical suggestion from an ogren? Practically unheard of. What makes you say that? I inquired, my interest piqued by his suggestion. They are new ogrens, they didn't have a lot of time to get proper ogren training. Yes, more training. He reasoned, and without any further interaction, he lumbered back to the Ogrins who had busied themselves with using their ripper guns to bash at each other in what appeared to be a heated argument, which was over as quickly as it started as Trock come close, his size dwarfing the other Ogrins and his neural enhancements making him a great deal smarter than the three of them collectively. The fact that he had not only carried a conversation, albeit a short one, and even made a reasonable tactical suggestion, again, even if it was still a minor one, was more than enough proof that there was more than just a handful of screws rattling around that skull of his. I would need to keep a very close eye on him. My gut told me there was a lot more to this giant than his strength and size. With the Ogrins now subdued by the presence of their bonehead, they could resume their training and I watched the new Ogrins struggle to remember the difference between empty and full clips for their ripper guns. Full ones heavy, empty ones light. This was not the time to present the new armor to Trock, he had his mind elsewhere, and if I gave it to him now, the rest of the day would go without training. That wouldn't do, I needed discipline in my new ogrins. They would be strictly kept where they trained and lived, as far as possible, so Trock was the only ogrin to have freedom of movement on the ship, but he usually stuck near to me whenever he was not doing ogrin things. I decided to go make sure everyone understood what was going to happen once we reached the space station above Slud. That was another thing that made me different from the regular commanders of this universe. I informed my troops what was going to happen, to the extent it was possible without putting us at risk. I always believed that people were much more willing to do their job if they understood why they were doing it. At least, that's how it worked back home, and I saw no reason for it to not work here as well. No matter what, it made me more transparent as a leader, which was always a reassuring trait in people in positions of power. We soon found ourselves nearing the station once more, and contrary to last time, we were immediately hailed upon entering communications range. As soon as they learned we were the same ship that had taken their governor to the planet and later led them away, they assumed we were back with their leader and immediately gathered most of their troops in the hangar we were designated to land in, to throw a parade for their returning lord. This made things easy for me but required a massive and hurried undertaking to change the orders I had so carefully planned out. I decided to take 2,500 soldiers with me, to subdue the bulk of the defensive forces with one stroke, granting us enough troop superiority that I could demand the surrender of those that remained opposed to us. I wanted to take as many of them alive as possible since their only sin was serving their lord dutifully, but I was prepared to use deadly force to take the station. The amount of damage they could cause to the planet below, to the trade ships that passed through, and to the tithe collectors, if they remained in control of the station, was simply too great to ignore. They had to surrender or die. But there were other ways of going about this, and I still had time to make a change in plans. I could initiate an attack immediately, causing a massive firefight on the station, but culling the garrison in the process. Or I could stick to the plan I had made now, of letting my troops mingle with theirs for the supposed parade before we struck. Or I could simply fly my ship in position near the plasma reactor, inside the void shield of the station, train my weapons on it, and demand immediate surrender under threat of blowing up the station. Of course, if they called my bluff, there was a very good chance I was going to be blown out of the void by the orbital weapons platforms that circled the station. 
Chapter 28, What Price is Too High? No, the best option was the one already planned. Infiltrate, strike from within, and take control as quickly as possible. There was no need to make further changes. As one would expect from a friendly ship, we approached the station slowly, taking our time getting to the hangar. When we landed, the station troops had indeed gathered en masse and lined up in parade formation to the best of their abilities. They looked immensely pleased with themselves, even their officers were sporting small smiles, and it managed to relax and worry me. That was the advantage of being the captain, I had access to everything my ship was capable of, including direct access to the outside cameras, allowing me to observe the situation before we disembarked. The smiles on their officers' faces calmed me because imperial officers, no matter how relaxed their attitude toward discipline, only smiled when everything was going exactly how they wanted. On the other hand, I was deeply concerned because the officers were smiling. Or rather, these imperial officers, if the soldiers' lack of discipline and general crass attitude from my last visit was anything to go by. Why were they so happy? They couldn't have let their standards fall that low, not within the imperium. My danger sense was completely silent, but I had a bad feeling in my stomach. Truck, go and get the other ogrins. Take them to the armory and get your weapons. I ordered. Yes, Captain. He answered and hurried away to do my bidding. Something was wrong here, very wrong, and I needed to watch out. I almost lost my life once already, being involved with the space station above Slud. There was no sense in inviting another attempt. Those that looked for trouble usually found it and luck favored the well-prepared. I ordered the soldiers that would join the parade to equip their shot cannons instead of their regular loss guns, the proximity to the station's garrison and the parade would ensure maximum effectiveness. Thinking about it, it would be a slaughterhouse, a true image of carnage. At point-blank range, the shot cannons would turn their enemies into a red mist with limbs flying everywhere. It would be like detonating a stick of dynamite inside the chest cavity of a human. If the death of their comrades didn't deter them, then the gruesome display certainly would, and being showered in the mist of your former comrade tended to do strange things to the morale of guardsmen. I kept studying the gathered garrison for a few minutes, flicking back and forth between the cameras in the hopes of finding something, anything, that could tip me off to what was going on. But nothing caught my eye except for the unusual cheery attitude among the officers. This was the Imperium, officers of the Astra Militarum were never happy. Their job was to find flaws and smooth them out and as a result, they were ornery and irritated at the very best of times. At the worst of times, well, that's when the firing squads were given a red carpet into the barracks. But I saw nothing. They were all decked out in standard parade uniform, not a single thing out of place, except for the extra ammo pouches. I fucking knew it. I spat and the first officer standing nearby cocked an eyebrow. Captain? The young man inquired. He was a steady first officer. Competent, ruthless, efficient, and calm. Do you see anything wrong with these formations? I asked and took a step to the side, granting him a full view of the screen. He studied it carefully, flicking through the screens at a rapid pace, but he shook his head. Nothing, Captain. All I see is a parade that would befit a new governor. He deadpanned, and I got the distinct feeling he was mocking me with my new responsibilities, but be that as it may, I wanted him to know better in the future. Why would they don extra ammo pouches for a parade? I grumbled, and the young man stiffened slightly. I saw his eyes stare into eternity for a moment before he turned to me, the only reason to bring extra pouches of ammo is if you expect a prolonged firefight. They must expect us to only have a small number of soldiers leave and prepared to take the ship by force, he reasoned and earned my forgiveness for his earlier jest at my expense. Correct you are, and I trust you will remember to put details such as that into their proper context in the future. It is what will keep you alive more than anything. I admonished my first officer, but he took it in stride and bowed his head in acceptance of this piece of questionable wisdom. Well then, let's not keep them waiting. Let us show them how real imperial soldiers look. I declared, and the orders began ringing out through my ship. A short trip brought me to a platform where I could observe the disembarking troops before I left with Trock and his Ogren squad. He had been given the new Bulgren armor and struck a truly intimidating figure, the discarded tank tracks used to make the armor made the already freakishly large abhuman even bigger, and the solid metal covering his body could withstand withering amounts of fire before it gave in. I would have to get him a slab shield eventually, and a proper power maul, but for now, the ripper gun and combat knife the size of a small regular human torso would have to do. 
I watched as my troops started leaving the ship in combat groups of 100 men, totaling 25 groups needing to leave, and for every group past the second one, I saw the face of the station's first officer grow darker and more worried. While I had taken the carapace armors back from the group that had escorted me to the surface of the planet, the shot cannons in their hands inspired fear in the men on the station. In this limited space, my troops would dominate any firefight by sending walls of buckshot down any corridor they advanced through, and in the point-blank conditions of this parade, they had no chance of losing, not even if the garrison troops had quicker instincts. Their lost guns had long barrels and took a while to swing about, compared to my men's weapons. Slowly, they disembarked and spread out evenly among the garrison, eventually being deployed all around the edge of the formations. When I left the ship with four ogrins in tow I could almost hear everyone's sphincter collective tighten at the sight of them. I was once again wearing the carapace armor given to me, donning the mark of the Inquisition and the effect was immediate. The air that had been filled with expectant happiness suddenly felt like cold winds were howling through the ranks of the garrison as everyone present did their best to not look like a force that had been gathered to invade my ship. As much as I disliked wearing the Inquisition symbols, I had to admit I was loving the effect they brought with them. The sheer fear and awe with which people treated you was intoxicating. All the more reason to hate it, such power could very easily lead me to forget what I wanted. And I wanted home. The first officer of the station came up to me, presented the Aquila, and stared down the barrel of my stub cannon a moment later. Immediately, the sound of 2,500 shot cannons being hoisted into firing position filled the large hangar. Your previous governor has been relieved of duty because of his greed and incompetence. I have been placed in command of the station and the planet below until a fitting governor can be found and travel here. Please, enlighten me if you have any issues with this, and I shall bless you with the Emperor's mercy. I growled and I met no resistance. The gathered that had not arrived with me all swore a temporary oath of allegiance to me, in the Emperor's name, before I was satisfied to move on to the rest of the station. With the first officer under my control, it was a small issue to order the station garrison to gather up, disarm themselves and allow my troops to take their places until I could have their loyalties verified. Until then, they were free to move around where they used to, even to work their previous occupation, just unarmed at all times. I was slightly worried that the former governor's troops might cause trouble for me while we waited for a new governor to arrive, but nothing ever happened. At least not with them. However, it only took three days for my men to cause trouble for me. I was almost done taking inventory over everything, three days of nothing but reading and compiling lists of goods, services, communities on the planet below, expected resource gain, expected selling price to keep the wheels of economy turning, funds freed up by removal of a corrupt official, projected injuries among the feudal population as a result of hard labor, sustainable loss of life among the population, amount of guards needed to keep a minimum of peace, expenses to cover costs from. Everything to maintaining guards' equipment to hauling the or so preciously mined and thousands of other minor details. My head felt like it was about to burst from the reading, the weight of it making it feel like I was about to keel over. I had just put down yet another book of numbers when the door sprang open and a sergeant guardsman came skidding into the room. I beg your forgiveness, Lord, but there is a riot growing out of control down near the mess halls. She managed between gasps for air, and I needed nothing more to draw me away from this tedious, soul crushing work. No time to put on my armor, but Troc was posted nearby along with a squad of my more disciplined guardsmen, functioning as my escort whenever I had to go anywhere. As little a threat as unarmed soldiers posed, enough of them would have no trouble kicking my skull into the floor if they got me to themselves for just a minute. Not that I didn't trust my guardsmen, but I wasn't so sure about these station troops. Ahead of our group, the sergeant led us through the station and we soon heard the sounds of a riot. Things breaking, people fighting, random cursing and yelling, and all around chaos. The scene we saw when we finally arrived, already seemed to have grown out of hand. Hundreds of soldiers, a mix of the station garrison and my guardsmen, were engaged in a full-on melee. I took in the situation in an instant and knew it would be almost impossible to stop this right, short of sending in more troops. Glancing around the large mess hall we were in, I noticed some wiring hanging down from the ceiling, most likely maintenance being interrupted by the riot, and I had an idea. A horrible idea, but an idea nonetheless. Looking back over the fighting soldiers, I saw one of my guardsmen pulling out his combat knife and killing two from the garrison, and I pointed him out to Troc. Bring him to me, Troc! I ordered and the giant abhuman wasted no time, crossed into the melee that parted around him like a shark swimming through a school of fish, grabbed the unfortunate man around the head, and started dragging him back to me. 
His vision was blocked by having his head encased in the hand of an ogren, and the guardsman was flailing around with his knife, trying desperately to free himself to no avail. When Trock brought him back, I grabbed some of the loose wiring hanging over a solid beam of the ship's structure and wrapped one end of it around the neck of the dazed guardsman before handing Trock the other and giving the order. Pull! And Trock did just that. The sight of a man being hung to death had a magical way of capturing the attention of people and the riot started dying out as the fighting men and women slowly stopped what they were doing to silently observe the diminishing struggles of the guardsman I had doomed to death. His thrashing became weaker as life got choked out of him and I for a moment wondered what this would do to me and my morals. This was the first killing I had done that was not done in self-defense, not done on the orders of anyone else or in service to the Imperium. This was a death that could solely be placed on me as the responsible party. I had technically committed murder and didn't know how to feel about it. Was achieving the goal of stopping the riot worth the price of human life? Could you even put a price on human life? And if you could, why were we doing what we did? When you turned human life into yet another quantifiable resource, have you advanced? Or have you regressed to a point where what you are fighting for is forgotten, replaced by the simple need and desire to keep fighting? I shook myself out of these depressing thoughts, but as the dangling man went limp, I got a faint red flash in the corner of my vision. Almost like when I arrived and some entity initiated contact, but deeper red, more insistent. It would have to wait, I was being stared down by several hundred people, fear and anger in their eyes. Just what the hell is the meaning of this? How dare you all show this lack of discipline? Someone explain to me exactly what happened here, or I swear by the imperial throne, you will all hang. I yelled as loud as I could as I scanned the face of everyone assembled, looking for any clue as to it being more than a random riot. A garrison soldier stepped forward and the rank on his pauldron identified him as a lieutenant commander. I cannot stand by and watch men under my command be menaced by foreign troops, even if we all serve the same emperor. His voice was strong and his words carefully chosen, and I had to admit that they were in the right to riot if they were truly being menaced by my troops. Our lord may have been corrupt, but we were just doing our duty in the emperor's name, as is expected of us. Why should we be punished for being dutiful? Before I could answer, I had a flash of a vision. I saw the situation from the outside. The garrison soldiers, justified and righteous in their anger, mixed with the guardsmen from my ship. Myself, standing under the hung, still warm corpse of one of my men with my first officer and ogren standing behind me. It made me realize that my next course of action would determine my reputation in the future, despite anything else I might do. Too many people with too much invested in the situation were watching, and the wrong course of action could doom me when it came to interacting with other people in power. Returning to the moment, I could only choose one action if I wanted to have a somewhat decent reputation as a rogue trader. If it is as you claim, we will find out soon enough. Everyone here is confined to quarters while an investigation is carried out, one that I will personally lead. Orders were given that this station's crew and garrison were to operate as normal, albeit without your weapons until your loyalty could be confirmed. I now see that my orders have not been carried out properly, or else this situation should not have happened to begin with. But, Lieutenant Commander, mark my words well. If you are lying to me, then ten years in a slave gang or even forced conscription into a penal legion will be too good for you. You, and your men, are looking at life in a slave gang in the mines on the planet below if I discover you are lying to me. As I delivered the final part of my decision, I watched the officer in front of me grow paler, but his eyes were as determined as ever. He wasn't lying I could tell. But putting the fear of the emperor in him would do me good in the days to come with unraveling this massive clusterfuck of an interruption. On the plus side, it gave me an excuse to assign my first officer to my more needed, and much more boring, official duty of getting a proper grip on everything going on with the station, the planet below, and the unholy amount of information that needed to be sorted, filed and compiled. My first officer oversaw the locking away of anyone that had been involved with the riot while I had to take on the questionably enjoyable task of dealing with the engine seer. Walking through the cramped corridors of the ship, I noticed the gazes of the crew members that thought themselves safe from my perceptive observation. It was no longer uncertain fear I saw in their eyes, more of measured respect, and I was certain that my choice to lead an investigation myself had turned things in my favor. This would keep any petty rivalries and nepotism out of the equation when it came to finding the guilty party. Making my way toward the generators of the ship, I noticed a lot more servitors and a lot less proper crew, the menial and mind-breaking work of the semi-sentient worker drones that once were human, left to the lobotomized remains of the punished wicked. 
It was difficult to not feel creeped out by them, shells of their former selves fused with robotic technology to get around the ban on artificial intelligence. Knowing that this was a possible punishment simply for failing the Imperium or insulting the Mechanicus in a situation where they had the advantage didn't improve the impression left by the semi-sentient automatons. I shook off the dark thought and continued toward the reactor area of my ship. It was still a bit of a way away, and I thought of the red flash I had experienced when the guardsmen died from being hung. I had to know. Innocence lost. Was it circumstance, purpose, fate, or personal choice? Adapting to the grim dark universe is a hard thing for those born into it. Those that come from the outside rarely reach this point of acceptance. The taking of life, no matter how casual or serious, is a definitive act, the ultimate show of determination. Why did you do what you did? Perhaps no one will ever know, not even yourself. You are a killer. Taker of lives. Plus three will. Once again, what's with the snarky attitude of this system? It is bordering on an almost accusatory tone at this point like the system is actively disapproving of my choices. Well, live long and suck it, system, I shall not be passive-aggressively goaded onto a chosen path. Though I always welcomed a stat increase. For now, I had to deal with the Mechanicus in earnest, which meant minding my words at practices that might be seen as barbaric and inhuman by the Imperium at large, but the Mechanicus saw as the natural way of things. The flesh was weak and they strive to achieve perfection through the replacement of biological components with mechanical. Perhaps the buff in will was just what I needed to get me through this conversation. I just knew that the engine seer would demand a boon in return for diverting precious attention and resources away from the ship in general. Well, time to play the diplomat with my own crew. Chapter 29, Rodent Issues it ended up taking quite a while and I got turned around more than once, but I finally managed to find my way to the engine section of the station and started my search for the omniscianic congregator. Not that he was hard to find, I simply followed the slow shuffle of tech priests that were wandering the oil-stained and damp corridors near the engines, applying new oil to the various parts they passed on their way while they chanted incessantly in high gothic. Some carried ancient tomes containing their prayers, others carried human skulls, swinging from long chains and emitting copious amounts of incense smoke. All of them were modified in one way or another. Some had replaced their eyes with cybernetics, others opted for arms or legs, a few of them had their entire torso exchanged for mechanical devices, the skin near the areas of fusion showing up as highly inflamed and infected if the bright red color and the small oozings of pus was anything to go by. I skulked through the station, surrounded by servitors, servo skulls, tech priests, and slave gang workers, I even passed a single cherub, the biosculpted homunculi with the appearance of horribly looking, child servitors. The ability to fly with the implanted cybernetic wings and an anti-gravitic generator didn't improve the horrible image. It all suddenly became too much and I felt violently ill as the horrors surrounding me finally overwhelmed me. Turning to the side, I unloaded the contents of my stomach onto the floor where it seeped into the grill I was walking on to disappear into the bowels of the station forever. I was shaking like a leaf in the wind, I felt drained of all my energy, and it was all I could do but sit on the floor for a while, pressing my head against the cool and grimy metal. It was nice here. Cool, dark, almost peaceful. I could sit here forever, forgotten in the dark. And yet, I couldn't. I had to pick myself up, keep moving forward. I was good at ignoring my situation and embracing the moment, but I was eventually overwhelmed. I had no idea how long I lay there, but the chanting had moved so far away that I could barely hear it when I eventually got on my feet. I found a smooth surface shiny enough to function as a makeshift mirror and was horrified by the sight that greeted me. Pale as a ghost with sunken cheeks and dark rings around the eyes, I could barely recognize the body I was inhabiting. I looked haunted. Was it taking so much of a mental toll on me, being here and having been given the responsibility I had? Or was it mostly caused by the past few days of little sleep and too much reading? I would have to take better care of myself if I didn't want to have a stress-related heart attack. I shook my head and got moving again, determined to not let these dark thoughts dominate my mind, but I found it hard to distance myself from them. Surrounded as I was by evidence of the very things that I wanted to avoid, dark thoughts and terrible moods kept trying to exert their power over me, but I wouldn't let it happen. There was too much at stake, and I wasn't thinking about the Imperium or the station, but of myself. Weakness would be taken advantage of by anyone that saw it, and the only reason I had been spared ridicule and or attempts at my life or undermining my authority was that I was in the station's Mechanicus area. 
The engines, the various machine parts, the small local manufacturums on the station, even the menial workshops and the mighty generators, all of these were the shrines of the Mechanicus and they guarded them zealously. Being caught doing anything not supervised by a tech priest and blessed by the Omniscia would guarantee you being turned into something less than human for your transgression. However, I was their captain, their rogue trader, and I had the might of the Inquisition at my back. They couldn't touch me even if they wanted to. I gathered myself and resumed my walk toward the chanting, the mechanical voice of the congregator sticking out like a sore thumb, leading their prayers as it was. I soon found who I was looking for, the omniscianic congregator, standing in front of a large conduit that transported the power across the station, surrounded by lesser tech priests chanting, applying holy oil, tightening bolts, and adding new paint to the flaking layer covering the conduit. The congregator himself was chanting out loud from a tome in his hands while the servo arm attached to his spine was slowly attaching prayer parchments to places of apparent significance. I knew better than to interrupt their work and thus made myself comfortable in a corner where I wouldn't be in the way. I knew the congregator had noticed my presence long before I entered his but their prayers and rituals would suffer no delay or interruption, such was the importance of their work. Yes, I considered it to be bogus, nothing a regular engineer could not accomplish, but unfortunately, the cult of Mars had a monopoly on the manufacturing and invention of technology, and they would be more than happy to disintegrate anyone that threatened said monopoly. And in a way, they made the imagined belief of the Omniscia become reality through belief. They literally willed their godlike entity into existence. This was the way of things in this universe. If enough faith was poured into something by enough beings, then it would manifest. The realm of souls, or the warp as it was commonly known, ensured this was the case. It made me miss my home, where faith was superstition and gods were nothing more than a figment of our collective imagination. When they finished their incantations and prayers, the congregator and his tech priests swiftly gathered up their tools and got ready to move on to the next job. Honored Omniscianic Congregator A word if you please. I called out and the group turned as one. Captain the voice box that had been installed to replace his vocal cords made the voice of the congregator sound like a horrible parody of an 80s movie robot, but the words were clear enough. The blessed engine requires our attention. I understand, but this cannot wait. I require tech priests to perform a sweep of the security measures around the mess area where we had a riot. I need to know exactly what happened in detail. I understand this would take them away from their duties, but I have neither the time nor the patience to put this on hold. I demanded. My words were carefully chosen, a perceived insult at this moment could very well mean that I would not get what I wanted for several weeks, and it dawned on me just how much I loathed the inefficiency of the Imperium. Human nature at its finest is self-serving and greedy no matter the situation. Not that the ruinous powers of chaos were any better, raving madmen that only cared for the death and suffering of every living being in the pursuit of a slave's powers. Sure, they were powerful beyond measure but they were forever bound beneath their chosen chaos god, doomed to an eternity of servitude. Even death would not see them free, as their souls had been sold to their gods. This will be a difficult task. A large part of the station remains unblessed, its systems laying dormant and unused. Power is there, but the machine sleeps. We must awaken the great machine, in the name of the Omniscia. We calculate at least two weeks before we can approach this task. The answer came swiftly and it was nothing I had not expected. Of course, they pushed back, they had their own agenda. I had seen them scurrying around, trying to gain access to the quarters I now inhabited, the many exotic and uncatalogued items stored in their drawing them and like flies to grok's shit. What if I send a team down to the planet to secure a group of indentured servants to take over some of the more menial tasks, freeing up your tech priest's valuable time in exchange? I had thought about it, and the easiest way to placate these technophiles would be to increase the number of hands they had at their disposal. But I would be damned if I gave them access to properly educated people, the shift in political power could very well see me relegated to a crown figure role, a puppet that was controlled by the congregator. I needed to properly cement my power as well as my authority. As for the jewelry I handed over to you, have you identified the digital weapon used in the assassination attempt on me? The one human I still left in the congregator's face flashed a moment of irritation and regret, annoyed at me for remembering the digital weapon. Had he been able to squirrel it away, it would have secured him a rise in rank the next time he was able to contact Mars. We were. I shall have it delivered to you carts. Indentured servants would indeed increase the speed at which we can sanctify the station we calculate three days before the security sweep can be completed. 
Even through the robotic voice filter, there was an undertone that told me I shouldn't press the matter further. No matter, I got what I wanted and now I just had to sanction a press gang raid on the planet below. Somehow I don't think that is going to do anything other than improve the mood of my men, growing restless as they were. I said my goodbyes and started the trip back toward the bridge with the congregator's single eye burning a hole in the back of my head. I didn't like the feeling I was getting from that one, it was more hostile than the engine seer prime and that warranted a response. Giving it some thought while I backtracked through the station, I got the idea to issue the press gang to target penal colonies on the planet, solving several problems with crime, granting more hands to the mechanicus, and having them go through the arduous process of turning hardened criminals into cowed servants, on account of the less than successful interaction I just had. I also needed to figure out what to do with the planet below. Sure, I could lounge around in my temporary ivory tower of a space station, but that wasn't me. Lounging around would only lead me down the same path that the former governor had taken, and considering how it ended for that sack of potatoes, it was not a path I was eager to follow him down. And I did vow to myself to annoy the Imperium for locking me down here. I wanted to explore, to see the new things in the galaxy. To find a way back home. Maybe it was time to deliver on that personal promise. With a new energy and a much more positive disposition, I set a course for the treasury, looking to have a serious word with the purser from my vessel. I had neglected this for too long as it was, and now was as good a time as any to make him understand that I had my own plans for how we were going to run things in the future. It was a long walk, getting to the administrative offices on the station, the layout was less than optimal for efficiency, but perfect for a nepotistic governor that wanted to play favorites with the varying factions within the Imperium. There were going to be grumbling and complaints when I ordered them to rearrange their various offices, but once the efficiency skyrocketed, they would sing my praises in the shadows. They wouldn't dare say anything that could inflate my ego. I practically kicked the door open, the sour and annoyed face on the wrinkled old woman that served as my economic advisor and personal banker quickly turned friendly and warm as she saw me enter. Great, I thought to myself, another snake in the grass, waiting to backstab me or rip me off. Captain. To what do I owe the pleasure of this unexpected visit? Her voice was like sandpaper scraping across gravel and her eyes were hiding beneath a sea of wrinkles. She was arched over a table covered in mountains of papers and data slates with a small army of scribes squirreling around in the background, handing over and receiving stacks of paper at a frightening rate. Despite her obvious advanced age, her hands moved with a frightening speed, grabbing and handing out the stacks of paper the scribes transported around while typing down information on the data slates. I wish to restructure the economic overview of the planet below. Now, I started and I saw her narrow her eyes at my words. That is an enormous undertaking, Captain. Are you certain we have the time? Her objection was a fair one, but it was not as hard as she made it out to be. Running an economy, be it for a nation or a planet, was like a household economy, there were just more zeros at the end of the numbers. How much does the average worker on the planet earn, for every 100 imperial crowns made in profit? I pressed. Five imperial crowns, Captain. The answer came without hesitation. She had accepted that this was happening. And we have a 20% flat tax on any income in place on the planet. Here is what I want you to do. Raise the pay of the average worker to 15 crowns on the 100. Implement a varied tax rate based on income, with the richer paying the lion's share of the taxes, institute four daily mandatory working hours in the mines for anyone who is not working there already, including the nobility and their households. Start work on disbanding the class system and move toward a system where worship of the emperor is at the top of everyone's to-do list. Start the process of disbanding nobility and higher ranks, we need hands in the workforce, and I will not accept that a good portion of the healthiest part of the population sit on their asses while the rest struggle to meet the tithe requirements. Start confiscating any food that is grown, sold, transported, and otherwise located on the planet, distribute it into large food banks in every city, and start rationing the food to ensure everyone gets a fair and proper share determined by family size. I need the populace to be strong and healthy to work hard and serve as guardsmen. Start disbanding the various militias and noble household armies, and start creating a PDF, with a focus on keeping the peace rather than anything else. I want them to function both as upholders of the law and protectors of the planet. Yes, there will be pushback from the local lords. I care not. They will accept this new way of things or see themselves obliterated. I will not hesitate to order the ship to fire from low orbit to prove a point. This was a good beginning and would keep the various people around me busy for the foreseeable future. 
Captain. This, this will take quite a while and will be met with severe opposition from the local lords. They might rebel against the Imperium in response. The purser argued, and she had a good case. Except I had a reason to not listen. They will listen to their governor or they will be sent to meet the emperor. Do not fail me, but inform me if I need to deploy troops to the planet below. I have things to attend to, you know my will. See it through. I was not in an arguing mood, and I did have the power to simply veto anyone on board this ship, except perhaps a commissar, which I conveniently did not employ the use of. Who in their right mind wanted to work with someone who could declare you unfit for service? I? Yes. Captain. Ave Imperator. The old woman said and presented the Aquila. I returned the formal greeting and turned to leave. When I left the room, I could have sworn I saw a shadow flicker in the corner of my eye, but when I turned my head, there was nothing. My danger instinct was calm and no gut feeling told me anything was out of order, but I still felt curious. Walking down to the junction where the flickering had taken place, I saw nothing out of the ordinary. I looked around, behind pipes and wiring, underneath panels, everywhere I could think, and nothing. Thinking nothing of it, I shrugged my shoulders and began walking back, but my eye caught something out of place. There, embedded in the wall and partially hidden in the shadows, was a small rat skull strung upon a simple, thin iron chain wrapped around it. Most people would have thought nothing of it. Not me though. I knew this thing, this foul pendant, better than most. It represented the faction I had loved most of all within the 40k universe, aside from the glorious space marines. But that couldn't be, they couldn't be here, it was the wrong universe. They belonged in the Warhammer fantasy universe, not the 40k one. And how would they have found their way to an imperial space station, hanging above a feudal world? And there it was, staring me in the face. Feudal world. Fuck me. I was staring at the evidence of a Skaven infestation. And not just any Skaven infestation, but one that was sanctioned by a council of thirteen. Chapter 30, Drafting a Merchant The discovery of the foul pendant made me search the area almost frantically, looking for any more signs of Skaven. And I found them. Small markings etched in the wall, no doubt runes from their written language. The Skaven had a large and complex written language, even more so than any other race. A rune or symbol for every word, concept, idea, thought, and thing. This meant that most Skaven did not know all of them beyond a basic idea of the concept, but they knew enough to understand whatever basic idea was being conveyed. I found several small markings I did not know the meaning of, but I also found runes indicating both the Grey Seers and Clan Scryer, the mad rat engineers that used warp stone to make unholy weapons of incredible destructive power. The symbols etched in the walls had no doubt been placed by Clan Ishin, the assassins, and spies amongst the rats. That only left evidence of Clan Mulder, the surgeons and fleshcrafters, makers of rat ogres and beasts alike and by far the wealthiest clan of them all. But they would be here as well, even if I couldn't find any sign of them. If the overgrown rats were bold enough to mark territory under direct and immediate imperial control, then they were most likely under the influence of the Musk of Battle, a curious thing that happened whenever a Skaven burrow reached its upper limit in regards to population density and availability of food, meaning they would be looking to expand, through the conquest of needed. The only thing that bothered me was, we were on a space station several hundred kilometers above the planet. How on earth did they gain entrance here, to begin with? Could they have snuck aboard the cargo haulers bringing or from the planet? It seemed the most likely. The only other way they could have gotten on board was if they had help. Which was a whole kin of trouble I did not even want to consider unless I could rule out everything else. In any case, I could sound the general alarm, send troopers out to comb the station with a fine-tooth comb, and they would most likely find nothing. Or. I could go get Troc and his ogrins, pick up a squad or two of voidsmen, they had better experience moving and fighting inside the ship, and go hunting myself? Bringing back a corpse to display to anyone thinking I had lost my marbles would be a godsend, especially when it came time to convince the Mechanicus that they did not have full control of the areas of their charge. I know, it is not the safe thing to do, but I wanted more than boredom and endless lists. I was a rogue trader, and I think it was about time I took on the mantle of a trader militant. Satisfied with this plan of action, I turned to walk away, but a sudden whim made me stop. I wondered. I turned on my witch sight and was assaulted by a projection of bright lights. As many runes and pictograms as I had found etched in the walls in inconspicuous places, they were nothing compared to the light show that sprang up in front of me. Walls of text written in the Skaven language, every single rune brimming with the power of the warp. 
It seemed as if the text was drawing in warp power in minute amounts, gathering it up like a flux. Disturbing the writing could have catastrophic results, anything from a fizzle of energy to the station being ripped apart could happen. So of course that's what I did, betting on my luck stat to keep me safe. I ran my knife diagonally across one of the walls of text, disturbing the finely carved runes and intricate symbols, and was immediately thrown violently against the opposite wall as a blast of psychic energy was unleashed in an instant, a gale of wind rushing through the corridors. Dazed and confused, I lay there rethinking several life choices recently made, when I heard stomping feet approaching fast. It turned out to be several guardsmen investigating the strange phenomenon and they quickly gathered around to make sure I was okay. Get Farson. Now. I ordered as I slowly got up. I was not well versed in being a psyker or the powers that followed with it and I needed someone much more experienced to help with this. Summoning my navigator Primaris was a bit of a gamble since there was a chance he would catch on to me being an unsanctioned psyker, but since he was from a shrouded house bloodline, there was also a good chance he might just ignore it, in favor for continuing working for me, which could be a path to redemption for his fallen family. In any case, I had turned off my witch sight the moment I gained control of myself after being flung through the air. I had hit the wall hard, but not hard enough to do any real damage. Bruised and with a hurting ego, I rose to my feet as the guardsmen fussed around me. They may find me strange and my way of thinking weird, but they also knew that I treated the common soldier with at least a grain of respect, which is more than they got from 99% of any other higher-ranking personnel they will ever meet. I sat down on the floor, crossed my legs, and began to wait while I observed my surroundings. The guardsmen, not knowing what to do, assumed positions up and down the corridor, standing watch and looking out for any potential danger. If nothing else, they were dutiful. It took almost an hour, but Farson finally came hurrying down the corridor with a slew of astropaths and guards in tow. It pleased me that he took care to ensure he and his subordinates were safe when venturing the station or my ship, the astropathic choir being my only link back to the Imperium once I left the relative safety of Imperial space. He didn't even make it down to me before he slowed down, staring in awe and fear at the hidden texts on the walls. What what is all of this? He said slowly as he gestured around him. All of what? I asked aggressively. I was thrown against the wall by. Something. All because I dragged my knife along a wall. I was playing dumb and the skepticism on Farson's face did not escape my attention, but he had more important things to deal with than my vague explanations. Captain, my astropaths and I will need to work uninterrupted for quite a while. Can you instruct your guardsmen to keep anyone from interrupting us while we work? Farson knew better than to press the matter with me, when we were not alone, and thus put all of his in the back of his mind to deal with the current issue at hand. Done. Seek me out once you are done. We have things to talk about, Navigator. I answered as I gestured to the guardsmen already in position around the area to stay and stand guard. Another gesture brought the corporal closer, ready to receive instructions. Increase patrols all over the station, increase the size of patrolling units, and, I pointed out the small charm embedded in the wall, or wherever you find these, or anything like it, I want soldiers on permanent watch. Instruct them to pack an extra ammo bag for their shot cannons, and a fully charged pack for their lost pistol. If anyone is found sleeping or slacking off in that specific guard duty, summary execution will be the punishment. And do not touch them. I spat at him at the hast with which he presented the Aquila and hurried off to make my orders a reality was enough proof that I had scared him sufficiently to understand the gravity of the situation. A trooper came up to me, holding the knife that had been flung away from me when I was thrown against the wall, and I took it with a nod. Before departing, I bent down and pried the Skaven pendant free from the wall, wrapping it in the cloth of my jacket as I picked it up. There was no telling what the fiendish rackin had done to these things. After that whole ordeal, I retreated to my room, placing the pendant on a small shelf in a glass cabinet left by its previous owner, taking care to lock the cabinet back up. For a moment I thought about trapping the cabinet, but decided against it, choosing instead to trap one of my hairs between the cabinet and the glass door. If anyone opened it when I wasn't here, the hair would fall to the ground, betraying any sneak thief in the process. With all that done, I sat down and started penning a letter that would be copied to the various city mayors below and distributed at the first chance. Precautions were needed to fight the Skaven effectively. First, they needed to triple the guards around granaries and food stores, as well as any industry quarters in the city that worked with metal, the Ratkins' greed for the metal was as insatiable as their hunger. 
They needed to increase the number of local city guards, improve and repair their sewer access grates, making them lockable and putting orders in place to lock them down each night, and in case of any grate being picked open, an ambush of guards should be placed for the following nights. I didn't bother explaining the last bit, I just added several phrases making it clear the horrors I would inflict upon any mayor stupid enough to go against my will. To take the edge off of my harsh orders, I also added an order to keep a detailed list of extra expenditures associated with these orders with a promise that the extra expense would be covered by their planetary governor, as a sign of understanding that they, and by extension I, still had tithe quotas to meet. With all that done, I poured myself a glass of Amasek and enjoyed the rich aroma rising from the glass. I had only taken the first sip when a communique sounded from the vox in the wall. Captain, Imperial trade ships are approaching the station. They are hailing the old governor with words of familiar greeting. My young first officer's voice rang out, and I felt a slow headache building behind my forehead. Summon them the moment they make landing. I might have use for an imperial merchant. Do not inform them of the change in governor. I said in a neutral voice. I did not need the distraction of a bootlicker trying to score a sweet trade deal, least of all one that already had a fleet of ships behind him. I was technically quite poor for a rogue trader, at least for the moment, but what I lacked in material wealth, I had gained in a small reputation among the people with real power. And it was time to cement more of a reputation. I liked the thought of the trader militant label, which would serve as an excellent way to enforce that reputation. I made ready to receive the guests, making my way to the closest thing to a throne room on the station where the old governor would receive important guests. It was a gaudy place, covered to the brim in expensive silks, gold inlay in the flooring, statues of the former governor, crystal decanter, and glass sets strategically placed so a servant would never have to walk far to get one for a guest, mosaics made from gemstones and precious metals. The entire room was as tasteless as it was extravagant, and if I had the time I would have ordered my troops to dismantle it all to be sold for a profit, which in turn would be used to improve the situation on the planet below. I summoned Trock and his ogrins, directing them to wait in the shadows near the doors to the room. Once our guests entered, they would walk straight past the monstrous abhumans without ever noticing them. It would make for a wonderful surprise, should they not be as pleased with the change in leadership, as the people below would soon be, at least once my changes were implemented. It took almost an hour for the ships to arrive, dock, and discharge their chartist captain along with the subordinate captains of the other ships that followed him, and I was getting bored with the waiting, but I could not break character. Contrary to belief, most statecraft is nothing more than theatrics and timing woven into an artfully directed illusion, presented to your intended target with one specific goal in mind. And my goal was to present a front of disgustingly exaggerated control over my surroundings. I wanted them to see me as a person that played cards while they were playing dice. To think I had already thought about every possibility and taken steps to ensure they fall out in my favor. When they finally arrived, they were neither silent nor respectful. The door was kicked open and a woman, not much older than myself, swaggered into the hall with all the self-confidence of a person who had complete and utter power over everything in her immediate surroundings. A small retinue of capable-looking bodyguards, headed by an arch-militant, followed in her wake. Dartsma, you old crook, did you get shafted by the Imperium, or have you just lowered the pay of your troopers again? I have never seen so many glum and serious faces around here before. Where's the wine, the pleasure slaves, the dash, she managed to yell out while strutting forwards, giving me a short while to study her as she approached, looking everywhere except at me. She was very sure of herself, indicating a long service in a position of power. Fairly short and slender, with blue eyes and raven black hair, she had something ageless about her, so most likely rejuvenating treatments to make her live longer. Her clothes were that of an imperial merchant, expensive and of colorful make from rare materials. It made my military-style uniform look impoverished by comparison, but it also made me look much more competent. A short haircut of a warm brown color sat above a pair of brown eyes the same warm and hazel color. Rather slender, much more so than Elris had been, and half a head shorter than me, she seemed slick. Like she could wiggle her way out of any problem presented to her. Well, let's just see how she managed to wiggle her way out of what I had planned for her poor outfit. Her yelling was interrupted when she laid eyes on me, the inquisitional markings on my carapace armor making her swallow her words with an audible gulp as the swagger left her step, she stopped dead in her tracks and the air of confidence that had radiated out from her just moments before, now seemed to seep out of her like a deflating balloon. A pleasure to make your acquaintance, Captain. I take it you were expecting someone else to greet you? 
I couldn't keep the mirth out of my voice, seeing a chartist captain go from being on top of the world to suddenly looking like a kid caught with their hand in the cookie jar was simply too damn funny for me to ignore. I am wa who are you, and where is Dart Marare? She demanded, stammering, trying to regain her composure. I am Bjork at your service. As for Dart Moret, the Imperium, in its wisdom, discovered that our dear former governor was raising prices beyond the acceptable and failing grossly in his duties to both the Imperium and the planet below. Not to mention his blatant heretical inclinations. I was dispatched so a squad of Astartes would not have to be. Now, do you want to start over with introductions? Or should we just continue from here? I retorted, and I had the satisfaction of watching her face change several shades paler when I mentioned both the Astartes and the former governor's rather liberal interpretation of what was acceptable within the Imperium. For a long moment she didn't say anything, but I saw the gears spinning in her head. One did not become a Chartist captain, especially not of a fleet of the size of the one she commanded, without being an exceptionally crafty and intelligent individual. She was weighing thousands of options against hundreds of possible scenarios, and she only had a few seconds to do so before protocol demanded she answer me. Let us start over, then. I am Idris Van Bale, Chartist Captain of the Emperor's Merchant Fleet operating in this sector, here for my scheduled arrival to deliver and pick up goods. When she finally spoke, Idris's voice was carefully neutral with only a hint of warmth to it, and I saw no reason to be dismissive. Welcome then, Idris Van Bale, to the humble station that is temporarily under my command. As said before, I am Bjork, rogue trader in his holy emperor's name, with the Inquisition's blessing to boot. I must admit, for a moment I had no idea how you would react, and I must admit I am pleased we can meet civilly, though I think Trok and his mates are sorely disappointed in the lack of conflict. Or am I wrong, Trok? My last words were directed over Iris's shoulder and she turned her head to see who I was talking to. The shock on her face when I mentioned my rogue trader status turned into her eyes bulging to the point where I thought they would pop out of her head when three ogrins lumbered out of the shadows behind her, followed by the enormous truck with his neural enhancements marking him as a bone EAD free for all to see and it brought me no small amount of joy to see as did the defensive postures her bodyguards took up. In this proximity, they had no chance against four armed ogrins with their eyes locked on them. Yes, Captain. Soldiers that love the Emperor are good soldiers. I don't like killing them. But those that stopped loving the Emperor I would be happy to squeeze into a ball for you. Trock rumbled while nodding sagely as he looked over the merchant captain, looking for all the world as if he had delivered the ultimate truth to us. The three ogrins with him all nodded eagerly in acknowledgement of their leader's words, hefting the improvised mauls I had the Mechanicus whip up for them. While not power mauls, they were still 100 kilo mauls of pure steel, meaning that whatever got hit with them would be crushed, unless they had inhuman strength. Even Astartes would have difficulty contending with the strength of such an attack, probably preferring to dodge the attacks instead. Trying to block an Ogren's attack was suicide, almost no matter who you were. A trick I would love to see one day, Trok. Now, Idris Van Bale, I welcome you to Slud. You and your men are welcome to make use of the station and its facilities for the duration of your stay. My purser will take care of any trade there might be scheduled. Kindly note that selling prices are reduced compared to your last visit, owing to the unfortunate removal of Dart Moret. Though I doubt you are going to complain about lowered prices. I smiled as I talked, happy that I had gotten over the initial stress of the situation. For a moment anything could have happened. Once you have found yourself situated on board the station, perhaps you would join me for a glass of Amasek afterward? Though while not as. Unhinged, as the previous governor, I still appreciate some of the finer things in this life, and there are things we must discuss as well. I extended the invitation to Idris and that, combined with the formal welcome, was enough to dispel the worst of the tension in the room. By giving her control over when we were to meet, I had shown I was a sensible individual, smart enough to understand that honey caught more flies than vinegar. I would like that, Lord Trader. I shall be there within two standard Terran hours. Idris said before giving me an elevator look and adding, I look forward to it. She was a fairly attractive woman by all standards, and while I was not against any form of fraternization, there were more important things at hand, as she would learn soon enough. Let's see just how happy she was with my invitation once my demands had been laid bare. Time passed fairly quickly as I waited for the arriving guests to get situated, while my guards were stressed and on high alert. I had no idea if they smelled trouble that I did not, but their behavior made me decide to keep an open eye and ear whenever I interacted with Idris and her people. I had to remind myself that as a Chartist captain, she had no more power than a glorified supervisor. 
Most of her duties lay in keeping the schedule as set forth by the administratum and securing good trade prices for the imperium. She might be one of the few Chartist captains vying for political power, but considering the minuscule route she was assigned to and the obvious consorting with corrupt and indulgent governors, odds were, she was a greedy but competent individual. If I presented my demands in a way that allowed her to gain something she would accept as a true merchant. Profit above all. When the time drew near, I retreated to my chambers and set up a table and two glasses. It wasn't much, but it made for a fairly intimate setting which would make discussing business nice and cozy. It would also throw off her preconception of what was to take place, I even dug into the old governor's stash of random exotic items and dug out a few real candles, lighting a single one at the table a few minutes before she was scheduled to arrive, which she did with the punctuality one would expect of an experienced merchant. So, of course, she arrived a fashionable fifteen minutes late. No matter, if she wanted to waste time, that was on her since her troops would bear the majority of the workload ahead. She had regained a lot of her confidence when she arrived, but she didn't swagger into the room like she owned it, so she at least had a good bit of decorum. Real candles? Is this a business meeting or an attempt at seduction? She coyed, smiling broadly as she took a seat and leaned back in a soft armchair. The synthetic fabric was a far cry from the solid leather I preferred myself but to each their own. I liked the feel of the leather and I felt it helped ground me in reality. A touch of nature where none was to be found. As I said, I also enjoy the finer things in life. And the luxury of reading in soft, natural candlelight is a rare delight that few get to experience. I deflected with a toothy smile. No reason to play all my cards, and it was better to let her fill in the blanks herself, letting her form her own idea of what was happening here. I gestured to a book to underline my words and she nodded knowingly. This is business, Idris Van Bale, mixed with small pleasures. Indeed, but a niche delight, one that focuses on the self instead of sharing the experience. Are you that selfish, or is it just a stroke of personal greed? Idris asked playfully. There was no maliciousness in her words, she was only trying to make joking conversation. Neither, I just have strange preferences. But for now, let us drink and talk, you and I. I gestured to the unopened bottle that was also dug out from the former governor's private collection, a far cry finer in quality and rarity than anything on board my ship. I was already in the process of compiling a list of things to be moved to my ship before the arrival of the new governor, including several pieces of furniture, his entire private hoard of alcohol and exotic items, candies, jewelry, and works of art, all meant to be used as lavish gifts for other people of importance but stuck collecting dust in the trophy room of a corrupt and heretical governor. They would see good use on my ship, as my only attachment to them was the value they represented regarding further diplomatic relations through lavish gifts. Needing no further invitation, Idris quickly pulled the cork from the bottle and poured herself a generous glass. I settled on a quarter glass myself, not wanting to cloud my mind too much. So, what did you want to discuss, Lord Trader? she asked as she took a sip from the glass. MMM, this is a good vintage. She added as an afterthought. I walked over to the glass cabinet where I put the small pendant and used a handkerchief to pick it up before placing it on the table in front of her. Do you know what this is, Idris Van Bale? I asked her, already knowing she didn't. It looks like a pendant made by a small child. But why a rat skull? She smiled overbearingly like a parent finding the hidden arts and crafts project of a child. This pendant represents a danger to the Imperium that has not been seen since the Hrud was first discovered, only, this threat is not diminutive, is not small, and is in all likelihood gearing up for a push to gain total control over the planet below. I laid it all out for her, and to say she looked skeptical would be an understatement. Lord Trader, while I do not doubt that there are constant threats to the Imperium, I highly doubt anything could be a threat to such a degree, especially against a backwater planet like Slud. She gave a small laugh at the end of her sentence to punctuate the absurdity of my statement. I didn't respond, instead summoning a guardsman through the vox in the wall. When he arrived, he presented the Aquila and waited for orders. How many pendants have been removed from the station so far? I demanded. Seventy-four at this moment, Lord. Navigator Farson also found pendants made of what he called contaminated ore. He reported and held out a small box for me to take. I opened it and noticed the light in the room seemed to be absorbed toward the box as the room visibly dimmed ever so slightly. I didn't even need my witch sight to see the warp energies surrounding the piece of ore. Only Skaven would be brazen and stupid enough to use warp-tainted materials and warp energies so freely and with so little regard for the long-term consequences. 
I dismissed the trooper and he hurriedly left to return to his duties. I turned to face Idris who was no longer smiling. Her forehead was wrinkled in deep concentration, the implications of this revelation having consequences she could not foresee. Why are you telling me all of this, Lord? She asked suspiciously. Because you have at your disposal the troops and manpower needed to take action against this unseen threat. Bolstered by my forces, we should be able to at least delay any expansion by this foe for long enough that reinforcements can arrive. And so, I hereby requisition you and your fleet for the time being until a response force can arrive in orbit. Of course, I need more than a few trinkets to convince the Imperium of this threat, so hopefully you can guess what I am about to ask of you. I watched her face drop as I spoke, the idea of being drafted by a rogue trader was not her idea of what was going to happen tonight, but it was what was happening. You are going to say that we are going hunting tomorrow, aren't you? Idris said flatly looking defeated. Correct you are my dear Chartist captain. If it is any consolation, I truly am sorry I have to do this, but at least I will offer you the or at production cost plus a meager 15% markup. A small acknowledgement of the trouble I am putting you through. I knew I got her attention again, the greed flashing across her eyes was impossible to hide. That's less than half the usual price. How can you do it so cheap? Idris exclaimed. I told you, the former governor was raising prices beyond the acceptable. But from the way you react, I can tell you are pleased with the news. Good, that should make it a little easier to muster as many of your forces as can be spared from your ships and start sending them to the planet, of course, keeping by the imperial decree that technology is barred from the world beyond what is already in place. So no firearms, no modern armor, nothing except melee weapons. We will leave the ranged combat to the native soldiers that will bolster our ranks, their training and natural affinity for the outdated combat will prove invaluable. Anyone able to use a bow proficiently will be outfitted with one as well as arrows. Your arch-militant should be put in charge of creating a melee specialist squad, we will need them to do the majority of the killing once combat is joined while our regular troops hold the line. I started sketching out my plans, but Idris looked overwhelmed as I continued talking. You talk as if we are going to war, Lord Traitor. I thought we were exterminating a nest of mutants. She interrupted, suddenly looking less than optimistic about the state of things. Nobody in this galaxy knows this enemy better than me, Idris, and when I lay out plans for a full-scale war, it is because it is needed. The fact that they are brave enough to place their foul pendants and stinking wards around imperial property only speaks of a problem ignored to the point where it threatens to overwhelm even the harshest of responses. What we face is akin to an orc walk. Except this one is coming from below, instead of from outside. Our enemy lives underground and how many abandoned mines and tunnels have not been left on the planet over the centuries? We have provided the perfect breeding ground for an enemy that thrives in the shadows, their natural affinity for intrigue and covert operations only aiding them in avoiding detection. I suggest you put some steel in your spine, Idris Van Bale, because we are about to face a living ocean of claws, blades, arrows, and the foul machinations of the ruinous powers. And we have to respond with violence on a scale so massive that we can force the enemy on the retreat, a task I think will be all but impossible if you do not cooperate with me to the fullest extent. I tried to paint a picture for her, a picture of such horror that she would have to agree with me, but I saw the doubt in her eyes, even as she nodded slowly in agreement. Very well lord, but I cannot delay for long unless we find this enemy of yours. No more than ten days before I need to depart to keep my schedule. It was a small defiance, but well within her right to demand, so I had to concede. Ten days is more than enough, I proclaimed confidently, and once we have the proof, I will make sure you can be delayed without punishment. So, let's not delay and get to work. I expect the first troops to be marching to the landers within the hour. I ended our little meeting rather abruptly, but we had no time to waste. Ten days was all I had, and if I judged the size of the merchant fleet right, it would take several days just to transfer the troops. I needed to take to the ground with only a scouting force to back me up. This was going to get interesting. Chapter 31, Into the Blackness Despite my very best efforts, it still took most of a day to gather enough forces to present a proper expeditionary force that could locate the enemy and take up a defensive position while reinforcements rushed to take over the main battle. Getting ranged auxiliary forces from the planet below was as simple as showing up and demanding that whatever city I arrived in, handed over half the garrison, sent messengers out to surrounding cities to do the same, and put the cities on lockdown until we returned their troops. I ordered the station's master of whispers to get me as much information on strange creatures being sighted, food stocks, materials, weapons missing, and strange green lights. 
The two first subjects were common enough, but the mention of green lights had the elderly, unassuming spymaster cock an eyebrow at me, but I stared him down until he relented his curiosity. It was not for him to know what I knew, only to get me the information I needed. I knew he was going to try and dig deeper, but my own master of whispers had already gained a foothold within the ranks of the station. Many people didn't know it, but one of the keys to the success of so many rogue traders was the master of whisper, their spies roaming far beyond the limitations of the ships and fleets of their employers, looking for information on anything that could aid the rogue trader, from resources left unattended and in need of a rescuing, precious knowledge. Trade opportunities in markets lacking certain resources which inflated prices to the absurd and everything in between. There was quite a bit of complaining about seeking out the enemy with no ranged weapons, but I was having none of it. I was not about to break imperial decree while withholding what I could only guess would be classified as vital information from the imperium at large. My report to the Inquisition would have to be vague enough to feign ignorance, but specific enough to satisfy any initial questions, leaving the whole mess for whoever was to take over after I was done here. It took around 12 hours for me to get an initial report on the status of things down below, and I did not like what I was reading. Rodents were always a problem on feudal worlds, but the overall situation had been a steadily increasing problem over the past several years, with outlying villages reporting giant rats every so often. Green light was also reported, mostly centered around an abandoned mountain that had been mined out. This was not good, an empty mountain meant that the Skaven most likely had a fully grown undercity on their hands. Nothing short of obliterating it from orbit would secure total annihilation. So I guess this world was stuck with Skaven now. No matter, I still needed to initiate a purging process or at least make the public aware of the threat. When enough troops had been mustered from the merchant fleet, I made ready to leave the station with Trock, his ogrins, and the same honor guard that followed me to the planet below last time. I was slightly miffed that I still had no proper slab shields for the ogrins, but there might be a solution on the planet down below, provided their smiths and artisans were not completely devoid of creative talent. I insisted on Idris taking the same lander as me when I left for the planet, as I wanted her to understand what we were headed for, and being surrounded by ogrins who was spoiling for a fight tended to paint that picture in the most illustrious of ways. Their banter, shoving, pushing, and general eagerness to finally get to smash the enemies of the emperor over the head with their mauls. Such marvelous yet simple creatures. I only foresaw problems once it came time to get them down into the mines. The Ogren's claustrophobic nature and fear of the dark were well known and well documented at this point, but I figured that with enough light and people around, we could coerce them into following down below. Once we made contact with the Skaven, they would care for little other than how much blood I would allow them to spill in their emperor's name. Lord Traitor, I really do not see the need for me to accompany you to the ground during this operation, Idris complained as the lander shook around us and the Ogrins huddled around Trok for comfort. He was just as uncomfortable as the rest of them, but his size and neural enhancements also made him aware of his Ogren charge's need for him to be the steady rock they could gather around right now. She looked, if possible, even more uncomfortable than the Ogrens as she spoke. I allowed myself a small, but audible, laugh before I answered, What's the matter, Captain? No stomach for fighting? I would have become a fleet commander instead of a chartist captain if I did. She mumbled defiantly, You already have the full support of my fleet. I fail to see the use you can have for me down here. It's not about use, Captain. It's about preparing you for what is to come. Do you think the trade lanes of the Imperium are safe? Sure, you might have seen pirate attacks in the past, but what about heretics, traitor legions, and worse? Compared to the galaxy at large and the dangers it holds, this threat is relatively safe, if such a thing can be said about going into battle, but know this. To my knowledge, this enemy cannot yet travel to the stars, which gives us a single advantage. They are locked to the surface of this world. But after having found the things we did on the station, I have reason to believe they have successfully infiltrated ships going to and from the surface, so at this point, it is only a matter of time before they can reach the stars. And even the orcs won't be able to fight them off when that happens. They are as dangerous as the Tyranids, and the only thing that has prevented them from already taking over this planet, if my suspicions are correct, is their propensity for backstabbing and intrigue in a never-ending quest to rule the galaxy. I was losing my self-control as my temper got the better of me, and I knew as soon as the words had left my mouth that I had made a grave mistake. The look in Idris's eyes told me everything. How do you know all of this if the enemy you speak of cannot travel the stars? There was steel in her voice I had not heard before, and I saw her left hand creeping toward her hip where the naval pistol rested in a quickdraw holster. Merchant or not, she was still an imperial. 
violence was the quickest and safest course of action in the face of anything that didn't follow a very specific doctrine. I wouldn't reach for that, Idris. You are locked in a small ship with four ogrins charged with my safety. How do you think they will react? I gestured to the group of ogrins with my head and noticed that they were observing the two of us with extreme attention. Among what I assumed were many talents, discretion was not one of Idris's virtues. You won't have time to draw the weapon before eight hands, each fully capable of ripping off your arm with disgusting ease, reach for you, after which whatever remains, will be shoved through the deck grating. I cannot tell you how I know what I know, beyond that the master of whispers aboard my ship is extremely talented. But I ask you to trust that what I do, I do for the Imperium's safety and well-being. You will understand once you face the enemy. A little white lie with a plausible explanation, combined with the Inquisition symbols she had seen on my armor earlier made her relent just enough in her suspicions to stay her hand. I will reserve the right to judge for myself whether you can be trusted. But for now, at least, I will follow you. She finally proclaimed, but her distrust was plain to see. Good, I only need your cooperation. The trust will come by itself once the fighting starts, be sure of that. Now, hide that naval gun, and let's put on our game faces for the native population. I tried sending her a blinding smile but only got a weird look back. You are not going to disarm me? She asked in surprise, still tense as a bowstring. If you shoot me, you will be dead before my body hits the ground. And since I understand how much you want to live and earn profit, I feel quite safe and secure. Besides, it might come in handy later, so stow and hide your weapon for the time being. With that, the rest of the trip took place in contemplative silence. When we landed, most of the troops gathered had already been transported to the surface and I almost had 500 guardsmen able and ready to move out. I had to admit, for a moment I wondered if Idris would order her soldiers to seize me, but she did not and we could get moving as soon as we disembarked. While still in regular uniforms, the armor of our scouting force had been replaced with metal plate counterparts, and they were under the strictest orders to not draw their lost pistols under any circumstances, except a direct order from me. Only Idris, myself, and my bodyguards carried hidden firearms, two in my case. A lost pistol and my stub cannon, just in case a rat ogre got too close for comfort. Trock and his little group did not need such things, especially on a feudal world, their size and brutality would see them through almost anything that could be thrown at us, and I had to admit it made me feel a lot safer. The Skaven were technologically inferior, supposedly, but they were numberless and once their Undersittites reached critical mass, they would make it the business of the entire planet to expand their territory. And if they had access to warpstone, that meant grey seers, rat ogres, warp-infused blades and bullets, everything one could ask for if they desired bad times ahead. This reminded me that I needed to check the cities for black dust dens, the infamous byproduct of warpstone usually sold off by open-minded and entrepreneuring skaven that sought trade with morally bankrupt humans, the substance smoked like opium-induced heavy euphoric dreaming and an immense sense of well-being. Unfortunately, those addicted to it would do literally anything to get another hit, putting them firmly under the control of whoever had control of the black dust. Finding these dens would make it a matter of waiting to get information on the skaven, rather than searching. I doubted we would find them first, the criminal activities of the Imperum tended to be extremely proficient at staying hidden when they wanted to, and a figure of authority would be the last person they wanted inside one of their dens as long as said person was not already thoroughly addicted or were prone to accept donations to the planetary coffers. The forest clearing that served as a landing area for ships was brimming with troops, both natives and our own. Those among the feudal natives who were entrusted with the knowledge of the broader Imperium and the technological leap present between them and the rest of the galaxy were busy handing out maps to the squad leaders and commanders. Someone in ornate armor and an air of superiority approached Idris and I, along with a retinue of soldiers clad in heavy full-plate armor from top to toe, and I had to admit that having a dozen men in full steel suits, carrying large greatswords all polished to a mirror shine, looked mighty impressive. But I also noticed the glances they kept making at Trock and his ogrins. It was nice to know that even the elite guard of this planet had a healthy amount of common sense. Enough to fear ogrins anyway. The figure in ornate armor caught my interest though. The air around them seemed heavier and denser, as if their mere presence was imposing itself on the world. I wanted to activate my witch sight, but if it was another psyker, of which I was almost certain, they would know me to be one as well, and we couldn't have that. The figure came to a stop in front of me and saluted. I raised an eyebrow and returned the gesture by making the imperial Aquila, resulting in the armored person becoming flustered in their attempt to recreate the Aquila, only to be stopped short by their armor. 
I waved away the attempt and looked expectantly at the newcomer. My lord, forgive me for demanding an explanation, but ordering such significant numbers of the local troops to assemble armed and ready for battle is an issue of great concern to the local leaders. I hope you understand the desire for clarity on this delicate matter. The voice was that of a woman of undetermined age, the armor and closed helmet completely covering her features. I turned slightly toward her to give her my full attention as I answered. I am afraid I do not understand. You have been given orders by those stationed above you and are expected to do as ordered. The Imperium requires bodies to protect you and your people. Speaking of, I wish to gather all the leaders, mayors, prefects, officials, and whoever else holds power over settlements and cities on the planet. Some things must be clarified, but I recognize this will take time. If you dispatch messengers now, I am certain they will have gathered once I return. It was an effort to keep my voice light and unbothered, but I like to think I succeeded. I didn't need already worried officials turning to panic over imagined problems. And ignorance was a virtue in this universe. Better to keep them ignorant for as long as possible. You plan to travel with the troops? Despite being muffled by the helmet, the shock was clear in the voice of the, I assumed, highest-ranking battlefield commander. Of course. How else am I going to make a proper report on the conditions of things down here? I said with a wide smile as the commander visibly wilted in front of me. Now, gather up the men, and let's start heading for the Glowing Mountain. The Glowing Mountain? But those mineshafts were abandoned many decades ago. What could we hope to find there except dust and rocks, Lord? Even her elite guards seemed amused if their body language was to be believed, and I could hear the slight laughter behind their helmets. If I'm right, which I know is a certainty, much more than we ever wanted. I retorted and my words gave them a slight pause. What could they expect to find if I was this confident in the danger that lay ahead? I knew what was ahead of us and I hated every step towards it. But it had to be done. I hated to admit that my reason for doing this was not the good of mankind, not to protect the innocent, nor the interests of the Imperium. I did this purely because losing the planet after being appointed temporary planetary governor would see the Inquisition punish me in ways that even the Chaos Gods would find distasteful, before finding a way to punish me for the millennia to come for the failure. And if I had to be honest, I was not keen on having that be the end of my life. I had a goal in mind and it had to be attainable, it had to be. I wanted home and nothing and no one was going to stand in my way, not even the furry tide of death known as the Skaven. When we started marching, I sent riders ahead with written orders to prepare any spare weapons and shields in the villages and single large city we would pass on our way to the mountain, so the soldiers I brought with me could be properly armed. There would be grumbling, there would be complaints from wealthy merchants, and there would be refusals. Which meant I either had to use my troops to bully the people, do it myself, or simply offer to pay up. I would most likely have to pay up, as five hundred men and women in plain robes to cover their flak armor did not make for an intimidating sight. Once they got armed with swords and axes and were given shields to help protect them from the skaven slings, crossbows, and warplock pistols asterisk, they would look far better, but for now my treasury would have to do the speaking. Not that I was missing anything in that regard, being appointed temporary governor, I also had complete control over the planet's coffers, granting a not insignificant amount of wealth within the Imperium. There was another problem though. Given the access to metal on the planet, and the amount of time the Skaven had been left unchecked, it was likely they even had warplock jezels, the Skaven sniper teams carrying rifles longer than themselves. Such weapons would be able to punch through Astartes' power armor, meaning nothing on this planet or the station above had the potential to protect against the dreaded sniper teams and their warpstone bullets. The first few small towns and villages were more a collection of hovels than anything else, but each still had their own small militia with a surplus of service weapons and armor, kept in good working condition and my small expeditionary force soon enough began to resemble something of a fighting force. With pauldrons, shields, and blades, the robes made the armed troops look more like devoted warrior monks than regular guardsmen. The sight of them woke memories of the orcs I had fought back when I initially joined the PDF and I suddenly felt a longing to get stuck in the shit with the troops again. There was something equalizing about the fray of battle. Status, rank, wealth, age, it all melted away once battle was joined. On the front line everyone was equal. I missed that feeling, the feeling of belonging and camaraderie, of having complete and utter trust in the person next to you. That kind of trust vanished, the further up the metaphorical totem pole you climbed. As the old saying goes, it's cold and lonely at the top. 
I had to promise payment to every village we came across, my robes having been modified with a small symbol of the Inquisition on top of the hood. This and my planetary governor status granted me enough goodwill with the common people in the small villages to be given what I needed, purely on promises alone. These promises I fully intended to keep, with a bonus to boot, their willingness to help me the moment they saw my robe spoke of true and loyal imperial subjects that deserved a better lot in life. Of course, it could be fear, but I saw nothing of the sort in their eyes. Only adoration and joy, over having been blessed with a personal visit of one of the god emperor's representatives. The children stood wide-eyed and silent as we marched by, the differences on the faces of the soldiers from the various ships giving them plenty to stare at, but it was nothing compared to the pure awe they showed when they saw Trock and the Ogrins, who for their part were absolutely delighted to see children. You could say a lot about Ogrins, but they were good people at heart. Simple, dim-witted, and in many ways childish, their simple minds gave them happiness and joy from the smallest of things. One of them stepped out of formation and was immediately rewarded by a solid punch to the improvised helmet we had a smith cobble together out of three regular helmets. Between the ogrins, such a reaction was commonplace and it didn't carry any significant pain for them, it was merely a reminder to get back in line. But it had an unexpected side effect. When the ogrin stepped back into line he rubbed the back of his head and grumbled to himself like one of the children standing on the side of the road would have done, and the sight of someone so tall and big, acting like one of them, was too much for the children who started a laughing to their heart's content. No one said anything or even acknowledged the incident, but I noticed that every time we passed a new village with new children watching us in awe, the same ogrin would step out of line, receive a smack to the back of the head, and proceed to grumble and pout, much to the delight of the kids. Several of the soldiers around us had noticed as well if their smirks were any indicator, but no one stopped it and I saw no reason to spoil the fun. Soon enough, they would wish the peace had lasted longer. We didn't reach the mountain the first day. We barely reached the largest city on the way to the mountain, but there was little grumbling about a night under the stars. It was a feudal world which meant low pollution and plenty of green nature to enjoy. Most of the soldiers had not spent a peaceful night under the stars in years, the only time leaving their ships was for shore leave on some orbital station or spaceport. For many of them, this was the first time they saw this much green, let alone spend any significant time in it. This was a memory they would cling to in the darkest hours on the ship when the grease and oil were dripping from the walls around them during their 14-hour work shift. When your muscles were screaming for you to stop working, your thoughts became muddled and random due to exhaustion, and the only thing that kept you going was the very work that was exhausting you to the core. At that time, they would reminisce about these hours, dream themselves back to these times right here, sitting silently around their small fires, taking in every second of true peace. It couldn't last, not in this universe. During the night, the posted sentries raised the alarm as several small crossbow bolts and square-throwing discs came flying out of the night, killing several sleeping soldiers before enough light was produced and enough troops had been woken up that the attack stopped, but it confirmed my fears. The Skaven were bold enough to attack soldiers moving in force, albeit a rather small force, without any significant fear. But it was not the attack itself that worried me, it was the fact that it happened to us specifically, so quickly after landing and making our way toward the mountain. Either they were better at stealth than I had assumed, and had listened in on my planning with Idris, or there were traitors among the ranks of the local population, which was by far the most likely scenario. Of course, it could have been a roaming band of raiders, but I highly doubted that. Perhaps a quick message to the Inquisition, once my business here was concluded, would do wonders to remind the people that certain acquaintances were not worth the potential trouble. After calming down the troops that wanted to set out into the darkness to take revenge, and giving strict orders that anyone leaving camp without a signed pass from me, was to be summarily executed in front of his or her squad, regardless of rank and or status. I ordered the dead bodies burned, there was no telling what foul poisons, concoctions, warpstone infusion, and other trickery they might have smeared on their weapons. I didn't feel like dealing with the mutated bodies of our fallen brothers and sisters. It would also rob the Skaven of a potential food source, as grim as that prospect was, but it was a truth that the Rakin didn't much care for what they were eating, as long as they were eating, even members of their race was not an uncommon food source whenever other sources ran temporarily dry. Skaven slaves were never in short supply and could be bought by the dozen for a single warpstone token, the disc-like shapes of pure warpstone the Skaven used for currency. The whole ordeal cast a shadow over our expedition, but the rest of the night passed in peace and quiet. It was not even a raid. It was a warning. Just who the hell did these overgrown rats think they were? 
sending me a message so bold that they might as well have marched up to me and told me in no uncertain terms to fuck right off, back to wherever I came from. We would see who held the power to tell anyone to fuck off from this planet. My planet. One of Trox Ogrins had been lugging a Vox caster in a backpack in case I needed to summon reinforcements, but now I had a different idea. I retrieved the backpack and grabbed one of the troopers able to operate the damnable thing with any degree of success and took off toward a nearby thicket of trees to communicate in peace and keep following the decree to shield the native population from advanced technology. A decree I would break in the future if my life depended on it. Dying for some imperial decree, screw that noise. I was more valuable to the Imperium, alive, no matter which way you looked at it. After my little communique on the Vox, I didn't even have time to return to the now-roused group of soldiers, having packed up the temporary camp, before I noticed the first lander touching down in the far distance, near our destination at the mountain, followed soon by more landing all around the mountain. Troops from the merchant fleet would locate mine entrances, both human-made and otherwise, seal them up with barricades, and then reinforce those barricades a dozen times over. Another would be conscripting the locals into a makeshift militia that would patrol the barricades, preferably manning them full-time, if we gathered the numbers. We should be able to, the imperial officers were very efficient at press-ganging civilians into military service. The fact that this would be very short-term, and kept planet-side, only made it easier to persuade, the unwilling to become willing. I didn't need a professional army to be raised, I needed enough bows and arrows raining down on anything that, against all odds, might find the smallest of ways out of the barricades that would be erected, to make it too costly an effort to make it out. I had taken care to stress the fact that I wanted at least 300 feet of clear ground between the mountain entrances and the barricades. Even with a fresh supply of wood nearby, provided by the vast forests surrounding the towns, villages, and pockets of cultivated farmland, it would take days to see my orders finished, and days more to reinforce the barricades to the point where I would be satisfied. But that was fine, I didn't mind at all. I wanted the Skaven to see what was happening to their home. They had been bold enough to challenge the Imperium. Well, the Imperium had arrived and was stepping up to the challenge in the same way the Imperium always did. Slow, ceaseless, grinding, gear of war being churned at slowly increasing speed, pouring lives, material, and death into the problem until it was either resolved or had become so expensive that it was cheaper to just glass the planet and be done with it. I wanted them to see Doom approach their beloved Undercity, and send the message that I was here to level the entire damn mountain. Around their ears if that was what it took to secure Imperial victory. By blocking off all but one of the entrances with large kill zones and enclosing barricades, I forced the Skaven to either make a move on the one open entrance, spend energy making a new entrance that would get discovered by roaming scouts, and close off like the others, or hold up in the mountain, giving me the upper hand on account of having gained the full momentum and forcing them on the defensive. They would most likely go for the third option, trying to scheme their way out of things. Fine by me if they did, it would give me time to plan my attack on the Undercity. As for the entrance, I was leading my ground troops toward, I wanted layered defensive fortifications, at least four trench lines deep. If the Skaven made a push out of the mountain, we needed to consider the possibility that their numbers would be overwhelming. There was also the matter of their grey seers and their magic. Everything I knew of it, made it out to be unpredictable and immensely powerful. I had nothing to counter it, no proper psychers, and no one able to use the same magic along the lines of the Skaven. I simply had firepower and bodies, though I suspected that technology at the level I was comfortable with would most likely seem like magic to the overwhelming majority of people on this planet. It took another half day to arrive, but when we did, we found a small army of people working on making materials for barricades, setting up temporary shelters, setting up foraging parties, and marking the area where the defenses would be built. Trenches, spikes, watchtowers, thick wooden walls, fall pits, kill zones designed into the architecture, allowing for maximum exposure with minimal opportunity of cover during an advance. Contrary to the expectations of most people gathered, the local leader and Idris included, I happily grabbed a hammer to the nearest improvised smithy and made myself useful in cleaning, sharpening, and repairing the tools of the workers. It was strange, picking up work I used to do back home before I was whisked away to what I thought would be the ultimate dream life. I missed this work, the smell of hot iron, the sizzle of the water when you cooled the metal, the flying sparks when the hammer struck true. My mind started wandering as I worked like it always did when the hands took over in completing familiar tasks, and my eyes fell upon one of the crossbows used by the professional archers of the local militia. The biggest drawback of the weapon had always been its reload time, but in my world, they had found ways around that. 
maybe I could do some of the same without breaking the decree of the Imperium? I left the work to someone else and found myself one of the crossbows. I turned it over in my hands as I studied the craftsmanship. Solid wood that had been worked with care, iron fittings carefully placed and secured to create a sturdy weapon, a finely woven and perfectly taut bowstring, and a nicely carved wooden bolt tipped with gleaming steel. The only way I saw it working was with gravity, so I found an artisan who was working on barricades and ordered him to get to work building the top modification that would hold the bolts in place, and the crank that would operate the bowstring and move the magazine on top of the crossbow to make the next bolt fall into place in the grove I went with the Chinese design from back home which, granted, had the drawback of low accuracy, in favor of high rate of fire. Per my instructions, the artisan created two magazines, capable of holding 7 and 15 bolts respectively. The work on the repeating crossbow took almost two days, but once a working prototype was made, it was as simple as copying the mechanism to the existing crossbows. There was a lot of mumbling from the local soldiers, their annoyance with my tinkering with a good weapon was almost enough to warrant a proper protest by some of the veteran archers, but once I was ready to show off the repeating crossbow, they still gathered around to watch the spectacle, no doubt ready to throw some scorn my way if the expected failure showed itself. I asked the veteran archers with the most sour faces how fast a sealed crossbowman could send bolts downrange, and how fast a skilled archer could do the same. The answer came back as 1 to 3 bolts and 8 to 10 arrows respectively. When I claimed to be able to send 15 crossbow bolts downrange, reload, and repeat the process at the same time, all I got in return was a snort. To prove my point, I asked for the most inexperienced archer to show me how the design worked. A large boy was quickly pushed to the front where pale and sweating with terror, he quickly made his way over to me and presented a very stiff and formal Aquila that drew a smile from me. Relax, son. Consider this as you helping me and me owing you a small favor. I said quietly so only the kid could hear me, and he tried putting on a brave face. I quickly went through how the new design worked, sending a single bolt down range and reloading it, so he could see how it worked. Then I handed him fifteen extra bolts in a small quiver and told him to hit the target, a dead old tree placed around fifty meters away, as fast as possible. The first two shots were somewhat hesitant, but as he understood what was happening he gained confidence and thereby speed. In less than twenty seconds he had emptied the clip and immediately started reloading, the little training he had received taking over and he stuffed the bolts into the top of the magazine and started unloading on the target gain, this time a little slower but far more accurately. He was still within the given minute when he finished the second clip of bolts and he stood, staring down at the weapon in his hand like he was holding a great relic of war, bestowed upon him by some heretical god. The veterans who had been skeptical and vocal about my misuse of a weapon were silent, mouths hanging open and eyes threatening to bulge out of their heads as they stared in awe at the impossible feat that had taken place in front of them. As one, the entire camp started clamoring for the artisans present to get to work on the same modifications for any crossbows there was to be found. While it brought me a lot of respect from the troops, I didn't care about that. All I cared about was increasing my odds of survival. I had not been lying when I claimed this to be dangerous, but to invade Skaven Undercity was borderline insanity, just short of suicide by an external force. But with the new modification proving itself and the artisans working overtime to copy it to any weapon delivered to them, it had taken almost nine days from the order was given until the mountain was encircled, closed off, and ready for me to begin the second phase of my plan. On the morning of the tenth day, I gave the order to assemble in front of the mine entrance. With the workers functioning as a makeshift militia to man the defensive lines stretching out from the entrance, I could bring all five hundred of my expeditionary forces with me, but I was not keen on that. Five hundred men and women would stumble around in the dark, killing each other as much as the enemy. No, we needed to be smart about it. I made small teams of two archers and three melee fighters to function as scouting teams, but once they started stripping off their armor, I stopped them and ordered them to armor up instead. They complained that they wouldn't be able to outrun any enemies they ran into, but I countered with the fact that they could not outrun this enemy. If they encountered them, their best chance lay in a fighting retreat while one of them ran to get back up. Their objective was to map out the entrance and the surrounding tunnels and find a cavern large enough to accommodate all of us, as close to the entrance as possible. That would be our forward operating base, taking the fight inside the mountain and forcing the Skaven to react to our presence. No self-respecting Skaven would tolerate what they considered to be invaders on their territory, to stay in said territory. I could have sent the troops from the merchant fleet with Vox beads and data slate maps. But again, this damn decree surrounding the planet. 
No matter, I would do it if the initial plan didn't work, my need for a forward base superseded any imperial decree. If I did not have a defensive location inside the mountain, I could send people into the meat grinder for decades and accomplish less than nothing since the dead people would provide the skaven with food from the dead bodies and materials from the weapons and clothes. It took almost half a day, and I received two reports of giant rats making the exploration difficult, but nothing on the ratkin. This was bad, if they were hanging back and letting the clan molder creations take care of harassing my scouts, that meant that whenever they chose to attack, they would pour everything into it. We didn't have much time to prepare, and we had an enormous amount of work ahead of us. They did find a cavern big enough to accommodate a thousand people rather comfortably, and so the order was given to make way for the cavern, posting detachments of guards every fifteen meters in the tunnel. I wanted them within eyesight of each other, a few moments alone was all a skaven assassin in the dark needed to turn a guard into a corpse. It took almost ten minutes to reach the cavern, but once there, my soldiers spread out, covered the entrances, and sent runners back to inform the workers that the way was clear for carts with building materials to be moved into the cavern where work would begin to create a small but more permanent fortification for us to occupy. There was not much I could do until the fortification was complete, so I started wandering the cavern, taking in the atmosphere and smells. It smelled foul in here, like a mix of old urine, rotting food, unpleasant musk, and death. They had been here, if not recently, then at least fairly often, and in significant numbers. I had been bugged by a steady blinking in the side of my vision and I knew the system wanted my attention badly. I have seen many color blips throughout this past week and a half. I wanted to check it out, but there always seemed to be something that got in the way and left me precious little time to do anything other than work and sleep. Since arriving back on this cursed planet, this was the first time that I had nothing to do and nothing to fill my time with. But right now was not the time to do so, as sitting around with a blank expression could not be good for my image. I needed privacy, but in these tunnels and anywhere near this mountain, solitude meant danger. So it would have to wait a little while yet. Perhaps when everyone was asleep I could get away with it. I would have to wait and see. Chapter 32 So Tired There was no way around it, I couldn't ignore the system any longer. With the number of notifications that had been thrown my way, and considering I had not been in combat to get kill notifications, something was, or had, happened that I needed to deal with. There was just so little time to myself, and whatever time was not spent leading a planet, was spent in desperate, blissful, sleep. I milled around the large cavern to find a place where I could perhaps have a shred of privacy, but none was to be found. The carts had not arrived yet, and even when they did, whatever tents we brought were to be used for storage or command tents. I was also getting irritated, having to wait, when you were the one in command, was infuriating. But I also understood that from my thoughts and commands to the effective completion of said task or idea, it would take time for the people to get things underway. While I made my way around the cavern I noticed countless small alcoves along the walls, some of them barely openings in the cave wall, others reaching deep into the mountain. For some reason, even though the area had been deemed safe, I had a gut feeling that it would be unwise to leave the deeper alcoves unguarded. There was not a lot of room in them, but an infiltrator or assassin from the Skaven clan Ashin could easily make its way through such an opening and cause devastation within our ranks. Unfortunately, I had nowhere near enough men at the moment to both set up guards near every crevice and opening and take a force significant enough with me to get anything meaningful done. Then again, with only 800 troops until reinforcements arrived, there wasn't anything I could do unless we all moved out together. But it would be suicide to attempt anything unless I had a literal army behind me. And even then, it might not be enough. A quick pat down of myself made sure I still had the lost pistol and stub cannon hidden beneath my robe. These bastard vermin had no idea what we could bring to the table, but Imperial Decree forbade it. No matter. If I were forced to save my own life and the lives of the guardsmen from my ship by using advanced technology, we would have to gun down any nearby native soldiers as well. My troops would understand the need and act accordingly. A regrettable action, if it ever came to it, but such was life in the Imperium. I settled for putting out guards at every nook, crevice, and cranny we were able to find, along with the larger openings, leaving me with only seventy soldiers not on active duty or in sleep rotation. I could have chosen those seventy to be from my crew, but it might make people think I liked to play favorites, which I of course did as much as the next guy, but I saw no reason to invoke the displeasure of the hundreds, soon to grow to thousands of soldiers to whom I was nothing more than a mysterious authority figure. They had no attachment to me beyond my title, and so I was keenly aware of the fact that a blade in the dark was never far away, especially with the Skaven nearby. 
those cunning backstabbers had a way of worming their way into the darkest and most depraved parts of human society. Still, I had no real fear as long as Trok and his ogren stayed nearby. Trok had bonded to me completely, my safety was his highest purpose in life. Of course, someone could risk it but a hired assassin would be more interested in staying alive to collect pay than risk death to ensure a kill. Since there was nothing I could do at the moment, besides mill around and get annoyed at the things I could not do before more troops arrived, the only sensible thing left to do was to add myself to the barricades at the tunnel leading further into the mountain. There wasn't a whole lot going on there, but a few extra sets of eyes could never hurt when on watch duty. Time passed slowly as I leaned against the wall and stared into the dark tunnel ahead, the soldiers around me were painfully aware that I was there. There was no banter, no gambling, no private training sessions between the soldiers, and none of the things that soldiers usually did to pass the time. My presence was putting a dampener on the mood, but at least it made the men vigilant and observant. No one was shirking their duties, which in turn made the rest of the camp feel incredibly safe. But no matter how dutiful my men were, I still had a bad feeling in my stomach. Something wasn't right. It felt like every move we made was being carefully studied by an unknown entity that loomed just out of view. After several hours of continuously growing unease, I decided to go get some rest in my tent. With a short bark, I called Trok and his PGRYNS to order, but before they could gather around me, an ungodly loud explosion rang out, no doubt amplified by the mountain walls, and one of the ogren's heads exploded before a green flash struck Trok's left arm and tore a solid chunk of flesh out of it. The wound started sizzling as the warpstone bullet had left traces amount of the solidified warp material in the open wound and the mutation it brought with it kicked into overdrive. Before I could do anything to react, the Chartist captain's arch-militant appeared out of nowhere, saber in hand, and performed what could best be described as an immediate, emergency field amputation. In other words, he cut Trock's arm off above the elbow, preventing further spread of the mutation by robbing him of a limb. It was nothing that couldn't be fixed once we returned to more civilized imperial space, but it effectively took him and his ogrins out of the fight as I couldn't be bothered to micromanage ogrins that were used to receiving orders from Trok. So I was left to take care of my own safety once the fighting commenced, which this current sniper attack was merely a prelude to. A friendly reminder that commanders on the front lines made for excellent targets of opportunity to an ambitious skaven. The soldiers had been busy in the two seconds it had taken for Trok to lose his arm, most of them having formed a shield wall while the rest had been diving for cover. This stark contrast in reaction highlighted a massive issue with taking troops from a feudal world and trying to train them to fight as imperial guardsmen. Their instinct was to create a wall of steel with a shield, while a proper guardsman dove for cover at the first hint of anything remotely close to what might possibly be considered to resemble sporadic and inaccurate signs of potential enemy fire. It didn't take long for a medikai to arrive and inject copious amounts of painkillers and sedatives into the, understandably, angry and pain truck. Sure, he wouldn't die, and with proper medical care, he would make a full recovery with a bionic arm to boot, but he would be out and away from my side for the duration of this campaign. So I was left woefully exposed, both to the enemy, but also to any of my soldiers who might I a quick way for this campaign to end. I needed contact with the enemy and soon. Also, much more of a confrontation than having Jezel teams take leisurely shots at us while we stood around. But to get that, I needed to go on the offensive. With only a handful of soldiers as well, since every hand removed from the forward camp inside the mountain, was a soldier that could not help prepare for the arrival of thousands of soldiers, summoned on my orders to help deal with the Skaven infestation that had grown, unnoticed and dangerously large under the lazy command of the previous planetary governor and, by extension, the lords and nobles on this planet. An issue I would have to address once the fat bastards had gathered and I had started a proper cleansing of this enemy. Once everything settled down once more, and the soldiers had forced the grumbling workers to start building crenulations on the barricades, I retreated to my tent to gather my thoughts and come up with some sort of plan or strategy beyond, go find some skaven and kill them to show the bodies off to the doubters among the soldiers. I could of course call it a revenge hunt for the cowardly attack we just suffered. But those words would not sound believable from my mouth and most of the troops would only think of it as me being annoyed that my pet ogren had gotten wounded. Which, while true, was not the main reason for me wanting to force a confrontation. While most of the men would follow orders, there was doubt among their leadership. And as much power and security as my title granted me, I was still an unknown to these people. It wouldn't be difficult to have someone kill me, pin them on the murder, and be done with me. The poor sap that then killed me would then be publicly executed, much to the amusement of the local populace while the nobles would see it as a demonstration of their divine status. 
I might be a lucky bastard, but I could not rely on it. I would have to take on a new persona. And for that, I needed to look inward. There was a large mirror in my tent, and I placed myself in front of it to look myself over. The blue eyes that stared back at me were my own, and yet not. The color was a different blue, and the shape of the eyes was more squinting, I guessed from whoever I took this body from, growing up on an ice world. I was tall, taller than most, built like a Greek god from back home. Even with the robe on, there were still scars visible on what little skin was still exposed. Countless small scars created a labyrinth on every part of my body I could get a good look at. Several larger and much more serious-looking scars showed previous grievous injuries, some of which I had received after taking over this body. My hair was slowly getting so long that I would have to consider getting it trimmed soon or risk looking like a vagrant. I didn't much mind the shade of brown, the warm chestnut color sat well with me, even if it was getting specks of gray hair. The stubble of my beard was looking a bit rough, but if I left it, I could probably grow a pretty decent beard. When I thought about it, I had to wonder why I had no beard to begin with, considering that I was originally from a world so cold that it bordered on the definition of death world. I concluded that I needed a change of clothes. I needed something more authoritative. More militant, since that was the traitor's role the action on this planet would cause me to be labeled as. Not the worst title among traitors, but certainly not the best either. It was a title reserved for the bloodthirsty conquerors who operated under the name of rogue traders. But I didn't have the most extensive wardrobe, though there were still options available to me. After some thought, I decided on a pair of dark blue pants with a few good pockets in them, much like the cargo pants from back home. A leather cuirass to wear under an open greatcoat, preferably in black or dark gray. The greatcoat itself should be a vibrant color in a darker shade. Purple or red if possible, but I would also settle for one in dark royal blue. I would be expected to carry lots of gold and braids to signify my status as the lord and ruler over my ship, future fleet, and possible imperial holdings. But that was one thing I had always detested, showing status through wealth. I would much rather look rugged and worn, in compliance with the old saying a knight in shining armor has never had his armor truly tested, especially if I was going for the traitor militant role. Sure, I would face many more direct threats by gaining that reputation, but it would also make most of my enemies, both current and future, approach me directly in a simple contest of brute strength, and those that would come from the shadows, I could get specialists to deal with. I had already instructed my ship's purser to allocate more funds and resources to my master of whispers, as well as ensuring that all the people under my command were paid fully and properly, on time. My orders had been met with excuses and attempts to weasel around it, but I had stood firm. After all, there was not much anyone could do to oppose my will if I desired things to be a certain way. I was slowly getting a reputation among my troops for being a rather lenient lord when it came to how they performed their duties, as long as everything was performed well and on time. Adding a reputation of also being honest with the pay would go a truly long way to ensure I would not lack troops in the future. Sure, they would always be against the idea of forceful drafting, but once my seasoned people got to talking to them, they would almost certainly calm down at the prospect of a generally easy life, compared to the many other places they could end up. But back to my new look, I got the thought to have my old issue of the Imperial Infantryman's uplifting primer sealed and attached to the leather course, as a memento, and a reminder to everyone under my command that you could potentially achieve anything. I would not go for a hat, as my carapace armor also had a helmet, which I much preferred. In the stories from back home, people would often leave their headgear in favor of being recognizable. No bloody way was I doing that, I valued my face too much to ignore the obvious advantages of a helmet. I started writing down what I wanted and summoned a runner to deliver my orders back outside the mountain. Once I was done in here, the new uniform would be ready and I could finally start looking my part. As soon as the runner had left, I sighed deeply. I had put this off for far too long. I opened my status screen and immediately, I was overtaken by notifications. Achievements? Fantasy running wild, congratulations. You managed to find a race that doesn't belong in this universe, however you managed such a feat. Plus two luck. Ah. Incoming, survive having caught the full attention of an undiscovered Jezel sniper team. Agility plus one. Unbothered. You have either reached a point where attempts on your life are so common that you don't care, or you are too stupid to realize the danger you are constantly subjected to. Plus 3 Will Innovator, despite imperial orders, you have found a way to improve the lives and security of an entire world through your inventions. Plus 1 Strength, plus 3 Perception Traitor Militant, you have taken steps that will set your reputation on the path of the traitor militant. 
Massive battles, planets forced into the Imperium through military might, death, and destruction will follow in your wake. Will you be a force for the Imperium or simply a killer consumed by bloodlust? Plus three strength, plus two will. Leading from the front, despite the common belief that leaders of the Imperium hang back and watch their soldiers die for their glory, you lead from the front right next to the soldiers you send to die. This controversy demands both respect and envy from your peers and adoration from the common soldier as well as lending considerable contributions to your physique. Plus two strength, plus two agility, plus two perception, feet, frontline savant unlocked. Know your place, use your power and status to requisition imperial forces against their will for purposes unknown. Plus two will. Found in the shadows, you manage to track down and expose an enemy that thrives on living a hidden existence. XP rewarded. Well, I was not about to complain about that. There were also countless notifications about the things that were being moved from the station above to my storage on the ship. For some reason, the system had decided to send me notifications about every single item placed in my possession. Endless lists of luxury items, from perfumes and real candles to exotic gems and rare fabrics. I moved on to look at my status screen as a whole. Human. Level 7. Stat points remaining, 5. Alignment, Faithful Imperial++. Plus plus. Litanies, 62. Augmentations, Cybernetic Lung, Upgrade LVL1, Toxins slash Environment. Level, 5618-385400. Strength, 17. Agility, 13. Perception, 17. Will, 24. Luck, 33. Psyche, 55-500. Skills. Feats. Abilities. Retinue. That was weird, why did my psyche increase so much? Sure, I had been the victim of a psychic blast from the bloody Skaven runic riding on board the station, and I had been near warp stone and mutation when they shot Troc, but beyond that, there was nothing, except perhaps the presence of warp dust in the air. But I liked what I saw in my status screen, even if agility was getting a low, compared to the rest of my stats. I threw the five points I had gained into the agility pool without hesitation. The Skaven were known to be extremely fast and agile, and closing the gap was paramount to my survival. With 18 agility, I would stand a better chance at getting out of this alive. There was also a new feat that I wanted to see, so I opened the correct screen with utmost haste. Feats Endurance, Tier 3, Level 1, Note, Planetary Bonus Applied Danger Instinct Living in a world where danger is relative and death waits around the corner of every new day have granted you the ability to sense malicious intent towards you. Natural bluffing. Since your arrival, you have spent a considerable amount of time during conversation lying and twisting the truth. You have been granted the natural bluffing feat. Frontline savant. Continuously seeking out battle on the front lines, even after reaching a level of power that lets you avoid it if desired, has granted you unprecedented awareness and attention to change on the battlefield. Even in the thickest of combat, you will never be in doubt about how the situation on the rest of the battlefield looks, as well as grants you a calm demeanor even in the most suicidal of assaults. A new tier in the Endurance feat? And click. Endurance, Tier 3, Level 1. Tier 1, Environmental Hazards affect you to a lesser degree than your peers. Passive bonus to Environmental Resistance. Tier 2, Minor Resistance to Irritants, Toxins, and Poisons. Minor Passive Resistance to Harmful Environmental Effects Tier 3, Minor Resistance to Diseases, Chaos Corruption, and Corrosive Substances Tier, Keep Leveling Up to Unlock the Next Tier Finally, fucking finally, I get something more useful than Environmental or Irritant Resistance. Does it take three tiers or more before things become truly useful? Oh well, I wasn't about to complain too much. Chaos Corruption Resistance? That was a prize in and of itself, that I was willing to throw enormous amounts of my soldiers at to achieve. I paused in my doings, stunned by my thoughts. Throwing soldiers at a problem until it was solved? When had I become so careless with human life? I mean, I understood that, in this universe, compassion could and would get you killed, but for me to have changed so much. It was a somewhat disconcerting thought, especially when I thought back to my beginning back on Carrick and the frustration I felt with the indifference of the common citizen of the Imperium. I would have to return to this train of thought. Introspection was sorely needed. I was interrupted by a knocking on the tent post and I had to return to the present. What? I called out and a muffled voice answered through the tent fabric. Lord, the 1st Regiment is arriving. 
800 troops will be here within the hour. The smile that crept onto my face was one of relief and maybe just a little joy. Excellent. Inform the commanders, take 500 men that are well rested and eager, and have them meet me at the tunnel leading further into the mountain within two hours. I heard footsteps walking away after my order had been issued, and I had to put my wardrobe plans on hold for a while. I needed to finish up with my status screens and get moving. It left me with precious little time to change my wardrobe from that damnable robe, but at this point, I didn't care. I was about to take 500 men and walk into a mountain infested by Skaven to the point where they had run out of space and were preparing to wage full-scale war to expand. The planet was not ready for such a wave of destruction and death to roll over it, the local lords and rulers would be steamrolled before they could mount even a laughable defense. I took off the robe and was left in my carapace armor and old uniform, but I felt more like myself. There would be stares and perhaps a few questions from the local leaders, but then again, the inquisitorial markings on the armor might just be enough to warrant the tried and true, don't ask questions you do not want answered a mentality that kept people alive in the Imperium. It felt good to drop the robe, the monk looks just didn't fit me, but I had to do a bit of rearranging of my gear to hide my backup loss pistol, and with a little creativity, I managed to make the stub cannon look like an exotic piece of strange equipment with an indiscernible purpose and look. I would not be able to quickdraw any of my firearms, but it was what it was. I pondered for a moment if I should leave the helmet behind, but a helmet has always been a good idea, and I was not about to lose an eye or get killed for the sake of aesthetics. I started to wish for a power weapon, but I would have to settle for something more available and the falchions I had secured my men were of good make and there was no reason I couldn't use one myself. Not that I left my field knife behind, but having a proper blade would be great. When I left my tent, Idris was waiting outside, looking angry and anxious. Lord Traitor. There was an insistence to her tone that gave me a feeling that it would be best to listen to what she had to say or risk her leading a mutiny. Yes, Idris Van Bale, what can I do for you? Speak up, my time is short. I snapped at her, and the sudden sharpness of my words took some of the wind out of her sails. It has been ten days, Lord. I need to make preparations to take my leave soon. The Imperium waits for no one. She explained, and she was right. I only had ten days to get some results that could be used to argue why I needed her troops here instead of on the trading lanes. We move to secure proof that I can keep you and your troops here for as long as I need. I wish for you to join me. Bring your guards, we are walking into danger. And don't worry, I only plan to be gone for a few hours, leaving plenty of time for us to return you to your trade lanes. And no, you do not have a choice, I need you to witness that I spoke the truth with your own eyes. She didn't like my words at all and did not attempt to hide it, but she still tried to weasel her way out. Lord, I am no soldier, nor a very capable fighter- dash. she began what I had no doubt was a very well-rehearsed and well-used speech, and I was having none of it. Idris, you are a chartist captain, in charge of a damn trade fleet, so don't bullshit me about your abilities. You may not be a good soldier, but I am certain that when you have your back against the wall, you are an extremely cunning and dangerous individual. And no, I am not going to have you killed to silence you, if I wanted that, I would have executed you the moment you let your mask drop at your first arrival when you thought Dartma was still in charge of this planet. You may operate using smoke and mirrors, but I do not. Now, go get dressed for combat and meet us at the tunnel leading into the mountain in no more than thirty minutes. If I do not see you and your entourage at that time, I will assume you have abandoned your posts and declare you renegades. My words had a profound effect, turning her anger into fear in an instant. Being branded a renegade would see her dead within a matter of minutes, maybe hours if she was lucky. There was no chance she would escape if she went against me. I decided to extend an olive branch and give her at least a shred of reassurance that she was in no more danger than the rest of us. I have no desire to see you dead, but I need you to know that I spoke the truth about this enemy. And I need you to know that you can trust me when I say my interests are aligned with the Imperium's. So go Idris. Dress for battle and say your prayers. Because it is time to go seek out the enemy no one wishes to find. And so, only twenty minutes later, five hundred locally trained soldiers, Idris, her entourage, myself, and a few squads of personal guards made our way down the tunnel leading into the mountain. Despite our numbers, there was no chatter, no idle banter, and very little boasting from recruits eager for glory. The few that attempted such bravado were quickly silenced by their superiors, the veterans sensing the same thing I did. Danger. 
There had been strange looks at my armor, especially from the veterans among the locals, and no small amount of scoffing since my armor looked more like glorified ceremonial plating than actual armor in their eyes. Especially Idris gave me a weird look and even went so far as to raise an eyebrow at me when she noticed my stub cannon, firmly secured to my left thigh. As if I cared, I preferred the safety of having a gun on me. All around us, the sense of immense danger was pressing down on us. The darkness was thicker, the light from our torches seemed dim and weak, the air stank of death, rot and rodents. There were no sounds beyond the noise we made as we moved. No skittering of little feet on the ground, no insects crawling on the walls, nothing. I suspected that the wards I had found on the space station were being used extensively throughout the mountain but there was nothing I could do about that, the time and effort required would amount to years. And that was if I had the mountain under complete control. Time dragged on as we moved down the large tunnel, ignoring the small side passages that diverged from what appeared to be a main highway for the Skaven. It was not a good place to be, but it could not be different either. What was worse, the enemy knew we were here, making it a very, very dangerous thing to not only move toward their undercity but do so down the main roads the Skaven themselves used. Time went by as we kept marching, the long wide tunnel seeming endless, though signs of life had started to show themselves, the occasional piece of warp stone, bound with metal wire and hung on the wall as a makeshift source of lighting. The first time we saw it, some of the men moved to touch, perhaps grab it, but I barked at them to the point where even their officers intervened, as they thought I was crossing the line. As a response, I found a small insect crawling on the ground and tossed it at the warp stone. As it burst into flames upon contact, there were no more complaints from the men or their officers. It was as we were getting back into formation that someone asked, What is that unholy stench? But before anyone could answer, we heard the squeaking. It sounded like enlarged rats making a whole lot of noise, but I knew it was the Skaven language, queakish. We barely had time to register the sound before they started pouring out of every opening and entrance available, dozens and dozens of Skaven streaming out of the tunnels, aiming straight for our rather large group. Ambush! The arch-militant working for Idris cried out and the reaction was immediate. The local soldiers closed ranks with their shields, forming a circular wall around our group, while those equipped with the new repeating crossbows started firing indiscriminately into the throng of rolling claws and fur that closed in on us with frightening speed. The first clip of bolts was barely empty before the living tide hit our shields and the line buckled under the pressure, the men groaning and cursing as they pushed back against the raking claws and snapping teeth. A skaven came jumping over the line, a piece of sharpened steel fashioned into a crude dagger lifted over its head to strike down when it landed, and I swung my falchion, hitting the beast in the torso, carving halfway through the body. A shower of black blood rained down over me as I pulled my sword back to avoid it getting stuck in the falling body and it hit the ground, twitching in death cramps. I grabbed the corpse around the neck and yelled at fighting retreat, before I gave a shove in the direction we came from to get the group moving. My order was repeated time and time again until the entire group was moving slowly back to where we came from. The dead skaven piled around our feet as we fought to get back to safety, but I noticed some of the ratkin busying themselves with looting their dead comrades rather than pressing the attack. That and their ragged appearance, their lack of clothes, the tattered strips of cloth they had fashioned into something resembling primitive clothes could not even be called rags, and the general weak physiology of the enemy suggested this was nothing more than skaven slaves, being driven forward to either get rid of us or hopefully overrun us. But they would not succeed, the slaves were malnourished and cowardly, even by skaven standards. Their lack of any form of equipment also meant they had to rely on their natural weapons, claws, and teeth, to do any damage and those came up short against hardened and studded leather and steel armor. More than once I felt and heard the screech of claws raking across my pauldrons and chest plate, the rackin were lightning fast and just as agile, but they lacked the strength to go head to head with a human in a pure contest of power. Every time a blade fell through the air, the screech of a dying skaven filled the air and mixed with the ungodly stench of their fear glands. They could not win this sort of engagement and they knew it as well as we did, and this made the skaven fearful, but when you backed them into a corner, like these slaves no doubt were caught between our blades and the anger of their masters if they returned alive and defeated, the desperation fueled their fury. They died by the hundreds, their dismembered bodies and filthy black blood littered the ground and covered us in grime and filth as we hacked, stabbed, kicked, punched, and otherwise took the lives of these filthy mutants. We were not immune to damage though, and every so often a set of claws or teeth would find unarmored flesh and do their best to cause as much damage as possible. The wounds were grievous and would most likely get fatally infected unless they were treated within the hour. To say that the Skaven were a filthy species would be a gross understatement. 
The cacophony of screeching, shouting, cursing, grunting, roaring, and multiple other sounds made it all but impossible to hear what the man next to you was saying, but we all knew what way to go. It was only a matter of time before we came into range of our backup, 800 troops and three severely pissed off ogrins that had recently seen their leader suffer a serious injury. But I didn't want the ogrins fighting yet, I wanted to keep them back in case of rat ogres, which the skaven would no doubt pit against us. What their species lacked in raw strength, they made up for with cunning and ingenuity, mixed with an extreme carelessness towards the danger of what they were doing. Many a skaven packmaster had died at the hands of his creatures, and even more, had died at the hands of greedy customers wanting their warpstone tokens back after making a purchase. We hadn't lost anyone yet, incredibly enough, but the frontline soldiers kept rotating out wounded men, putting them in the second and third line of men holding the ranks together, our bolts kept flying out of our circle, though at much slower speeds. It was reassuring that the archers tried conserving ammo, trying to make every shot count. It didn't stop the tidal wave of bodies trying to overrun us but it prevented them from gaining any proper momentum. The archmilitant was invaluable, his expertise in the field of killing shone through as nothing and no one got near him before they met death, his twin blades claiming multiple lives by the second. Over the fighting, I thought I heard orders being shouted, but there was too much noise around me to be sure. But as I thought I heard someone yelling orders in the distance, I no longer needed to hear the orders. Somehow I knew that reinforcements were making their way down the tunnel to assist us, and almost equal to the number of men I already had. More regiments had arrived, at with the growing numbers, and the sound of combat from the tunnel we entered, someone must have chosen to move to assist us. The air filled with electrically charged energy that made the hairs on my body stand on end, and the Skaven assault changed character from desperate to frenzied. I desperately looked around for the source of this change and my eyes fell upon Rakin, wearing a robe and hood of fine quality, the grey fur and large horns on its head let me know I was looking at a grey seer, no doubt the one chosen to lead this assault on us. Or maybe he had been proactive and decided to take care of us for his own nefarious purposes. He was chewing vigorously on a crumbling piece of green glowing stone in his mouth while he chanted in queakish. Before I could react, he extended a gnarled paw with claws the length of small daggers, and green bolts of warp lightning spread out toward my soldiers. There was nothing I could do as dozens of my men were engulfed in lightning that killed them before they had time to realize what was happening to them. The grin on the stupid Skaven's face was too much for me to handle. I would not allow my men to die in such a manner, not without consequence. I holstered my falchion and grabbed the grip of my stub cannon, but before I could draw it, Idris was at my side, holding on to my arm. No, Lord, we are forbidden. She yelled over the noise, but I shoved her aside, drew the gun, took aim, and pulled the trigger. The deafening boom that rang out stopped the fighting as everyone, man and Rakin, tried to locate the source. When their eyes fell on me, they followed my aim and their eyes fell on the grey seer. With most of his torso blown off, the only thing keeping him upright was his tight grip on the staff beside him and he was swaying heavily as his brain came to accept the fact that his body was dead and the moment he fell over, one of the sergeants from the local troops gave a mighty roar and charged out of the group, attacking with wild abandon as he moved toward the now growing sound of our reinforcements, who were charging up the tunnel at full speed if the noise of running boots were any. Indication It only took a second but the entire group followed his example, charging down the tunnel. The Skaven, now robbed of their leader and the greatest threat to their lives should they flee, opted to follow their natural instincts and get as far away from the danger as was physically possible for them, and the way forward was more or less clear by the time we had taken ten steps. I was still dragging the corpse of the Skaven that had jumped at me and it was important to me that I brought it back. Not only to secure access to Idris's fleet and troops, but also to send a message to the Imperium at large, and specifically the Inquisition. If they were here, there was a chance they could be on other imperial planets, and a general imperium-wide search had to be undertaken. The corpse was my proof and I damn well needed to bring it back with me, to be picked up by imperial representatives at a later date. The local soldiers kept sending me side glances, and a few of those with more keen eyes were trying to get a good look at my stub cannon, but mushed together as we were while we ran toward salvation, there was no opportunity for them to satisfy their desire. If I was lucky, they would forget what they saw though I doubted it. If not, they would have to die. We did not do a fighting retreat as much as we just ran, cutting down everything that stood in our path as we did so, and within a minute, we ran into the reinforcements who promptly turned around and kept up pace with us, helping to drag and carry the wounded that was still in a position to be saved. Those whose wounds were too serious would be cared for and eventually burned once they died of their wounds. I was not about to risk warp shenanigans with the corpses of my dead soldiers. 
and it would prevent the ratkin from using them as an impromptu food source. It wasn't until we reached the relative safety of our barricades that everyone stopped running, but I didn't mind. I had gotten what I came for, and one look at Idris told me that she needed no further convincing. To be honest, I was surprised how well she was holding up for a merchant captain. Sure, they suffered the occasional pirate attack, but considering that she had an entire fleet under her name and the reluctance with which she followed the orders to join this little trip. She was gasping for air, clutching her rapier, and keeping her eyes firmly fixated on the dangling skaven corpse in my hand. I threw the corpse on the ground in front of her and said, There, Idris, is the proof you need to excuse yourself from your regular duties and answer the call to war. I expect your men to start arriving at dawn. And with that, I spun on my heel and walked away, once more dragging the corpse of the rack in. There were things to do, reports to write, messages to send, and a war to plan. And now that the local troops had started arriving, I could get to work on pushing our front line into the mountain. I couldn't set up too close to their undercity, not if I wanted us to survive. I needed to spend valuable soldiers on scouting parties that could find the most defensible locations. Unless, I had to gather the commanders and have them scour their ranks for anyone who used to work in these mines. It was a long shot, but perhaps there was someone who either knew their way around or had access to a person who did and could assist in making maps for us. I sighed deeply. I had just left the field of battle, and I was already knee-deep in new worries and half-made plans. No rest for the wicked, indeed. I needed to relax, but I couldn't afford to dull the mind with alcohol, so I settled for a low stick. With a heavy sigh, I managed to light it with the embers from one of the small braziers inside the tent and sat down to have a moment to myself. I spent a minute making a list of goods to be gathered from the things taken from the former governor's private stock. Idris had done reasonably well with little in the way of resistance. An expensive gift of rare goods would go an extremely long way to suit the demands I had put on her resources. Halfway through the low stick and with the list barely done and handed off to a runner, an ungodly roar reverberated through the cave, causing me to jump out of my chair and rip the tent opening to the side to see what was going on. I couldn't immediately see anything, but then the same feeling from the short clash with the skaven washed over me, and I knew that a massive counterattack was forming in the very same tunnel I had fought my way out of minutes earlier. And that roar could only be rat ogres descending on our barricades. To arms! Arms yourselves, the enemy is here! I yelled as loudly as I could to rouse the soldiers around me. To the barricades! Get up and fight if you want to live! The cave made my voice boom with the echo, spreading my message to every soldier within the mountain, and I grabbed a young man who was standing around with a confused look on his face. Run to the barricades outside and get more troops! I snarled before shoving him toward the other side of the cave, and he started running as if he had demons chasing him. This was not too far off from the truth, considering that the horned rat which the Skaven worshipped was a minor chaos god in the established lore from back home. There was no more time to do anything, the sounds of battle were being heard from the barricades and soldiers were streaming from all over the cave to reinforce their friends. Even the guards stationed at the larger crevices were moving to join them, but a sharp command from their commanding officers made them stay at their designated positions, despite their instincts to join the fight. We could not afford to be attacked in the rear right now. And I should have expected this. We killed a grey seer, one of the priest cast among the skaven, as close to royalty as you could get without killing a member of the Council of Thirteen. Unless, of course, I had been so lucky. The vermin had been rather careless about the seeming expenditure in life and warp stone when it engaged in combat. There was simply no way of knowing, and I rushed toward the barricade to assist as best I could. It took less than a minute to make it there, but everything was chaos and pandemonium when I arrived. Officers trying to get soldiers into the best positions, soldiers trying desperately to plug any hole in the defense, and a sea of skaven trying to wash over us. There was actual equipment on these attackers, which meant the clan rats had been engaged in combat. The irregular citizens of the skaven empire, they could at least afford knives and spears, and the most rudimentary of clothing and armor. I could see large halberds slowly making their way toward our front, which meant this was a dedicated assault. Stormvermin didn't seek out minor skirmishes, they wanted large battles to showcase their ferocity and violence so they could be favored by whatever skaven leader they served. If they were here, this was a dedicated attack, meant to either see us leave the mountain, fall under their claws, or leave us so wounded and exhausted that we have to abandon our invasion. I also suspected the skaven lords having taken offense to me initiating an offensive on their home, in the days before they did the same thing to expand their territory. 
The vermin had always had big egos and a terrible case of a main character syndrome, eternally doomed to think that everything happening in the world happened purely to aid or spite them, and I would not be surprised if this was the work of a skaven lord attempting to right some perceived slight against him. Of course, it could just be a reaction to having me kill a grey seer so casually, the unknown danger I represented after such an action would undoubtedly put the biggest target on my back, but I couldn't worry about that. I had started down a path of a leader who led by example, and I would have to continue down said path or see all the authority and integrity I had built up crumble in front of my very eyes. It was a short run to the tunnel leading into the mountain and when I arrived everything was chaos. A desperate shield wall was fighting with all its might to prevent being overrun, two rat ogres were doing their damn best to push through while the corpse of a third rat ogre lay peppered with the crossbow bolts being fired in a steady stream from the back lines and raised platforms on the inside of the barricades. The living ocean of Skaven trying to push their way and were better equipped, some of them with actual armor and decent weapons, and all of them with as proper clothes as you could find among the Rakin. To me, it was more than obvious that my little excursion and subsequent fight that saw a Grey Seer dead was the cause of the anger being directed at us. This was not the work of the Council of Thirteen nor of a single Grey Seer trying to assert themselves. This was the collective effort of the Grey Seers being pitted against me, to punish me for killing one of them so casually. I had shown the slaves around them that the Grey Seers were mortal and that they died just as easily and quickly as the rest of them. And for that, I had to be punished. The dead continued to pile up on both sides, but the Skaven had the advantage. This was their territory and they had numbers on their side. This? This had not been a good idea. Not a good idea at all. I stood there for a moment, taking in the enormity of the situation I had unleashed upon myself, and I realized that I would come up short in the long run. I might win now, I might even win the next 100 engagements. But unless I added a magnifier to the power of my troops, I would at best be able to achieve a stalemate that would see this world devolve into a planet that spent more resources than it put out, making it an effective cost for the Imperium instead of a gain. Drastic measures had to be taken to ensure these people could continue to live their lives the way they had always done. If not, they would become a war world, a breeding ground for veteran soldiers of the Imperium. But first, we had to survive this and I threw myself into the fray with unusual abandon. Maybe it was the knowledge of what the rats would do to me if we failed, or maybe I just finally had enough of this cruel and cold existence that had been thrown at me. Or maybe I was just changing as a result of being in this universe. In any case, I sought the front line and joined combat where the fighting was hardest. One of the rat ogres had made it within reach of the shields and was swiping at our lines while using the corpse of Skaven to shield itself from the worst of our ranged fire. Every attack it made saw men fall over, either from wounds or simply from the brute strength of the attack, and every fallen man was a potential opening for the Skaven who never failed to capitalize on an opportunity to gain the upper hand, and they pushed forward, unrelenting in their efforts. I stabbed, punched, kicked, hacked, and swung the best I could along with the troops around me, but we were losing ground and losing it fast. Something had to be done if we were to be victorious, but the only ace I had up my sleeve would break Imperial Decree more than I had already done. Screw Imperial Decree, it was this or see the world fall into chaos. Firing lines, lost pistols are free to use. I cried out, over and over, trying to shout over the squealing, snarling, screaming, roaring, clanging of blades, and other noises that filled the air. Native troops near me looked at me like I had gone crazy, but at least a few dozen soldiers pulled back from the front line and formed two ranks with the front rank kneeling and produced lost pistols from their robes before they unloaded on the Skaven ranks. To the technologically advanced enemies of the Imperium, the lost pistol and lost gun were little more than a nuisance. But it was still a beam of concentrated light powerful enough to punch holes in concrete and blow off limbs, and against the Skaven and their mostly unarmored or lightly armored troops, it was like taking a scythe to a field of grass. Hundreds died in the initial volleys of fire, and their bodies had barely hit the ground, clearing the line of sight, before the next volleys lanced through the air. You could say a lot about the Imperium, but when troops had a leader who cared how well-trained they were, they became frighteningly effective at what they did. The rat ogres both disappeared under concentrated fire from my troops, and the extreme slaughter the Skaven found themselves to be the victim of stunned them into inaction for a few moments. Time that was used by the native troops, who had now gotten over their initial shock of my troops using gunfire, to aid as best they could with their crossbows, adding further killing potential to the torrent raining down on the unprepared Skaven. The Skaven attack was not just halted it was destroyed. 
A massacre on an obscene scale, hundreds dying every moment as the lost shots scythe through the thin, wiry rack in and the crossbow bolts found panicking bodies with their backs turned. It was a rout, even the storm vermin, betrayed by their large halberds and actual iron armor, were pulling away from the battlefield as fast as their legs could carry them. Surprisingly fast, as it turned out, especially since they did not hesitate to cut down anyone and anything standing in the way of their retreat. I couldn't help but sneer with contempt at the sight, their scorn of compassion and sense of community was the very thing that prevented their race from rising to the top. They reproduced fast and in large numbers, they had a natural resistance to chaos energies, they were able to wield enormous and terrible psychic powers, and even knew to work mutation to their advantage as seen in their rat ogres. They could work warpstone into usable weapons, even consume it to magnify their psychic powers. In short, they were the perfect counter to the orcs, the other big contender for top species, but their lack of unity, like the orcs, was their great flaw. When the last Skaven had fled or been killed, a weird silence fell on the gathered soldiers. Even Idris was present, though I had not seen her during the fight, and she was staring at me. For a moment, I had no idea why she was looking at me with such intensity, but then it dawned on me. There was no way around it. Not unless I wanted every soldier in the Imperium turned against me by a vindictive Chartist captain. Guardsmen, fulfill the Emperor's decree. The words left my mouth, but it felt like I was not the one giving the order. There was no hesitation in the troops Idris and I had brought with us. In an instant they turned on the native troops that were still alive and opened fire, cutting them down before they realized what was happening. They barely had time to scream, much less try to fight back, as my troops' training showed its worth. Precise shots were fired in a calm and controlled manner, without panic, without remorse. They had the luxury of hiding behind the mindset of just following orders to stay alive, where I had to live with the knowledge that these deaths were squarely on my conscience. I had chosen to break the imperial decree to save my own life, and by extension, the lives of most of the people on the planet, even if they did not know it, but it didn't make the burden less heavy. On my order, several hundred people just lost their lives for no other reason than me making a choice. Idris! I called out. And she slinked out from the shadow of the troops from her ship, blade in hand and a bad case of the after-battle shakes. She was switching her gaze between me and the dead soldiers as she approached me, timid and hesitantly. When she finally rested her eyes on me, there was no small amount of accusation in her eyes. I did what Imperial Decree demands I do. And I would think that you of all people could understand the need for this to happen. Now, see that my orders are carried out and make sure they come with plenty of ammunition and explosives. I am going to bring this whole damn mountain down on the heads of these vermin, by sledgehammer if need be. I defended myself by hiding behind the imperial decree and Idris knew it, but we both knew I only did it to protect my sanity. Nobody in their right mind could order the death of so many loyal people without a care in the world. Idris didn't respond, but she didn't stare me down anymore. She seemed more resigned than anything else as if this was not the first time she had been witness to a situation like this, and it struck me once more just how dark and grim this universe could be even to those in power. Sure, I might not risk getting gunned down for breathing in a manner that is not imperially regulated, but on the other hand, I was holding the lives of tens of thousands of people in my hands. A single command would see this world purged of human life without question or delay. Was I fine with having such unregulated and total power? How could I guard myself against moral corruption? These questions rang out in my head and decided to stay there, as the now properly armed soldiers took up positions on the barricades. A few of them got to work on moving the bodies outside to be burned. A single body could be burned inside the mountain with little worry. But the amount of bodies we had piled up on both sides at this point warranted fresh air and open spaces to avoid making the air toxic to breathe. I felt drained. Not from the fight, thought it had been a tough one. But the weight of my actions was taking their toll on me. I needed time to think. To rest. So I made my way back to my tent and informed the guard that I was not to be disturbed for the foreseeable future. But once more, I barely had time to sit down and gather my thoughts before I could hear mumbling outside my tent. The voices grew in volume and I could hear Idris and the guard exchanging harsh words. I had to stop this before it escalated. I walked over and ripped the tent open, Idris and guard both swinging their heads around to stare at my tired face like two kids caught sneaking candy after being told no. Let her in, it's obvious she will not let this go, and the sooner I can get some actual rest, the sooner we can get this campaign underway. I stepped to the side and held the tent flap open for Idris to enter, and she did so hesitantly. 
She waited until the tent flap was back in place and I had taken a seat once more before she spoke up. Lord, my apologies for intruding had I known you were about to rest dash. I guess a guard telling you I am not to be disturbed is not enough to convey a message. Should I send a runner with a message every time I lay down to sleep? Or can this rogue trader be allowed to do things the way he desires? I was cranky and tired, and I made no effort to hide it as if my harsh words were not enough to convey the message. So kindly get to the point so I can rest. My words seemed to have the effect I hoped for, as Idris lowered her gaze and her ears turned red from shame. Lord, what is expected of people in our positions of power is never easy, and sometimes we have to secure the Imperium, by violence if need be. But it is not the reason I wish to talk with you. I noticed you helping out in the forges some days ago. I was wondering where you learned to work like that. It's not like you gained your rank through sheer luck and promotions, so what Rouge Trader House would allow the next generation to perform such menial work? She did her best to remain respectful and I heard no accusation in her voice, only curiosity and a hint of amusement. You are mistaken Idris. My first taste of combat came from my home planet as a PDF trooper. Through luck, skill and grit, I have managed to rise to the position of power I now have. That, and I gained the good graces of an inquisitorial agent after being sent off-world to fight against a rebelling hive city. I was not born to this Idris, I got here on my own. And the reason you saw me working the forges is that the mind gets time to wander and turn around ideas when the hands are busy, it is almost meditative to engage in work I know so well. I was tired, but I didn't care at this point. She owed me her life several times over, and debts were important to merchants, so telling her a bit of my humble beginnings would not be the worst thing. But apparently she was not sharing my mindset. Why are you telling me all of this, Lord? She asked after a moment of contemplation, and for once, I did not have a response ready. Because I understand that I have pulled you into something you would much rather avoid being a part of. You are a Chartist captain, running the trade lanes of the Imperium. Your life is predictable, safe apart from the occasional pirate raid, and most of all profitable. And this campaign of extermination I have pulled you into is anything but profitable. If your ship's purser does not report a net loss from your stop here, I might be inclined to let my own go over your numbers. I said the last bit with a small smile on my face and a dismissive gesture to let her know I was joking. But most of all I am telling you this because you have been wary of me from the beginning and this state of mind is counterproductive to the both of us. I know I do not fit in among the echelons of power and in truth I am not trying to fit in. I don't want to and now you know why. I just want to serve the Imperium, vanquish its enemies, both internal and external, and see the people under me working in the best conditions I can provide. A happy imperial is a productive imperial. Idris stared at me with an open mouth as I spoke, and it took her almost thirty seconds to gather her wits enough to fully absorb what I had said. How did you catch the attention of the Inquisition and live, she asked, and I smiled at the memory as I answered. They suspected me of being a psyker when I am just able to inspire the people around me. As a result of their investigation, they decided to offer me this position and a letter of mark to explore the unknown in the name of the Imperium and the Inquisition which should explain their markings on my carapace armor as well. But if you ask me, it's just a way to make sure they have me nearby should they change their mind and decide I would be better served with the Emperor's mercy. In any case, now you why I might be a bit unconventional, but I trust you understand that I have the Imperium's interests at heart. We were interrupted by the guard poking his head inside, Lord, the runner you sent off has returned with your request. He said before shoving a young man and struggling under the weight of a large crate. Perfect timing. Idris, I would like to offer you this crate as a small token of appreciation for the help you have provided me. Exquisite silks, expensive jewelry, rare gems, and more. I have also taken the liberty of having three barrels of Rienka brandy reserved for transport to your ships. Finally, I think I saw a bottle of Theosophist's filter in the crate. I hope it will suffice. I said as I took the crate from the young soldier, who hurried out of the tent again and put it in front of Idris. For once, she seemed to have nothing to say, doing her best impression of a fish by opening and closing her mouth several times. Lord! She finally managed, this is too much. Such an extravagant gift in exchange for help that I am bound by imperial law to provide. I would be hard-pressed to accept it. Nevertheless, I would consider it an insult if you refuse it. I have no use for it anyway, my interests are located elsewhere and I need the space on board my vessel so it would be better served in the hands of someone who can appreciate its material value. 
I dismissed her words rather casually, and I was speaking the truth. I had no use for it beyond the goodwill it could secure me when used as gifts like I was doing now. And I can see how eager you are to inspect it, no need to hold back on my account. The words had barely left my mouth before she had wrenched the top from the crate, which was quite a feat since it was nailed shut and was carefully pulling out items to get a closer look. Her small oohs and ahs as she ran her hands over the silks, inspected the gems against the light from the braziers and carefully studied the jewelry work. Are these real candles? She suddenly gasped as she held up a bundle of twelve handmade candles. Indeed they are. I hope you can appreciate them more than I do. To me, they are a source of light. The look she sent me told me she considered me insane, but coming from a merchant to a militant rogue trader, it only made sense. I took a seat and lit a new low stick as Idris continued to fawn over her new wealth, which was by no means small. The brandy barrels alone could earn her enough to make this entire venture worth the expense I had put on her. The crate of oddities would most likely find its way to her personal coffers, but who cared? I had turned Idris's opinion of me around, both with my words and with my generous gift. This would help me later in this life, though I did not realize it just yet. As for the now, I had to prepare a plan of attack on the Skaven Undercity. And sleep to catch up on eventually. 